Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Fred Larkin, Johnny. New Jersey fire and casualty. Hope I didn't get you out of bed. Well, you sure did, Freddy, but how are things in Trenton? In Trenton, fine. In the little town of Vineland, I'm not so sure. Vineland? About halfway between Philadelphia and Atlantic City? That's the place. What goes down there? Fire. Arson? That's what I hope you can find out. Well, uh, any reason for suspicion? Yes. The man who holds the policy on $83,000 worth of bedding. Bedding? Mattresses, box springs, it went up in smoke two days ago. Okay, Fred, I'll grab the first train. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the New Jersey Fire and Casualty Insurance Company Home Office, Trenton, New Jersey. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Smoky Sleeper matter. Expense account item one, ten seventy five, fare and incidentals, Hartford to Trenton. Item two, eighty cents, taxi to Fred Larkin's office on West State Street. He lost no time in getting right to the point. That's right, eighty three thousand total loss. Well, who's filed the claim, Fred? Name is Ben Murray, sole owner and manager of Ben Murray Furniture Sales in Philadelphia. Sort of a small chain scattered around all over the city. I thought you said the loss was in Vineland. It was. That's where he had a big warehouse. Well, if his stores are in Philly... He claims it's cheaper than maintaining a big warehouse in the city. Also, apparently, it's close to a couple of sources of supply. He's been a good account, Johnny. We've made a lot of money on his policies. Well, it sounds like you've issued him quite a few. Well, we have. You see, in addition to the usual coverage on his stores, we've issued him a lot of short-termers on warehouse contents from time to time. I don't quite see what you mean. Uh, His whole business is based on special sales. Free inventory, going out of business, distressed merchandise, fire and water damage sales, summer, winter, spring, and fall sales. Anything you can think of. No kidding. Periodically, he loads up his vinyl warehouse with stuff he's accumulated for the next big sale. And we insure it. This time, it was $83,000 worth of box springs and mattresses. Wow, that's a lot of betting for just one sale. Yeah, don't worry. He'd have got rid of it. His salesmen are the sharpest bunch you ever saw. Too sharp, if you ask me. Almost like a bunch of con men. You know what switching means in the retail trade? Isn't that when they advertise a well-known item at a very low price? That's it. Then when you try to buy it, they just uh, happen to have sold the last one. That's it. But by that time, they've got you in the store where they can use the high-pressure pitch to sell you some inferior item at an even higher price and on a no-return basis. Yeah, by the time the customer gets wise, it's too late. Exactly. I suspect they're not above using the label switch, too. You know, have some local manufacturer make up a cheap item, then put a nationally recognized label on it, or a pretty good copy. My, my, what nice clients you have, Freddy. Well, what can we do, Johnny? As long as we don't catch them red-handed in something that directly affects us... Well, you don't need to write any more policies. The company says different. At least until such a time as they try to pull something on us, or we find proof of such doings. I see. Well, where will I find this Ben Murray? Either his main office in Philadelphia or down in Vineland, looking over what's left in the shell of that warehouse. On what exactly does Murray base the amount of his claim? Face value of the policy, which in turn was based on the cost of the goods to him. Huh? You mean you used the figures he gave you? Mm-hmm. Hardly. We got the figures from the actual bills sent him by the manufacturer. Well, I wondered. I don't blame you. No, Johnny, that 83000 is exactly what the mattresses and box springs cost him. It was a special order from one manufacturer, made up especially for one big sale. Can your secretary check on Murray's whereabouts for me? Sure. All right, then let me use your phone. I may be able to save us all a lot of time, labor, and soap. I called my old friend Adam Bowles, who lived within a few miles of Vineland, who, before he retired, was one of the top arson men in the country. Investigator, I mean. He wasn't home, but I left word for him to drive to Vineland and meet me in the lobby of the East Landis Hotel whenever I got there. Meanwhile, Fred's secretary had learned that Ben Murray was in his Philadelphia office. 
Expense account item 3, 560 for a train to Philadelphia and cab to the main office of Benmer Furniture Sales. The place was a madhouse. Okay, Dollar, go ahead in. It's that first office on the right. Thanks. And listen. Oh, wait a minute. Sales department, call me back. I'm busy. Listen, Dollar, if you can get a word in edgewise with Ben, ask him where's the contracts for that West Philadelphia deal, will you? Oh, sure. Sales department. Yeah? Well, turn the hose on some of that stuff and throw it a block sale. What like that. Makes a picture in that advertisement look good, see? Put a lot of stuff around. Pictures on the wall, rug on the floor, stuff like that. Yeah, make the suckers think they're getting a 25-piece dining room suit, not just a table, four chairs, and 20 crummy dishes. Dollar, sit down. Thanks. Yeah, make it look like they'll be getting everything they see in the ad. Yeah. Now, would you get them sofas in from Sterling? Okay. Put a price ticket of 95 bucks on them, and then mark it down to 49.95, and we'll clean out the whole... Mr. Murray. Huh? See what? Sterling charges 25 bucks for those lousy sofas. Listen, we're giving them twenty-two fifty for them, except for the demonstrator we show on the floor, the good one. Who does he think he is telling me the price he's going to charge me? Oh, the lousy bunch of chiselers trying to hike the price on me. Holy, what a business. From the looks of that outer office, you've got plenty of it. Yeah, yeah, volume, Dollar. That's what does it. I work on a narrow margin, see? Oh. Yeah, sometimes I even lose money, just to keep the volume up. I got nine stores, see? They're all over Philadelphia. Hey, Ben. Yeah, what's the matter now? Pine Street wants to know the sale prices on those three grades of night cloud mattresses. What'll I tell them? What are the cost prices? All the same. Thirteen bucks a piece. Cost us thirteen bucks, huh? Well, price them at, uh, at, uh, thirty-nine ninety-five, forty-nine ninety-five, and sixty-nine ninety-five. Okay, Ben. Hey, Larry. Narrow profit margin, huh? And now look, Dollar. Your card says you're an insurance investigator. That's right. Well, if it's about that fire I had down in Vineland a couple of days That's ago... That's exactly what it's about. Well, let me tell you something. Uh, oh, for... Yeah, what is it? Oh, yeah, well, listen. Hey, pick that other phone off the hook, Dollar. That noise is killing me, will Why you? Why not? I might learn something. Well, you tell him I don't care. He's a Department of Internal Revenue in person. Hello. We pay hey, for Ben, I got like a dame here in the store who found out that bed we sent her wasn't the yeah, same that? one she saw on the floor. Well, well no. Wait, wait we just a minute. I, uh, uh, she threatens okay. to go see the, the Better Business Bureau. Up well, up. look, uh, this That's isn't me. Ben. Huh? That's what I mean. Just hold on a minute, will you? Hold on. And you tell that bookkeeper we got there, he either keeps the books the way I tell him, or either he... Well, look, I'll call you back, see? Did you hold that call for me, Dollar? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hello? Yeah? Yeah? Well, don't take any chances. Give her anything she wants. Give her the one she saw on the floor. Go out and buy her one, a good one. Just make her happy. Keep her from... Uh, from well, you know what I mean. Yeah. Troubles, troubles, troubles. When I look, Dollar, you think there was anything wrong with that fire, you prove it, I'll give you this whole business. What do you think I am, a crook? I haven't said that yet. Then, then what's the idea investigating? Not you, but that fire. We always investigate when a claim this large is involved. Oh, yeah? Do it automatically. Look, I'm trying to run an honest business here, just barely scraping by. That phone call just now. A customer ain't 100% satisfied, we make her satisfied. Oh, sure. To keep her from blabbing about the way you rooked her. Oh, look, look, get out of here, would you? Can't you see I'm busy? I try to run a decent business here, and punks like you come in and... Oh, if I'm... Yeah, hold on. Look, you got some legit reason to investigate, Dollar. You come around then. Maybe I will. Now go on. Get out, will you? Gladly. Listen, Charlie. You tell him he tries to outsmart me, I'll sue him for every set he's got. Expense account item four. $50 deposit on a drive-your-own car. I crossed the Delaware River Bridge and finally picked up Route 47 for the 35-mile drive down to Vineland. Flat country, this, with plenty of beautiful trees and rich farmland and occasional cranberry bog. The soft smell of ripening peaches greeted me from the vast orchards I passed. It was all very pleasant. Certainly a complete contrast to the noisy, unhealthy joint I just left. And I could see only too plainly why Fred Larkin suspected arson in the warehouse fire. Sure. If a character like Ben Murray didn't resort to arson, he'd feel he was missing a good bet. Proof of arson, however, is a different matter. And not always easy to come by. That's where I wanted the help of Ed Bowles. But Ed hadn't got to the hotel when I arrived in Vineland. So I drove over to the police headquarters at 610 Wood Street, a block north of Landis Avenue, the main drag. There I found Sergeant Louis Tommaso, who'd been working on the case. 
Be glad to take you over there, Dollar. Just the other side of Chestnut Avenue that's over south of town. All right, Sergeant, I'd like to see that warehouse, or what's left of it. Oh, there's plenty left of the warehouse, all metal construction. Come on. That in itself might make it hard to spot our... Dollar, we went over the... Lieutenant, Mr. Dollar and I are going out to the Benmer warehouse. We went over that place with a fine-toothed comb, both during and after the fire. Came up with nothing, huh? Nothing that would give any cause for suspicion. Sergeant... Do you know a man by the name of Adam Bowles? I certainly do. He's been giving me a lot of help with this. You know, just to sort of keep his hand in. And he's found nothing? Not a thing. But of course, he's the kind that never gives up. Yeah. Well, let's get on over and take a look at that place. It was obvious that the whole contents of that warehouse was damaged beyond repair. And apparently the big steel building had been packed to the roof. I looked over some of the damaged mattresses very carefully, sometimes with the aid of my pocket knife, and I learned some rather interesting things, things that showed the best possible reasons for wanting to burn up a lot of merchandise like this. Hmm. Wow. Well, have you seen enough, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, I guess so. But I still want to talk to Adam Bowles. So let's go on back to... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Looks like Ed pulling up in that car there. Huh? Oh, so it is. Hey, Ed. What? Johnny. Yeah, well, hi, Ed. Sergeant, don't tell me you sent for a half-wit like Dollar. <laughs> Just again. a minute now, Stinky. Why, the greenest rookie on the force would get further. Ed, I'll brain you. You two know each other. <laughs> are you kidding? <laughs> Johnny, how are you, baby? Great, just great. You got my message, huh? Yeah, but I hereby inform you that, as usual, you got here too late. Oh, is that so? When I found out you were coming, I decided I'd better get to work, if only to show you up. <laughs> So I did, and I found out who started the fire. Well, I've got a pretty good suspicion myself. Who did it, Ed? Poor old Jerry Cumber. Who? Jerry? The old town ne'er-do-well? Yep, that poor, foolish old wino. Wow. How'd it happen? Oh, he was just wandering around that night, as he often does, with a bottle to keep him company. Found the back door of the warehouse open, thought he'd take a little nap, or rather sleep it off. He certainly had his choice of nice soft beds. Yeah. So he went to sleep with a lighted cigarette in his fingers. And there you have it. And the funny thing, Sergeant. Yeah? The only charge you can really hold the old bum on is being drunk and disorderly. And, of course, trespass. What? Well, you look it up. You'll see I'm right. As for you, Johnny, you can just go on back to your company and tell them to pay the claim. Oh, that's so? Yes, sir. Case is closed. At least for you. That's where you're wrong. Huh? After a couple of things I heard at the Benmer office, plus a couple of things I've seen here, Adam, I think this case is just starting for me. Act Two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. For a long time, people have been saying that the earth is shrinking because transportation is getting faster and faster. And because this is true, people are getting closer, too. Today, our neighbors are not only the ones who live next door to us. They're all over the world. It is axiomatic that one should help his neighbor. But Americans have gone a step further. In addition to individuals helping individuals, now many American cities help many other cities through the Sister City program. Now, perhaps you've heard how it works. If not, here's an example or two. In the fall of 1959, a large area of Nagoya, Japan, was struck by a devastating typhoon. Her sister city, Los Angeles, California, sent tons of relief materials to Nagoya by way of an Air Force plane headed for the area. The Marines and the Navy rendered vital emergency aid during the disaster. When earthquakes shook Viña del Mar, Chile, during the summer of 1960, her sister city, Sausalito, California, sent hundreds of dollars' worth of relief materials to help out. Another case in point, the school children of Clovis, New Mexico, sent a number of cultural exchange packages to students in their sister city of Adana, Turkey. There are hundreds of such examples because there are hundreds of sister cities. By using this means of diplomacy, 
friendship and understanding have increased throughout the world and paved the way for permanent freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, Act Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Smoky Sleeper Matter. <laughs> From the looks of things, the case was practically over. The fire at the warehouse full of box springs and inner spring mattresses had been accidental. And it looked, I underline that word looked, as though Ben Murray's claim for reparation to the tune of $83,000 was entirely justified. Ed Bowles, the finest expert on arson I knew, had produced the man who started the fire as proof. So, on the surface, there was nothing for the company to do but pay Ben Murray's claim. But I smell a rat. A big one. Expense account item five, 75 cents for a person-to-person call to Fred Larkin and Trenton. Well, Johnny, if you're satisfied with Bull's conclusion that it wasn't arson, well, that's that. We'll have to pay off the claim. Uh, what if I could prove fraud? Fraud? What do you mean? Look, Fred, you told me you saw the bills, the manufacturer's bills, to Murray, giving valuation on the bedding that was stored in that warehouse. Yes, I have photostats of those bills right here in my desk. But what are... Good for you. Dig them out, will you? Oh? Why? Go on, go on. Dig them out, Fred, and read them to me. What if there was no arson? I fail to see what you're driving Look, will you do what I ask you? I'm trying to save your company some money. All right, all right. Ah, here now. Uh, Now, what do you want to know? Well, the labels on the remains of the mattresses I looked at at the scene of the fire, those labels indicated there there was a model called the Night Cloud Sleep Rest. And that checks with these bills. Now, let's see. Uh, There were... 3,500 mattresses called Night Cloud Sleep Rest. Well, forget the quantities. What was the manufacturer's price to Ben Murray on that Night Cloud Sleep Rest? Well, let's see. Uh, uh, Johnny, they cost Ben Murray exactly twenty-five fifty a piece. And there's an equal number of box springs. Twenty-five fifty. That's right. But I overheard him say in Philadelphia that he only paid... Hmm. What, Johnny? Uh, nothing, nothing. What other models are on those bills? Uh, Night Cloud Super Sleep. And the price? Uh, just a second. And look while you're figuring, you might be interested in knowing that the labels on that sleep rest indicated a retail price of $69 each. Some profit, huh? Uh, here now. Johnny, the Night Cloud Supers cost Murray $26.20 apiece. Wow, hey. All right, I got it. And he claimed to be working on a narrow profit margin. Now, the Night Cloud Perfection Sleep cost him uh, $27.14 each. Good. Any more? Uh, those were the only ones he bought and stored in the warehouse. All right. Now, give me the name and address of the manufacturer. Easy. Golden Bedding Corporation, Woodvine, New Jersey. Good. Now, one more thing. Can you think of the name of another big chain of furniture stores, you know, like Ben Murray's, only in uh, New York or Chicago or some other big city? Well, of course, there's Glauder Brothers in New York. Glauder Brothers. Only they're such a disreputable outfit that when they try to talk insurance with us... Freddy, that's all the better. Thanks a lot. Now, wait, Johnny. You still haven't told me... Oh, I will, Freddy. Don't you worry. I will. Why I didn't get pinched for speeding somewhere along Highway 49, I'll never know, because I certainly didn't hold back the horsepower. Just short of the town of Tuckahoe, I turned off on 557 and then a few miles later pulled into Woodvine. Although it's a small community surrounded by farms that boasts a big hat factory, a couple of clothing factories, a vast, sprawling state institution, and on the far edge of town, the Golden Bedding Corporation's huge plant. I figured the best thing to do was put on a bull front and bull my way into the president's office. But any such tactics proved entirely unnecessary. Barney Glauder, huh? Uh, yes, Mr. Golden. Uh, but just Barney's good enough. Well, I should say it is, because you must be Barney Jr. I've known your papa for years. Sit down, my boy. Would you like a cigar? Why, uh, no, no thanks. You don't look like your old man, though. You know that? Not a bit. Of course, I haven't seen him since 42. <laughs> Barney Glauder. Yeah. Well, what are you doing in this part of the country, huh, Barney? Oh, um, business. Uh, pleasure, trip. Business, huh? What's the matter? We haven't had any orders from you people lately, huh? Well, up to now, I haven't really had anything to do with the business. <laughs> Living off the old man's millions, huh? <laughs> Smart boy. Did you go to college? Yeah. Full four years. Yeah, that's the way. Smart boy. Now you are in the business. Buying, maybe? Well, if you mean from you, that depends. <laughs> if you're as sharp as your papa... How old is he now, huh? Pop? Yeah. Oh, uh, let me see. Yeah, how's your mama? Mama? She, uh, uh, look, Mr. Golden, mm-hmm. if you if you don't mind, uh, we'll talk business first. Huh? <laughs> Chip off the old block. Sure, business always first. After maybe you come out to the house and have dinner, huh? Talk over old times, your family. Sure, maybe. All right, you go right ahead. Tell me what you want to order. A thousand mattresses and box springs, huh? Ten thousand? 
Anything you want, my boy, and at a good price. Well, like I said, that depends. Uh huh. What kind of a deal? Is that what you mean? Yeah. All right, I'll tell you. Your papa's a very smart man, you know that? He's a good businessman. I know what he's thinking, so I know what you're thinking. All right. If you want to give me a nice big order for a lot of merchandise, I'll name you a price that you... Listen, Barney, I've got such a good customer in Philadelphia these days, not mentioning any names, but you'll pardon me, I don't even miss your papa's business. Understand me? But to get your business back again, I'll make you the same type deal I give this man. For a firm order, that is. You understand? No cancellations. You'll, uh... You'll, uh, pre-ticket the merchandise. That mm -hmm. is, uh, put the list price on the labels for me, uh, for us. Any price you say, regardless of the cost to you. Uh, look over here, my boy. The pictures of our merchandise here on the wall. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Night Cloud Perfection Street. Well, we'll put on any name you like. One should sound like some national brand, we'll think up a name for you. Not a bad deal. So far. And we make up as many models as you want. You know, we change just the ticking. They look different. All 196 springs, I personally guarantee it. Only 196? That's all you need, sure. Nobody can tell the difference. Except, of course, the demonstrators you keep on the floor to show the customer. <laughs> the demonstrators are 392 springs. Those you can jump on and bend them anything you like. Yeah, and the customer thinks that's the kind he's getting. What else? <laughs> I tell you, Barney boy, just as smart as your old man. Yeah. Now, uh, what about the price? Ah, the price. Now, Barney, this you can't resist. You understand, out here in the country... Low overhead, no labor problems, nobody snooping Yeah, around. yeah, I know. How much? Well, for you, my boy, how many? Well, uh, say uh, 10,000 units. 10,000 units. All right, I'll give you a special price. How much? Well, now, this depends on the ticking material. Hmm? You look here. See? First class material looks like twice the money. Go on. Plain blue and white ticking, that costs you. And remember, Barney, this is very special because of your papa and getting back his business. So, at 10,000 units in this ticking, $14.93 and you never saw such a buy. That okay? Eh, strikes me as a little high. A little high? I'm not making a thing on it. Look at here. This, the fancy ticking, this is real class. $15.06 a unit. Now, you can't beat that. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Well, of course, Barney, my boy, if you want to order a few no, more... No, no, no. I, I, I think maybe I can do better up in New England. In New England? Who? Tell me who. Well... All right. All right. Now, look. I told you, I've got a big customer in Philadelphia. Well, all right. Never mind. We'll do it the same way for you we do for him, all right? On the books. How do you mean? Well, I mean fourteen ninety three cents, huh? Only what would you think if the bill I send you says twenty nine ninety six? hmm? Double? Mm-hmm. You'd make it look like I paid twice as much? So? Yeah. Yeah. For tax purposes, I'd only be showing about half the profit I was actually making. <laughs> Smart boy, Barney. Or, uh, suppose I insured the stuff for the amount your bill showed, and something happened to it. Well, that's I? right, sure. However you want to excuse me. Hello. Oh! <laughs> Hello, Ben. I was just thinking of you. I hear you had a lucky fire up there. What? Oh, no, not now. Listen, Ben, I've got a customer. I've got... No, I've got an important customer here. The son of a very dear old... F... What? Yes, he is. Yes. A blue shirt and a bow tie. Oh, no. Oh, no. Ben, I'll call you back. Mr. Dollar? That's right. Johnny Dollar. In person, Mr. From Golden. the insurance... Oh, no. Oh, no, no. Too bad no, Ben Murray's no. call interrupted our conversation. Oh, what advice? That was a very interesting lot of facts you gave me, and I strongly suspect it'll not only put Murray out of business, but you too, and a lot of people you've been oh, dealing I'm with. dollar. Brother, I hate to think of what the Better Business Bureau oh, will do when they get hold of these business facts. Bureau. To say nothing of the Federal Trade Mr. Commission. Dollar, listen to but me. But I have a notion it'll help to clear up one of the dirtiest chip rackets in years. There's no need Even to the long-suffering public understands this sort of shady operation when it's brought to their no, attention. It's not at all. As for the decent, legitimate national firms you've been practically now, stealing listen from. Me, dollar, will you please listen a minute? Yeah, go ahead. Business has been good. I've made a lot of money. Oh, now, wait Maybe a minute, you, you could use a little bit. You know, we'll call it the commissioner. Huh? Say $10,000. In cash, it wouldn't show. Golden, I wouldn't even spit on that kind of money. Oh, I could maybe persuade you. You couldn't persuade me to have any part of it. Brother, you've had it coming for a long, long time. And believe me, I'm going to see that you get it. Understand? Yes, Dollar, you make it... I understand. I understand you, too. You dirty crook. You faker. You liar. You cheating, dirty, conniving, chiseling liar. 
You ruined me, you hear? You ruined me. Yes, Fred? I'm afraid that your nice client, Ben Murray, based his insurance claim on a lot of values that didn't exist. On the hiked up prices. Hiked up to cheat you and the income tax boys. And if that is not right fraud, I'll eat my shirt. So you can just forget about paying that claim or any part of it. And I hope that you and the company will take whatever legal steps are necessary to put these guys out of business. Expense account total, including incidentals and the trip back to Hartford, $130.49. And cheap at half the price. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Kansas' state flag is dark blue, and in the center is the state seal, surmounted by a large sunflower, the official state flower. The seal reflects the history of Kansas, the train of ox wagons going west, for most of the great roads passed through Kansas. An Indian is depicted chasing a herd of buffalo, recalling the words of the official state song, Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam. For this truly was the home of the buffalo and Indian. The east is represented by a rising sun, and the promise of future prosperity is indicated by the steamboat on the river and the farmer plowing the field. Above a mountain range are 34 stars, for Kansas was the 34th state admitted to the Union. Over all is the state motto, Ad Astra Per Aspera, to the stars through difficulties. Kansas state flag, the flag of the 34th state to enter the Union, was adopted on March 23, 1927. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the case of a girl who was willing to kill for money she didn't need. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Russell Thorson, Jack Edwards, Will Wright, Paul Dubois, Lawrence Dopkins, and Vic Perrin. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Transcribed. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. What? Oh, Fritz. Yeah, I thought it was the outside line. Yeah? Yes, thanks. I'll be right down, Fritz. Boss, Mr. Wolf, will you please hurry? You're well aware that it will avail you nothing to hurry me? Why must the world be in such a rush today? But the car, it's downstairs waiting. Fritz is all ready. Let him wait. Isn't it enough that I've agreed against my better judgment to leave the comforts of home to go rushing through the crashing traffic of the city? To a dinner, that should be an inducement. Fritz could have prepared a delicious dinner. He has truffles in the pantry. Well, why did you promise Arthur Merle? You didn't have to accept the invitation. Quite so. He's an old friend. Besides, he does set an excellent table. It's just that I don't like the traffic. Traffic? (laughs) I know why. It's that awful oxygen in the atmosphere outside. It's not the traffic. Archie, you're talking much too much. I know, boss. I'm impatient. Would you mind giving me some slight indication that you intend to move from that chair? Just as soon as I finish this beer. Sure you wouldn't care for half a dozen sandwiches before we go to dinner? If we were going anywhere other than to Arthur Murrow's, I'd agree with you. He's the only person in the world I know of, except myself, of course, who has a proper appreciation and respect for the art of preparing good food. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, balkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chairborne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. We 
usually refer to this story as the case of the final page. Under normal circumstances, the last page of a manuscript would be absolutely worthless unless you read all the preceding pages. But in this instance, the final page held the answer to a murder. Without that page, we couldn't arrive at the solution. Actually, we didn't even know the problem. Anyhow, I finally got Nero Wolf to the lobby of Arthur Merle's apartment building. Going up. Going up. Up, please. Are you going up, gentlemen? Are you, honey? Certainly. It's my job. Then so are we. After you, boss. When did they install women elevator operators in this building? I've been here for two years. Floor, please. Arthur Merle's apartment, I believe it's 814. That's right. Are you Mr. Wolf? Uh, no, this is Mr. Wolf. I'm Archie Goodwin. Although the name Wolf would be much more appropriate for him than for me. How did you know he was Mr. Wolf? Mr. Merle came in half an hour ago. He mentioned that he was expecting you. You see, Archie, you rush me unnecessarily. We practically preceded him here, and we'll probably have to wait interminably for dinner. I just hate to be late. Arthur Merle has never been on time in his life. He's no more punctual than any other writer. He's never been known to meet a deadline on time. This is your floor, gentlemen. Arthur Merle is just down the hall to the right, 814. Uh, thank you. And uh, by the way, I want to compliment you on your congenial attitude, miss. I'll speak to the management. Oh, thank you, sir. Decent of you. Uh, what's your name, huh? Women are usurping everything. Really cost to live here. Merle's really in the chips. Every book he writes sells a million copies. Remember the last time we had dinner with Arthur Merle? I do. Delicious. Mountain Quail shot them himself. Yeah, he's quite a marksman. Archie, such proficiency as Arthur Merrill displayed in hunting is evidence of a wasted life. Sure, he probably never made over $500,000 a year in his whole life. Well, ring again. Don't just stand there. Surely he's expecting us. The elevator operator said he was? Yeah, she seemed quite well informed. If I were a judge of women, which I am not... I'd say she has a line on every male in the building. She can get a line on me anytime she wants. Archie, your insatiable interest in the female seems sometimes to border on the psychopathic. You know a more pleasant way to go crazy? Phooey. It's strange as a light on in there. I can see it under the door. Shall I try the door? Do so, Archie. Thank you. Mm, unlocked. Well, at least we can get in. He may be in the bedroom. Probably in the kitchen. I'll just sit here. I must figure out the comforts of my own home. I certainly intend to avail myself of the comforts of Arthur Merle's. Hmm. Very much over-decorated. You wouldn't like heaven unless they had orchids and beer. Hmm. Not a chair in the place worthy of the name. Well, I'll try that divan while you have a look around. For what? Ah, the Merle, of course. Suppose you have a look in the study. Maybe writing. Have a look, my boy. I am exhausted and thirsty. See if he has any... Boss! Vi- Boss! Good heavens, Archie. Don't shout. Uh, I'm coming. It's Arthur Merle. Look. Slumped over his desk. A knife in his back. Yeah. He's quite dead. You haven't touched anything? Certainly not. I've been around long enough to know that. Well, you just call Inspector Kramer at homicide. How long do you think he's been dead? I'd say a half hour. From all appearances, yes. And perhaps only ten minutes. I can't understand it. Why would anyone want to kill Arthur Merle? Everybody liked him. Nice man I'd expect such a thing to happen to. The answer is probably a considerable distance from the question, Archie. Inspector Kramer, homicide. Archie Goodwin, Inspector. Just a minute, Nero Wolf wants to speak to you. Oh, no. Don't tell me you two have started up something on a night like this. It's ten below zero. I'm sorry. Here you are, boss. Hello, Inspector. Yes? What is it this time, Wolf? Find a dead body under Grant's tomb? (laughs) I'm sorry you'll forgive any apparent failure to find humor in your little witticism. But I'm at Arthur Merle's apartment. I suggest you come here at once. Seems that Arthur finally met a deadline. So, you just walked in here and found Merle dead, huh? We were invited here for dinner. Hmm. Anyone else around when you got here? No. You see anyone, Goodwin? Only the elevator operator who brought us up. 
Well, Mr. Wolf, since you were in on the ground floor, maybe you've got some ideas. Sorry, Inspector. Had I been able to solve the crime so soon, I would have advised you, Inspector. <clears throat> yeah. Well, it's obviously murder. Obviously. You knew him well? Quite well. Ever know of his being in any trouble? No. Everybody liked him. Arthur Merle, I felt, didn't have an enemy in the world. Is that so? I don't think anybody pulled this as a little friendly gesture. Don't jump to conclusions, Inspector. That this murder was committed necessarily by an enemy of Merle's. Meaning? It could have been an absolute stranger. A woman? Or a burglar, or a madman, or a crank, or... As far as we know, it could have been anybody in the city, Inspector. Arthur's been dead nearly an hour. And an hour ago, I was in my own home, sitting comfortably in my own big easy chair, drinking a delectable glass of beer. Someone at the door, aren't you? Yeah, just a minute. I'll answer that. Mr. Merle? No. Uh, well, is Mr. Merle here? Yes, he's here. But he's not seeing anyone. Well, he's expecting me. I'm from the Serve Right Catering Company. We're ready to serve for four here tonight. Their dinner has been canceled. Oh, but it's been ordered. Breast of guinea hen, cooked in wine and cloves, delicious. It's prepared and waiting. I'm afraid that I must insist on seeing Mr. Merle. Mr. Merle has been murdered. Well, I'm afraid I must... Uh, murdered? Well, oh, my goodness, but... Well, in that case, I... Yes, good evening. Don't you think you might have taken a bit more time with the fellow, Inspector? Why? You might at least have let him serve the dinner. Guinea hen, wine, and clove sounded positively delectable. Look, I've had dinner. I'm afraid you're too busy, Inspector. So busy that you've just passed up an extremely interesting bit of information. What are you talking about, Wolf? He said he was to serve dinner for four. Well? Arthur Merle, Archie, and myself are only three. Well, who else was supposed to be here? A fourth guest who either hasn't arrived yet or who arrived earlier and left. Oh, I see what you mean, Wolf. Good. In that case, I'll leave you to pursue your deductions from that premise. Archie, will you please stay with the inspector and be of any help that you can? As for myself, I'm going back to my own home, which I should never have left in the first place. <laughs> Okay, that finishes the apartment search, Goodwin. And what have we? Nothing. Except that Merle had over $300 in his pocket, and he was wearing a ring worth a couple of thousand, so it couldn't have been robbery. And I don't think it was premeditated murder. Why not? The weapon. Obviously, if someone had planned on killing Merle, he'd have prepared it better. Used a better weapon than a blunt paper knife. No, as I see it, someone was here before you and Wolf arrived, and for some reason that person found it necessary to kill Merle, and he did it on the spur of the moment. I'm listening. Well, it's obvious. Merle was slumped over his typewriter. The sheet of paper was in it. He'd been working. May I see it? Yeah. Starbreaker. Strange title. Page 189. He was getting well along with his latest mystery. Apparently. Okay. Gregory Thorne slipped the paper into his pocket. It was just an ordinary piece of paper, but Gregory knew its value. Used properly, as Greg knew how to use it, it would be worth $100,000. He walked away briskly, and as he... That's all. Yeah, that's all. Must have been right. You no, know, I'd it? like to read the rest of it. We didn't find any more of it. Any other ideas? No, at the moment we seem to be right where the murderer himself left off. It. Oh, what is this, open house? Sorry to be so... Oh. Oh, what? I was... I mean, I expected to see Mr. Murrow. Is he here? Well, who are you? Cynthia Roberts. He expecting you? Well, no. That is... Uh, come on in, Miss Roberts. Thank you. Maybe the young lady is trying to say that he didn't have to expect her. Maybe she felt free to call without advance notice, Inspector. Inspector? Uh, what did you want to see Mr. Merle about? I... Well, I'm his fiancée. Oh. Had dinner yet, Miss Roberts? Why, yes, I had dinner earlier. Uh, when I... were you last here, Miss Roberts? Well, last night, after the theater, Arthur and I were... What's the matter? Is something wrong? I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Miss Roberts, but Arthur Merle was murdered. And you say you hadn't talked to Mr. Merle all evening. Is that right, Miss Roberts? Yes, that's right. You didn't have a date with him tonight? Oh, no. Then why did you come here? I told you we were engaged. I just came by, that's all. I see. 
Any more questions, Inspector? Yeah, none for the present. How about you, Goodwin? Nope. But maybe Wolf. Let me call him. Yes, I guess under the circumstances, we can't very well leave him out. <clears throat> Go ahead. Oh, Arthur, I just can't believe it. Why would anyone want to kill him? That, Miss Roberts, is a question we'd all like to know the answer to. Nina Wolf speaking. Archie, boss, I'm still at Merle's. We haven't found out anything new except that Arthur's fiance dropped in a few minutes ago. Did she know anything of interest? I don't think so. What does the inspector plan to do about it? Just a minute. He wants to know what you're going to do with it. Well, hold her, of course. He's going to hold her. Let me speak to him. Okay. He wants to talk to you, Inspector. All right. Hello. Inspector, I suggest you let the young lady go. Are you crazy? I haven't got enough suspects in this deal to be letting the hottest one go free. You can't consider her a suspect simply because she knew Arthur. Now, see here, Wolf. If you go around arresting people at random, you'll suddenly be tipping your hand to the real murderer. Admitting that you don't have a real clue to go on. And just what do you suggest? Find a motive, Inspector. Find a motive. Then if you stumble on a suspect, you'll have some basis for making an arrest. At the moment, I suggest that you let the girl go and tell Archie to stop wasting his time down there and come home at once. <laughs> So that's the story, boss. We went over that place with a fine-tooth comb. Nothing. There's not a single suspect. The last person to see Arthur alive was the elevator girl. Correction, Archie. The last person to see Arthur Merle alive was the person who ended his life. Well, I just can't imagine that pretty little elevator gal. You don't solve crimes by imagination, Archie. Then there's Cynthia Roberts, his fiance. You suspect her? Not exactly, but just suppose she did have a motive. Maybe he threw her over. Wouldn't it have been very clever of her to come back to Arthur's apartment after the police arrived, allegedly looking for him? I thought you were the admirer of the fair sex, Archie. So far, the best you can do is practically accuse the elevator girl and Arthur's fiancée of murder. Well, who else is there? Certainly the fellow who came with the food doesn't count. I repeat, who else is there? The entire population of the city, Archie. Thanks. Well, that's all I get. Oh... Oh, there was something else. What? This. Page 189 of what appears to be Arthur's latest novel. It was in his typewriter. As you can see, just started the page. Hmm, Starbreaker. Hmm. Very interesting. What's the rest of it? It's all we found. What? And there was something missing. Archie. Yes, boss? First thing tomorrow morning, get the address of Mr. Morton, who publishes Arthur's books. Then get over to see him right away. Yes, may I help you? I'd like to see Mr. Morton. Uh, did you have an appointment? Tell him I'm from Homicide. Uh, how, oh, yes, sir. Yes? Uh, Mr. Morton, I know you have someone with you, but uh, there's a gentleman here from the Homicide Bureau. He wants to see you. Tell him I work for Nero Wolf. My name's Goodwin. His name is Goodwin. Send him in. Yes, thank you. You may go right in, sir. The large door to your right. Thanks. Come in, Mr. Goodwin. Come in. I understand you're from Homicide. Not exactly. I'm Nero Wolfe's assistant. We're working with Inspector Kramer. And what can I do for you? You've heard about Arthur Murrow. Yes, I received the word when I came in this morning. It was a great shock. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Goodwin. This gentleman is Henry Childs. How do you do, Mr. Childs? Glad to meet you, Mr. Goodwin. You're with Nero Wolfe? I'm his, well, his assistant, man Friday. Mr. And... Childs is a publicity agent. He handled all publicity for Arthur Murrow. I've not only lost an excellent client, but a very good friend. Did you know Mr. Merle? Yes, I'd met him a number of times with Mr. Wolf. Yes, indeed. Arthur Merle was a great writer and a fine citizen. He'll be missed by millions. Mr. Goodwin, when was the murder discovered? Last night, shortly before dinner. Well, what are the police... I mean, what do you think the motive was? Don't know as yet, Mr. Charles. A little early for that. Well, it's certainly a shame. I, uh... I wanted to ask you a few questions, Mr. Morton, privately. I hope you don't mind, Mr. Charles. Oh, no, no, not at all. I was about to leave... I'll run along now, Mr. Morton. Uh, see you again soon, Mr. Child. Good morning, gentlemen. Well, Mr. Goodwin? You did a lot of business with Mr. Merle, Mr. Morton? I published every one of his novels for the past eight years. And you intended to publish his new one, the one he was working on? Yes, we had a contract. The usual agreement between you? Naturally. Although I didn't know the story, I was always sure that if Arthur wrote it, it was good. 
Mr. Merle's name on the novel was a guarantee that it would sell a million copies. You don't know what this last one was about. Haven't the faintest idea. We relied completely on Arthur's judgment. Not even any carbon copies, huh? Not that I know of. Why? When Mr. Merle was killed, the only thing missing from his apartment was the novel. The novel? The first 188 pages. All we found of it were a few lines of page 189 in his typewriter. He must have been working on it when the murderer stabbed him. The rest of it's gone. You mean, Goodwin, the the novel's gone? This will cost me a million dollars. Well, it cost Arthur Merle his life. Arthur Merle dead and his novel gone. I can hardly believe it. Well, thank you, Mr. Morton. I hope I've been of some help, although I don't I'm sorry you haven't. But we may call on you again. Before it's over, you may be a great help. Here, Wolf speaking. Archie, boss. I just finished with Morton. He doesn't know a thing. Merle never discussed his stories with anyone, and as far as Morton knows, he never made carbons. I see. Where do I go from here, boss? See Cynthia Roberts. Oh, then you haven't dismissed the possibility that she may have had something to do with it. Being his fiancée, she probably knows more about Arthur than anyone else. She may know who the fourth guest was to have been last night, and she also may know what Merle's novel was about. I personally don't give a hang what the novel was about. What I want to find out is someone who does know the story. Because I have a hunch that whoever knows that is the person who killed Arthur Merle. Miss Roberts, I know you want to help us find out who killed Arthur. Oh, yes, of course. I'll do anything. Nero Wolf and I were invited to have dinner with Arthur Merle last night. Well, I knew he was having friends in for dinner, but I didn't know who they were. Oh, I'm sorry. I hoped you'd know whom he invited. No, he didn't tell me. Miss Roberts, we have reason to believe that there was to have been a fourth person there last night. A, a fourth? The caterer came to deliver dinner for four. Now, the fourth party never did show up, or else came earlier and left after Arthur was killed. You mean someone Arthur invited to dinner might have killed him? Maybe. Oh, there's no one that I can think of who bore any ill will toward Arthur. We're convinced that this was done on the spur of the moment. Unpremeditated murder. Arthur Merle suddenly became a threat to someone. Now we've got to find out what the threat was and who was threatened. We'd hope you could help. I'm sorry. Did he ever discuss his new novel with you? Oh, no. He never talked about his stories until he'd finished them. So his latest mystery contains the answer to an even greater mystery. Unless we find the first, they'll both go unanswered. Mr. Morton? Yes? Nero Wolf speaking. Oh, yes. Your man Goodwin was here to see me. I presume you are interested in seeing Merle's murderer brought to justice? Certainly. Arthur was a close friend of mine. And his death cost you a best sir, I know. Now, would you be willing to help a bit? Why, yes, if I... I prepared a statement for the papers. I want you to call the literary editors first thing in the morning. Here's what I want you to tell them. Got a pencil and paper? Yes. And take this down. Quote, Mr. Carlton Morton announced today that the last work of the late Arthur Merle will be published according to schedule. Fortunately, it was Mr. Merle's custom to furnish his publishers with carbon copies of each day's work Consequently, with the major portion of his... Boss! Boss! Good heaven, Archie. Please don't be so loud. Look here. In this morning's paper, why, that rat, he lied to me, that... that... What on earth are you talking about? That publisher, Morton, he said he didn't have copies of Merle's manuscript, that he didn't know what it was about. And And listen to this. Mr. Carlton Morton announced today that the last work of the late Arthur Merle will be published according to schedule. Fortunately, it was Mr. Merle's custom to furnish his publisher with carbon copies of each day's work. Consequently, with a major portion of his latest work, Starbreaker, in the hands of his publisher, together with a complete synopsis, including the denouement, it will be possible for a ghostwriter to complete the novel. It will be published posthumously in proceeds with... Boss, did you hear that? I did, and it couldn't have been more to my liking if I'd written it myself. Now, excuse me, I want to make a telephone call. Who? Publisher Morton. Yeah, I'm beginning to see. He lied about the whole thing. I still don't see why he'd kill Merle, 
but on... Hello, Mr. Morton. This is Nero Wolf. Yes, perfect. Now I'll call Kramer, and he and Archie will be waiting for you. Remember now, if anything comes of it, you are to say the manuscript is in the safe in your home, and you steer the party here. Say you've recently rented this place. I hope we'll be seeing you. Yes. Goodbye. Oh, and be careful. Remember what happened to Arthur. The manuscript is in my desk in the middle drawer. What the... You mean... Archie, look out of that window. Huh? Yeah? Out there is a city of some five million people. In that five million, there is one who murdered Arthur Merle. Now, we don't know who it is, so we can't go out and put a finger on him. But, Archie, since we can't go to him, we have only one other choice, make him come to us. Tell me why we're sitting here in the dark in Wolf's office. Yes, Inspector Kramer, Mr. Wolf promised us a caller. Mr. Morton is to pretend that he's rented this place recently. Well, who's the caller? Can't tell you until he or she gets here. You seem certain he'll come. I'm quite certain. I'm just hopeful. You trying to tell me that Morton killed Merle? You're almost as dense as Archie was. No, Morton didn't do it. Unless Mr. Wolf is very wrong, which is doubtful, before the night is over, Morton will know who did. Man, it won't be long until we know, too. Uh, you should get on a quiz program. You're so good at guessing games. Shh. Listen. Huh? Yeah, someone's coming. A great introduction, my dear Kramer. I hope there are two of them. Inspector, behind these drapes. Quick. I'll get behind the screen. All right, Mr. Morton. So far, you've been very cooperative. Just keep it up. I have no intention of doing otherwise. Your gun has me completely convinced, Mr. Childs. Get the manuscript. Uh, yes, uh, just a moment. It's in my desk. Wait a minute. I thought you said it was in the safe. A mistake, Mr. Childs. I don't have a safe. Shall I get the manuscript? Yes, but no tricks. You be careful. I'm being exceedingly careful, Mr. Childs. There you are. Uh, Starbreaker by Arthur Merle. Yes, this is it. Thank you, Mr. Morton. Now, I trust that's all you want of me. I'm sorry. I wish that were true. Unfortunately, you see, it's not the actual novel that I want. Oh? My interest in this copy is the same as it was in the original. And that is? That no one should ever learn the content. I take it you know what it's about, then. Yes. You see, Mr. Murrow made the mistake of telling me when I called a bit early at his apartment for dinner last evening. I was forced to deprive him of his life once I learned the storyline of this novel. This story must be kept secret. Why? Most of you people in the publishing business know me as a public relations and publicity agent for several prominent writers. Yes? Actually, I've been as successful as I might in this business. Because a few years ago, I stumbled onto a very neat and foolproof method of blackmail. Unfortunately, Arthur Merle thought of the same thing and based this story on it. If it got out, I'd be exposed and sent to prison. So you can see why I had to stop it, why I had to kill Arthur and why... Now I'll have to kill you, too. Oh, child, for heaven's sake. The contents of these pages condemn me. You know what's in them. Further, I've confessed the murder to you. You don't think I could let you live after that, do you? Child, you're insane. I'm sorry that I must repay you for your trouble in such an ungrateful manner. I'm sorry to do this to oh, you, child, but I can't... Child, please, no! <laughs> sorry, Mr. Charles. There wasn't time to ask you to drop the gun. All right, Mr. Charles. Get your hands up and stay where you are. Nice going, Mr. Morton. Who are you? That took courage, Mr. Morton. Sorry we had to wait so long, but we had to make Mr. Charles here convict himself. Convict? What do you mean? We've been waiting here for you. Behind the drapes all the time. We heard every word. Mr. Charles, you're under arrest. Police? Yes, Mr. Charles. Only one person could have been so anxious over a copy of that novel. That's the person who killed Arthur Merle for the original. And we heard you confess to that. And that's all we need to convict you. We didn't have any proof until we set it up for you to make a second try to cover up for the first. Fortunately, the setup worked. Setup? Take a look at the rest of the manuscript, Mr. Child. What? Oh, the front page is there, all right, but look at the rest. Why, the blank. They're just blank pages. You didn't have a copy at all. No, but we certainly got a murderer. Eh, Inspector? Child! Child! Stop, Child! Stop! Well, that's one way to avoid standing trial. 
Well, Archie, I'm glad you and Kramer got Charles. Some BRP. That was a clever scheme, boss, making him think there was a copy. Yes. In a way, though, I wish it hadn't been just a scheme. Meaning? I wish there had been a copy of Arthur Murrell's novel. Why? You never read detective stories? No, but I've drummed up so much curiosity over this one, I'd like to know exactly what that blackmail gimmick really was. Good night, Archie. Ah... You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Don Arthur was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman production and is directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin. And Evelyn Eaton, Peter Leeds, Lucille Alex, Marna Keneally, Herb Butterfield, and Bill Johnstone. Next week, at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you the case of the Telltale Ribbon. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's excitement for you Sunday when talented servicemen compete on the Phil Regan Show. And Sunday on NBC also means another delightful adventure with Cary Grant and Betsy Drake when they star as Mr. and Mrs. Blandings, the proud but bewildered owners of the famous Dream House. The chimes are your invitation every Sunday to Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. Tomorrow for excitement, hear Herbert Marshall in The Man Called X on NBC. Personal notice, changes my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Greetings, mystery lover. Welcome to another George Valentine adventure. Better known as Let George Do It. I think we have a real George story for you even though the title may do nothing for your goosebumps. It's called The Sedan from the City, which I must admit is kind of mild. However, it all takes place on Halloween, which is something at least. And even though it might not be Halloween where you are, I think this story with its goblins and its witches and stuff should kind of scare them your harem. Want some gas, mister? Better drive closer to the... Pu- uh, what? Yeah, this Broomville. The way you're headed, though, is Timber Corner. But... Hey, look, look out! Holy smoke, mister, where do you think you're going? It's because you drive a fancy sedan from the city. Yeah, I know. I heard your car. Heard it drive up. I'm coming. Oh, shoes now. Where to, where to put those? Ah, all right. All right, just a minute. Wonder who it could be. Yeah, I bet I'm going to be surprised. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I got a little surprise for you, too. Don't go away. Just take a minute. Yeah. Big sedan. Whose car is that, for God's sake? Mervyn Brewster, huh? B-R-E-W-S. But why? Why? Everyone loved my husband. They did. From the city it was, there Lieutenant was no Riley. One. Big black sedan. Didn't catch the license, oh, but I it did. was the same car they saw drive away from the house here. Didn't they, Fred? They loved Mervyn. Everyone did. Uh, Dora, yes, wait sir. a second. She'll tell him. Take hold of yourself, Dora. The lieutenant has but to... But, Mac, work. I just came home and there he was, lying there, dead by the door. 
I'd been out visiting. I wanted him to go with me. It's such a beautiful night. Mrs. When I Brewster, came home... please, we've got to work fast. <laughs> Several people spotted the strange car, and Fred... <laughs> Fred, in the service station, couldn't you see what the man looked like? Well, he had a dark hat, Lieutenant. An overcoat pulled up, sort of a... He's sort of a fish-colored face. I remember that. Little skinny shrimp, I'd guess, and... Uh, oh, and then he had a funny eye, sort of pushed out of place. Scarred, I guess. Well, but Murr didn't know anyone Well, like we'll that. radio the highway patrol. They're uh, setting up roadblocks. There's never been anyone like that in Broomville. That's right, Lieutenant. People love Merv. He was the nicest man in the world. Yes, uh, Why would anyone like that from the city just come out and shoot him? Now, Mrs. Brewster, Here, Lieutenant, please. I'll take care of it. Yeah, oh, you... thanks, sister. The... Huh? Miss Brooks. What in the name Hello. of heaven are you... Do... Come on, Mrs. Brewster, we'll go. Wait a minute. What are you doing here? Well, I came with George, naturally. But what? Who sent for him? Come on, come on. What's going on here tonight? Who sent for Valentine? <laughs> You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to Let George Do It and George Valentine. Everybody loved him, Mr. Valentine. That's why I called you so quick. I didn't know the city police would be called in, too. Okay, Fred, so you phoned me. Well, uh, you see, Dora come home and, and found Merv. Went to the nearest neighbor, first place down the other road from Timber Corner. Only that's old Fonville. He wouldn't help his dying mother. So she called Mackenzie. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me get these people straight. Uh, uh, Mackenzie, he's in there in the other room. You saw him. Merv Brewster's assistant down at the factory. Uh, whisk broom, Merv called him. <laughs> Gosh, Merv always had a funny the word... What? What, well, what's this factory you're talking about? Brewster's Brooms. Haven't you heard of them? Sweep the skies, sweep the world. <laughs> yeah, that's Merv. Well, it's his factory, and this is his town. Gosh, he built the whole thing. You mean thing. the chubby man and the suspenders in there who's dead, Merv Brewster? You mean he owned a factory? Well, sort of one. But it don't make him no rich man. He, he never cared about profit, just for the good of the town. See, practically everyone here works in the... Okay, fa- okay, I understand. Brewster's Brooms. But you didn't work for him... You own a service station, so where do you fit in? Oh, but Murr's my cousin, don't you understand? Gosh, I'm the only relative he had. Always a joke for everybody. And you should have seen how the kids loved him. And then an hour ago comes a big sea dan from the city, and this stranger... You didn't know anyone in the city, Fred. Huh? Uh, this is Mackenzie. You saw him. Hello, Mr. Valentine. I suppose it's confusing when you... Yeah, first... sure, of course it is. Every murder is. Until it's solved. Uh, Merv was a genius in his own way, you know. He drew his own labels, witch riding on a broom in the trademark. Made up his own slogans, rebuilt a barn for a factory all by himself. Uh, sort of a rustic one-man band. Okay, of... okay, I get the idea. Now, that's the real mystery, isn't it? The town Santa Claus gets murdered. A man you say everybody loved. Do you blame us for being surprised? Being shocked? Yelling for help? There's no one in Broomville with a fish-colored face and a bad eye who drives a big black sedan. It looked like one of them armor-proof jobs you see in the movies. Mr. McKenzie, your boss or your partner, whatever it was, he must have done business in the city. Maybe he had enemies no, there. No, no, he didn't. Murph was born in Broomville, Mr. Valentine. Born and raised. Married 27 years. He had no children himself, but 20 times a godfather. Now, look, look, somewhere there's got to be somebody who didn't no, like I this guy. No, I tell you, there isn't. That's why you're here. To solve a riddle, it's impossible. Uh Uh-huh. Impossible. But it happened. Valentine, forget the sedan. Just think about Brewster. He sat here. Room was dark. Doorbell must have rung. Walked to the door. Well, of course, Lieutenant. Just a minute, I said. Little alcove by the door, see? Did Brewster go straight to the door? Did he flip on the porch lights like a friendly guy in a small town would do? He was shot from the porch through the alcove window, that I know. He was peering out to see who was ringing the bell. (laughs) Now tell me Merv Brewster wasn't afraid. Now tell me he didn't expect a strange collar and a big sedan. The person saw him through the glass and shot him. Shell casings, two of them, and they checked with the slugs. 
Found them right on the grass, right next to the window box here. Uh, what kind of a gun? A Luger, my friend. A special type of a special shell. A very popular gun in the city, in the dirtier parts of the city. And gang killing. Exactly. But we already know it has all the earmarks of, of a gun. Of Miss Brooks. Yeah, a killer and a rubout. Ronnie, if the killer stood here on the wet grass by the door, there's probably... Now be... you're getting it. Now you see him. Oh, we'll chase the sedan from the city, sure. But right here in Broomville, we've got something. No? Because where the killer stood, there are no tracks. Hey, wait a minute. But oh, there yeah. were. Yeah, sure, sure. But some of these local lovable people have very carefully trampled all over them with a pair of rubber boots. You see... Somebody's been killed that everybody likes. Then we find that he really sneaked to the door like a rat in a trap to peer out. Look, we don't know what kind of motives people really have underneath all that. Okay, Riley, go ahead. Make like a detective. Huh? Me, I'm going to follow the footprints. The footprints of the rubber boots that spoil the killer's tracks. George, they turn in here. Yeah. Yeah, across the road. Broomville, so innocent, so shocked. A sedan from the city, and to them it's like a man from Mars. <laughs> you can't kid me what's going on right okay, here. Okay, here we are, White House. Tracks turn up the drive. You see it? Yeah, come on. Hey, wait a second. Huh? Yeah, number three, Cedar Road. Hmm? Mailbox. Everett says... W. Fonville. Wow. Fonville, huh? First place down the other road from Timber Corner. What's the matter with... Oh, well, somebody said that, that's all. The house is dark. Yeah. The neighbor, Mrs. Brewster, came to for help. Only he wouldn't help his dying mother. What in the devil was... It's a bell. Like a homemade burglar alarm. Yeah, it's a tripwire. Here it is. Well, that does it. Oh, these rubes. They don't expect trouble. Oh, no, no. Imagine running a tripwire across your lawn. Really? Huh? Straight up the driveway. See it? George, in the shadow by the garage, something moved. Yeah, well, here's where we get our answer to what's going on in this night. Here we are! Hey. There's a barrel full of bird shot for the first one of you that moves. That's not from the garage. Someplace overhead, George, back there. I saw you! Oh, yes, I saw you, and grown up every one of you. Well, you ought to be ashamed. Hey, now look, friend, what do you no mean? No light, you think I'm asleep. Well, I've seen every one of your little games around here tonight. You'll get old fondle, you say. <laughs> kind of forget a man might keep a watch out of his attic window. Well, it's private property you're tramping on. Trespass, malicious... Hey, consent. slow down, and slow down, Buster. If this were any place but Boomville, I'd have every one of you arrested. You'd and... what? Climb down from that attic. And get down here fast, my friend. Because you're under arrest. <laughs> So, Mervyn Brewster is murdered. Huh. That's too bad. But I don't know anything about it. Is that so, Mr. Fonville? I've hardly met the man. You what? But everybody in town... I'm not to... from this town, lady, though sometimes I wish I were. Far from it. Brewster's brooms. Huh. That's all you hear. What a funny thing Mr. Brewster said. Well, I've had enough of it. I retired here for my health and let... For me your tell health? You. And a lawyer, too, huh? From the city, no doubt. And your doctor says, uh, surround your house with burglar alarms and uh, sit up nights with a shotgun across the Riley, room. you're barking up the wrong tree. Huh? He didn't trample around in rubber boots. George, can you still yeah, see? Yeah, yeah, still by the garage, Angel. Oh, There's somebody else here, all right, Riley. What? No, no, wait a minute. I'll do this. I don't want you embarrassing yourself anymore, barking at all the wrong things at the wrong time. What are saying you... the small town must be up to something mysterious tonight. Broomville, where the trademark is a witch on a broomstick? George, right uh -huh. here. Know who it is, Riley? Wearing great big boots and sneaking around? Oh, I know, we've still got a crime to solve. Only tonight it's going to be a lot tougher than you ever figured. Well, well who is it? Who is it? Just Take it easy now. It's only a little short guy carrying his head under his arm. Huh? But the head is a pumpkin. And the rubber boots are his father's. What? <laughs> it's all right, Sonny. Come on out. The man here comes from the big city. He just forgot the date, that's all. Trick. Trick. Trick or treat, sir. Yeah, Riley. It's Halloween.
are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Back to George Valentine, a sedan from the city. Before the car disappeared into the dark again, its driver had murdered Broomville's leading citizen, Marvin Brewster, the man that everybody loves. Well, naturally, the highway patrol is out frantically searching for the big black sedan. But if your name is George Valentine, your problem is right here. Your problem is why. Why would anyone even think of killing a jovial man like Brewster? And needless to say, Lieutenant Riley is not so jovial when he is reminded that tonight, whatever clues there are, may only be the work of goblins or witches. That tonight is Halloween. All right, Mrs. Brewster, so none of it makes sense. Well, this part does, Riley. Donuts. What? Oh, yes, those. I fried them myself just this afternoon. Donuts. Now, look. There was cider, too, on the little table, see? Poor Mervyn always liked to have something ready for the kids. It was sort of his day, you know, Halloween. We built this factory out of a witch's broom. He was so full of fun himself, you know. He wouldn't let anyone interfere, the police or anyone on Halloween. No, no, sure. Big, a big joker. Yeah. Only Valentine, look, look, I... Look, the donuts mean this, Riley. He wasn't sneaking to the door when he was shot into the alcove to peer out. He was just reaching for some donuts to give to the kids. That's what he must have thought the doorbell was, a trick-or-treat. So he wasn't scared. He didn't expect a stranger from the city tonight. Oh, brother, the man that nobody hated. So maybe it's true that... Uh... What? No, no, everybody loved him. That's what I told you. Until I heard about the telegram, I, eh? I, I still don't oh, believe... What's this what telegram? telegram? Well, didn't Mac, Mr. McKenzie tell you? He's the one who took the message from Priscilla. Maybe he told the local police. Priscilla, but... what are you talking about, Mrs. Brewster? Well, she's down at the telegraph office. It's really a part of the post office, and that's part of the general store. Priscilla's a lovely uh, person. What's the telegram? A carbon or something that came through. The telegram somebody in Broomville sent today to somebody in the city. Somebody who came out here in a sedan. <laughs> Who, um, who sent this? In a little place like this, you must but have a record. But they just write them out and leave the money. I'm so busy at the other window, you hey, Riley, see. listen. It says, uh, y- you don't something. Anyway, don't get paid until he's gone. <sighs> paid until he's gone. Dead. Dead. There, you see what I mean? The guy in the sedan was a killer from the city. And somebody right here in Broomville hired him. Oh, yeah? Well, that's not the way I figure, Riley. Come on, I'll show you. Okay, here we are, Timber Corner. Now, give me your flashlight. What in the world? Riley, what's the Brewster's address? Huh? The house on Cedar Lane beyond the corner. That's what I phoned my crew and wrote in the report. Sure, sure, but you've never been here before. You came out with a native cop, he wouldn't notice. But look at the street sign, you idiot. Take a look at that. Now, wait a minute, get out of the way. Eh? Right here, Miss Brooks, cutting out paper dolls. You check at the newspapers, Brooksy? It's true he's a lawyer from the city, sort of a big time ambulance Uh chaser. Now, Riley, I said there was another way. Even the telegram could work. It didn't have to be sent by somebody from town, did it? Huh? Gangland stuff. Somebody might have spotted the victim and wired the killer how to find him. Hey. Hey, I'm beginning to get yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. This street sign is loose, all right. Don't you remember Fonville's mailbox? It said Cedar Lane. George, the street sign... Sure, sure, it turns. Now, which street is which? First house beyond the corner. The oldest Halloween trick in the book. Changing street signs. So maybe Merv Brewster didn't have any enemies. Just a big, loud, lovable guy who was so crazy about Halloween that by some kid's prank, he died for it. Funville. He was the one they meant to kill. Come on! Well... 
Well, we're too late. He's dead. That was the same gun, same empty shells. Mm, it all must have been the same. Came to answer the door and... Yeah, that's right, two shots. George, he was the kind of a man some gang might want to get. Retired criminal lawyer who didn't pick his clients too well. Yeah, that's it, all right. The killer's sent out to get Von Bill only tangles up with a Halloween prank and picks the wrong house. Kills the wrong man. Then finds his mistake and comes back. Riley, this couldn't have happened very long ago. Ah, no, no, I know. So, let's go. We'll, uh... Oh, hello. That's Fred, the guy who got me into this. Yeah, the guy who found the car. The sedan. You, sedan? you what? Yeah. Killer ditched it down the woods. Engine's still warm. Come on. It's all over but the shouting. We found it. Not surprising you ditched it, sir. We got a half hundred patrol cars out in the highways, roadblocks set up at every cross. The same sedan. I'm sure of that. I'm positive. Not going to be easy to trace, neither. There's no registration. The driver will be easy to find. Little fish faced guy with his eye all scarred up. How many men have you got, officer? Oh, plenty, and everybody in Broomville will be only too glad to hey, help Wait a minute, us don't in... touch that. What? Uh, there won't be any fingerprints, Valentine. We know he was wearing a hat, an overcoat, and probably gloves. Yeah. Well, I was looking for something else, but I can't find oh, it. Oh, now, don't you start playing detective. We'll get him. This is Broomville, and we're going to sweep the woods for a killer. All right, all right. But remember, it's still Halloween. <laughs> I hope they find him. I hope they find him. Yeah. Mind if I take a look at something inside your house, Mrs. Brewster? Oh, no. Miss Brooks is already in here someplace, I think. Oh, hello. Remember me? Oh, yeah, Mr. McKenzie. Mm -hmm. I thought you were out on the manhunt. I thought Dora might need me. They're coming closer, you know. Yeah, looks like he's hiding right around Timber Corner here someplace. Right close. And the closer they get, the more wrong I am. Wrong? What do you mean? Oh, something Lieutenant Riley said earlier. And he was right. When you investigate a case this fast, you don't know what kind of motives people really have underneath. Motives? Everyone around here knows that old Farmville was mixed up in all sorts of things. Back in the city, that is. Halloween. Gosh, if Merv hadn't always been so considerate, telling the cops to lay off and everything, then the kids never would even thought of twisting that road sign. George, what's happening? What? Oh, excuse me. It's all right, Angel. What'd you find? Well, I looked for it. I've been upstairs. She's what? It's all right. But She's... I didn't find it. And it wasn't around the car anyplace. Someplace in between, I guess, huh? Hey! How you doing out there? Hey, Lieutenant! You catching him? Georgie's leaving. No, no, Brooks. It's all right. Fred's a tall guy. Let him go. It's a false alarm anyway. They haven't found the killer yet. They won't. Mr. Valentine, will you please tell me what in the name of Blue Blazer? Yes, you... yes, I'll tell you, Mr. McKenzie. Now, suppose somebody wanted to kill Mervyn Brewster. Oh, I, I don't know why yet, but... but... everybody loved my George, husband. Upstairs, Suppose there's... that person set up the phony telegram. Suppose that person dug up a big sedan from the city. That part would be easy. Why, I'll and uh, most important, suppose that person took advantage of Halloween by twisting the road sign. On purpose. George. Sure, Brooksy, what would everybody say? Kids. An unfortunate accident corroborated by the Halloween road sign and the telegram. Oh, yeah, sure. Everybody knows Fonville has enemies. And forever after, the police would be combing the city for some mythical gangster killer. Mythical? Well, people saw him. Fred saw him. Of all Mr. The McKenzie, food. what do you think I was looking for at the deserted car? Miss Brooks looking for here. I, I haven't the slightest it's idea. It's uh, Halloween, Buster, remember? Well, what's been the greatest boost to Halloween since the Headless Horseman? The rubber mask. The skin mask. The rubber horror mask. You've seen him. And think back, Mackenzie. Fish-colored face, a funny eye, sort of pushed out of place, all scarred. Oh, no, it, it couldn't possibly have been anyone. Those guys here. outside are getting closer and closer, lady. And I'm getting more and more sure all the time. It was somebody from Broomville, changing his voice and wearing a mask and an overcoat. It was somebody in this room. Uh, Mr. Valentine, I, uh, I think you're forgetting Fonville. He was murdered, too, you know. The killer made a mistake and then killed Fonville. Yes, but Mr. Fonville told us he'd been watching from his attic. He'd, he'd seen every one of the little games around here tonight and the pranks. Exactly, and... Angel. And he could have, from that attic, very easily seen who changed that road sign. Mr. Fonville? As I remember, there's only one person who's been over to talk to Fonville since Brewster's death. 
who might have guessed him and told that the old coot had been watching from his attic, who would have known that he had to be killed, too. I'm afraid You, Mrs. I... Brewster, when you went for help. No, what are you trying to... It was to... dark. If a stranger from the city came out and did get mixed up by road signs, how would he know it was your husband or even a man behind that darkened glass in the alcove? How would a stranger standing at the door think to look in that window and see him? Stop it! But if you heard Stop him it. trapping around, you'd know what he was doing, you and nobody else. If he stepped aside to get a surprise for the kids, some donuts maybe, you'd know where to look for him, wait for his shadow to fire at... Because you were the one who put him in the alcove with the cider. Put your hands up, all of you. Oh. Yeah, sure. He loved Halloween. The Brewster broom, it's built around Halloween. You know, even the trademark. Oh, he was such a funny man, my husband. Everybody loved him. Except you, huh, lady? All right, now, come on, come on. Give me that gun. Give me the Luger. There's a lot of policemen getting closer all the time, and you can't you get away with it. stay where you are. I'm going. I can go past those policemen. They know me. I'm just a meek little housewife. There's Fred coming on the lawn. There's a side porch to this house. I can see you from there. I have my own car. If you move, I'll kill you. Dora, please. No, no, no. Don't move. Let her go. But it's Halloween. The police won't pay any attention to it. George, what happened? Some what? kids piled trash cans on the porch. Brooksy, it's Halloween. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. <laughs> so I was right. You see, Valentine, we don't know how people really feel underneath. There she is, married for 27 years to a perfectly nice guy, Oh, just and... a minute, Lieutenant. You must have worked both ways. Huh? Well, when I was upstairs, George, I started to tell you. In Mervyn Brewster's study, he drew his own labels, remember? The witch riding on the broom? Yeah, that's right. It's on every broom. It was a big sketch. The original, I guess, in the drawer. Oh, he must have been a lovely man to live with. What, what do you mean? Well, you can't see it on the little ones. But guess whose face he drew on that witch? And yeah. then probably laughed about it, thought it was funny. Hey, yeah, that's right. Dora did look a little like a witch. Santa Claus to everybody but her. Kind to everybody but her. Well, it worked both ways, all right. And she's hated him. For... Halloween. <laughs> she used it to kill him. It trapped her. Well, Brooksy, somewhere the witches and goblins are laughing real loud. They had a big night. <laughs> You have just heard The Sedan from the City, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now, this is yours truly, inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And as for me... Well, I'd like to tell you the easiest way I know to get the reputation of being the perfect host. Next time friends come over for dinner, before you sit down to the table, serve glasses of Petri California Sherry. Petri Sherry is the best beginning a good meal ever had. I say Petri Sherry because Petri Sherry is extraordinary Sherry. You can tell by looking at it. 
Hold it to the light. Notice how clear it is. Notice its beautiful deep amber color. And you can tell Petri Sherry is unusual from just a whiff of its fragrance. And, of course, in the last analysis, you can tell just how fine a wine Petri Sherry is by tasting it. That's the best test of all. And that's where you'll get the most pleasant surprise, because Petri Sherry really tastes wonderful. A flavor right from the heart of the grape. So serve Petri Sherry to your family and your friends, and serve it proudly, because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wine. And now I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson's expecting us. Let's not keep him waiting. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. You'll forgive me if I, I don't get up, won't you, my boy? Of course, Doctor. What's the matter, a touch of rheumatism? No, no, I've played 18 holes of golf today. <laughs> I hope that when I'm your age, Doctor, I can be half as sprightly. Oh, it's very nice of you, but if you don't mind, we won't discuss the uh, question of my age. <laughs> so drop your chair, make yourself comfortable, and I'll yeah. get on with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Well, from the hints you gave us last week, it sounded like quite a spooky story. It was, Mr. Bartell, it, it certainly was. Towards the end of November in the year 1895... A dense yellow fog had settled down over London. For four or five days, it was impossible from our rooms in Baker Street to see the outline of the houses opposite. A real London pea super, huh, Doctor? Yes, my boy, and it became most pressing. The first day, Holmes had spent in cross-indexing his huge book of criminal references. The second and third had been patiently occupied with a subject which he had recently made his hobby, the music of the Middle Ages. But when on the fourth day, on pushing back our chairs after breakfast... We saw the greasy, heavy brown swirl still drifting past us and condensing in oily drops upon the window panes. Sherlock Holmes' impatient and active nature could endure this drab existence no longer. He paced restlessly about our sitting room, chafing against the inaction. After several minutes of these perambulations, he turned to me and spoke. Anything of interest in the paper, Watson? News of a revolution, a possible war, and of an impending change in the government. Nothing to interest you, though. <laughs> no crimes of any importance. The London criminal is certainly a dull and unenterprising fellow these days. Look out of the window, Watson. See how the figures loom up, are dimly seen, and then blend once more into the foggy depths. What a day for a thief or a murderer. He could roam London as the tiger does the jungle, unseen until he pounces, and then evident only to his victim. That's a cheerful thought, I must say. Hello, hello. I wonder who that is. Probably a visitor for Mrs. Hudson or... Perhaps the local plumber has finally condescended to pay some attention to the faulty gas jet in our hallway. I don't think you're right on either count. I can hear Mrs. Hudson's footsteps on the stairs. Come in. Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson, what is it? Oh, excuse me, Mr. Holmes, but there's a gentleman to see you. Says it's most important, and he asked me to give you this card. Oh, thank sir. you. Oh, Mother Mahali, eh? Show him up, please, Mrs. Hudson. Very good, sir. Mother Mahali, and who's he? I've not had the pleasure of meeting him personally, but I'm quite familiar with his scientific reputation. Scientific? Oh, and what does he specialize? Oh, I, um, I suppose one might refer to him as one of the greatest authorities on all matters connected with the occult. You mean the fellow dabbles in supernatural stuff and all that sort of thing? Hmm. I mean, my dear Watson, that, uh, Otto Mahali is an extremely intelligent man with a thoroughly comprehensive and scholarly knowledge of his field and an intense belief in the existence of the supernatural force. Now, here he is to speak for himself. Oh, come in, Holly. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Uh, you're Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Yes, sir. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, Mr. Holly? How do you do, Doctor? Uh, won't you sit down, sir? Thank you. <laughs> well, you fellows are probably wondering who I am and what's brought me here. Well, we're not wondering who you are, Mr. Holly. My friend Holmes was just telling me of your scientific eminence. I'm flattered that you know of me, Holmes. Just the same. You're wondering why I'm here. Naturally, sir. Well... Since you know I'm a student of the occult, I'll get right down to my problem. Mr. Holmes, have you ever heard of the headless monk of Trevenice Chapel? Oh, yes, indeed, Mr. Holly. An apparition to be counted among our more intangible national treasures, I should say. I'm sorry to appear stupid, but I have never heard of the headless monk of whatever it is, Chapel. Well, then, let me tell you about it, Doctor. Yes, I wish you would. Trevenice Manor in Cornwall was once an abbey. It was expropriated during the reign of Henry VIII. And several of the monks were killed in some of the, uh, 
some of the minor difficulties attendant on such an act. But one of the murdered monks, a certain Brother Hugh, the chapel organist, was persistent. He still haunts the chapel today. He still plays the organ. And since he was beheaded, he always appears deadly. <laughs> Charming little legend, Mr. Harley, but you don't expect us to believe it's anything but a legend, surely. Ah, uh, skeptic, eh? How about you, Mr. Oh, I'm extremely curious to know why you've come to see me, Mr. Harley. I'll tell you why. I have a rare opportunity to investigate the phenomena. You see, the son of an old friend of mine, a young fellow by the name of Leonard Miles, is secretary to the owner of Trevenice Manor. He asked me to stay there, and I find the invitation irresistible, particularly since the phenomena have curiously increased of late, Mr. Holmes, almost as though some more mortal agency were motivating them. Oh. Now I see why you've come to me, Mr. Holly. I knew you would, Holmes. You see, I'm like my good friend and fellow investigator, Karnacki. I believe in being prepared to meet phenomena on either the natural or the supernatural plane. If the phenomena are real, then they fall legitimately in my field. Uh, whereas if, um, as I'm sure you suspect, they are being contrived by human forces, then you think uh, that's more of my department, eh, Holly? Exactly. Well, what do you say, Holmes? A little trip to Cornwall will be a nice few, few days we... We'd probably escape the fog down there. Ah, oh, the places where the weather, Watson. What? I'm much more concerned with the fog that surrounds the appearances of the headless monk of Trevenice Chapel. And Mr. Harley, I accept your invitation with pleasure. There's still time to catch the Cornish Express. We can be at Trevenice Manor before the moon is up. Hello? Who's this funny-looking fellow coming down the steps towards us? If I didn't hear the sound of his footsteps, I believe it was a psychic manifestation. He certainly looks as if he came from beyond the grave. Who be ye, gentlemen? Where be ye going? Well, supposing you tell us who you are first, my good man. Who be I? I be David Pendragon, sir. That's who I be. Stable and here at the manor. And I ask you gentlemen again, where you be going? We're staying at the manor. And we're just going to take a look at the chapel. Oh, don't he do that, sir. People that go in there don't often come out the way they go in, sir. Don't he do it, gentlemen? What are you talking about, my good fellow? I be talking about the ghoulies and the ghosties and the organ music that comes out of the nowhere. You... you heard it? Of course I heard it, sir. Just like I seen the poor monk walking around without his head on. Take us into the chapel, will you? And, and show us where you saw the figure? Aye, that I will not, sir. Not for all the gold in Porth Call will I go back and chance seeing the poor lost soul wandering about without his head on. If you gentlemen know what's good for you, you'll not go in there either. Mark my words, don't he go in that chapel. Extraordinary chap. Seems really frightened of the place. Yes, but it's more than blind superstition that accounts for his reluctance. Uh, let's go in, shall we? Well, I suppose it's all right. Great Scott, listen to that. The organ. The ghosts playing. We are extremely fortunate. A psychic manifestation as soon as we enter. Remarkable. Psychic manifestation. Rubbish. Look who's sitting at the keyboard. It's Holmes. Holmes. What's the matter, Watson? What's the matter? <laughs> you frightened us to death, didn't he, Harley? Well, speaking for myself, Doctor, he disappointed me. I thought it was a genuine phenomenon. What do you think you're doing, Holmes? I thought you were still behind us. I'm sorry if I frightened you, Watson. I was curious about this organ. I slipped in by the side door ahead of you and tested the instrument. It's in astonishingly good condition for a disused chapel, don't you think, Harley? Yes, I do, Holmes. One might reasonably presume that someone tends it with great care. In fact, I would go further Who and are say... You? What are you doing in here? Uh, we are guests at the manor house and we decided to pay a visit to the chapel before we paid our respects to our host. Oh, my father is your host. I'm Dorothy Brown. Oh, how do you do, Dorothy? Uh, my, my name is uh, Holmes, and these gentlemen are Dr. Watson and uh, Mr. Harley. How do you do, Dr. Watson? Harley? Mr. Harley, I heard the organ music, and I was terribly frightened. You've heard of the legend, I suppose. You mean about the headless monk and the ghostly organ music, Miss Brownlee? Yes, Doctor. And it's more than a legend, I assure you. That's why I rushed over here as soon as I heard it. It must have frightened all the servants within hearing distance. Why were you playing the organ? I was curious to see whether it was in good repair. <laughs> Obviously it is, Mr. Holmes. Well, my father and his secretary, Mr. Miles, are expecting you, I know. Let's walk over to the house, shall we? I'm sure you've seen enough of the chapel for tonight. Father 
Father, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do, How do you do, sir? Uh, How do you do? This is my secretary, Leonard Miles. How do you do, Mr. Miles? Oh, Mr. Well, Brown. Dr. Watson? I'm afraid Mr. Brown is rather angry with me. I hadn't told him that you were an expert on psychic phenomena, Mr. Harley. Well, I fail to see why the knowledge of that fact should make you angry, Mr. Brownley. I don't want you ferreting about into this so-called ghost business. There's been enough trouble in the neighborhood already. It's almost impossible to keep servants. And these Cornish people are incredibly superstitious. You haven't seen the ghost yourself, Mr. Brownley? Oh, of course not. There isn't any ghost, I tell you. You heard the mysterious organ playing? Hmm? Uh, well, uh, no, no, I haven't. And I don't want to talk about it anymore. Yes, yes, what is it? Uh, David Pendragon at the door. He's very anxious to see you, sir. Pendragon? Oh, oh very well. Tell him to come in. Uh, yes, sir. David? What does he want, I wonder? Pendragon, that's the fellow we met outside the chapel, isn't it? Yes. Quite a colourful character. Oh, he's a superstitious old fool, if you ask me. But he is a good groom. Yes, Pendragon? What is it? Begging your pardon, sir, but there'll be trouble at the chapel again tonight. I says to myself, David, tis your duty to go to the master, I oh, says. Oh, never mind, never mind. What's the trouble? As the moon was hanging low tonight, sir, I hears the organ a-playing. But that was Mr. Holmes, my good man. Aye, that's what he thinks, maybe. But what I says to myself is, what made him play the organ? And then this very night, I saw the headless monk. With my own eyes, I saw that poor soul with his head off, wandering in the moonlight. I saw that, sir, with my own eyes, I did. Oh, get out of here, you blithering old fool. And I'm warning you. If I hear any more nonsense about this ghost, you'll lose your job, you understand? Now, come along, be off with you. Aye, sir, begging your pardon, sir. Come on, I'll give you chaps a drink. Mr. Browner seems absolutely rabid on the subject of the ghost, eh? Yes, suspiciously so. What about he's trying to hide? Whatever it is, I don't think he'll be successful. In your profession, Holmes, you know that murder will out. It's true in my profession also. Try to suppress them as you may, gentlemen. Ghosts will out. Well, Holmes, this place may be haunted, but I swear that I never spent a better night anywhere. Ah, good morning, Mr. Holly. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I'm glad to see I'm not the only late riser. Oh, were you up late too, sir? Yes, I was, Doctor. I decided to ignore the veiled threats of Mr. Brownlee, and so I did a little investigating in the chapel. Uh, would you mind passing the teapot? And what were the results of your investigations, Mr. Holly? Well, there was no psychic manifestation, you understand, but I'm sure of one thing. That chapel is evil. Evil to the hearts of its stones. And I'll swear that evil does not stem from the hapless monk who was murdered there. Mm, you confirm certain suspicions aroused by my own investigations last night. There is evil here, Mr. Harley, and I think I know its nature. Unless I mistake every sign and reaction, someone has been initiating the local peasantry into the evils of the Black Mass. Black Mass? Good Lord, what a, what a shocking thought. My own sensations last night confirm your theory, Holmes. There is a coven here, I swear it, hiding its own obscene practices under cover of the haunting. Well, that sounds quite feasible. After all, the people are so superstitious that they'd keep uh, as far away as possible from the chapel when they... And they heard the organ playing. And this problem falls into both our fields, Harley. The practice of black magic is a criminal offence. Well, perhaps it's just as well the old laws against witchcraft are still in force. I imagine, Mr. Harley, that you uh, have your own methods of combating such forces as we're up against. Oh, yes, Holmes. Though mine are not connected with the legal aspect of the case. Of May I ask what you plan to do, sir? Well, I have several rather elaborate preparations to make, Doctor. It'll take me most of the day, I'm afraid. However, I shall explain them to you all uh, after dinner tonight. It's very pleasant to sit here after a good dinner with a superb brandy at one's elbow <laughs> and listen to the piano being so, so charmingly played. You're very fine, Doctor. Won't you play something more, Miss oh, Barley? Really? I'd love to. Are you enjoying your stay down here, Oh, Mr. very Holmes? much, thank you. Both Mr. Harley and I have found the local folklore extremely interesting. I see. You fellows haven't been investigating the haunted chapel business again, have you? Oh, look here. If you have, I shall be very angry. It's abusing my hospitality. I told you distinctly I didn't want any more talk of ghosts. We are not talking of ghosts, my dear Mr. Brownlee. I have something even more important that I must fight now. It's possibly a little hard to imagine me as a crusader. Me, the stooped little man beside the four of you, as toweringly tall a quartet of men as I have ever faced. And yet, 
I am your St. George. What on earth are you talking about, sir? I'll tell you in secrecy. This mustn't reach the ears of the peasantry. I refer to myself as St. George because I go to wipe out an evil that lives in your midst. A living, modern dragon. Oh, please, Mr. Holly. That sounds dreadfully frightening. And to rid you all of this fiend, I must cleanse the chapel, purify it, exercise it, remove its residue of psychic evil. That, gentlemen, is my mission tonight. Dorothy! He's fainted. Get some smelling salts quickly. I'm afraid you were a little too graphic, Mr. Harley. I'm sorry if I frightened the young lady, but I, I'm sure that after tonight she will have no further grounds for fear in Trevenice Manor. <laughs> Yes, old chap. Did, did you hear anything? Nothing but the owls and the clock striking midnight. I'm getting off the jumper. What do you suppose Harley's up to? I can imagine his procedure. Midnight. The crucial hour, I suppose, in his endeavors. I wish him luck. My own plans are not nearly as clear, unfortunately. I sense a guiding force here, but I lack the clues. There is something, Holmes. Listen. Great heavens! It's the organ in the chapel. And Holly's in there alone. Not alone. Listen to the organ. Peeling forth its madness. Come on, Watson. Something has gone horribly wrong. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. You know, a moment ago, I told you how much I thought you'd like Petri California Sherry. But I didn't tell you that Petri Sherry is the all-round, all-American wine. You can not only serve Petri Sherry before dinner, it's good after dinner, too. And, of course, later in the evening when you're listening to the radio with some friends, a glass of Petri Sherry is just the thing. And say, Petri makes two kinds of sherry, the regular and Petri Pale Dry. To make sure you get the one that you like best, do what I do. Don't buy one, buy two. But remember, always buy Petri. Dr. Watson, that was a heck of a place to break off your story. Then let us continue it as speedily as possible, my boy. As soon as we heard that devilish organ music, Holmes and I rushed out of the house and raced in the moonlight down the path leading to the ruined chapel. By the time we reached the entrance, the organ music had ceased, and the tall, gangling figure of David Pendragon was standing in our path. You gentlemen be wanting at this Never time of night. That. What are you doing here? Oi, I be here because the gentleman gave me five shillings to stand outside here and see that no one disturbed him. Right. That's why I be here. And nobody did come or go. He still be there, he be. But when you heard that organ music, why the devil didn't you go in? Organ music? I heard no organ oh, music, come sir. come on, Watson. Great heavens. Look at him. We're too late, poor devil. A knife through his heart. Well, it's obvious who did it. That full of pen dragon. I'll, I'll go and grab him no, before no, he gets no, away. He's not our man. This murder was planned with devilish cunning. The curious thing, there's no sign of a struggle at all. Looks like he just stood here and allowed himself to be stabbed. Is there are these uh, chalk marks with which the body is surrounded. They're known as a pentagram, I believe. He thought it would protect him completely from the supernatural forces. Poor chap. For once his researches went too far. Yes, because they touched not on the supernatural, but upon natural evil. And remember, Watson, that only three people besides ourselves and David Pendragon... Knew of this vigil. Yes, Brownlow, his daughter, and young Miles, the secretary. Exactly. Um, go back to the house, will you? And bring them here. Perhaps we can lay a ghost by trapping a murderer. And it's all I know, Mr. Holmes. Well, you've not established much so far, Holmes. Three of them all swear they were asleep and that they didn't hear the organ. Yes, then you can't prove otherwise, I think I can prove that one of you was not only awake, but also murdered Mortimer Harley. But why should any of us want the poor man dead, Mr. Holmes? In your case, young lady, I confess that I find it hard to conceive a motive. Implying that Mr. Brownlee and I might have one. Well, Mr. Miles, you must admit that you're responsible for Mr. Harley coming here. And you, Mr. Brownlee, must uh, admit that you did everything in your power to prevent the dead man from carrying out his investigations. Why? What were you trying to hide? Nothing. It's just that I wanted to sell the manor house. All this talk about ghosts was giving the place a bad name. And if it had gone on, I'd never have disposed of the property. Well, speculation can get us nowhere. Let's get down to facts. 
Is there any other entrance to this chapel besides the two doors? None. Oh, there was an old smuggler's cave which came out near the organ lot, but Father had it bricked up some years ago. I mm. had to. The tourists kept crawling in. Go and examine it, will you, Watson, old chap? All right, you are, huh? If you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Holmes, it seems obvious who did this murder. You told us David Pendragon admitted that no one went in or out as he stood guard. He must have done it himself. Oh, the man's half-witted. And superstitious. He might have killed Mr. Harley because he was attempting to interfere with the ghost. And then played the organ to celebrate the occasion? I think you overestimate David Pendragon's capabilities, Miss Brownlee. Mr. Miles. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Uh, Pendragon is waiting outside. Would you be kind enough to ask him to come here for a moment, please? Certainly. Uh, Why don't you find out, Watson? Well, it's easy to see where it was bricked up, but it's a solid wall now. No one could get in that way. But if no one came in or out, who else could have killed Harley except Pendrag? The ghost, or rather the person disguised as a ghost. The dead man expected a psychic manifestation. When he, uh, when he saw the supposed ghost coming towards him, he offered no resistance. He believed that the magical pentagram would protect him. Ah, there you are, David. Aye, here I be, sir. But I don't know nothing more than what I told thee. Oh, don't be frightened, Pendragon. All we want is the truth. That's what I told thee, sir. And tell us a little more, will you? Uh, when you said no one had entered the chapel tonight, you meant that no mortal man had entered, didn't you? That I did, sir. But how could I say I'd seen the ghost when Mr. Brownlee here had told me I'd lose my job if I spoke of the ghost again? Oh, now we're getting some up. So you did see the ghost? That I did, sir. The poor soul walking through the moonlight with no head on his body. You saw it quite clearly? Just as clearly as I see you now, sir. How tall was he? He was... Would you Would you mind standing against the wall, sir? Yes, of course. He was as tall as... Well, his shoulders come to just where your shoulders come now, sir. You're a tall man, then, so we narrow it down to either you, Mr. Brownlee, or you, Mr. Oh, Miles. But this is utterly ridiculous. Of course it is. On the contrary, gentlemen, the case is solved. Which one of them was it, Holmes? Neither. Remember that the ghost is headless. That means that the imposter must have built up fake shoulders covering the head. On either of these men, it would have uh, brought their shoulders to the level of my head. Great Scott, it was... <laughs> Bravo, Mr. Holmes. I didn't think you'd catch me. Dorothy! No, no, I don't believe... Miss Brownlee, I must warn you that... Keep back! Don't any of you come near me. As you see, I have a revolver. Dorothy, for heaven's sake! Don't speak to me of heaven! <laughs> You thought I was a sweet little girl, didn't you, Father? <laughs> you didn't know your dear, demure daughter could murder a man, did you? Why did you kill Mortimer Harley? Because he was a meddler. For months I've been practicing black magic here. For months I've been building up the legend of the headless monk and the organ music. It made me so wonderfully alone. So gloriously free to practice the rite. And then he came here. I let him live that first night because I thought he was a fool. But on the second... When he said he was going to exercise this chap, to purify it, as he said, he signed his death warrant. <laughs> if you could have seen his face, if you could only have seen his stupid, toddled face as I plunged the knife into him. Dorothy! He bled so beautifully. Holmes, Holmes, she's mad as a hat. What are we going to do? Finally, give me that revolver. And let you take me to prison or to asylum. No, you'll never catch me. She's backing up the stairs leading to the organ loft. Dorothy, Dorothy, come back. Don't try and follow me. Look out. The railing's behind you. Oh, and turn my head. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. I... No! No! Dorothy. Dorothy. My poor little girl. Mr. Brownlee, the powers of evil are frightening. Your daughter had killed one man and might have killed more. She was insane. Hopelessly insane. Well, Doctor, that was quite an exciting story. You know, I wish I could play the organ and write music for it. There's nothing like music to really express a thought. Yes, I can just imagine the kind of music that you'd write. Probably a catchy little ditty such as The Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you drink, remember Petri wine. Oh, no, Doctor. Is that the way I affect you? Although on the level, you could probably write beautiful music to describe the way the grapes look on the vine in the sunlight. But what music could tell you about the Petri family? And how long they've been making fine wine? You know, the Petri family has been making wine for generations. 
handing on down from father to son, from father to son, the knowledge necessary to transform luscious, sun-ripened California grapes into delicious, fragrant wine. And when you see that name Petri on a bottle of wine, remember, you're not looking at a mere trademark. That name Petri is the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of wine in that bottle meets their unusually high standards. Petri wine is always good wine. It's got to be, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes adventure do you have lined up for us next week? Well, now, let me think. Uh, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a story that started quietly enough as Holmes and I sat at a London dinner party, and yet, before the evening was over, we found ourselves involved in one of the most shocking scandals that ever rocked London society. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Adventure of the Devil's Foot. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs> Here's Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. My name's Diamond, and I'm in business for a very simple reason. I like money. Oh, sure, I could do better, but I don't believe in straining myself. I might make a few bucks more, but so what? You work harder, your back gets weaker... And you take that extra couple of bucks and spend it for a brace to keep it from folding in the middle. No, I got a little one-room office that leans out over Broadway, and I'm very happy. Sometimes I get a case that lasts a week. A hundred bucks a day in expenses, and I make enough to pay the rent. Take my girl Helen Asher to dinner a couple of times and rest my feet on the desk like a prosperous businessman. I'm in partnership with a shill called Human Nature... And with him on my side, it just figures that people are going to get in trouble. Like the character who's ringing the doorbell of an apartment on the east side. He's built just right for more trouble than he can handle. Well. Hello, Mrs. Moran. You say that like you're really glad to see me. I'll let you know as soon as we can talk business. Did you bring a rubber hose along? Why? Are you going to be hard to get along with? This time, yes. Where's your husband? He went out. I tried to convince him the window was the quickest way to the street, but he's old-fashioned. He took the elevator. You're drunk. You can't get a bit out of me. Want a drink? Just get the 500. I don't want to be around when your old man gets back. You couldn't afford that, could you? No, and I don't think you could either, baby. Now let's stop playing games, Mrs. Moran. I've got a big, fat surprise for you, Mac. Keep it in small bills. Oh, isn't that funny? That's your surprise. Yeah? Yeah. You don't get the money. You get something else. Stop yelling. You'll have the whole building up here in a minute. they will be up anyway, Mac. A gunshot makes people curious. Now, wait a minute. You don't have to pull a gun. I don't have to do anything. And I'm breaking myself of one habit right now. I'm through paying your dirty blackmail. Now, you know I got my orders. If I don't collect, someone else will be around. Come on, give me the gun. Sure. A piece at a time. I need a drink. (laughs) 
Well, here's to nothing, Betty, old girl. Shot to death in blackmail plot. Socialite Betty Moran kills gangster, then takes own life. Read all about it, paper. Hey, kid. Oh, paper, mister? Yeah. Hey, uh, I'll the chair. Oh, thanks. Wealthy wife of William Moran kills... Well, I have to call Mr. Moran. No sense to lose a good source of income. <laughs> Come in. Mr. Diamond? Over here. Oh, this clothesline, I, I couldn't see you. Do you always do your laundry in your office? Free soap. Pull up a chair, Mr. Uh, Moran. Uh, William Moran. Oh. Mm. Nice pair of Argyles. One of my old clients sends them down from Sing Sing. Have you read the morning papers, Mr. Diamond? I haven't had time. Took some throw rugs down to the laundry mat before I started on the socks. My wife died last night. What did you eat for breakfast? Why, uh, pancakes and eggs? Why? You must eat a whole pig when you're not in mourning. How did she die? She was shot to death. Couldn't she get two people for a pyramid club? She was being blackmailed. It's usually the other way around. The victim shoots the blackmailer. She did that. His name was Mac Grayson. Hmm? I want you to find the other man behind this blackmail ring. Oh, what makes you think there was more than one? I received an anonymous phone call this morning. It was from a man who said he was a friend of Mac Grayson. He made it perfectly clear that he was going to continue with the blackmail. You, uh, know what they had on your wife? She was a very wealthy woman, Mr. Diamond. Before she married me, she was rather... Uh, wild. Well, they get that way sometimes. There were some letters. Why don't you go to the police? As far as they're concerned, the case is closed. They say it's a murder and a suicide, and that's that. But I want to get the people who drove my wife to suicide. Okay, Mr. Moran, but if you want me to try and dig up your blackmailers, my fee is rather high. I want to start sending my laundry out. Money is no object. That's the nicest thing you could have said. A hundred dollars a day and a fifth of plasma. Plasma, Mr. Diamond? A hundred proof. I never know what I'm going to run into in a case like this. I may bleed a little. You can reach me at Evergreen 45021. I'll write you a check. Here, uh, use my pen. It's getting an inferiority complex. Do you know anything more about this man who called you this morning? No, only that he said he was a friend of Mac Grayson's. Oh, there you are, Mr. Diamond. This should be enough of a retainer. Oh, yes, yes. And uh, that's all you know? I'm sorry I can't be of more help. Oh, you've been a brick. I'll get the rest from homicide. Thank you and goodbye, Mr. Moran. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond, and good luck. Oh, I'm sorry I knocked down some of your washing. Uh, there. Well, I'll be hearing from you. Well, that's the way it goes. One minute you're washing socks, and the next you've got enough money to stake out a claim on every night spot from Mott Street to Harlem. Unless a particular blackmail ring likes to kill private detectives. I had a hunch the assignment might run into overtime, so I put in a call to a lovely redhead named Helen Asher. Francis the butler answered, and I told him to pass the word along that I might be late for my date. I hung up before Helen could get on the pipe and start screaming at me like a wounded eagle. I locked the office, went down to 5th Precinct, and an old friend, Lieutenant Levinson. He was in charge of the homicide detail and could tell me about the late Mrs. Moran and her victim. When I walked in, Sergeant Otis was polishing his billy. Hello, Otis. The lieutenant in? Well, Richard Diamond, the all-American gumshoe. Oh, you're just jealous because that club you've got is a better shape than your head. Lieutenant, Diamond's out here. Okay, send him in. Tell me, Shamus... How does one get to be a great big private detective? Slaving box tops? Well, you have to observe things, Otis, my boy. For instance, one look at your shirt, and I can tell you've been eating well for a week. Why don't you either get it cleaned or stick it in a pressure cooker? Hello, Walt. Now, wait a minute, Rick. If you've got a body somewhere, take it to another precinct. Well, I'm a little short right now, but maybe I can dig one up. <laughs> what yeah, a Yeah, that was a swell one. Is this just a social visit or am I a dreamer? It's about the Moran suicide. You handle it? Uh-huh. One of the neighbors called us. They're both debtor to notice on a double date. What about the Grayson guy she knocked off? Cheap thug. Couple of convictions. He... Oh, 
Don't tell me Moran's been to you with that blackmail story. Yeah, yeah. He seems to think Grayson was working with someone. Rick, that guy pestered us all morning, but there's no proof of blackmail or anything else, except two people got killed. Give me a quick rundown. I don't know why you're interested. I think Moran drummed up the blackmail theory just to cover that his wife was running around with another man. Well, I'm interested because Moran gave me a fat 200 bucks in advance to get me in the spirit of the thing. Well, if you want to be bored, here are the photographs of the deal. Here's Mac Grayson. Mm. Bullet entered his chest just below the 10th rib. The gun was a 32. Same one that the Moran dame used on herself. Enough powder burns on the shirt to show that she was standing pretty close when she gave it to him. She'd have to be not to miss him. Ah, uh, you can see she was lying about ten feet from Grayson near the bar. Huh? Probably needed a stiff shot before she knocked herself off. That's the highball glass on the floor near her head. And that's the thirty-two she used, about six inches from her right hand, and only her prints on it. Powder burns on the girl? Sure, all over her temple. We did the paraffin test on her hand, too. She fired the gun all right. Did uh, Grayson have any friends? We never tied him up with anyone except an old wino that hangs out on Skid Row, dump called the Parry Club. Name's Wilbur Truitt. Mm-hmm. Now. Well, thanks, Walt. Now, look, the dame killed the guy and then shot herself. What more do you want? I'll let you know. Now, wait a minute. I know that gleam in your eye. I always get a sour stomach from it. If you've got something, you'd better tell me. Oh, you're a cynic, Walt. Have you, uh, have you talked to this Wilbur Truitt? We questioned him this morning. Got a tail on him? Sure, but he won't take us anywhere. Now, what are you cooking up? Well, maybe you think there's something to Moran's blackmail story. Oh, don't be an idiot. Then what are you tailing Truitt for? Because I can't take a chance. Blackmail's a federal rap, and if Moran keeps stirring up trouble, I want to be able to prove he's nuts. Now, you look here. I want to know what's on your mind. I'll send you a letter. Oh. Otis! Yeah, Lieutenant. Get me my bicarbonate. Then shut up. Bye. Goodbye. I went through the squad room and out into the hall. I used the payphone by the door and put in a fast call to my client, William Moran. I had a hunch that Moran's $200 retainer in my pocket gave him an A priority on it. Yes? Mr. Moran. That's right. This is Diamond, Mr. Moran. Uh I've got a lead on someone who knew Mac Grayson. That's fine, Mr. Diamond. Who is it? A guy who hangs out on Skid Row named Wilbur Truitt. Ever heard of him? No. Oh. Well, he might have been the one who phoned you this morning. I, I think I'll go down and find out. Good, good. You'll keep in touch, won't you? Oh, as long as I'm on the case. Goodbye, Mr. Moran. I left the 5th Precinct and headed for Skid Row. If you've never seen the street, it's a liberal education in the misery of human beings. Even the sun winds up with a hangover if it shines on the place too long. The Parrot Club was a cellar with a low ceiling and a drink of wine for ten cents a glass. The smell of stale alcohol was so strong that if you opened the the door to air the place out, the walls would probably cave in. I found Wilbur Truitt sitting at the bar with a dirty towel around his neck. He held the towel and a glass of wine in one hand, and with the other he pulled the towel, lifting his hand and the glass up to his mouth. You must have been an engineer. I learned this little stunt in grammar school, bucko. I started missing my mouth 30 years ago, so I used this towel as a sort of alcohol pulley. It cuts down the element of risk. Hate to spill a drop. You know a guy named Grayson? It's the shakes, bucko. I am completely exhausted after a night of revelry, and my hand waves like it was flagging down a caravan of whiskey trucks. Look, friend... But uh... after one or two pick-me-ups, I am perfectly capable of lifting the glass by myself. And come nightfall, I'm in excellent condition to entertain my little friends. Oh, swell. Most cowards let the little fellows frighten them. And they end up in Bellevue, but I like them. They worried me at first, but when they found out how much I drank, they began to show the strain, and the shoe was on the other foot, so to speak. Oh, no. They tried to frighten me the first night, but I just kept right on with one bottle after another, and it finally drove them to drink. Now my DTs have hallucinations. We are rapidly building up a thriving community. What were you saying, bucko? Uh, something about the evils of self-indulgence, but I've forgotten now. Good. In that case, I will let you buy me a drink. Oh, sure. Waiter, bring a bottle. You just gave me cold chills. If I lick your hand, it's only a sign of fond endearment. Okay. Now, uh, do you know a guy named Grayson? 
I knew there was a catch. Are you a cop? No. In that case, I trust you. Besides, you are holding that lovely bottle. What about Grayson? First, a small glass of truth serum. First, Grayson. I can't stand to look, so I will turn my back on the bottle and tell you what I know. Mr. Mac Grayson, a very unsavory character who reached a sudden demise last evening, dealt in smutty pass and made them pay off by milking his victims. He has only one friend, a Mr. Leo Fink. Now, please, I'm beginning to spit out wads of cotton. Where does this Fink live? Oh. You are indeed a heartless role. I was once. You aren't by any chance a spy from the Purity League? You get the bottle when I find out where Leo Fink lives. 1122nd Avenue now, please. Now, here you are. Don't struggle with the cork, bucko. I have just acquired the strength of an uncropped Samson. And as I gaze upon this ruby goblet, I am reminded of the fact that you are not the first to come seeking the whereabouts of one Leo Fink. Huh? Play it back in English. Ah, a thug with the disagreeable habit of twisting my ascot approached me not ten minutes before you came in seeking the same information. Did you give it to him? I had to. One more pull on my tie, and dissipation would have been a thing of the past. Thanks, Wilbur. Here. Buy yourself another jug. Oh, bless you. And good morrow, cousin. Here's to my love. Oh, true apothecary. Thy drugs are quick. Thus, with a kiss, I die. I left Wilbur with his first love and walked out on the street. I grabbed a cab and headed for Leo Fink's address. All the way over, I kept thinking how wonderful fresh air really was. When we finally got there, I paid off the cabbie and looked at my watch. It was 4.30, and the city was turning soft and mellow as the sun started giving up behind the tall buildings. I got that lousy feeling again when I looked across the street. A prowl car was parked at the curb, and it looked like Homicide's private limousine. Something was wrong. I went up to Fink's apartment in a hurry. Yeah? Ah, uh, what do you want, Shamus? Well, good afternoon, Sergeant. I'm taking the census. How long ago did you die, sir? Very funny, Diamond. Otis, who is that? Diamond, who else? I didn't ask for a quick quiz on well-known personalities. Let him in. Yeah, Lieutenant. Shame on you, Otis. You'll never make an Eagle Scout. Hello, Rick. What do you want? I'll bet he's dead. You'll bet who's dead. You know who's dead. Sure, I know who's dead. Who do you think is dead? The guy I came up here to see. Well, who did you come up to see? Well, I think it's the guy who's dead. Don't you know? No, I ask you. Well, I'm telling you. You told me nothing. Look, why are you up here? Because I'm looking for a guy. What guy? I think it's the guy who's dead. Who's dead? Oh, he's on third. Don't you know? I think I know, Lieutenant. You shut up. Of course I know. Well, all right, all right. If you're going to hold out on your old pal. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. How did we get into this thing? Oh, this. Here's your bicarbonate. All mixed. All right, now let's start again. Walt, who's dead? Oh, let's not have two bodies up here. The guy's name is Fink. Leo Fink. Uh, why did you say that in the first place? Because I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. Walt. Lieutenant Levinson. Now, what are you doing up here? Oh, well, I came up to see Leo Fink, that's all. Well, he's in the other room. If he spills anything, don't believe it. He's been dead for ten minutes. That's too bad. He knew Mac Grayson. Yeah, how did you find out? That sweet old gentleman you sent me over to, Wilbur Truitt. Oh, you got something out of him, huh? What else did he tell you? Nothing, but we uh, struck up quite a friendship. I'm going to go back over and see what another bottle of wine will do to his memory. I'd better haul him in. Well, don't do it, Walt. Don't do it. I can find out things a lot quicker. Shh. I got a system. Okay, but keep me posted. I've got to clean up here. How did Fink get it? Two bullets in the head. No idea who gave it to him. They used a Luger, I think. Hey, have you questioned Otis? Oh, go on. Get out of here. Walt, tell me, did you check the prints on that highball glass next to Mrs. Moran to find out whether they were from her right or left hand? Now, what difference does it make? I'll let you know. Now, you wait a minute. No, I can't. I'm behind schedule now. Bye. Oh, Otis! I went downstairs in a hurry and started back to Skid Row and Wilbur Truitt. I turned a corner and had a quick change of heart. That's far enough, Shamus. Wow. Well, look what I picked up. All right. Get in this alley. Now, why don't you put that cannon away? 
Shows up like a pair of gums at a dentist convention. Turn around and get going. I can run if it would help. Take your time. You haven't got too much of it left. Stop nudging. You got a cold barrel. Don't you like it? No, but it helps. A lesson in the manly art of self-defense. Next time, don't get so close with a gun. Well, what do you know? A Luger. Okay, so... So I'm a Butterfingers. You got the gun now. What are you going to do? I got a mean streak, and it shows up when someone tries to kill me. I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and if you don't answer them, you'll wish you'd picked on an octopus. Now get up! <coughs> oh, you're a big one. Now, who sent you after me? I don't know. <coughs> who sent you after me? Honest, I don't know. <coughs> oh, wait, wait a second. All right, the guy told me on the phone his name was... Jones. Sure, first name's John. Now, wait, wait. I, I know it's a phony, but he was recommended. You get paid for your work, don't you? Yeah, but this one I collect after the job. Where? I thought you'd gotten over that stubborn streak. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, the 8 o'clock ferry to Staten Island. He's going to slip me two bills. And you don't know his right name? No. Did you know Mac Grayson? Well, I heard of him, but I never met him. Are you as handy with a thirty-two as you are with that Luger? Huh? Forget it. Next question. Who killed Leo Fink? Oh, that's a pretty big one. Okay, I'll word it differently. Who killed Leo Fink? I'll take the beating. Yeah. Well, I got a hunch this Luger of yours will check with ballistics. Come on. Homicide's still up in Fink's apartment. No, it's... What did you say? Okay. I hustled Louie up to Walt and left him handcuffed to Sergeant Otis. They deserved each other. Louis said he was going to be paid off at 8 o'clock, and my watch said it was a quarter after 7. That gave me 45 minutes to check at homicide and still catch the ferry to Staten Island. The fingerprint man at the 5th precinct put the prints from the highball glass under a microscope and told me what I wanted to know. My hunch had been right. So I grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later, I was paying for my ticket at the ferry landing. A thick, wet fog was beginning to roll in off the river, and by 8 o'clock, it was hard to even see your watch. Someone was playing a piano in the lounge as the ferry began to move slowly across the river. I didn't know who I was looking for, but I figured if there was going to be a payoff, it would be outside. I leaned against the rail and took out a cigarette. Got the match, mister? Huh? Yeah, yeah, right here. Thanks. Lousy night. Yeah. He wasn't my man. When he struck the match, I could see his dirty work clothes and his factory badge. I started down the other side of the boat. Finding a killer in that fog was like looking for your car keys in a mine shaft. I reached the bow of the boat, and right then I knew I was about to score. I get a tight feeling in my stomach when I start closing in on danger. I spotted the dark outline at the rail, so I pulled my hat down and walked up beside him. He was hunched over with his arms resting on the rail. Terrible night. Mm Mm-hmm. It'd be awful if you had to find someone in this fog. Not if he found you first. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like the name Louis Osgood. Have you heard of it? I like the name Moran. William Moran. Who are you? Just an employee. Diamond. Hey, you get a gold star. Well, what do you want? Uh, Have you found the blackmailers? Now, stop playing Alice in Wonderland. I just pushed around your hired gun at Louis Osgood. He had enough to say to put you away for a long time. He couldn't have. He didn't know Didn't know your name? Who murdered your wife? You or Louis Osgood? Why do you say murder? The police said it was suicide. Well, I got news for you, Buster. Homicide just changed its mind. I checked and found out that the highball glass near her head was covered with prints from her right hand. What does that prove? It proves that to take her own life, she'd have to have fingers a foot long. The prints on the gun were also from her right hand. You're going to tell me that your wife shot herself while holding a highball glass in the same hand? That's not my problem, Mr. Diamond. Well, I think it is. If Louis Osgood didn't shoot her, that leaves just one suspect, you. Now, let's take a walk back to the cabin. I want to keep an eye on you for homicide. All right. This is where I leave you, Mr. Diamond. Hey, come here! I hadn't thought he'd make a break, but as long as he had a gun and knew how to use it, I could understand why he did. I got my gun out and took off after him. I expected him to go over the side and in the fog, and he'd have a good chance. But when a guy gets cornered, he does funny things. I never would have spotted him, but he threw open a door and framed himself in the light from the inside. 
I must have caught him because I saw him start to fold and stagger through the door. I took my time getting there. A wounded man with a gun can get pretty mean sometimes. The door swung back and forth with the motion of the boat, and I could hear the sound of the engines. He'd gone down in the engine room, so I dropped to my knees and went in after him. A long, polished ladder led down to the big diesels below, and I knew I'd hit him with the first shot because there was a bright red trail of blood leading down the ladder and behind the churning machinery. Moran! Oh, Moran, come on out! You can't get out of here. Come and get me, Diamond! I don't like being slapped around, and I'm going to see that you get yours! He was somewhere off to my left and keeping himself hidden. A catwalk circled the engine room, so I pulled an old stunt. I took a wrench off the wall and tossed it down the metal ladder. I watched for his gun flashes, and when I spotted his position, I got down on my stomach and crawled along the catwalk until I was directly over his head. He was sitting in a lot of blood, and he didn't look like he had long to go. Come on, Simon, I know you're down here. Surprise, look at the birdie. What? Don't try it. Sorry, Moran, but this just wasn't your night. You want to tell me about it? I shot my wife. I came in just after she shot Grayson. And she was standing at the bar with her back to me, mixing a drink. She dropped the gun by Grayson's body, so I picked it up to shot her. Wiped my prints off and put hers on it. Why did you do it? I hated her. She had money. I found some letters and turned them over to Mac Grayson, the well-known blackmailer. I wanted him to drive her crazy until she drank herself into a sanitarium, and then I'd have her money. I never guessed she'd kill Grayson, but when I did, I saw a chance to kill her and make it look like suicide. You should never have called me. The police were satisfied. I had to find Leo Fink. He knew I'd hired Grayson, and he was going to blackmail me. So when I dug up the little wino that knew Fink, you hired Louis Osgood to bump Fink and me. Is that right? Hey, hey, Moran. Oh, well, it was a dull conversation anyway. Lousy night. The captain came and helped me carry him up to the deck. Back at the ferry landing, I called Walt Levinson and told him the whole story. I didn't wait around. I just hung up in the middle of his lecture on good behavior and started walking. A stiff breeze was kicking up and pushing the fog back where it came from. After a good round of murder, a guy likes to relax. And I knew just the place to curl up and get my fur brushed. I grabbed a cab and headed for 975 Park Avenue. And the only girl in the world who looked better than her $10 million bank account. Oh, good evening, Mr. Diamond. Hello, Francis. Is Miss Asher in? Yes, sir. She's in the library. Thanks. Get me a glass of milk, will you, Francis? Milk? Oh, yes, sir. Right away. Hey, that's a B-flat. Rick, where have you been? Sailing, sailing over the bounding main. Move over. You were supposed to have been here at 8 o'clock. Oh, what's an hour if you tack it on to the end of the evening? Well, I'm glad you've been keeping out of trouble. I can't stand it when you wander in all beat up. Mm, you smell nice. What kind of cologne is that? Gunpowder, 38. What? Oh, nothing. What's this you were playing? Oh, a new song. Again. You were just dandy. Well, you know I don't play well. I just pick. You should be glad you don't play the guitar with those beautiful nails you'd saw it in half. <laughs> You're ridiculous. Whoops. Oh, that wasn't a B-flat. Rick. Mm-hmm. Who do you love? I won't tell. Rick? I love you, baby. Then let's get married. Uh, hey, these are pretty good lyrics. Now stop that. Again, this couldn't happen again. I hate you. This is that once in a lifetime. This is that moment divine. You never sing when I want you to. What's more, this never happened before. Though I have waited a lifetime. For such as you to suddenly be mine. No comment. No. Mine to hold as I'm holding you now and yet never to part. 
Mine, too. Hey, what's the matter? Uh, don't go. You want to sing? Go ahead. Well, what did you have in mind? I won't tell. You're not being original. That's my line. Well, I'm mad. And come here, come here. No. Come here, huh? Mm -hmm. Helen. Mm -hmm. Still mad? No. Mm. Well, let's get you mad again. It's so much fun making up. <laughs> Mine again. What's the name of the song again? <laughs> uh, it never happens again. Oh, good. No. Oh, Ricky. Here's your milk, Mr. Diamond. Oh, my goodness, you never warned me. <laughs> just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Tal Avery, Herbert Butterfield, and Jack Petruzzi. Music was under the direction of David Baskerville. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. Now NBC brings you a three-way cavalcade of grand comedy with Phil Harris and Alice Faye, Fred Allen and Henry Morgan, all following in fast succession over most of these NBC stations. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. WBBM FM, Chicago. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment John Lund as Johnny Dollar. Is this Joe Benson, you call me? Oh, yeah, Lieutenant. I'm from Federal Underwriters. All the way from Hartford? Yeah. They sent me to get a report on the National Savings and Loan holdup. Oh, I see. How's the watchman? Well, he died about a half hour ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Shot three times. Hardly had a chance. Did he ever regain consciousness? Yes. Long enough to give us a make on one of the four guys who heisted the place. Well, that's something. Look, uh, if you want a report, you better come on down and get it firsthand. I'll be there in ten minutes, Lieutenant. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment... Plus refreshment, it's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Federal Underwriters Incorporated, 223 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Dameron matter. Expense account item one, $240, plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to San Francisco. I arrived ten hours after the news of the National Savings and Loan holdup reached the office. Lieutenant Benson was waiting for me when I got to the city hall. Yeah, you're just in time, Dollar. My men picked up Bernie Manners a few minutes ago. He's down the hall. Manners? He the one you got an identification on? Yes. Watchman looked at some mugs we pulled from the files and spotted him right away. Said Manners was one of the four men who did the job. Oh, it's quick work. Uh, shall we go on down? Yeah, sure. 
What about this Manners? Well, he's a two-time loser. 25 arrests on his card. On the way from narcotics violation to armed robbery. We'll see what he has to say before we check out his mama sheep. How'd they get him? Uh, when the watchman made him while we put out an APB. One of the units spotted him because he was going into a saloon. Uh, this way. Oh. Have any trouble? No. They uh, find anything on him? Two dollars and forty cents. No gun, nothing. Hmm. Mm-hmm. You, uh, you got a smoke? Oh, yeah, sure. A fresh air. Yeah, here you go. Oh, thanks. Well, uh, what do you think of our weather out here? Oh, pretty nice, pretty nice. We're still having snow. <laughs> I haven't been east in 13 years. Forgotten what it looks like. I don't know what you guys are talking about. I didn't have nothing to do with nothing. This matters? Yeah. Sergeant Friedman, Johnny Dollar. Hi. How are you? Hello, Bernie. Hello, Lieutenant. Well, let's have it. Have what? A story on the National Savings and Loan Job. I don't know anything about the National Savings and Loan Job. Four men walked in there about midnight last night, shot the watchman, cracked the safes, and got away with $65,000. Now you know about it? I don't know anything. What are you guys trying to hang on me? Where were you last night, Bernie? When last night? Between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. I was in my room, sleeping. Can you prove you were sleeping last night in your room? Who can prove they were sleeping? In a lane, ladies, somebody like that. I don't know. What do you know? Huh? About the national savings job. Nothing. I don't know nothing. Look, Bernie, you can make this thing a whole lot easier. I can? Now, who worked it with you? Who were the other three men in on it? Oh, come on, Bernie. You were always pretty good at talking. I'm not going to tell you anything. I don't have anything to tell you. How are you making a living these days? What? What do you do for a living? Oh, I've been driving a truck up to last week. Yeah? Where? Coast trucking outfit. Did you quit? I was fired. Why? I got in a beef with the boss. Check that. Yeah. Lieutenant Benson and Sergeant Friedman continued to question the suspect. He refused to admit any part in the burglary of the National Savings and Loan Company or to name any people who were connected with it. An hour went by. He still refused to talk. Two hours. Uh... I'm getting tired. So am I. All of us are tired, Bernie. Now, look, why don't you open your face so we can get some rest? I have told you I didn't have anything to say. (sighs) Who's this joker? Me? My name's Dollar, Bernie. I'm from the insurance company. What's he doing here? Worrying about you and your friends. (laughs) You don't have to worry about me, Dollar. I'll try not to. I uh, thought maybe you was a lawyer. Do I get to see a lawyer? What do you want to see a lawyer for? To get out of here, that's why. You aren't getting out of here, Bernie, you know that. Uh, now, tell us all about it. Come on, Bernie, you know it's all over. We got enough to take you into court right now. Uh, don't give me that. Uh-huh. Don't you believe it? No. Hand me that. Yeah, sure. There you Thanks. You know what this is, Bernie? No. It's a notarized statement from the watchman that was killed. His name was Fuller. I talked to him just before he died. You know what this says? It says that you were one of the four men who robbed the National Savings and Loan Company last night. Listen. Me. Please state your full name. Him. Henry Fuller. Me. Where do you live? Him. 235 22nd Avenue. Me. I understand that you are seriously hurt. Is that true? Him. Yes. Me. Do you believe that you are about to die from injuries you have received? Him. Yes. Me. Have you any hope of recovery from the effects of these injuries? Him. No. Listen, I... Shut up, Bernie, and listen. Me. Who caused the injuries from which you are suffering? Him. One of the robbers. Me. Is this a picture of one of the men who caused your injuries? Him. Yes. 
He was looking at a mugshot of you, Bernie. There were four witnesses in that hospital room when Fuller made this statement. It's a positive identification on you. Well? Can I have a glass of water? Later, maybe. Who were the other men? I don't know what you're talking about. Questioning went on. Another hour passed. Everybody got pretty tired. Manners still admitted nothing. It was the usual method of interrogation. Hammer away. Hammer away. Sooner or later, he'd spill something important. Lieutenant Benson knew his job. Once more, Bernie. Who were the other men? For the 20th time, there were no other men. There were four of you, Bernie. Why didn't we play bridge? Tell us what you did all day yesterday. What? Start with from the time you got up. I try to remember. Yeah, we're all interested. Well, what is this? Go on, Bernie. Tell it. What? I got up about ten, I fooled around all day, and I got to bed early. Very nice. What do you want me to tell you? What you did all day, who you were with, where you went. Oh, it's... And after you tell us that, you can tell us how you worked on the National Savings and Loan Office. I'll tell you nothing, nothing. All right, what's your name? What? What's your name? Bernie Manners, you know my name. Where do you live? I told you. Tell us your address. 2020 Army Street. Who worked with you? Nobody, nobody. Yeah, just a minute. Vince? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that'll do it. Yeah. That was about you, Bernie. What about me, Lieutenant? What about me? Guess what the crime lab found tucked behind one of the cushions in the front seat of your car. Oh. Twenty thousand dollars, Bernie. You didn't hide it very well. I didn't think you'd be looking. Did you use your car? Yeah. Who were the others? Eddie Page, Jack Ivers. One more. The other guy was called Chick. I didn't know him. Chick one. Just Chick. He figured the whole thing. Uh, who contacted you? Eddie. He put me in on but Chick ran it. Where can we get hold of Chick? I don't know. Now, what about ADP? I don't know. Jack Iowa? No. It won't do you any good to lie now. Bernie. I'm not lying. I just don't know where you can get hold of any of them. Now, what'd you do after the job? Well, we all got in my car and beat it. I let them off near the Fairmont. All three of them? Yeah. That way you split the money? No, we did that before we left the loan company. Look, I, I, I'm, I'm tired. Now, one more thing. Who shot Fuller? This Chick... Are you sure? Well, he was the only one who had a gun. Sure, I'm sure. Why did he shoot him? I couldn't figure that myself. We're all leaving the place. The watchman was all tied up and it was no trouble. Chick walked over, stuck the gun in his back and let him have it. Bernie Manners gave us a description of the man known only as Chick. It was pretty much the same as the description given by the watchman. The check through the moniker files revealed a possible 23 persons who answered the general description and background of Chick. Manners was shown a picture of each one. He couldn't identify any of them. I went back to my hotel and went to bed. The next morning, I was with Lieutenant Benson. They checked the slugs taken from Fuller's body. Any luck? Yeah, they came from a forty-five automatic revolver. Looks like it might be a Colt. Well, that checks with what Manners said. Yeah, but nothing in our files on the gun itself. Manners is in the mug room now. If this chick ever did time in any California prison, we'll have him on file. The hard way, huh? Mm -hmm. Hard case. Man's been killed. What about the other two, Page and Ivers? Ivers was released from San Quentin three months ago. The parole office gave us an address for him on Turk Street. Quinlan Friedman went out there, but the people who run the rooming house say Ivers hasn't been around for two days. I've got the place staked out. What was he in San Quentin for? Grand theft auto. Did four years. That the only time he fell? Mm-hmm. Page has had a little more experience. He's older than Manners or Ivers. He's a two-time loser. Both convictions were for armed robbery. Police in Denver want him for questioning, too. Any leads on him? No local address. He has a sister who lives in Eureka. Police there are talking to him. Should be getting something pretty soon. 
Communication's been broadcasting this every 30 minutes all night long. I left Lieutenant Benson so I could talk with the auditors who'd been working with the people at National Savings and Trust. By that time, they determined that $68,000 had been taken in the robbery. I spoke to the claims adjuster who'd flown in from Hartford and the officials of the company. I explained the situation with the police and the recovery of $20,000 of the stolen money. They agreed to suspend their claim pending the arrest of the other three suspects and the possible recovery of the entire loot. Expense account item two, ten cents, phone call. I checked with Lieutenant Benson at about four o'clock. Hi. Hi. You're just in time. We got a lead on page. Oh, yeah? 1485 Clare Street. I'll meet you out in front. Right. Expense account item three, one dollar and thirty-five cents. Cab fare to the address on Clare Street. Hi. Hi. In there? Yeah. You want to be in on this? It's all right with you. Okay. Friedman's covering the back entrance. Quinlan's in the lobby. Let's go. Uh, How'd you get it? The Eureka police talked to Paige's sister. Said she'd been writing him here under the name of Ernest Lawyers. Oh. Uh, want to take it over there? Yeah. Who's there? Uh, looking for Mr. Lawyers. You, Mr. Lawyers? Yeah. What do you want? Package. Who from? Well, it's, uh, Mrs. William Redding, in Eureka, California. I have to sign for it. Okay. You want to see I... You alone, Page? <laughs> Who are you? Police. Get your hat. Come on, let's go. Want to take a look over there, Don? Yeah. What is this? Bernie Manners spilled it all. Look out. He's got a gun. Drop that page. No good, mister. Why, you lousy cut. All right. All right. Come on, get up. Put your hands out. All right, let's go, Page. Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying sports and other activities. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good anytime, and the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Sergeants Quinlan and Friedman took the suspect, Eddie Page, downtown. I drove over to the emergency hospital with Lieutenant Benson, where they patched up the cut in his temple where Page had slugged him with his gun. After that, we returned to headquarters. Sergeant Friedman met us outside the interrogation room. How do you feel, Joe? Oh, headache. And what about him? Real quiet so far. Mm, fine. We went over the apartment. Now, you'll be happy about this, Dollar. More money? 15000 stuck in a suitcase. Hey, your insurance company's doing well so far. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's see about Tough Boy. Remember me? I remember both of you. How's your head? I'll get over it. How's your chin? I'd like to get at you again. Kind of like to get at you. That's all he's been saying ever since he landed. You're tied in with Bernie Manners and Jack Ivers on this thing, Page. Am I? Yeah. And that's enough for us. I suppose you're going to send me to prison. I suppose we are. <laughs> Some talk. Who's Chick? 
chick? The other guy. I don't know. Where's Ivers? I don't know. Bernie had to stay in here six hours. How long are you going to take, Paige? As long as you like. We've got all the time in the world. So have I. You know, we found your cut of the job in your room. Bernie's already told us about you. You're not going to admit anything, huh? Why should I? Man was killed on that job. As a murder charge to go along with everything else. Do tell. You can make it easy on yourself, Paige. <laughs> Easier for you. Okay. That's the way you want it. Friedman. Yeah. You and Quinlan stay with this bird. Stay with him if it takes all night and all day and all night. I want to see how long he can last. Well, now okay. You're... Come on, darling. Well, what now? I'm hungry. Expense account item four, six dollars and thirty-five cents. Drinks and dinner for Lieutenant Benson and myself. After eating, we returned to the interrogation room and the questioning of the suspect, Eddie Page. Although he knew there was enough evidence against him to make a burglary and homicide charge stick, he still refused to admit his part in the burglary or to give us the full name of the man known simply as Chick. <laughs> About 10 o'clock that night, a man who ran a drugstore on Geary Street telephoned that he thought he might have some information that would help. I drove over there with Lieutenant Benson. Foggy. Yeah, sure is. Oh, good evening. Can I help you, please? Uh, we'd like to talk to Mr. Smith. Yeah. Oh, you're the police? Well, I'm Smith. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Benson. This is Mr. Dollar. Uh, how do you do? You said you had something that might help, Mr. Smith? Indeed I do, Mr. Dollar. Indeed I do. I read all about the burglary in the papers yesterday, and, well, I have this. Hmm. A bill wrapper from National Savings and Loan. Yes. Now, where'd you get this, Mr. Smith? I found it on the floor, right here in the store. You know who dropped it? Uh, yes, I think so. Who? Well, a man who was in here earlier. I think he dropped it. What did he look like? Well, he, he was tall. He was kind of husky. Oh, he was about 35 years old, I'd say. He wore kind of a dark hat and a trench coat. You ever seen him in here before? No, just tonight. What did he buy, Mr. Smith? Quite a few things. Well, like what? Well, three bottles of scotch. And some mixer, and some ice, and some cigarettes. Uh-huh, I see. Oh, uh, when did you find the wrapper? Uh, right after he paid me for the things. What size bill did he give you? It was a 50. Do you still have it? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, could we look at it, please? Well, surely, yes, this way. Here you are. Thanks. No, huh? Brand new. Uh, did you happen to notice if he left in the car, Mr. Smith? No, he was on foot. When I found the wrapper on the floor and then remembered the newspaper story, I ran outside to take a look to see which direction he went. He walked right across the street. Do you mean he might possibly live around here? I think so. Like, uh, like right there, you see? He went into the Alden Hotel. How long ago was this? Oh, my, that was not over 15 minutes ago. Hey! hey. What? That, that's him, just coming out on the street there. Get back. Can you see his face? No, no, not yet. Is he one of the men you're looking for? I don't know yet. Sounds like it. Lieutenant. Yeah? Take a look. Jack Ivers. Let's go. Uh, you. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, call downtown. Hey, you. Hold it up just a minute. He's going for the alley. Yeah. He ducked right in there, I think. Yeah. Be careful, Johnny. Okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Throw out the gun, Ivers. You don't have a chance. Down here. Yeah. He's going to try for that fence down there. Yeah, let's go. He can't see us in the shadows. And he made the fence. Come on. <laughs> Yeah. 
see anything? Oh, too dark. Somewhere in here. Hey. Over there? Yeah. Anything? No. The apartment house. The one in the back door. Yeah. Get down. You okay? Okay. Ivers! This is your last chance. Somebody will get hurt if we don't stop him. That did it. What's it look like? Oh, he's done for. Well, I better phone in. Jack Ivers, one of the suspects connected with the burglary of the National Savings and Loan Office, died instantly while attempting to escape arrest. While we waited for the coroner's men to arrive, we searched his body and found $12,000 of the stolen money concealed in a money belt around his waist. I accompanied Lieutenant Benson to the Alden Hotel, where we learned from the desk clerk that Ivers had checked in the previous day using the name of David Ward. The clerk said that he shared the room with a man who'd registered as Charles Daly. Daly was still in the room, as far as the clerk knew. We went upstairs. Well, this is Chick. It's been a good day's work. Yeah. Yeah. Two ten. Yeah. Here we go. Could have sneaked out. Mm. Let's find out. (laughs) Well. (laughs) Well, I'll be. (laughs) Drunk? As you can get. (laughs) That's the way I like to pick them up. Quiet. The man passed out in the hotel room was identified as Chester Dameron, Toledo, Ohio. A check with authorities there revealed he had a criminal record covering 17 years. His nickname was Chick. Along with Eddie Page and Bernie Manners, he was indicted on charges of burglary and murder. The remainder of the stolen money was found in his hotel room. All told, 99 and 39 one hundredths percent of the loot was recovered. Excepting what Ivor spent for whiskey. Pretty good for federal underwriters. Expense account item five, $63.30. Miscellaneous while in San Francisco. Item six, same as one. My plane fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Total expense account, $551.10. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment, Treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. 
Featured in tonight's cast were Bill Johnstone, Clayton Post, Bill Conrad, Peter Leeds, and Howard McNear. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Many of the war orphans of Korea are dying of starvation and exposure. Without your help, they cannot live. We can send them food through CARE, the American Package Sending Relief Agency. One $10 CARE food package will feed four children for a month. Send your contribution to CARE's local office or to CARE New York, or Care Los Angeles. This is the CBS Radio Network. My name's Regan. I work for Anthony J. Lyon, International Detective Bureau. They call me... The Lion's Eye. Wednesday at 9 and CBS brings you Jeff Regan, Investigator, starring Frank Graham as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery and suspense and adventure in tonight's story of The Little Man's Lament. They called it Margate Mansion, but the name didn't fit. It was a pile of old cement and cracked stucco held up by a half a dozen tired palm trees. The people inside didn't fit either. A crusty old lady who talked backwards, a redhead with an urge to travel fast. But it was Junior who won first prize. He was half Einstein and half Hollywood playboy. Only when this boy played, it was with poison. It started on a Tuesday... I was headed down Taft Avenue on my way to the laundromat. I had a date with a washing machine and a blonde cashier named Gloria. That's when a cab pulled up beside me and the lion hopped out. He was blowing sparks out of a fat cigar. I could tell by the 50 cent smell that we had a new client. Oh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, my boy, I'm glad I caught you. Get back in the cab, fat, so I'm busy. But I have to talk to you. I was just going up to your apartment. Have a good time. I'll be out all day. Now, Jeffrey, is that any way to talk after all I've done for you? After the many opportunities I've given you to help your fellow beings in distress? I've worked three weeks without a rest. i got to wash my socks. Wash your socks? You can talk about a thing like that when I'm here to present you with a golden opportunity? An opportunity to demonstrate our humanitarian sentiments? A chance to lift one who's in trouble? How much did you lift from him? A hundred bucks, and it's not a him, it's a her. Oh, it's really a simple job, Jeffrey. Very simple. I've just been over there. Lovely old house, fine old family. The Margates, flower of the old south. Gone to see. Uh, well, yes. But you know how it is with descendants of old families. Fresh young growth choked back by the weeds of the old family stock. The fresh new plants smothered by decay and ruin. Try Vigoro. Regan, you don't seem to understand. We've been retained by Mrs. Margate. It's about her nephew, Hillary Margate. Strange youth, very strange youth indeed. If Mrs. Margate needs protection from him, I tell you it's a very serious matter. Well, so's my laundry. Regan, will you listen to me? There's another choice? Yes. Yeah, see, Mrs. Margate, root out the facts. Get her a gardener. She doesn't need a gardener. She needs you, and don't give me any more trouble. Okay, okay, sweetheart. Here. You wait a minute. What's it? My laundry. Put the shirts and socks in a washing machine, put two bits in the slot. And stay away from the blonde. She doesn't like cigar smoke. Regan, this means you will see Mrs. Margate? Don't try to be coy. You knew I'd see her the minute you stepped out of that cab. I walked up Vine and turned right past Franklin. All the places up there are old, but Margate Mansion was old when William S. Hart was Gene Autry. A bunch of turrets made out of wood that termites wouldn't look at. But I was looking at what was standing in the front bay window, looking at me. Red hair and wide eyes and a complexion like skim milk. 
She was what answered the door when I twisted the old-fashioned bell. Hello. I saw you from the window. Yeah, I saw you seeing me. Come in. Come in, please. Thanks. I, I hope you don't mind the disorder. I'm afraid I don't... Your name? Regan. Oh. Sit here, Mr. Regan. Please don't mind the dust on the sofa. No one nice ever comes, so it doesn't matter. I like you. I want you to stay. It shows. You're not married or anything like that, Mr. Regan. Nothing like that. Oh, that's nice. I'm not married either, Mr. Regan. I heard it was Mrs. Margate. Oh, that's my aunt. I'm not married at all. Mr. Regan, you didn't just come to see my aunt. I've got a lot of time. Oh, I've been foolish again, haven't I? Oh, sometimes I, I get so mixed up. I, I'm... Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Yes, Mr. Regan. What's your name? Gwethelyn. Mrs. Margate's niece. Yes. Hillary's your brother? Yes, Mr. Regan. All those questions. Business. Business? International Detective Bureau. Your aunt's on the line for $100 worth. A detective? Well, that's polite for it. Oh, you shouldn't have told me that. You shouldn't have told me that at all. Suppose you tell me some things. I'm mixed up, Mr. Regan. I can't tell. Bless him. Oh, that's my aunt. Did I hear the front door bell? Don't say anything. Don't tell her. I did hear the front door. Well, Gwethelyn, who is this man? He's... Regan. Regan? Oh, you're the man they call the lion's eye. I've been expecting you. I'm gardening. I should have figured. It was? Oh, I have a green thumb, as they say. Follow me. Go to your room, Gwethelyn. Yes, Annie. Gwethelyn? Yes, Annie, I'm going. She went all right like a rabbit at a greyhound race. Only I wasn't sure this rabbit could stay ahead of the dogs. But right then I had another problem, keeping up with Mrs. Margate. It wasn't the way she walked, it was her talk that went at me. You go to the garden. <sighs> my niece and my nephew, a problem is that weigh heavily on my heart, Mr. Regan. Oh, this way. Family collapsing and falling to ruin. Just three Margates left, myself and the two children, Wertheland and Hillary. Only 52 years old with such responsibilities. Hillary? No. No, myself, of course. Fifty-two. But Hillary is the real problem. You follow me? Right behind you. What? Oh, yes, out this door. Oh, the garden. There. Do you see that pool by the date palm? Uh-huh. Fish. Carp, Mr. Regan. He concocts things. Hillary brews things. Poisons. One day he said something he had brewed to Hillary F. Margate Sr., the carp, and he turned bright green. Hillary? The carp. We found him next morning floating belly up, stock bright green. Hillary F. Margate Sr., the carp. We name our fish after the dear departed members of our family. Nice custom. Yes. Hillary poisoned the carp when he was only 146 years old. The carp? Yes, yes. Uh, come along. <sighs> Hillary was only a boy at the time. Such a problem, Mr. Regan. Oh, here. My vegetable garden. Uh, have an onion, Mr. Regan. Delicious. Uh, yeah. Look, Mrs. Margie. Eat the onion, uh, Mr. Regan. Uh, George. George. George is my gardener. I'm over here, Mrs. Margaret. Oh, well, you, you can go out back and cut the weeds, George. Mr. Regan and I have some private matters to discuss. Yes, ma'am. Excellent, ma'am, George. Excellent. And be sure you get them all, George. We must be rid of the weeds. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. <sighs> now we're alone, Mr. Regan. The onion, go on, eat it. Uh, as I was saying, Hillary, that boy, such a problem. Yeah, as you were saying. Yes, yes. Good, aren't they? Mrs. Margate, what is it you want me to do? Do? Well, I want you to look after Hillary. I was told you wanted protection. Well, it's the same thing, isn't it? No. Hillary needs a nursemaid. That's not our line. No, see here, Mr. Regan. International Detective Bureau has already agreed to handle my case. Mr. Lyon himself accepted my check. He'll accept anyone's check. But he promised to help. Well, then talk to him. I'm talking to you. I'm explaining. You're explaining nothing. You've given me a lot of double talk, and I have a feeling that's all you want to give me. Now, make sense. All right, all right, all right. You're going to force me to say what I hoped never to say to anyone. Not anyone. My life is in danger. I can believe that. My tea yesterday, I noticed the odor of almonds. I'm listening. No, I didn't drink it, naturally. 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 
Hello, Ray Brood, that tea, Mr. Regan. My nephew. Now you've said something. Where is he? Ocean Park, the shooting gallery. Shooting gallery? Yes, he's strange, very strange. He brews things, collects guns, practices shooting. You won't like him. Uh, suppose I go talk to him. Well, you'd better. As I've said, Mr. Regan, I don't wish to be murdered. <laughs> I headed the car down La Brea to Olympic and then out to the Ocean Park Pier. It was afternoon business, popcorn and sailor style. The shooting gallery had one customer, a kid in a corduroy sport coat with a face like a cantaloupe out of season. He was taking shots at the little swinging targets. You didn't need the family album to figure him for Hillary Margaret. I walked over, but he didn't take the gun from his shoulder. Leeks. Come again? Leeks. Scallions. My name's Regan. Allium mascalonica, Mr. Regan. Onions. You've been eating them. So? This suggests you're the private detective hired by my aunt. Bullseye? You read palms, too? I fancy myself an amateur detective, Mr. Regan. I seldom miss. I notice. As a matter of fact, Mr. Regan, I'm interested in hiring you myself. Well, that's a switch. I think there's going to be a murder... Anybody I know? Yes, my aunt. Who plays the heavy? The heavy? Who's going to kill her? I am. Practicing? I don't need practice, Mr. Regan. Even experts get the chair. Possibly. All right, Junior, let's start making sense. Very well, Mr. Regan. My aunt is a domineering autocrat. Actually, I should hate to kill her. But I feel I must, uh, to protect myself, you understand. From what? <laughs> you know, I dabble in poisons, Mr. Regan. I am empoisonné, as the French say, poisoner. When I was 15... I heard that one, yeah. Hillary F. Margate Sr., the carp. Oh, he died a horrible death. My regrets. Now, get to the point. Ours is an evil household, Mr. Regan. The last of the Margates, a decaying race... My aunt, for example, in Gwethelen. I met her. Then you understand that something must be done. This is an urgent matter, Mr. Regan. It would be wise to take my case. One Margate for a client's too many. Very well, Mr. Regan. But you want information. Uh, Perhaps I'll give it to you tomorrow. I'll phone you. As they say on the radio, you may save a life. Possibly your own. made a real funny joke the way he said it. Only I wasn't laughing. And neither was he. I got in my car and started for town to tell the lion he'd been underpaid. All the way in, I kept getting a picture of a mechanical rabbit going around a track. I tried putting Grethelin's face on it, and Mrs. Margate's, then Hillary's. The others didn't fit. Grethelin's did. I was still thinking about it when I parked on Hill Street and got out to walk. And that's when I put another face on the rabbit, my own. The guy who fell in behind me and started following was no greyhound, but he had squeaky shoes that slowed down when I slowed down. We stayed together for a block, and when I turned left toward the office, he turned left. I wondered if he was an amateur. I found out when I sidestepped into an alley and pulled him in after me. All right, Buster, this is where you get off. Hey, say, what the devil? Come on, come on, who hired you? Let me go. Give me some answers. I... Talk. You want muscles, huh? Muscles? All right. I got him. He had him all right, and he knew where to use him. He had a bald head, and he used that, too, right in the middle of my stomach. I shouldn't have bent double, but I did. It was a setup. The next blow sent me around the fender of a truck parked in the alley. I went to my knees. When I came up, it was too late. The bald head was gone. But someone else was there. Mr. Regan. It was Gwethel and Margate. Mr. Regan, you should be careful. You all right? He was following me. No, Mr. Regan, no, he wasn't. I was going to your office. He was following me. She was ready to talk, but the fog in my head wouldn't let me listen. I got her around the corner into a bar. She waited until the waiter brought the drinks. Two bourbon straight, Mr. Regan. And if I may say so, this is a lovely tomato you are escorting to my humble palace. You said so. Ah, 
And may I say, Mr. Eager, I'm also partial to redheads. On account of my first love was a redhead. She played second flute in our orchestra. Sure. Keep the chains. That was when I was with Stokowski. Ah, oh, the Hollywood Bowl, how well I remember. Me and my fiddle. We made together beautiful music. Me and the fiddle, you understand, not the redhead. She gave me nothing but the cold shoulder and account she was hot for a guy that played bass. Come on, you told me this story yesterday. You don't wish to hear the story of my life, Mr. Regan? Well, it was the same way with Mr. Stakowski. The artist is lost in the world of today. <laughs> All right. Now we can talk. I don't know, Mr. Regan. Who was following you? It doesn't matter. I'm used to it, Mr. Regan. Well, who was the mug? It doesn't matter, Mr. Regan. It's too late anymore. I thought... You thought what? I thought you'd help me, Mr. Regan. I was on my way to your office. Why? It's going to be trouble, Mr. Regan. Serious trouble. What says so? Everything. Hillary, my aunt, they're all acting so strangely. And those people who come to the house... People? Who? I don't know. But the man who is following me is one of them. Well, something strange is going on, Mr. Regan. Something terrible. You still haven't told me anything. Don't you see? It isn't anything I can tell you. It's a feeling, a terrible feeling. Everything's wrong. I've got to have facts, lady. I don't... Wait, there's one thing. Yeah? The gardener, Mr. Hendricks. George? Yes. My aunt knows him, Mr. Regan, better than just a gardener. Something else. What? George has been in prison. I know he's been in prison. I heard him say something once on the telephone. To who? I don't know. So much I don't know. That makes two of us. You don't believe me. You've got to believe me. Something terrible's going to happen. Sure. Hillary's going to kill your aunt. Hillary? Oh, no, no. That's not it at all. It's me they're going to kill, don't you see? They're going to kill me. <laughs> After that, I couldn't get anything out of her that made sense. I loaded her in a cab and then walked over to Pershing Square to feed the pigeons. Maybe something would come to me. Nothing did, except the pigeons. After a while, I went over to the examiner morgue to look up George Hendricks. There was nothing, not a word. But the lion has ways of finding those things out, so I went back to the office. The lion had information, all right. But not the kind I expected. Regan! Regan, where have you been? I've been calling every saloon in the city. You got the wrong one. I often wonder why I hired you. Okay, Fatso, oh, why the steam? I'll tell you why. Because you were supposed to be on the Margate case, that's why. What do you think I've been doing? I know what you're going to be doing. You're going to get out to Margate Mansion right now and fast. They just found Hillary Margate in his room. He's been shot through the head. <laughs> This is CBS, and you're listening to The Story of the Little Man's Lament. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. Here's a special word for those of you who are interested in setting up a retirement fund. One that will permit you to have some of the good things of life before you're too old to enjoy them. Join the payroll savings plan where you work and invest in United States savings bonds. Under this plan, your firm sets aside whatever sum you name from each paycheck and uses the money to buy savings bonds for you. Buy United States bonds and keep them. And now, back to tonight's story of the little man's lament and Jeff Regan, investigator. Nothing made sense. There were three Margates. The old lady, her nephew Hillary and his sister, Gwethelyn. And all three of them wanted to hire me to stop a murder. Then the lion tells me Hillary Margate has just been shot. Well, one thing was sure. With three people to work for, one of them was bound to turn up dead. I put the lion to work looking up the gardener, George Hendricks. Then I hopped in the car and headed out to the Margate place off Franklin Avenue. By the time I got there, it was turning dark. Out front, a black and white gnash said, Police, in big letters. But when the old lady opened the door, she acted as though she'd never heard of police. Oh, 
Oh, Mr. Regan, please come in. I'm sorry you didn't get to meet him. Hillary, strange boy. I met him. You did? Oh, this way, Mr. Regan. Well, it's no matter. It was inevitable. Hillary's uncle, my husband, before he died, warned me something like this would happen. He was a young fool, Hillary. How did it happen? Happen? Oh, with a gun, of course. How else could one shoot oneself except with a gun? In here, Mr. Regan, we won't be bothered by them. Sometimes police can be so nosy. Oh, do sit down. We shall have tea. With or without arms? I know what you're thinking, Mr. Regan, but I'm sure it had nothing to do with it. What did? Just a moment, Mr. Regan. There's someone at our door. Well, Gwethelyn? I was just coming to see you, Andy. I thought you'd want me to tell Mr. Regan about Hillary. Mm. Yes, a good idea. Uh, Mr. Regan, I'll let Gwethelyn tell you. She was here at the time. Oh, she was a lovely woman. Gwethelyn's mother, my late sister. Well, go ahead, child. Go ahead, go ahead. I, I got home about five. Uh, better sit down, child. No, 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 not there. Here. Yes, Andy. Well, Mr. Regan, Hillary was in the gun room reading... I went in to talk to him, but he ordered me out of the room. He said he didn't want to be disturbed. He was concentrating. Go on. I left the room. A couple of minutes later, I heard a shot. When I went back, he was there. Hillary. On the floor, dead. Then you called the police. I told Angie. She called them. They've been so nice, the police. They promised not to disturb me any more than necessary. Wasn't that nice? They're um, in his room now? With Hillary. Dear Hillary. Well, he won't need me anymore. I think I'd better be going. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, Gwethelyn, uh, see Mr. Regan to the door like a good girl. Yes, honey. Uh, and come again sometime soon, Mr. Regan. We shall have tea together. Thanks. This way, Mr. Regan. Mr. Regan, I've got to talk to you this way quickly. What's on your mind? It's about Hillary. Something he did tonight. Like what? When he came home, before he was... Before that, he had a book. A big book. He was reading it when it happened. Why would he read a book and then shoot himself? He got me. What was the title? I don't know. But when the police came, the book was gone. Where did he buy it? I don't know that either. I'm sure it's important, Mr. Regan. I'm sure of it. You don't think it's important? I don't know. I reach for answers. Sometimes they come up air. I know something else, Mr. Regan. It's about George. George Hendricks, our gardener. Yeah? He disappeared this afternoon. After it. Go on. And he sent for him when the police arrived, but he wasn't in his room. The police were angry. They think he might have done it. And you think so, too? I'm not sure, Mr. Regan. I'm not sure of anything now. She turned and ran into the house and left me with a lot of night air and cool breeze. If Hendricks had taken a powder, the police would check that angle. That left me with a book. A very big book. I walked down Franklin toward my car. Up ahead, I saw a small man in a black suit locking up a shop door. Over his head, a sign said Franklin Avenue Bookshop. That did it. I caught him before he closed up. I... Beg your pardon. Do you know a Hillary Margate lives up the street? Yes, I know him. Why? Was he in today? He's a regular customer. Was he in? Yes or no? Uh, yes. Did he buy a book? No. You sure? Uh, positive. He asked for a volume we didn't have. What volume? I don't remember the title because we didn't have it in stock. It was a textbook. Textbook? Uh, yes. On horticulture. Uh, plants. Pla plants? Does that mean something to you? Yeah. It could explain why the Margate family has gone to seed. It was crazy, but it was beginning to untangle. I headed for my car up the street. Before I touched the starter, I found out I had company. All right, Regan, drive. The gun in my back told me he meant it. One look in the mirror told me he was George Hendricks. Well, you're calling him. Where to? Your apartment. I want to talk. Have a chair, Regan. It's your house. Thanks. I talk. You sit and listen. I can stand. I say sit down. It's your party, Hendricks. There's been an accident at the Margate house. I heard. Hillary shot himself. Is that right? Oh, you think different? Changed my mind. I didn't kill him, Regan. Who said you did? I never could get used to confinement. Oh. 
San Quentin? Sandstone. Sandstone, Minnesota. Tell me more. Listen, Regan, the police don't like guys with a record. What was your rap, Hendricks? Checks, something like that, forgery. So why tell me? You're moving in my direction, Regan. I don't like it. Is that why you ran? There's something else. Yeah? The name. It isn't Hendricks. It's Margate. What's that? Freehold Quincy Margate. No wonder you changed it. There were several reasons. Yeah, Old South family. Listen, Regan, you got to believe me. I didn't kill Hillary. I didn't have anything to do with it. You know a big guy, bald head with a stupid face? Morley. He works at the Margate place part-time. What's his job? Flunky. He works in the garden with me. When he isn't tailing the girl. Leave me out of that part of it. Well, do I answer that? Yes, but watch what you say. Regan. Regan, I expected to hear from you sooner. What's happened to you? Regan, are you there? Uh, yeah, just got here. What's the matter? Someone with you? You're a genius. Well, I just found out about Hendricks. You guessed it. You mean he's there? Go on. Listen, that's not his real name, Regan. He's a Margate. Freehold Quincy Margate, age 46, height 5'11", weight 180. Get to the point. Well, about that prison record, quite correct. It was eight years ago, charge. Narcotics violation. Oh, yes, but be careful, he'll hear you. No, he won't. He just went out the door, fast. I had what I needed. I averaged 50 down Franklin and pulled up in front of the Margate place ten minutes later. It was dark and it looked empty, like a beer can after a picnic. I found an open window and crawled in. It was the gun room. And that meant I didn't have to go much farther. But somebody changed my mind for me when the door suddenly opened and a hunk of orange lightning stabbed in my direction. I ducked and the chair next to me toppled over. I couldn't wait for the next one. Let me go. Drop it. You're hurting my... That's better. Now some lights. Mr. Regan, I thought you were one of them. I'm not. That book Hillary was reading. I... I'm in a hurry, baby. You already know, don't you, Mr. Regan? All right. I didn't see it closely. It had pictures of plants. Like the ones in your backyard? Yes. I didn't know what it meant until... Until Hillary got it, and then you were too scared to talk. Why? <laughs> Mr. Regan, Hillary didn't poison my aunt's tea. They only said he did so they could kill me and then blame him for it. That way they'd be rid of both of us. Yeah, but Hillary caught on too quick. That's why they killed him, Mr. Regan. Oh, don't let them know I know. It won't matter now, baby. I circled around the house in a hurry. Empty. Then I tried the garden. That's when I saw it. Fifty yards behind the house. A strange light at first. Then something red that began to grow. Then smoke and more smoke. I ran for the back of the garden in the flames. She saw me coming. Stand back, Mr. Regan. Maybe tomorrow, Mrs. Margate. I warn you, Regan. Stand back. You hired me, remember? Take one more step, Mr. Regan, and Morley will kill you. You figured he'd be around. Put that gun down, Morley. The smoke's getting in your eyes. No, no. Shoot him, Morley. Shoot him. You're too late for that. I drove across the column of smoke and caught his arm as he tried to find me with that gun. I got to him first. I owed him something for what he'd given me in that alley. And I paid him back with interest. The old lady just stood there and glared at me. The fire reflecting in her eyes. It took me ten minutes in my best sport coat to stop the blaze. But the price was cheap. Because where the fire had been was a nice pile of Exhibit A. It looks just like an ordinary plant, but the police call it marijuana. Somebody spotted the smoke and called the fire department. The police were right behind them and loaded the last of the Margates into the wagon. And it was like Greth said. She was scheduled to turn up poison, and I was supposed to testify that Hillary had done it. Only Hillary caught on too fast, and they gave him a bullet for his trouble. And after I finished up at headquarters, I went to the office and filled the lion in. He was disappointed. And this fellow the police picked up at the depot, this Hendricks, he, he wasn't the culprit we were looking for? He was under the old lady's thumb like the rest of the family. She blackmailed him into growing this stuff. With his record, he couldn't afford to squawk. He couldn't afford to squawk? How do you think I feel? You got a check for a hundred bucks, didn't you? Uh, <coughs> well, yes, I did. Uh, well, that she is... did pay you, didn't she? Well, you see, Jeffrey, uh, that is, she, she gave me a check when I first went out there for one hundred dollars. You said that. Well, I didn't think anything of it at the time, but... Uh, well, you see, her brother-in-law... You mean... Well, that is, Hendricks did have a prison record for narcotics violation, but, uh... Well, it seems upon examining the records more closely, there was an earlier sentence for, uh... Bad checks. 
Uh, yes, it seems to run in the family. I don't get paid this week. Uh, go on. Quit me. Pick a man when he's down. Oh, stop it. You know I never withhold payment when I have it. Right now, I don't have it. Maybe next week... If you I... wait two weeks, it'll be Thanksgiving. What's that mean? You can have the end of the turkey I've been getting. Jeffrey, you're not being kind. <coughs> Remember my heart. I'll try. Oh, thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Now, oh, here's 25 cents. For what? Go over and pick up your laundry. I forgot to wait for it. <laughs> Jeff Regan, Investigator, is written, written by William Frug and William Fifield, directed by Sterling Tracy, and stars Frank Graham as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. Original music is by Dick Arant. Jeff Regan, Investigator, is heard each week at the same time over CBS. Bob Stevenson speaking and inviting you to be with us again next Wednesday at 9 for more suspense and mystery and adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Greetings as always, Mr. Lover. Time for another visit with Valentine. I think our menu for Mayhem is particularly enticing this adventure. It's called the Blue Plate Special. And it was created especially for those of you who are trying to lose a few pounds. You see, it doesn't contain a single protein or calorie, or even a vitamin for that matter. Just a couple of fat hits, which you should be able to digest very easily. Now, if you'll take your elbows off the table, I'll tell the chef to commence serving. How much did you say? Uh, uh, what's that, Josh? I said, how much did you say? Oh, uh, well, uh, $1.75 is what I said, but you know me. Yes, Sam, I know you. Uh, been in the family a long time, I suppose. Must have meant a good deal to your dear old mother, rest her soul. How much, I ask you? Uh, uh, of course, with you boys, it's a little different, but I want you to understand nothing would make me prouder than to do business with the Higby family. Never mind that old maid business, of uh, course. But, but I mean, uh, well, what did I say? Two uh, fifty? Wasn't that what I said? Oh, sure, Josh, I'd be glad to pay you three uh, dollars. Three dollars you pay me for that plate. Oh, Josh, no. Well, for three dollars, I'd break it over your head. Do you hear me? Let me go, Josh. Please, look out. You oh, don't, don't, little don't you chip artist trying oh, to take me for a dodo. Oh, well, I'll break every no. plate in the house before you get it. Don't. And I'll break you, too. Dear Mr. Valentine, you've got to come to Hickby Corners before something terrible happens, before I'm ruined. Mr. Valentine, I want you to, to steal a plate. Yours truly, Sam Ferris. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to Let George Do It and George Valentine.
Here we are, that big place with the iron deers. Way out in the country, isn't it, Mr. Ferris? Why well, up here, next door? Uh, some of these iron deers always turn out to be <laughs> live dogs. What? Oh, but don't you worry, none. They won't bother us if we walk on the gravel and make a lot of noise. That's what I always do. Now, wait a minute, not so fast. Uh, from what you've said and from the looks of their house... Uh... These Higby brothers practically own this part of the country, right? Uh, Josh thinks they do. Well, they have got a pile of money, I guess, And yet but... you told us he wanted to sell you a plate, of all things, to raise cash. Oh, well, it's a farm, you see. Josh wants a new tractor, that's all. And it makes sense, that house of theirs full of heirlooms they never even look at. But what kind of a plate? Early to bed, early to rise. That's what it said. A what? Well, you see, I run a furniture store here in the corners. Yes, we know that much. Well, in this part of the country, a man gets to have a nose and reputation for antiques. Know what I mean? <laughs> well, some of them early chinaware, hand-painted, mottos and things on you know the type. My gosh, they can get me $200 a piece sometimes in the city. Only this one you looked at wasn't any good, huh? This one I looked at was a fake. Cheap imitation you could buy for a dollar. But out of the kindness of my heart, I offered more than that. You mean out of the fact you're scared to death of Josh Higby, right? Um, well, <clears throat> Mr. Valentine, I've been in business around here for 27 years. I got a standing, know what I mean? Well, so's Josh Higby. But he's mean and vindictive, too. And once he starts after you, you might as well move out of here. He thinks that plate's worth a hundred dollars or more. I know it's not. But he's already telling people I'm a liar and not to be trusted, and they should take their antique business to somebody honest. And I suppose you want me to steal that plate so you can prove to people that it is a fake, right? <clears throat> you, uh, won't do it, huh? What do you think? Well, of course, I didn't exactly mean steal like an ordinary thief. I know, but it seems to me that this whole thing is nothing but a tempest in a teapot anyway, so why do George, we... George, wait. Oh. Somebody's coming. Oh, well, now, 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 careful what you say. People can get killed in tempests, you know, and when Josh gets all riled up... Well, and... for the land's sake, Sam, what are you doing out here? <laughs> oh, it's you. <laughs> you think it'd be anyone else? Saw you standing out here in my front lawn, finally thought I'd better either chase you away or ask you in. <laughs> Just baking some cakes, and they're not all on order. So why don't you and your friends come in for a piece? Uh, huh? uh, no, 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 no. Uh, this is Miss Brooks, Mr. Valentine, Widow Parsons. Hello, Mrs. Parsons. Yes, cottage in the trees there, that's hers. But if you'll excuse I us, know, Widow... I know, You think you're going next door, don't you? <laughs> well, there's no one home. Well, isn't Josh or Amy... I heard both their cars drive out hours ago. <laughs> oh, well, if they're gone, we'll just... And I suppose that makes you prick up your ears, because that makes you think the coast is clear. Oh, look at him blush. Oh, no, 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 don't be sick. Uh, coast clear for what, Mrs. Parsons? Well, to steal behind their backs. Oh, I... Sam, I know you're all right, but the way those two Higbys look after her, you won't have a chance. Not that I blame you, Eddie. I guess every man in the country has eyes on her, and after all, the way she primped. Her? Oh. Whom are you talking about? Why, that little secretary, that Doris Drury. She's spending the summer there. Uh, didn't you know? And those two Higbys acting like 17-year-olds and Sam here. Oh, 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 look at him blush. Oh, <laughs> oh no, 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 stop it. She don't mean anything to me. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. Well, I got bad news for you anyhow. She's not home either, making her weekly trip to the city, and she's not back yet. So there, Sam. Sam, you little conniver. Oh, you come all the way out here and brought your friends on a false alarm. <laughs> oh, oh, that blasted nosy nuisance. No, no, Sam, no, I'm still interested. In fact, in the morning, I'd be only too glad to investigate this case of the uh, plate. Yeah, there might be more to it than I thought. Dog makes a lot of noise, doesn't he? Yeah. Uh -oh. Hello there. Good morning. What? You, Mr. Higby? What? Oh, yes, yes. What do you want? Well, this may sound a little silly, but I want to talk about a plate. Huh? Oh, from Sam. Oh, no, no. It's Josh you want. I am Amos Higby. Oh. I don't know where my brother is. Now, please don't bother us now. I'm sorry. Oh, hey, wait a minute. Well, I just My brother, Josh, is a fine man. A fine man, you hear me? He's... No. Go away, I'm sorry. Well, what's the matter with him? Oh, I don't know, Brooksy. But if Josh isn't here, it isn't him I want to see anyway. Come on. But if there's nobody here, why go in? That girl, Angel. She's supposed to be back from the city by now, isn't she? 
Well, maybe she can tell us why people get so excited about chinaware. The plate, it's broken. And in the hall there, there are others broken. <gasps> yeah. The plate can be a pretty good murder weapon, can't it? I guess that's the secretary. And she's dead. Take it easy, take it easy, all of you. Nobody's upset but you, Sheriff. All right, hang it, I am upset. Why shouldn't I be? You, Pete. Yeah? Get those men out finding Josh Higby. Okay, sir. What about Amos Higby? He was the one we saw coming out of the house, and the doctor says it didn't happen over an hour or two ago. Yes, yes, sure. But he wouldn't hurt anybody, not Amos. Well, it was quite a fight, no matter how it happened. Yeah, hair and curlers, bathrobe. I guess she must have come down for breakfast. Come on, I have an idea, Sheriff. Where are we going? Well, it was light when this happened, wasn't it? You said so yourself around breakfast time. Well, if there was a real fight here, what about that next door neighbor? Isn't she supposed to be a snoop? No. No, I didn't hear anything. But, Mrs. Parsons, are you sure? Honestly, it's it's too far to hear anything. Uh, she's right, Valentine, it is. Skip it for a second, will you? Mrs. Parsons, uh, those two Higby brothers both have been making eyes at their secretary, isn't that right? No, no, no. They're really nice. I- it wasn't that way at all. Uh, of course they made eyes at her. They couldn't help it. No more than any other men around. She was somebody sent to them by their lawyers in town to help out with the books. But she didn't want to be a working girl all her life. She was a nice girl. I talked to her several times. Oh, Mrs. Parsons, you've sure changed your tune. (laughs) Well, what's that? Well, I don't mean you really were critical of anybody last night. But now there's been a murder, so everybody's perfect. Oh, I didn't mean that. Uh, But it doesn't do any good to... It might do some good if I pointed out your kitchen window has a nice clear view of their front door. And their front hall where the murder took place has glass across the front. No, no, no. It won't do any good. What won't do any good? Mrs. Parsons, who are you afraid of? Oh, I don't know. I I mean, oh, please. You saw it, didn't you? You saw who was in there with that girl. Leave me alone. I've been their neighbor for 12 years. You can't make me say things. I'm sorry, but who was it, Mrs. Parsons? I, I saw him come out. I saw her. I was going to you. It's such a lovely morning. Did you see the murder? I heard her scream. They were alone because I saw him leave earlier for the field. Wait a minute. Who? Which is the him that left? It won't do any good, I tell you. You can't hear anything but a loud noise like a scream. And and, and, and then I saw her fall and then he slammed the door shut. And you've just been sitting here ever since, scared to death. Yeah, we'll take care of you. Don't worry. <laughs> And it's good enough eyewitness for a jury, all right. Only in the circumstances. Yes, Mrs. Parsons. You still haven't told us who it was. It's no good, I tell you. I don't know. I couldn't hear, but I could see him. Hey. Wow. Hello, Higby. Oh, no. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mrs. Parsons. I guess this is the one, huh? Amos Higby. What's all this? My name is Josh Higby, stranger. Heard you wanted me, Sheriff, and I thought I'd well, better... Wait, hold it, would you? You're the same guy we talked to out in front of your place only an hour ago. You're Amos. Yeah, you were scared and you ran away. I'm, I'm sorry. It won't do any good. Are you trying to make a liar out of me, stranger? Oh, no, shut up, Josh. Valentine, you don't understand the circumstances, that's all. But you realize, Josh and Amos are identical twins. <laughs> listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to George Valentine. It all started over a plate. Or did it? A 
Apparently a visiting secretary from the city, the girl named Doris Drury, was quite a dish herself. Or at least both of the Higby brothers and every other middle-aged man in the vicinity thought so. But now Doris is dead, struck down by one of those same heavy plates. Well, for a moment, the crime looked simple. There was practically an eyewitness, and it was obviously a Higby who did it. All right, but which one? Because if your name is George Valentine, you've just learned that the Higbys are identical twins. Well, at least it was one of you twins. That's something. Sure, that's something, all right, Sheriff. Well, now, is that all you're going to say, Josh? Don't know yet. Haven't talked to my lawyer. All right. But in the meantime, i got to lock you up. You know that. Well, don't apologize for it. Mrs. Parsons says it was one of you. You heard her say that, didn't you? There on the farm, you're both dressed about the same. I heard, I heard. Oh, laughing blabbermouth. She can't help it. Should have sicked the dogs on her the first time she borrowed a cup of sugar. Oh, get in there. Hmm. Don't see Amos anywhere. We'll get him, don't worry. Now, listen, Josh. I'll get your lawyer, but he's going to advise you the same as I am. That you should tell everything you remember about what happened. Oh, so, so. Be glad to. Well? Well? Well, pretty sore at this furniture guy, this Sam. About one of your family's heirlooms. A plate, I think he's... Sam's a liar. I'm no authority, but those plates, everything in the house is as good as... What's that got to do with it? Well, you see, Josh... Hold it, sir. Let me you. Oh, nothing, Josh. But that girl, Doris, was certainly pretty. What? In love with Amos, I understand. What are you trying to do? Leave her out of it. Well, that's a little hard to do in the present situation. This is our town, not yours, mister. Because you'd been putting on the dog for her, too, isn't that right? Get him out of here before In fact, you murdered her, didn't you? Why, you meddling, Josh! Oh, no. Well, you're quite a temper. Did you kill her, Josh? You still haven't told us anything. What time did you get up this morning, Josh? Usually out in the fields early, both of you. But which one was first? Oh, come on, Sheriff. Let him wait for his lawyer. Can't make a man talk, you know. No, but you can trip him up. We'd better work fast before you get a permanent puzzle thrown in your lap. Hey, where are you going? To start at the beginning where I came in. On a plate. Okay, Sam, how many items have we found now that are fake? Well, now, let me see. There's the Dresden doll, that's strictly Detroit. Uh-huh. And, and, and three plates out of the ten there on the wall. I'll go take a look through the other rooms, George. Okay. Now, let's stick to just the stuff we saw so far, Sam. That's all of it, I think, plus the early to bed, early to rise, and uh, uh, that pair over there. What's the total value, I mean? Of the fakes? Well, I don't get you. Oh, yes, you do, because each one called for an imitation, right? Well, sure, to match out the sets and so, so what's on. the total value of the fakes if they were real? Oh, oh, yeah. Well, say 150 times 3. And Dresden, of course, is higher prices. Oh, just in rough figures, please. Uh, $1,000? All told, 1200 maybe. Uh-huh. But that's not enough to go killing people over. I don't get what you're driving at. Don't you? Sam, maybe the reason Josh was mad at you the other day was because he really had no idea there were imitations in here. George, look at this. Oh, yeah, Brooksy. How much do you suppose this one's worth? What's that, a package? Yeah, all neatly wrapped up. It's almost a shame to open it. Let me see. Where'd you find it? It It's in the suitcase under the stairs. Oh, wait a minute. Take a look at this, Sam. Mmm, another plate. It's a real one, all right. It is, huh? Mm -hmm. And the initials on the suitcase are D.D. George... Doris Drury. Oh, say, she used to make trips every week to the city for the Higbee. Yeah, I know. All begins to fall into place, doesn't of it? Of course. She took things back and forth all the time. Well, her trips were for business. I mean, the Higbees wouldn't have known the difference. And she could have picked up imitations to replace things with. That's the idea. She was killed, but it was a crime of passion, a fight. Sam here started the ball rolling. He got Josh all upset. Josh told Amos. And if one of them found out what Doris was yeah, doing... Yeah, that's he'd... right. It'd be a pretty big blow. Especially to a middle-aged guy who thought he was the reason for lowered eyelashes from a good-looking young woman. And then he finds out she was stealing, and not even large amounts. It would... George, are the police all through here? Mm, what do you mean? Well, they were out of the house even before we came back, but just now I felt a draft behind me. Must be from the back hall. I, I, I'm getting out of here. 
Somebody's back there. I don't want any part of this. Listen. Come on. Be, 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 be careful, Valentine. Why? There's only one person that can be. All right, Amos, come on. Get out of my way. Oh, no, you don't, Buster. Look out. Amos, the gentle one, huh? Well, maybe this will work. No. No, I, I, I don't know. Don't know what? Come on, what's your story going to be? No, 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 I, I won't tell you anything. But you were hiding here, and earlier you ran away. Your brother's already accused you of the murder, you know. What? What did you sure, say? Sure, he said you... No, no, wanna... no. I don't want to hear it. I won't tell you anything. Very good. Very fine. At least we got both of them, haven't we? Well, Sheriff, I tried one bluff on Amos, but it didn't work. Don't worry. I'll keep them separate, all right. And I suppose sooner or later we can cross-check and break down their stories. We hope. Well, the attorney's going to kill me if I hand it to him this way. It's going to be one for King Solomon. Mm-hmm. Twins are identical in appearance. One of them committed murder. The other one is keeping quiet to protect him. And keeping quiet so neither one can be tried for first-degree murder. Holy smoke, you can't hang two men when only one did it. What's the court going to do? End up by saying they both aided and abetted a criminal? Lawyers could argue it'll doomsday. Uh-huh. Hey, Sheriff, would you trust me? No. No, oh, I don't know. What do you mean? <laughs> I always wanted to play King Solomon. Why? Because he had a thousand wives? No, never mind. Just give me those keys, will you? Give you what? Your cell keys. Then meet me back out at the Higby's. Don't worry, your deputy Pete can take. Now, look, I want those guys kept apart. The only way we're ever going to saw this twin act in half you is... You want the murder solved, don't you? Okay, let's throw a little party. <laughs> Sit here, Josh. I'll be right back. Why not? It's my own driveway, isn't it? Yeah, sure. Come on, Brooksy. George, are you sure you know what you're doing? I want to get Mrs. Parsons. I'll get her. You stay there and Give watch. Hey, Pete. Yeah, right behind you, Mr. Valentine. Come on over here, please, will you? What about Amos here? I can't leave him alone. Come on, I said. Step on it. Well, yeah, okay. Get the sheriff's in the house already, but... Hey, that's Sam over there. Yeah, yeah, both of you. Come on, step on it. George, you can't even see the cars from here, let alone the Higby. Hey, listen. That was a car door. They're getting together. Say, look, Stand I better... still, will you? I know this is all against police practice, but there's a reason. Mr. Valentine? Yeah, Mrs. Parsons. Over here. Come on out. I want you to take a look at something. I'm sorry. I got a job. Those two backs there, my shoes are taken. Hey, by. wait, wait. They're handcuffed, aren't they? Oh, for the love of... Bring her over, Brooksy. George, no, look. The Higbys aren't in the car. Where are they? Hey, stop, you guys. Sam. There's one of them after Sam. Oh, get away from me! Sheriff! George, help him! Hey, hey, you... How Josh came at me, Mr. Valentine? You put Mrs. Parsons up to it, you sniveling little wash. Both of you, will you? What is all this? Mrs. Parsons, can you tell these two men apart? Oh, I'm so sorry, Amos. Of course I can. Josh, I didn't mean to. All right, now take it easy, please. I can tell them apart myself now. But you couldn't at a distance, I know that. Well, it's true. Josh may be a bit more aggressive than I am. Sure, Amos. And Josh jumped for Sam because Sam put Mrs. Parsons up to something. He what? Hey, now, looky here. I think the boys will talk now, Sheriff. How about it, Josh? Did you mean, did I kill her? No, I didn't. I don't believe that. See what I mean, Sheriff? Easy way out of a riddle. How about you, Amos? She was a very sweet girl. Why would I kill her? Oh, I'm so glad. I told you I didn't want to say anything, but... No. No, I still saw what I did. Sure. We're just as bad off as we were, Mrs. Parsons. But at least we know now that the Higbys kept quiet because they hadn't checked with each other yet. Uh, Now, wait a minute. Sam, get over there and stand beside them. Huh? You heard me. He's about our size. Now, Dolly, I I know you've known us for years, but you could have been mistaken about us. Hold it, all of you, please. I'm afraid this is pretty simple. There were a couple of tip-offs. I didn't think they were strong enough, but I guess they are. Josh, your secretary made weekly trips to the city, didn't she? Hmm. Well, that's right. You see, we got a lot of holdings and investments. Last night, she came back from the city. So if she were stealing some of that authentic china, she'd scarcely wrap one up and leave it in her suitcase until next week's trip. Hey, that's right. In other words, somebody planted that there after the police left the house. So we'd think Doris was a thief. 
So we get the wrong idea about motive. What's all this stealing plates? I don't even know what you're talking about. Take it about. easy, Josh. Take it easy. You couldn't have done it anyway. You were in jail. Besides, it was too neatly wrapped. What's that? <laughs> well, I couldn't wrap a plate that neatly. I doubt if any man could. Uh, Mr. Valentine, I... Uh, uh, except a dealer in those things? Now, now, wait a minute. Oh, I, I... know, Amos. I thought of that. But there's another clue. Same type. Mrs. Parsons, you bake cakes on order, don't you? So uh, I guess you haven't too much money. She's all right, Mr. Valentine. And you've lived here for years, been in and out of the Higby's house. You could have stolen a few things, couldn't you? Not much, but enough to help out. I saw somebody out the window. I was at my kitchen window. Nobody else out here but you and the Higby brothers. So you grabbed at the straw of being a witness. I was And it might have worked, too. Only this was a real crime of passion, wasn't it? The pretty young thing from the city, sure, primping and getting all the eyes. She was awful. Oh, no, she wasn't. But the Higbys have a lot of money. And I guess she might have had her cap set for one of them. Anyway, she'd be rough competition for a middle-aged widow. No! Well, what happened? She decided you were a nuisance? She find out about the plates and threaten to tell the Higbys? No, no, she didn't. And she wasn't any good for them. Oh, cut it out, lady. The girl had come downstairs to talk to somebody. Josh and Amos always went out to work early. She came down in a bathrobe with curlers in her hair. Well, did you ever see a woman who was trying to make an impression come downstairs with curlers in her hair looking like a mop to meet a man? Oh, George, that poor Mrs. Parsons. Well, she committed murder, didn't she, Angel? So come on, let's get out of here. We can figure the rest on the way home. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. Pretty easy to see how it happened, I guess. Yeah, sure. Living next door for years and years. Probably considered the Higby brothers her private property. Hope to marry one of them. <laughs> Then along came Alana Turner. The only thing I don't understand is why Mrs. Parsons would steal from them. Considered their property hers, too, I guess. Jumping on a gun on what she hoped for the future, maybe. It wasn't much through the years, but she yeah. probably... Yeah, she must have been panic-stricken when the girl found out about it. You know, George, sometimes you're very brilliant. All those feminine-type clues, wrapping packages, curlers and hair. That surprise you? Huh. Well, your secret, Angel. I spent a good many years observing women. Imagine. Oh, but you should have caught on to that business. No, no, not I. I've spent all my time observing men. Oh. We ought to get together sometime. Now, there, Fred. There's an observation. You have just heard Blue Plate Special, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now, this is yours truly, inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective Sherlock Holmes. You know, the lives of Holmes and Watson were not always filled with action. They spent many a quiet evening at home in Baker Street, discussing the problems of the world over a glass of port. 
You know, it seems that no wine is more expressive of friendship and hospitality than port. And I'm sure there's no port wine more enjoyable than Petri California port. Try a good glass of Petri port after dinner some evening, or any time you get together with your friends. You'll love the rich, ruby-red color of that Petri port. You'll love its smoothness and full body, its remarkable and wonderful flavor. A flavor that comes straight from the heart of luscious, hand-picked grapes. Serve that Petri port alone or serve it together with cake or cookies or with fruit. Yes, and serve it proudly. You can because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now I'm sure our old friend Dr. Watson's expecting us. Let's tap on his study door. Come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Come over here by the fire. I was just having a cup of coffee. Would you care to join me? Thanks. That'd be nice. Uh, it'll prevent you falling asleep during my story tonight. <laughs> There's no chance of that, Doctor. From the hints you gave us last week, it sounded like quite a story. It began in a circus in Paris, you told us? Yes, my boy, the circus. A colorful world of sawdust and spangles. A world, Mr. Bartell, that I may tell you confidentially... Always held an irresistible fascination for me when I was a youngster. Me too, Doctor. In fact, when I was eight years old, I fell desperately in love with a, with a lady bareback rider. A stunning creature who wore pink silk tights with gold sequins on them. Unfortunately, my mother caught me writing her proposal of marriage, and I'm afraid that, uh, well, that's another story, and one that you probably wouldn't find very interesting. <laughs> I'm sure I would, Doctor, but... I think it would be safer to stick to your Sherlock Holmes yes, story. Yes, you're probably right, my boy. Well, it was a winter in the 1890s, and Holmes and I were in Paris. On our second day there, Holmes suggested we attend that night's performance of the Cirque Royale. Needless to remark, I was delighted, Mr. Bartell. And shortly after nine o'clock that night, I found myself seated beside Holmes in a box near the ringside. It was an incredibly vivid scene, even for that city of color and light. The gay costumes of the women and the gaudy trappings of the ringmasters and clowns looked like a giant kaleidoscope under the blazing glare of the arc lamps. As we sat there, a brass band nearby blared forth some popular music of the day, and yet he didn't appear to be enjoying himself. And so I leaned across and touched his arm. Hmm. What is it, Watson? Well, you're very quiet, Holmes. Aren't you having a good time? A good time, oh, I suppose, old chap. I was just wondering where Mr. Edwards is. Mr. Edwards? Who, who's he? An extremely distinguished client who was to meet us in this box at nine oh, o'clock. Oh, client. So this little excursion was on business. After all, yes, I might have known it. No worry, old fellow. In your case, I think you'll be able to combine quite a little pleasure with the business. Well, can't you be a little more explicit, Holmes? Shh, shh. Here comes the ringmaster. La grande vedette du cirque, Mademoiselle Giselle Girondet, équestrienne incomparable. Giselle Girondet, yes, I've heard of her. She's a bareback rider, isn't she? Nice right? and France, old fellow. She also has quite a reputation as a femme fatale. Three duels have been fought over her. A young English officer in the Grenadier Guards committed suicide last year because of her. And a famous French banker is at present languishing in prison because her extravagances drove him to appropriate funds that did not belong to him. Yes, Watson, she's an extremely colorful personality. You know, Holmes, the funny thing, when I was eight years old, I fell violently in love with a lady bareback rider. She wore pink silk tights with golden sequins on them, but uh, unfortunately... Yes, she is, old fellow. Yes, she is. Look at the way she's jumping from the back of one horse to the other. Sheer poetry of motion. The lady appeals to Watson. By George, yes, indeed she does. In fact, Holmes, I don't mind telling you that if I weren't a married man and a yeah, poor you'd like man... like to court the lady, eh? Uh, yes, I, I should be. Excellent, Oh, excellent. That's the very reason for our attendance at the well, What in heaven's name are you talking about, Holmes? 
Ah, there you are. Good evening, Mr. Edwards. Holmes, my dear fellow, how are you? I haven't seen you since, uh, since that little affair at Windsor Castle when Mother... Uh, excuse me, sir. I am Mr. Mycroft, and this is my friend, uh, Sir William Nigel. William Nigel? Oh, of course, of course. And I am Mr. Edwards. We must uh, respect each other's incognitos, eh? How do you do, Sir William? Oh. Uh... Well, I'm extremely honored to meet you, Your, your Royal, uh, 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 Mr. Edwards. How'd you like Giselle? Isn't she a stunning creature? Yes, indeed she is, sir. They've all of us to have supper together after the performance tonight, I understand, Mr. Edwards. Well, unfortunately, I can't be there, Mycroft. There's some stupid affair at the embassy which I have to attend. We must postpone the dinner until tomorrow night. Oh, very well, sir. Uh, come over to my hotel a little early and we can discuss the whole business. Personally, I think a lot of fuss is being made about nothing. Now, if you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I must go back and see Giselle for a moment and tell her that I can't keep our appointment for tonight. I'll see you tomorrow, Mycroft. Good night, Sir William. Good night. Good night, uh, good sir. Night, sir. Et maintenant, pour votre plaisir, les frères Salini, les jongleurs internationales. Holmes, what's all this mystery? That wasn't Mr. Edwards, it was the Prince of... Shh, Watson, please. Discretion, old fellow. Mr. Edwards, as you know, is extremely democratic. Too much so, possibly, when one considers his position and responsibilities. He's become quite seriously involved with Mademoiselle Giselle, the lady bareback rider who has just left the ring. Oh, so that's it. The Foreign Office, quite naturally, I suppose, is deeply concerned over the matter. And I've been entrusted with the delicate mission of protecting Mr. Edwards. Oh, does Giselle Gironde know that his true identity, do you suppose? That's the first thing that we have to find out. It's possible that she is simply captivated by having a rich Englishman at her feet. If on other hand, uh, she knows who Mr. Edwards is, then we may be in for a great deal of trouble. Yes, but how are you going to find that out? By tempting her with a richer Englishman. And one with a title. That, my dear fellow, is why you are Sir William Nigel. You mean that... Uh, your I... job, old what? fellow, is to do your utmost to steal Giselle Gironde from Mr. Edwards. But, uh, well, I, I don't even know the girl. We shall remedy that defect in a few minutes. As soon as the performance is over, my dear chap, I shall take you to her dressing room and arrange an introduction. I must say, Holmes, the backstage life at a circus is even more colorful than in the ring. What makes you say that, old fellow? Well, I just saw Pinhead having tea with a, a bearded lady while a sword swallower was standing behind him practicing his act. Oh, hello. See that man standing talking to the girl in tights? Yeah, attractive, isn't he? Uh, the gentleman is Inspector Bernay of the French police, an old friend and a distant relative of mine. Bernay! How are you? Ah, well, <laughs> mon cher ami, comment ça no, no, va? No, 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 Bernay, please. On this occasion, my name is Mycroft, if you don't mind, and this is my friend, Sir William Nigel. How do you do, Inspector? Enchanté, Sir William. Uh, permit me to introduce Mademoiselle Yvette Marat. How you do? How do you do, Mademoiselle? How do you do? Uh, uh, what brings you behind the scenes at the circus, may I ask, mon cher Mycroft? Uh, my friend, Sir William, is most anxious to make the acquaintance of Mademoiselle Gironde. But of course, every man wishes to meet Giselle Gironde. Why not ask Bernay? He will present you to her. Ha! In another way. Oh, now, Yvette, chérie, do not begin that all over again. You are in love with her. You have always been in love with her. I, I, I wish you were dead. Sometimes I... Sometimes I think I could kill her myself. <laughs> On my soul, Inspector, she's a fiery little thing, isn't she? Ah, ça c'est vrai, ça, Sir William. <laughs> Many times I've told her that Giselle Gironde would never waste her time with a simple police inspector. Uh, uh, she prefers a wealthy foreigner. But Yvette ne comprend pas. She does not understand and she does not believe. Mademoiselle Nara was dressed in tights, Berne. And what does she do in the circus? Uh, she walks the tightrope. Oh, She's yes, a queen of the high wire. Mm -hmm. A charming and a talented girl, but a most, most, most jealous one. Uh, Berne, my distinguished friend, Sir William Nigel, is most anxious to meet Giselle Gironde. Uh, will you introduce him? I should prefer not to appear on the matter at this stage. Oh, Miss Certainement. I, I will take you to her dressing room. Uh, please come with me, Sir William. Yeah, right. I'll, I'll see you later, Holmes. I'll be waiting for you, old chap. Good luck. Hey, uh, you're a lucky man, Sir William. Giselle has quite a penchant for the Englishmen. And when they are rich and have a title, I am sure she finds them irresistible. <laughs> you really think so? Oh, but of course. Ah, quel dommage that I'm only a poor policeman. Ah, uh, here we are. Entrez. Giselle, mon chou, permit me to present to you Sir William Nigel. 
He's a great admirer of yours. Yes, indeed, madam. Ah, Sir William Nigel. Come and sit here beside me, Sir William. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, shall leave you. Au revoir. Uh, sit closer. There. That is much more cozy, no? Oh, it's very nice of you to see me, Mademoiselle Gironde. Oh, don't <laughs> be so formal, my Englishman. You may call me Giselle, and I shall call you... Let me see, I shall call you Sir William... Na Willie! I shall call you Willie! You do not mind? <laughs> Mine, I, I it's very delightful. Quite delightful, my dear. I was hoping perhaps that you'd care to have a little, little supper with me tonight, Giselle. <laughs> Uh, so what about some, some oysters, a cold pheasant, and a bottle or two of Pomery and Green 072? They get to taste rather well, don't you think? Oh, Willie, <laughs> I can see you are perfect. Oh, toast. I don't know about One that. One more, I get my clock. Uh, well, you, you know, you know it, it, it's a funny thing. What is a funny thing, Willie? When I was eight years old, I fell violently in love with a, a lady bareback rider of a circus. History seems to be repeating its... Here. I feel Pierre. Do you no longer knock when you come to my door? Who is this man? My name is Nigel, Sir William Nigel, my good man. And who may you be? I am Alfio Alfieri. I am Alfio Alfieri. And what is he? Huh. A trainer of wild animals. An ambassador. What do? You must not speak to Alfio in that way. You belong to me. Send this stupid Englishman away. You found it impudent? Of course, yes. Yeah. Belong to you. She said belong to no one. Do I have to take my whip uh, to put you? Put down that way. Put it down, you scoundrel. <laughs> That's the time it will be your face, Carl. You me. infernal blackguard. Raising your hand against a woman. Shocking. Bravo. Monsieur Willie has knocked him down. Uh, he certainly deserved it. Oui. And you in turn deserve something, Willie. Oh, what was that? Come close, Willie. And I give it to you. A little kiss. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thanks awfully. <laughs> So strong, so resolute, so brave. Oh, it was nothing, my dear Giselle. Nothing at all here. More champagne, Gus. More champagne. Oh, Willie! Really? Giselle? Oui, Monsieur Edwards? I have a box for the opera tomorrow night. I was hoping that perhaps... Oh, I'm sorry, monsieur, but my time is occupied. I am showing the delights of Montmartre to mon cher Willie. Mademoiselle est mieux le collier de perles à cinq rangs ou celui à trois rangs? He says, which do I prefer? The five-string color pearls or the three-string color pearls? What does my Willie think? So that you can't hang too many pearls on a pretty neck like yours. I'll take the five-string collar, my good fellow. You're doing splendidly, Watson, splendidly. Yes, but Holmes, I felt such a blasted fool handing that jeweler fellow a check. Signed by Sir William Nigel. Are you quite sure that it'll oh, be on Oh, don't worry, old fellow. Remember who our client is. Money is the least important concern in this matter. On with the masquerade, old fellow. On with the masquerade. More champagne, Gasson. Willie, you are such a headstrong boy. <laughs> More champagne. Citadel, you dear little thing. Oh, <laughs> Good evening, Bernay. Has Mademoiselle Gironde come into the evening performance yet? Yes, Monsieur Holmes. I escorted her to her dressing room half an hour ago. Uh, Monsieur Edwards is in there with her now. At last, it seems, she has used for a poor policeman. Last night, she found a threatening letter on her makeup table. Since then, she has been most grateful for my company. A threatening letter, eh? Any idea who might have sent it? Oh, yes, of course. I'm afraid I have, Miss Holmes. Uh, I told her to pay no attention. Uh, by the perfume of the notepaper, I recognized the sender. A jealous tightrope walker called Yvette Marat. Oh. <laughs> poor Yvette. She would make a very inferior criminal, I'm afraid. 
Still, Giselle asked me to stay outside her dressing room till the performance starts. Uh, uh, you wish to see her? Uh, yes. Oh, good evening, Mr. Edwards. Evening, Mycroft. Evening, Inspector Werner. Uh, come on, sir, Mr. Edwards. Look here, Mycroft. I think this little game's gone far enough. Giselle has just refused another invitation of mine. Now, I know who Sir William Nigel is, and I swear I'll tell her. Uh, don't you think, sir, that the lady is hardly worth bothering about? Surely this whole incident with Sir William proves that she's a scheming little adventuress. A fictitious title and an apparently bottomless purse have shown her up in her true colors. <laughs> I could have told you the same thing without such an experiment, my friend. Well, I suppose you're right, Mycroft. I've been a fool. An idiot who lets a pretty ankle turn his head. A conceited dope. <laughs> Let us just say, monsieur, that you have been a man. Uh, good evening, sir. Oh, good, evening. Watching, good evening. Good evening. Uh, just going back to see Giselle for a moment, I brought us these flowers for her. Oh, I'll be back in a jiffy. Uh, just a minute, Watson. I, uh, I hate to dampen your ardor, old chap, but uh, the masquerade is ended. Ended? What, what do you mean? It's it is no ended. longer necessary for you to impersonate Sir William Nigel or to pay court to Giselle. Oh, really? Oh, 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 really? Really? Well, that's a, that's a great relief, sir. Great relief. I'll take it the whole business. Oh, yes, yes, I'm sure you have. Uh, we um, appreciate the sacrifices that you've made, don't we, Sir Edward? Yes, yes, indeed. Well, I must go back and see her once more, though. We had a rendezvous for tonight, and I must cancel it. A gentleman thing to do, you know. Um, I, I won't be a minute. <laughs> Never have I seen a man more downcast. Obviously, with him, my dear Holmes, business was a pleasure. Alfieri! Where are you going? That Englishman. I just saw him go into Giselle's room. To whom are you referring? That the man that called himself Sir William Nigel. Oh, yes. Two days ago he strike me. I have to settle with him. No man may strike Alfieri. Do not cause any more trouble, Alfieri. From what I've been told, you thoroughly deserved what happened uh, to you. Here he come now. You English, you! Alfieri challenge you to a duel. Holmes! Holmes! What's no chap? What is it? You're as white as a ghost. It's... it's Giselle. What's wrong with her? She's dead. She's lying there in her dressing room. Strangled. Strangled. And only half an hour ago I spoke with her myself. Since then I've been standing in this corridor, guarding her door at her own request. Only two men have entered Giselle's dressing room since then. You, Monsieur Edwards, and you, Sir William Nigel. What are you suggesting, Vernet? I am suggesting nothing. I am stating that these two gentlemen are under arrest for suspicion of murder. Dr. Watson's unusual story will continue in just a few seconds. Time I'd like to take to remind you that one wine that seems to be the outstanding favorite among the ladies is Petri California Muscatel. That's probably because, like a beautiful woman, Petri Muscatel is subtle and intriguing. Petri Muscatel is the color of burnished gold. And its flavor, well, it's the flavor of big, plump Muscat grapes. Picked by hand, carefully and tenderly, and they're just full of wonderful, delicious juice. If you want to show that you really know the wine that women prefer, serve Petri Muscatel. Serve it after dinner or later in the evening. It's wonderful. And why shouldn't it be? It's a Petri wine. Well, Dr. Watson, so you and the mysterious uh, Mr. Edwards got yourselves arrested on suspicion of murder, huh? Yes, Mr. Bartell. Holmes did everything in his power to persuade Inspector Vernet to release us, but it was useless. And so, while Mr. Edwards and myself were languishing in detention cells, the local Sûreté, Holmes, and the French inspector were examining the dressing room of the dead woman. I'm, in sh I'm sure, Inspector Vernet, that uh, being as keen a detective as you are, you must suspect the true identity of Mr. Edwards. Of course, Mr. Holmes. But that is the danger of incognitos. If he chooses to assume the identity of plain Monsieur Edwards, then he must run the risks of plain Monsieur Edwards. And you are convinced that either he or my friend strangled Mademoiselle Gironde? It is obvious. Then I'll have to prove to you that they didn't. Let me examine the body again. No. If she had been strangled by either of my friends, why would her body be lying here under the window? It's as far away from the door by which they left this room as possible. That proves nothing. No, but it's odd. Giselle was a strong girl. Uh, there might easily have been a struggle. Uh, perhaps she tried to get away through the window. And yet there are no marks of violence on her throat. Just this piece of very fine cord that did its deadly work so cleanly. Mm -hmm. Cut with a knife. Uh, please do not remove the cord, Monsieur Holmes. The body has not yet been photographed. Jeremy Vernet, you're making it very hard for me, aren't you? Uh, you notice, of course, that the window is open. Yes, but we have examined the snow outside. 
There were no footprints within three yards of the window. The murderer must have entered by the door that I was watching. Yes, it would be hard, even for a professional acrobat to jump in. An acrobat? Bernie, your young friend, Mademoiselle Yvette Marat, is a tightrope walker. Yvette, but... Yes, yeah, she's certainly had a motive. She'd even sent a threatening letter. I heard her express hatred and jealousy for this dead woman. It's conceivable that she could enter a room by a window without leaving footprints in the snow. Where was she at the time of the murder? I do not know. I was waiting for her in the corridor. And I suggest that we investigate her alibi at once. And after that, Inspector, I must pay a visit to the Surte. I don't want my friends to think that I've deserted them. Excuse me, sir. Yes, Holmes. I'm afraid it looks rather black. As I was telling you, Yvette Marat, the tightrope walker was able to establish a completely satisfactory alibi. Vernet still suspects you or Dr. Watson. Well, that's ridiculous. May I ask you a very straightforward question, sir? Of course. I can well understand that if you had gone into the dressing room and found the woman already murdered, you might easily be tempted to conceal the fact, to avoid a scandal involving your person. Will you swear to me, sir, on your true identity, that Giselle was alive when you left her? She was, Holmes. I swear it. Thank you, sir. That's all I wanted to know. I'm glad to see you. You know, I've been thinking. All this depends on Vernet's evidence. But supposing he was the murderer. He told us that Giselle had turned him down, you know. I thought of that, but Mr. Edwards swears that Giselle was alive when he left the room. And yet that means that Mr. Edwards... Oh, no, 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 no. It's unthinkable. Holmes, you're not suggesting... Holmes, if I thought that that were possible, I'd confess to the murder myself. My life wouldn't matter if... If it had saved us cattle like that, great Scott, it it would shatter the empire. Dear old Watson, you will not sacrifice yourself. You're as valuable a British institution as the lion himself. No, my dear fellow. We shall never sacrifice you, not while my mind is still capable of... My mind? That's it. Thank you, Watson. You've given me the answer. Holmes, what are you burbing about Be patient, old fellow. In half an hour, you'll be out of this cell and the real murderer will be in it. Questions, questions. Why must Alfieri answer so many questions? Because he will not yet tell the truth. You murdered Giselle Gironde. How many times I have to tell you I did not kill her? Why should I want to arm her? Because you were jealous. Because she humiliated and tormented you. But I was not in her dressing room. I've already proved that fact. Am I a magician that I can kill somebody without entering a room? Alfieri, I know how you killed Giselle Gironde without its necessitating your entering this room. Uh, you're a very smart man. Please, to tell me. I don't need to tell you. With the aid of Bernay, I'll show you. Open the window, Alfieri. Uh, what game is this? Very well, then. I'll open the window myself. Put your head out. Come on. So. Uh. Who do you see? Inspector Vernet, standing three yards away, where you stood, and he's got your long training whip. No, no! Don't move! Stand there, the inspector hasn't your skill with a whip, but he wants to try a little experiment. No, leave him alone! All right, Vernet, I'm holding him! Well, Mr. Edwards, I, I mean, well, sir, this is a, a pleasant change from a prison cell, isn't it? It certainly is. <laughs> Holmes, I can't tell you how grateful I am. I still don't quite understand how you did it. Watson, in uh, rather a roundabout way, was responsible for giving me the clue. Oh, how was that, Holmes? Well, on more than one occasion, old chap, I've had cause to deploy a rather florid style of writing. Tonight, I was very thankful for it. Uh, when I began to speak of the capabilities of my mind... Uh, suddenly I remembered a phrase of yours in which you referred to uh, its whip-like rapidity and accuracy. That, of course, made me think of Alfieri, the animal trainer. Exactly how did he kill the poor girl? Uh, well, sir, he stood outside the window, uh, far enough away to leave no incriminating footprints. Called to Giselle, probably persuaded her to lean out, then snapped the whip around her neck, pulling it tight and strangling her. Well, then I suppose he cut the cord and let the body fall back into the room. Precisely, old fellow. We found a whipstock among his tackle, a whipstock from which the lash had been cut. The stub of lash left matched the cord around the dead girl's throat. Amazing business. 
I don't mind telling you, fellas, I'm very thankful to be through with it. Yes, so am I, sir. In fact, I wouldn't be at all surprised if this whole incident cures me of my love of circuses. Oh, I didn't know you had a predilection in that direction, Watson. Oh, oh, oh yes, sir. Yes, you don't mind my saying so. Uh, uh, when he was eight years old, he fell in love with a lady bareback rider. <laughs> didn't you, Watson? <laughs> Indeed. What happened? Well, sir, I, I don't remember her name, but she wore pink silk tights with the golden sequins on them. And I wrote her a rather hot-headed letter. Unfortunately, my mother... Well, Doctor, that was one of the most unusual stories you've ever told. And, and I might say you played a very prominent part in that case yourself. Oh, I suppose I did it. That, Mr. Bartell, Giselle was a beautiful girl. Beautiful. Boy, I sure love that nickname she gave you. Wheelie. Yes, I thought it was rather nice myself. Well, that is, uh, I, I, I mean... I... <laughs> Don't get embarrassed over a nickname, Doctor. You should hear the nickname I had. When I went to school, all the girls called me Bottles. Bottles? Oh, oh I see, from Bartell. Bartell? Bottle. <laughs> Some nickname, like a prophecy. What do you mean? Well, they called me Bottles, and now that's what I like to talk about most. Bottles. Bottles of Petri wine. Oh, I should have known. <laughs> and I'd like to talk about Petri wine because, as far as I'm concerned, it's the swellest wine that ever poured from a bottle. That's because the Petri family really knows how to make good wine. Well, they ought to. They've been making good wine ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And since the Petri family has always personally owned and operated their business, they've been able to keep that fine art of winemaking right in the family, handing it on down from father to son, from father to son, from generation to generation. So it's no wonder, whenever you want a good wine, you want a Petri wine, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you going to tell us about next well, week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you of a strange adventure that Holmes and I had in the swampy Fenlands of Norfolk. Concerns a gypsy encampment, a child that vanished, and a horrible death in the murky depths of a fearsome quagmire. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Three Students. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. <laughs> People who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company present <laughs> The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. It was Gilbert and Sullivan who said, quote, a policeman's lot is not a happy one, end quote. But tonight, just on the stroke of eight, Mike Shane, San Francisco's favorite ferreter of felonies, is seated in his apartment. He looks down on the bay at the masthead lights rising and falling with the swell as Phyllis, his easy-on-the-eyes associate, does things with eggs in the tiny kitchen, a kitchen which hangs like an eyebrow on the forehead of Telegraph Hill. 
Uh, yes, Angel? How's the shoulder? It's fine. Uh, that is... Uh, oh, it's pretty good. Why? Because uh, I think you're using it as an excuse to get me over here every night to fix your dinner. Well, Angel, some fellows have etchings. I use scrambled eggs. Uh-huh. Well, from tonight on, if I come over to your apartment, it's to be as a guest. You're going to do the cooking. Oh, Angel. I mean it. I'm through being a detective by day and a cook at night. All right, come and get it. Oh, boy. Uh, hello. Hi, Mike. Oh, hello, Inspector. What are you doing? Well, I was just going to sit down to a plate of scrambled eggs. Why? I got a body. <laughs> you sound like something out of a horror film instead of Inspector of Homicide. What kind of a body? It's been in the water a week or so. It looks like an accident. Autopsy's surgeon seems to think it was an accident. Sergeant here says it was an accident, but... Uh, you think it's murder? Could be, Mike. Where are you? You know where Olium is? Right on San Pablo Bay? Yes. I'll have the police boat pick you up at the jetty. Oh, swell. The sergeant will pick you up as fast as he can get there. Well, uh, give me two more seconds. Two more seconds? Yes, Inspector. One second for each egg. <laughs> She is. Pull alongside. Are we going aboard that yacht? Yeah. The inspection aboard. Ah, it's a trim looking craft. Yeah, about 200,000 bucks worth. Hi there. Can you make it up the ladder or do you want a bosun's chair? Oh, half an hour aboard ship and he talks like an admiral. <laughs> we'll use the ladder, Inspector. Hmm. Oh, what's the matter, Angel? Can't cook his own dinner because of a bullet wound in the shoulder, but he can climb a ship's ladder. Well, I... Okay, okay, you go first, Mike. Okay. Well, kids, you made good time. Mm-hmm. Sergeant brought us up the bay as if he knew every wave. He does. Born and raised at San Rafael. <laughs> well, where's the body? On the engine room hatch. Mm-hmm. Any uh, wounds? One blow on the head. Which could have been made if he had fallen off the rocks. Water in the lungs? Yeah, Phil. Oh, so he was alive when he hit the water. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Dressed in sailor pants, a reefer jacket, scarf. Shoes don't look like a sailor's. Uh, what besides the shoes make you suspect murder, Inspector? A dead man's hands, Mike. No calluses. And the nails have been manicured. Mm. Sailors don't have soft hands and manicured nails. Oh, good work, Inspector. Good work. But uh, how come uh, you're aboard this ship? Is the owner aboard? No, Mike. But we've sent for him. We came aboard because the Bay Patrol found the body near the ship. And because of this. We found this note in the dead man's pocket. The North Star. Owner Nelson Carter. And this is the North Star? Yeah, Phil. Autopsy surgeon said the body has been in the water about ten days. Oh, it's pretty hard to identify him now. Any missing persons reported? I don't know. The sergeant checked with the missing persons bureau when he went back to pick you up. Yes, sir. Nobody reported missing, Inspector. Say, uh, who's aboard? I noticed the anchor light is trim and clear. No smudge on the glass. Must have been lighted tonight. That's right, Mike. Captain is aboard, also the quartermaster. Oh, I don't see any cabin light. No, Phil. The portholes are covered with heavy green curtains. Uh, did you uh, question the captain and the quartermaster? Yeah, Mike. Very noncommittal gents. Said they didn't know the dead man. Never seen him before. Didn't know anything about him, and then they both retired to their cabins. Well, that's a little suspicious, don't you think? Uh, not particularly. Well, most people are inquisitive, Inspector. Especially about anything that smells of murder. Inspector, did you search the ship? Yeah, they're doing quite a bit of repair work. Huh? Placing all the paneling in the stateroom and so on. Oh, uh, Inspector, did you take a look at the uh, ship's log? No. After all, Mike, we really haven't anything definite to go on. Not even a legitimate reason to suspect murder. I think we have. Well, so do I. Otherwise, I wouldn't have sent for you. But to try and tie the murder up with the captain or... With the ship, even. But I do tie it up with the ship, in a way. What do you mean, Mike? Point number one. We're agreed that this dead man isn't a sailor because of his hands. Uh -huh. Agreed. Point number two. We think that these sailors' clothes aren't his clothes, all except the shoes. Oh, yes, Mike, but I still don't see how Dead you... men can change clothes, Angel. Oh. So that suggests uh, violence. Now, take a look at the inside of that right trouser leg. Mm -hmm. You see that uh, smear of orangey red? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mike. So what? Well, that was made by red lead. The stuff they used to keep iron and steel from rusting. Go on, Mike. Now, take a look at these stanchions on the port side. 
freshly painted with red lead. I didn't notice that before. Well, neither did I until right now. But you'll notice, Inspector, that there's no trace of red lead on the inside of either of the dead man's shoes. I see what you mean. To get that smear on the pants legs, whoever was wearing those pants would be sure to get some on their shoes. Right, Inspector, if he were wearing them voluntarily. Now, that smear suggests that he was carried. So I give you a suggestion. The murdered man was stripped of his own clothes, then these sailors' clothes were slipped on him and he was dumped into the bay. And these sailors' clothes came from this ship? Yes, Inspector, yes, these clothes are from this ship. And for that reason, I think we should question our four suspects. Four suspects? I... I don't get you, Mike. Four suspects? Yes, yes. The captain, the quartermaster, the owner. Yeah. And the fourth? The fourth is the ship's carpenter. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the news you've all been waiting for. Post-war gasoline is here. Right now, as we speak these words, Union Oil Company's huge new 100-octane refineries are shifting to civilian production after long months of exclusive military service. That means that within a very few days, you'll be able to buy a new 76 gasoline that will knock your hat off. As fast as this new super gasoline can be blended, our trucks are hurrying it to your Minuteman stations. Some have it already. If your Union Oil Minuteman hasn't received his first shipment of this powerful new gasoline yet, he will within the next two weeks. And just as soon as he does, he'll post signs announcing its arrival in his station. Watch for these signs to go up. And then drive in for a real thrill. Your first tank full of the new 76 gasoline. Soon on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector are still aboard the yacht North Star. The dead man's body still lies on the engine room hatch as Mike knocks on the captain's cabin door. What do you want? This is the inspector of homicide. We'd like to talk to you again. Well, I won't say glad to see you because I'm not. I won't say sit down because I'm hoping you won't stay long. We've uh, sent for the owner, and I thought we could save time by asking you a few questions. Who are you? I'm Mike Shane, private detective. I don't know that I got to answer any of your questions. Oh, you don't, of course, but I'd like to ask one question anyway. Well? Where's your master's certificate? Why, you went And to... don't tell us it's in the chart house, because uh, we looked there. Now, Captain, you may not like to answer Mike's questions, but I think you'd better answer mine. Where is that certificate? Here in the drawer. I haven't had time to put it up yet. I only took over this ship yesterday. Oh, only yesterday, huh? Yes. I answered an ad in the paper. The man wanted a navigator to be captain of his private yacht. I got the job. What about the crew? Only well, need three. I'll pick them up in San Francisco tomorrow. What about your quartermaster? Is he a new man, too? Yes, I hired him yesterday. Ahoy there, North Star! Throw us a line! Here you are, Sergeant! Who have you got there, Sergeant? The ship's carpenter named Wilkinson. What about the owner, Carter? Couldn't you find him? No, he's down in South America. Been there for three months. What's that? I said the owner of the North Star has been in South America for the past three months. But that's impossible. I spoke to him a couple of days ago when he hired me. Uh, that's what Carter's secretary says, and he ought to know. I brought him along in case you wanted to ask any questions. Mm-hmm. Who else is that in the police launch? Well, the woman is Mrs. Carter. Um, has she heard from her husband lately? No, not for three weeks. Mike. Yes, Angel. You and I have the same idea. I'm beginning to have the same feeling, kid. Well, let's have the secretary up first and have him look at the body. What's his name? Jackson. Mr. Jackson, will you come up the ladder, please? I wonder... Yeah, Mike? I wonder if the ship's carpenter is one of the old crew or a new man. Did you know he's be one of the old crew? I didn't hire him. You want me, Sergeant? Uh, yes. This is Inspector of Homicide. How do you do? Mike Shane. Hello. Miss Knight. How do you do? I wonder if you'd come over this way, Mr. Jackson, to the engine room hatch. Okay, Sergeant. Oh, uh, well, that's... 
That's... Mr. Carter? Yes, that's Mr. Carter. Hmm. Inspector. Yes, Mike. I'd like to make a suggestion. Sure. I think we should take the body back to San Francisco. Yes? Then we should take everybody, and I mean everybody, to police headquarters. <laughs> Sit down, Mr. Ride. You're carpenter on the North Star. Yes, sir. Tell me, how long since you were aboard? Well, nigh three months, sir. Not since Mr. Carter left. Is that right? That's right, miss. Mm-hmm. Now, take a look at this reefer jacket. Hey. Hey, that's mine, sir. I left it in my bunk. And these pants? Mine, too. But there wasn't no red lead on them when I laid them on the bunk. Mm -hmm. Did Mr. Carter say anything to you about redecorating or repairing the paneling in the staterooms? No, miss, not to me, he didn't. And uh, you think he would have, if that's what he wanted done? Oh, I think so. But uh, Mr. Carter was always one to be full of surprises. He could have done it without saying anything to me. You don't know of any reason why anyone should want to kill him? Not me, sir. I didn't know anything about his private life. Only as the owner of the North Star. Did he and his wife use the North Star much? Oh, yes, quite a bit. Sailed a couple of times to a wire with her. Lots of trips to Vancouver, B.C. He was in the shipping business, you know. Yeah. Well, Mike, unless you have any more questions... Oh, yes, just one. Where was the North Star anchored the last time you were aboard? She was tied up at her own jetty, three miles northeast of Olium. Oh. So she's been moved in the past three months. Yes, miss. Out into the middle of the bay and about uh, three miles south. Uh -huh, I see. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Wright. The sergeant will show you out. And bring in Mrs. Carter, sergeant. Yes, sir. Sit down, Mrs. Carter. I know this has been quite an ordeal. You identified your husband? Yes, we suspect murder, Mrs. Carter. Have you any reason to suspect anyone? No, my husband hasn't... hadn't an enemy in the world that I know of. You thought he was still in South America? Well, yes, although I haven't had a letter for a month. I, I used to hear from him regularly every week. I suppose you inherit your husband's property, Mrs. Carter? I suppose I do. Half of it is mine anyway. I inherited it from my mother. Did, um... Did your husband say anything about repairing or redecorating the paneling in the salons? No. But that reminds me of something. Yes, Mrs. Carter? Well, I heard Mr. Jackson talking to someone on the phone the other day about paneling. I didn't know what he was talking about, but then I paid very little attention to my husband's business. I see. And you can't help us anymore? I'm sorry, but I I'm afraid not. I if I think of anything, I'll call you, Inspector. Thank you. The sergeant will show you out. Bring in the captain, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Uh, we may be out of call on you, Mrs. Carter. It might be necessary to search your husband's papers. Certainly, Mr. Shane. Sit down, Captain. Thanks. I take it that if you only took over command of the ship yesterday, you haven't given any orders? No, I spent yesterday and today checking supplies, looking over the ship's gear. You knew nothing about uh, the replacing of the salon paneling? Oh, yes, yes. The man I thought was the owner told me he was having it replaced and the workman already knew what to do. And this man that you thought was the owner, what did he look like? I don't know. I never saw him. But you said you spoke to him when he hired you. I spoke to him on the phone. Aha. Now we get somewhere. What was his phone number? I don't know. He called me. I wrote him an answer to his advertisement and put my phone number in the letter. He called me on the phone and told me to report aboard yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that's all you know? That's all I know. I saw the ad, answered it, and he told me the berth was mine. I came aboard, and that's that. Well, thanks a lot, Captain. I guess you'd better get back aboard ship. I'll wait for the quartermaster. I'm sure he doesn't know any more than I do. As you wish, Captain. You're quite certain that the quartermaster doesn't know anything. How can he? I picked him up on the waterfront this afternoon. He's only been aboard a few hours. I see. All right, Sergeant. We'll see Mr. Jackson next. Uh, just a second, Inspector. Yes, Mike. I think maybe we ought to take a trip out to Mr. Carter's home before we talk to Jackson. All right, Mike. Keep Jackson and the quartermaster till we get back, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Yes, Inspector. Get out into the cargo and see if the captain and Jackson or the quartermaster get to talking. Right, Inspector. Atta boy, Inspector. 
Uh, are you serious about going out to Carter's place? Well, yes, honey, why? Well, I've been following your advice, Mike. Yes, Angel? I've been listening to the tone of these voices. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think the captain is lying. Or at least not telling the whole truth. Why, Phil? Well, he said he hadn't given any orders since he went aboard. That's right. Yeah. He said he'd been checking stores and looking over the ship's gear, but... Well, then why who you... painted the stanchions with red lead? The captain? Those stanchions were still damp. Well, it takes red lead quite a time to dry, but Angel... Angel, I think you have something there. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know quite what it is, but you have something. <laughs> Thanks, Mrs. Carter, for waiting up for us. Oh, not at all. Naturally, I'm anxious to do anything I can to help find my husband's murderer. Hmm? I'm afraid I, I hardly realize he's dead. Yes, there isn't much we can say, Mrs. Carter, except that we'll get his murderer if anybody can. This is... this was my husband's office, his home office. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jackson always worked here when my husband was out of town. Mm -hmm. Well, we'd better check the desk first. Bill, you take the straw, Inspector. I, I don't know about shipping schedules. Say, Mike. Phil, yeah? hmm? what is it? Here's the North Star's clearance to leave her jetty on the an anchor in the bay, dated the twenty sixth of last month. Well, it might mean something. We'll uh, we'll remember that. Hey, what have you got there, Mike? Well. Something not quite on the up and up, I think. In the fireplace there? Uh-huh. Yeah. Burned envelopes and letters. Here, Inspector. Yeah. Here, if that isn't part of a Panama stamp... Panama? I don't... That's where my husband was when I last heard from him. Well, this was mail the 21st. Airmail. The last I received was the 18th. Mail the 21st, and the North Star changed her moorings on the 26th. Yes, Angel, yes. Just time to receive this letter and change the ship's moorings. Does that mean something? It uh, depends, Mrs. Carter. It depends. Inspector. Yeah, Mike? I think we should pay a visit to the North Star's jetty, three miles northeast of Oleum, as I remember it. <laughs> Rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, for the benefit of those who may have tuned in late, we are repeating the announcement made earlier in the program. Post-war gasoline is here. Union Oil Company's huge new 100-octane refineries have been shifted to civilian production after long months of exclusive military service. That means that within a very few days, depending on your locality, you'll be able to buy a powerful new 76 gasoline that beats all pre-war performance. As fast as this new super gasoline can be blended, our trucks are delivering it to your Minuteman stations. Some have it already. If your Union Oil man hasn't received his first shipment of this sensational new 76 gasoline, he will within the next two weeks. Just as soon as he does, he'll post signs announcing its arrival in his station. Watch for these signs to go up, and then drive in for a real thrill. Your first tank full of the new post-war 76 gasoline. Soon on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Watch for it. <laughs> Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector are facing one of their most baffling mysteries. A murder with apparently no motive and no clues. We pick them up at the jetty, where the North Star is usually tied up. Well, there's not a thing that I can see. Bare jetty. Odds and ends of rope, freshly painted stanchion. Yes, but everything connected with the North Star seems to lead to stanchion. What, what is it, Mike? Look, look, a piece of red glass. Looks like part of a ship's lantern. Port lantern. A natural deduction, Inspector, since we're on the jetty, but look again. Then look at the railing here. Hmm? A long scratch with paint rubbed into it? Yeah. A scratch made by an automobile bumper and rear fender. Yes. When the car was backed up to turn around, whoever was driving scuffed along the rail and broke this tail lamp glass. Uh, Sergeant. Oh, uh, yeah, my. Check with Mrs. Carter's car, Jackson's car, and uh, the captain's, if he has one. Yes, sir. Uh, Mike. But uh, first get hold of Chips. Chips? Uh, the ship's carpenter, Mr. Wright. Oh. Get hold of him and tell him to meet us aboard the North Star as quickly as possible. Yeah. And then? And then 
Then bring everybody back out to the ship, but not before you've checked all the automobiles. Yeah, Mike. And what's our move, Mike? Back aboard the North Star and lay a trap for a murderer. Constant creaking of the ship gets me. I think we're in luck. I don't believe the captain or the quartermaster are back on the boat. No, my captain said he was going to wait for the quartermaster, so they're both back at headquarters. Yeah, you're right. I forgot. What are you looking for, Mike? I don't know, but I'm giving these port stanchions the once over. Say. What? You see that dark stain on the deck? Yeah. Sure. What about it? You know what made that? No. Do you? No, but I'll make a good guess. Fresh water. Fresh water? Yes. Deck should always be washed down with salt water. It leaves them white and sparkling. Fresh water makes them dark. Yeah, but even so much. Shh, shh, shh. I hope this is Chips, our ship's carpenter. Oh, there! Oh, Scar! Yeah. Here's the line. Try up and come aboard. All right. All right, mate. Well, what can I do for you? Uh, tell me, what will dissolve red lead? Red lead? Why, oil will if it ain't too old. And you've got to scrape it. Uh, take a look at the stanchion. Oh, what? That off in no time. You've got oil aboard? Sure thing. Okay, let's get going. All right, sir. Now, now for a quick look at the salon. You know, this was a pretty cleverly conceived murder. If that body hadn't been found for a week or two, there would have been no trace of this murder at all. There isn't much trace even now, Mike. Uh, not enough for your district attorney or grand jury, but enough for me. And I think we can trap the murderer without too much difficulty. Well, this is the salon in here. Oh, what a beautiful place. Yes. Doesn't seem to me that the paneling needs redecorating. Uh-uh. But I tell you what it does look like, Mike. Yeah? Looks as if the paneling had been torn out in the search for something. The ship's safe, perhaps? Mm. Could be, or something hidden behind the paddling. There goes Chips. Uh, Why do you call him Chips? His name is Wright. All ship's carpenters are called Chips. At least in the books I read. Well, here we are. I found these rags in the captain's cabin. Good. Look like they've been used for the same job before. Let me see those. Hmm. Blood? I think so. Here, use this one. All right, sir. This is going to make a mess of the deck, though. Uh, that's all right. All right. Do, do I hear a boat coming? Yeah, I hear it too, Phil. Hurry, Chips, hurry. Get some more of that red lead off. All right, sir. I'm going like the roaring 40s, I am. Ah, that's the stuff. You got it down to the old paint there in spots. He was right off when it's still soft this way. Ahoy, the star! Tie up and come aboard, Sergeant. Bring everybody aboard with you. I think this ought to do it. Well, now I want to. Let us see. Hey, 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 what's going on there? You'll ruin that deck. I think this deck's already been ruined, Captain. But let that go for a moment. The uh, inspector had you all brought out here to see what we were doing. Yeah, what are you doing? We're taking off the last few layers of red lead that somebody put on this stanchion. Now, would you know who did it? You did it, Captain? You've been aboard two days and this red lead was still soft and wet. Could it have been put on without your knowing about it? Red lead often takes a week to dry. That stanchion hasn't been painted since I came aboard. That stanchion is the clue to this killing. What do you mean? Mr. Carter was killed aboard his own ship. Oh, Mr. He was probably hit on the head with a marlin spike, but that's beside the point. The main point is that while his killers were changing his clothes, putting the ship's carpenter's clothes on him, he bled quite a bit. Some blood was spattered on the deck. The killers tried to clean that with fresh water. Yeah. Then they were afraid that some of his blood was on the freshly painted stanchion. So after they'd thrown his body overboard, they repainted the stanchion. But not before they got a smear of red lead on the pants leg as they heaved him overboard. Oh, but who would do such a thing? My husband... The captain, for one, Mrs. Carter, and I think the sergeant has the answer to the other. Right, sergeant? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Mike, we found the car. The car? What car? Yes, Captain, the car which was used to take Mr. Carter out to the jetty while the North Star was still tied up there. That car has a broken taillight and a badly scraped fender. And it is where, Sergeant? In Mr. Jackson's garage. Jackson, you fool, I told you... Shut up, you idiot. Cut out the arguing. You'll need all the arguments you can scrape together when you face the jury. Okay, Sergeant, you can handle them. Tastes good. Nearly six in the morning and I'm hungry. You know, I was afraid that the inspector wasn't going to get a confession from those two, the captain and Jackson. They were tough monkeys. Oh, not so tough, really. 
They had just spent so much time plotting and carrying out this murder that they, they couldn't realize they were trapped. Oh, such a senseless murder, too, Mike. All murders are senseless, honey. But I don't think they started out with the idea of murder in mind. As I see it, the secretary of Jackson had uh, made several trips on the North Star. He knew that wherever they went, Mr. Carter always had plenty of ready cash. Mm. He just got the idea in the back of his head that the money was hidden somewhere on board. He didn't know where, but... Uh, when Carter went to Central and South America, he determined to make a haul. Mm. So when the crew was on vacation, he got together with this man who called himself the captain. They started taking the salon apart, huh? Right, Angel, right. Jackson needed someone who knew something about ships. And then when he saw from the mail that Carter was coming home, he, he got panicky and destroyed the letters to Mrs. Carter? Mm-hmm. He met the unsuspecting Carter when he arrived, took him out to the jetty where the North Star was berthed, set out into the middle of the bay and killed him. Ah, oh, dressing him in the carpenter's clothes so if he were found, nobody could identify him. Mm-hmm. I see. Have some more coffee, Mike? Sure thing, Angel. How's the shoulder after the night's excitement? Oh, pretty good, but I still think you'll have to come over for a few nights and fix dinner for me. I will not. You can eat out if you're too lazy to fix your own dinner. You know, I've been thinking, Mike. Yes, Angel? Wouldn't it be nice to have a yacht like the North Star and go any place, any time you wanted to? Oh, I don't know. Look what happened to Mrs. Carter. She lost her husband on account of the North Star. <laughs> of course, darling. I don't have a husband. Well, don't give up hope, Angel. Now, if you were to fix my dinners for the next few weeks... Mike Shane, I believe that's all you think about in a wife, a good cook. Oh, no, Angel, not quite. But uh, being a good cook is a good recommendation. <laughs> Before we sign off, I'd like to repeat the special announcement made earlier in the program. Post-war gasoline is here. As fast as Union Oil Company's trucks can haul it, a powerful new 76 gasoline is being delivered to your Minuteman stations. Watch for the signs to go up at all Union Oil stations announcing the first shipment of the new 76 gasoline. Then drive in for a real thrill. Your first tank full of powerful post-war gasoline, soon on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Watch for it. Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Written and produced by David Taylor, tonight's story was based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Charles Dan. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective Sherlock Holmes. It began on a, on, a, on a summer evening in 1906. I'd been for a long walk in the park. I remember when I returned to Baker Street and entered our rooms. Holmes looked up at me with a twinkle and, uh, and spoke. You look positively glowing with health, Watson. Well, I had a splendid walk, my dear fellow. You should have come with me. The park was looking particularly beautiful. Well, well chap, during our absence, I've decided to write another monograph. Oh, well, what's the subject this time? Occupational liability to murder. For instance, the mortality rate is naturally high among policemen and detectives. Physicians are murdered with fair regularity, but the murder of a dentist is rare. And who ever heard of a murdered 
veterinary surgeon. That's quite true, but what's the occasion for this little homily? I've been browsing over my newspaper clippings. Yeah? You recall ever hearing of a murdered tobacconist, Watson? No, no, I can't say that I do. Oh, I... And yet my clippings inform me that no less than three tobacconists have been murdered in the past six months and all the murders have occurred in the same small shop at the East End of London. <laughs> now, why do you suppose three tobacconists would be murdered in the same shop? Come now, old fellow. Give me a logical solution to the problem, will you? Well, uh, let me see. You say that the shop's in the, in the East End? Yes. Is it near the river? As it happens, it's on the water's edge. Then supposing the tobacconist shop was the headquarters of a smuggling ring... Perhaps boxes of cigars were unloaded from the dock and mm -hmm. brought to the shop. Cigars containing pearls or opium or something. Watson, my dear fellow, you're doing splendidly. Oh, you must walk in the park more frequently. You're positively scintillating. Oh, no, no you're, you're making fun of me. I'll show you I'm not. You're expecting anyone home? No, no, probably a visitor from Mrs. Hudson. Go on with your fascinating theory. Now, why are three tobacconists murdered? Well, because they, they know too much. Perhaps they demand a share in the profits, uh, so the head of the ring decides to kill them. Plausible enough, Watson. I really must congratulate you. Oh, I can see that I'm very lucky in having a biographer with such a lively oh, imagination. Thanks very much. Come in. Imagination. Oh. Oh, hello, Mr. Stroud. Stroud, I'm glad to see you. Uh, I hope I'm not intruding. Not at all, my dear fellow. Come along, sit down. Uh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. Anything uh, remarkable on hand? No, no, Mr. Holmes. Nothing very uh, particular. Ah. Huh. Then tell me all about it, Mr. Stroud. <laughs> Can't hide anything from you, can I, sir? Yes, there is something on my mind, and no mistake. And it concerns the three murdered tobacconists, I see. Splendid. Now, how the blazes did you know that? Yes, Holmes, that's pure magic. Not at all, my dear Watson. It's simple deduction. deduction? Observe the five oh, cigars peering out of Mr. Stroud's mm -hmm. breast pocket. They are of a far superior quality to his usual brand. Obviously, the scene of his latest investigation has profit certain, well, shall we say, uh... Professional perquisites? Am I right, Lestrade? <laughs> of course you are. Careful one, Miss Holmes. Thank you, I'll stick to my pipe. Well, how about you, Doctor? Oh, thank you, Lestrade. Hi, Joe. Coronas. And now, Inspector, tell me about the murdered tobacconists. Well, how much do you know about the case? Oh, just what I've read in the papers. Well, curiously enough, we were discussing the affair as you walked in, Lestrade. Eh, it's a strange business, gentlemen. I only got hold of the old story today when I had a long talk to young Jack Longworth. Now, he's the owner of the show. Oh, in relation to what? Gerald Longworth, the taller member of Parliament who battled so successfully against the slum clearance bill? His son, Mr. Holmes. Oh, what's nice young fellow, too. Uh, when his father died, he inherited this shop along with a lot of other property in the East End. Well, uh, how big a shop is it, Mr. Holmes? Oh, just a hole in the wall, Doctor. Like all the other shops in that part of London. Uh, young Mr. Longworth... Tells me he first rents it to a man by the name of George Grillet. He lives there with his daughter Lily and made it quite a nice go out of the shop. Six months ago, when Jack Longworth was abroad, George Grillet has a stroke and nearly kicks the bucket. Kicks the uh, kicks the bucket. He nearly dies, Doctor. Oh, kicks the bucket. Very <laughs> good. I don't remember that. And then what happened to Stroud? <laughs> well, while he's in the hospital, his daughter gives up the lease on the shop. A few days later, an Italian takes it over, and a couple of weeks later, he's found with his throat cut. Did you investigate that first murder yourself? No, Mr. Holmes. It seemed like any of a dozen killings we get in that part of London. A shopkeeper cut up, his till emptied, no clues. Well, who was the next tenant? A Scotchman. bloke by the name of Macintosh. A few weeks after he moved in, the same thing happened to him. That time, I did go down there. But I couldn't find out nothing. Was robbery again the apparent murder? Yes, sir. That the killing wasn't the same. He was strangled with a silk scarf. Silk scarf, eh? And who was the third tenant? The man who was murdered yesterday? A Hindu fella. A man by the name of Mukherjee. He takes it over a week last Friday, and yesterday we find him knife through the back and his money gone. Of course, I was down there eh, before you could say Crystal Palace. But once again, I didn't find out nothing. No knife, no fingerprints on the till, no footprints... Just a very dead Hindu. Was young Mr. Longworth a landlord in England when these murders occurred? Yeah, that's the funny thing about it, Mr. Holmes. He docked at Tilbury yesterday morning. He didn't know nothing about what had been going on. Well, I imagine he'd have difficulty in renting the shop after three murders. Well, that's just it, Doctor. That's why he comes to me at the yard. George Grillet, his first tenant of the shop, moved back there today with his daughter, Lily. And young Mr. Longworth worried about them. <laughs> Oh, if you ask me, he's more worried about the daughter than he is about old man Grillet. So the original tenants of the shop are back in residence again, eh? And, uh, 
What do you want me to do? Well, I thought perhaps you'd be interested enough to come along with me and look at the shop, Mr. Evans. I should be very glad to, my dear fellow. Get your coat and hat, Watson. Oh, Richard. Oh, dear, that wretched instrument. I'll answer it. Hello? Mike Craft, how are you? What? Yes. Yes, he... He's here now. Why, of course. I'll do everything I can. Certainly. Let's have dinner together soon, shall we? Splendid idea. All right. Goodbye. Well, is that your brother, Holmes? Yes. Lestrade, I do think you might have told me the whole truth. Well, how do you mean, sir? I thought your visit was prompted by a need for friendly assistance. I didn't realize that you came here virtually on a government order. Well, it wasn't just quite like that, Mr. Holmes. What's the government got to do with the case? And how does your brother Mycroft fit into the picture? Not eh? sure yet. But of one thing we may be certain, there's obviously a great deal more in this case than Lestrade would have us believe. Why do you say that, Holmes? You must bear in mind, old fellow, that occasionally Mycroft is the British government. Yeah. Nice part of London to take a walk in on a foggy night, ain't it, gentlemen? <laughs> All our policemen work down here in pairs, you know. Yes, I don't blame them. It's a vile neighborhood. Uh, there's the shop just ahead of us, with a sign hanging out. Hello, hello, there he is again. Oh. See that bearded Hindu skulking off around the corner there? Oh, yeah. He's been haunting the place ever since I came down here. Hmm. So a bearded Hindu haunts the place, eh? Yes, and yesterday, Holmes, the Hindu proprietor of the shop was murdered. Exactly. Well, here we are. I'll go in first. Depressing looking place, huh? I'll be out in Jiffy. That's Lily, George Grillet's daughter. Helps him with the shop. Sorry to keep you wet. Oh. Oh, it's you, Inspector Lestrade. Yes, Miss Lee. Uh, I brought some gentlemen to see your father. Uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Pleased to meet you, I'm sure. How do you do, Miss Grillet? Uh, how do you do, young lady? Is your dad home? No, Inspector. He won't be in till after dinner. Went down at the docks, he did, to see about some cigar shipments. Mr. Longwax here. If you want to see him, we were just having some tea in the back room. Yes, uh, I'd like these gentlemen to meet him. Jack, come out in the shop, Jack. What is it, Lily? Oh, Inspector Lestrade. And this must be Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, I'm sure. How do you do, sir? How are you, Mr. Longworth? I'm very glad the inspector was able to persuade you to come down here, Mr. Holmes. I'm dreadfully worried about this business, particularly since Lily's father insisted on coming back here. I'm afraid they're in great danger, but I can't make Mr. Grillet see it. Young lady, I wonder if I might ask you a few questions. Well, of course, Mr. Holmes. Before your father had his stroke, did he receive any threats concerning his occupancy of the shop? Well, if he did, he never told me about him. But it wouldn't surprise me. I often told him his biggest enemy is himself, if you know what I mean. Yes, I think I do, Miss Grillet. When your father had his illness, who decided to give up the lease on the shop? I did. No money was coming in, and, well, it looked like Dad might be an invalid for life. Mm. Of course, I couldn't run the shop by myself. Anyhow, I never did like this part of London. It wasn't the right business for Father. Uh, what was his reaction when you told him... Uh to given up the lease. Oh, he was awful angry with me. Said I'd no right to do it without asking him. Uh, by the way, uh, we saw that bearded Hindu again as we walked up just now. He's been hanging around ever since we came back here, Inspector. Well, has he actually come into the shop, Miss Grillet? Mm, no. But he keeps walking by and looking in the window. I'm sure if we both went into the back room or left the shop for a little while, well, he'd come right in. Then I suggest we give him the opportunity he's seeking. Miss Grillet, I wonder if you and Mr. Longworth would mind leaving the shop for a while. Of course not, Mr. Holmes. Make your departure rather ostentatious, shall we say, so that he can't help noticing it. Give us half an hour or so and then come back. Perhaps you wouldn't mind going with him, Mr. Rod. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, this is my place. I know, I know, but um, in a situation like this, Watson and I work much better alone. We may have to go a little outside the law, and your presence might embarrass us. <laughs> You'd never think I was a detective, too, would you? Very well, we'll be Mr. back in half an hour. <laughs> poor, poor old Estrade. He gets very touchy as the years roll by. Yeah, I blame him. I'm leaving him completely in the dark. Come on, Watson. Behind the counter. No, 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 my oh. dear fellow. Not oh, under it. it. Not under it, old chap. Oh, we lift the flap. Oh, 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 oh. So. Ah, now I suggest we crouch down behind here. Come on. That's it. 
Have you got your revolver, Watson? Yes, it's in my pocket. Good. In the meantime, make yourself as comfortable as these cramped quarters will permit. We may have uh, quite a wait ahead of us. I got you covered with this revolver. Now, my man, what are you doing here? Who? Who are you? Never mind who I am. Just answer my question. I do not speak very good English. Do you understand about Bullen, Sector? Ah, Sector, hi. You go to the Aya. Dek me, Kosti. Tumara bai, Homko, who come here? Tumara bai. Tum Johnny, Sector. Bota cha. Salam. No, 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 you don't, my man. Just you stay where you are. It's all right, Watson. Let him go. He's on our side. I wish you'd tell me what in thunder's going on, who that man was, and why you let him go. He's an investigator from the foreign office, old chap. Given his instructions by my brother, Mycroft. Mycroft? Yes, old fellow. When my brother fails to tell me all the facts concerning this case, I begin to think these triple murders have far greater ramifications than we ever dreamed of. Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a second. Just about time enough for me to mention that any meal becomes a better meal when you serve it with Petri wine. And say, you'll find that Petri California Burgundy and Petri California Sauterne are just made to go with food. That Petri Burgundy is a rich red wine that's bosom pals with any meat or meat dish. Boy, what a flavor. And that Petri Sauterne is the delicate white wine that's just perfect with chicken or with fish. Yes, sir, with food... You just can't beat a good Petri wine. And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. A puzzling case is occupying the attentions of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Three murders have taken place in a small tobacconist shop in the east end of London. As we rejoin our story, it's late at night, and Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, accompanied by Inspector Lestrade, are once again walking toward the ill-fated shop. Well, I don't see that you've accomplished much, Mr. Holmes, except that you've just bought me a nice dinner. Oh, I'm making progress, Lestrade. It's only by the elimination of obvious suspects. But there's a pattern to this case, and that should give us a clue. Well, how do you mean, Holmes? My dear fellow, consider the obvious motive of these murders, and particularly observe the results they've obtained. Well, the motive was the same in all three killings. Robbery. Oh, no, Lestrade. Not only for theft of a few pounds from the till... Blind you to the real motive. Look, 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 look. Here's Miss Grinnett now. He's coming out of the shop. Good evening, Miss Grinnett. Hello, Mr. Holmes. Is your father home yet? Yes, he is, Mr. Holmes. And I can't tell you how anxious I am for you to talk to him. I'm going to meet Mr. Longway. He's taken me to the music hall. I should be home just after ten. I hope you'll be able to stay with Dad until then. Well, don't you worry, Miss Grinnett. We'll keep an eye on him. Oh, thanks ever so much. Oh, um... Oh, Mr. Holmes. Yes, Miss Grinnett? Please don't go into our rooms in the back, will you? I've left things in a frightful mess. I quite understand, Miss Grillet. Well, ta-ta. See you later. Hmm. Let's go into the shop. Who is it? Oh, oh, it's you, Inspector. Yeah, these gentlemen are uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Oh, good, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening. Did you meet young Lily just now? Yes, she uh, told us she was going out to the music hall with Mr. Longworth. Yes. I'm afraid we had quite a set to about that. A uh, very strong-willed girl, Lily. Very strong-willed. I'd assume that uh, you disapprove of your daughter's association with Mr. Longworth? Uh, of course I do. He's a top. He's got lots of money. Lily's so blind she can't see that he's up to no good. Hmm. I'm pretty sure he's afraid I might find out what's really at the back of these here murders. And what is your theory, sir? Well, I'll tell you this in confidence. Got nothing to back it up now, you understand. There's been talk of widening the docks around here. That'd make property values go up, you see, of course. Young Longworth's been trying to buy up all the other shops along the waterfront here, but they wouldn't sell. 
If you ask me, he's had these murders done just to frighten people away so that they, he could buy cheap. Now, I'm not saying that he did the murders himself, you understand, but he planned them. Why, in these parts, it's easy enough any night to get a throat cut for a couple of quid. Yeah. That's why I'm glad you're here, gents. You see, I... Uh, I just got another warning. Warning? What do you mean, sir, warning? Found this note slipped under that door there not three quarters of an hour ago. Let me see it, please. Huh. What does it say, Holmes? I shall call on you at 8.30 tonight. You know what's good for you? You'll be waiting for me alone. If you try any funny tricks, you'll go where I sent the rest of them. Well, that's obviously from the killer. Possibly. What's the time now? Mm, it's, uh, very past eight. I, uh... I was hoping you gentlemen would wait in our rooms back of the shop. You can hear what's going on in here, and if he tries any rough stuff, you can pop in and nab him. Just what I was about to suggest myself, Mr. Griffith. Either way, will you? Oh, yes. Just step behind the counter, gents. Now, through here. Ah, here we are. Ain't exactly Buckingham Palace back here, but you can make yourselves comfortable, can't you, gents? Oh, don't you worry about us, Griffith. Oh, i better turn up the gas. If this bloke spots a light under the door in here, he might smell a rat. Now, there we are. Now, as soon as I see him coming in the shop, I'll knock twice on the door. Like this. And that'll give you the signal that he's here. Is that right? Right, you are, Grit. All right, now keep your ears open, gents. I may need your help. Where are you, Holmes? I can't see a thing. Over here, Watson. You know, I've, I've got another theory why Jack Longworth might be at the back of all this. You listening, Holmes? What is your theory? Longworth knows that Grillet doesn't approve of his having anything to do with Lily. So when he goes abroad, he leaves instructions to murder the tobacconist. The assassins don't know about Grillet having a stroke, of course, so they keep murdering the, uh, the wrong fuller. Well, that makes very good sense, Doctor. <laughs> what do you say, Mr. Holmes? Holmes. Holmes. Where are you? That's my He's disappeared. No, I haven't. I was just exploring. Shh. The signal. There goes the front door. Somebody's come in. We'd better go in. Right, watch him listen. We've got to get in there at once. Open the door. Well, it's locked. Never mind that. Get your shoulders into me. Come on. Come on. Help me. Come on. One more. Poor devil. He's been slashed with a knife. Do it. Brilliant! What, the killer got away? I'm going to... Now, Lestrade can you. conserve your energy. Your murderer lies there. But that's grilly. Of course it is. Search his pockets, Watson. I think you'll find a bloodstained knife. Uh, Let's have a look. Uh, good Lord. He has a razor in his pocket. It's covered with blood. You mean to say that he slashed himself? Let's oh, the handcuffs uh, on him, Lestrade. While he's still play-acting, he may be more difficult to handle when he realizes the game's up. <laughs> Take your hands off of me. Come on, quick. Come on, here. Come on. Very neat, Lestrade. Well, now that I've knocked a wounded man out cold, perhaps you'll tell me what's going on, Mr. Holmes. Yes, I'm completely in the dark, too. Oh, it's very simple, really. Willett has just staged a fake attack on himself. Fool us into believing that someone else is the murderer. Yeah, but the threatening note he received. Composed by himself for the occasion. Yes, but we heard voices. We heard the shop door open. We heard Grillet talking to himself. And as for the shop door, that's how he gave himself away. Well, how do you mean, Mr. Holmes? Whenever the shop door opens, there's a bell that jangles. You will notice uh, So. Yeah, that's right, there is. There's no bell jangle when we were in the back room. But it got us in there, locked the door on us unobtrusively, and staged his little drama. Yes, but we heard the door creak open and close, Mr. Holmes. The creak of this flap in the counter would sound exactly the same, my dear fellow. Now listen. Yes, but why, Holmes? How did you spot that Grillet was a man? It was obvious from the beginning that since nothing had changed about the shop except the ownership, that the attackers were directed against any tobacconist who was not Grillet himself. Of course, his daughter, Lily, obviously knew what was going on. Well, I don't see how you figured that one out, Mr. Holmes. Every remark that she made showed that although she loved her father, she knew his failings. In any case, she gave me the final clue. Well, what clue was that? 
and very pointedly asking me not to go into the back room of the shop. Of course, she meant the reverse of what she said. I followed her advice when you were explaining our theory to Lestrade. Well, what did you find, Mr. Holmes? Miss Grillet had obligingly left a secret door open, a door leading to a passageway that seemed uh, to go down to the waterfront. We'll examine it more thoroughly in a minute. Yes, but I still don't understand Grillet's motive, Holmes. Neither do I, old chap. No, I suspect that from uh, the interest of the foreign office in the case, this shop has been the headquarters of, a, of an espionage ring. I'm afraid the final answer to that question will have to be given by someone else. Oh, who, Holmes? By my uh, elder brother, Mycroft. Humiliating, isn't it, Watson? And what was the final answer to the question, Dr. Watson? Well, uh, Holmes was right as usual, Mr. Foreman. The shop had been the headquarters of a spy ring operated by Grillet. And many international criminals had been smuggled in England or foreign ships moored up the river. And did Mr. Grillard hang for his crime? No, 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 he didn't, my boy. Before the, he came to trial, he, he had another stroke and he died. Probably just as well for his daughter's sake. Oh, his daughter. He's <laughs> a lovely girl. Did she marry Longworth? <laughs> Indeed she did. As a matter of fact, I, I danced at her wedding. It was a very wonderful wedding reception. <laughs> See, you would have been there yourself, Mr. Foreman. In fact, you'd have liked it very much. They, they served a Pretty good wine. <laughs> was it a Petri wine by any chance? Hmm? Oh, well, it was so good it easily might have been. <laughs> <laughs> you mean because Petri wine is the kind of a wine you can't forget. That's exactly what I do well, mean. Well, that's because the Petri that's family the really knows here. all there is to know about the fine art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. You see, the Petri family's been making wine ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And they've been able to hand on down in the family from father to son, from father to son, every bit of their skill and experience. That's why Petri wine is so good today. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And say, don't forget to take a moment yourself and send for your free recipe calendar. Remember, send to Petri wine. Petri wine, San Francisco 26, San Francisco 26, California. This offer is intended to apply only in those states and other localities where its acceptance is permissible by law and regulation. And now, Doctor, do you feel like giving us a hint about next week's story? Yes, I do. Next week, Mr. Foreman, I'm going to tell you a strange adventure that happened to Holmes and me in the West End of London. It concerns the death of a famous actor who was portraying the part of an equally famous man, Sherlock Holmes. Thank you, Doctor. See you next week. And say, from the news we've had so far today... Maybe by next week at this time, we'll hear some really good news from Europe. I certainly hope so, Mr. Foreman. But let us remember, the war won't be over when Germany quits. We've still got to lick Japan. That's going to take a long time. So instead of celebrating when VE Day comes along, let's just strengthen our resolve to support the war more than ever here at home. Keep that war job. Don't leave it till you're released. Keep on buying more and more and more war bonds and, and keep them. Don't turn them in. Help all you can with all home front activities and observe all our wartime regulations such as price ceilings. That's the real way to celebrate a victory in Europe, by working harder to end the war in the Pacific. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Six Napoleons. Mr. Rathbone appears with the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce with the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Meanwhile, don't forget to take advantage of our offer of a free recipe calendar. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, pet, Petri. This is Bill Foreman saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Who? Oh, yeah, hello, Doc, how are you? 
<laughs> what? In trouble, you? <laughs> More trouble, you track trouble, Archie. Hang up. It's our dentist, Dr. Thrumming. Let him wait. We never can find him when we need him. Tell him it's after office hours. Doc. Doc, you're talking so fast, I can't make head and the tails of it. Look. Look, listen, Doc. Come on over here and we'll be able to hear you. It'll only take you a few minutes. Right. You consistently disobey me. I want to work on my paper about odontocosms. Doc Thrummick has a friend who's in some trouble, and he needs our advice. Besides, we owe Doc a fair-sized little bill, remember? Money again, Archie. Money is the curse of our times. Yeah, man. Bring on all the curses that is available. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> This story is one we refer to as the case of the Midnight Ride. Oh, yeah, that was a ride, all right. But it would never have happened if we hadn't received another phone call a few minutes after our Dr. Thrummig phone. It was late in the evening, and Nero Wolf was studying his paper on orchids while I was absorbed in playing some phonograph records. Archie, Archie, not so loud. I can't possibly think when you play that infernal thing at such volume. What was that you said, boss? I said I can't understand why you can't get music from a phonograph without vibrating the top of the instrument. That's right, that's right. I can't understand why the neighbors haven't called the police. Do you hear that, Archie? Archie! All right, I'll answer. You're fired, naturally. Hello? Hello. Is this Archie Goodwin? I know, Mr. Wolf. What? Me? Archie. Yeah, who is it? I need help, Archie, please. Come at once. Please. Oh, please. You and Nero. Who is this? This is Gloria Bo- No. No, don't. Gloria who? Ronaldo West. Hello? Hello? Well, did you hear that? Another female bar. What happened? Boss, who do you know named Gloria? Gloria? I know nothing about anyone named Gloria. She said her name was Gloria something. I couldn't quite get the last name. But she did say Ronaldo Road. Well, it's quite possible that she resides on Ronaldo Road. First she asked if this was Archie Goodwin speaking, and before I had a chance to say anything, she asked me to come to her at once. She needed help. And for you to bring me along. I mean, for me to bring Nero along. You don't even know what you're talking about. Well, she said she was Gloria Barr or Mar or something like that. And then she said Ronaldo Road West. And then the scream, and that's all there was. Hmm. The usual pattern of your experience with women. Sounded like a hand was slapped over her mouth or she was grabbed by the throat. Bring Nero with you. I am taking no more assignments this week. Ronaldo Road West, where is it? I don't believe there is a Ronaldo Road West. If I remember correctly, Ronaldo Road runs north and south and is approximately 12 miles long. But she said west. What she probably tried to say when she was interrupted was Ronaldo Road West Chester. West Chester, of course. Asked Inspector Kramer to try to check on that phone call. I'll ask him to try. By the way, do you expect to find this glory alive, Archie? I certainly hope so. And are you aware that if someone strangled her, then they must have heard her speak your name? Yes, and yours too. Shall I open it, boss? Why not? Let us face it, Archie. Huh? It's me, Archie. Oh, 
Wait till I slide the night chain off, Dr. Thrummy. Yeah, my nose. <laughs> I forgot all about you, Doc. Where have you been? <laughs> it's only been three or four minutes. I have never had such a disturbing night since I had my first patient. But at first I was afraid to leave the house. And why were you so afraid, Dr. Thrummy? But there were two men sitting in front of my place in the car. Oh, oh good evening, Nero. Uh, were they waiting for you, Doctor? Well, why not? It's very likely. Since she called me, I've been so completely unnerved. Here, Doc, I... here. Have some brandy. Oh, no, 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 no. You know I never... Uh, well, that is... Uh, well, a small one. I, I am upset. Uh, you understand, Archie. Uh, 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 oh, well, that's better. Just who called you and upset you so? Oh, hello, Nira. Did someone call me? Uh, when? You phoned me frantically that a woman called you. I couldn't understand you on the phone. Oh, yes, yes, poor Gloria. She was cut off. Oh, Gloria. Did you say Gloria? Well, didn't I? I thought I did. Oh, dear. What did you say? I said Gloria. Oh, my, isn't that strange? I thought that's what I said. No, no, no more, please. We just had a call from Gloria. Who is Gloria? Well, you remember. We all went to school together. Uh, that is... Oh, you do too remember. Uh, Gloria, you know, she was... Um... Uh, just what is Gloria's last name, Dr. Thrumming? Well, it was Gloria Barnesworth. I don't know what it is now. That's what she was trying to say to me, Barnesworth. Did she tell you where to find her? Uh, no, she didn't. Uh, oh, dear me. She was just about to tell me when I said I'd call you and Archie and get your help. And then she was cut off. How do you know she's the Gloria Barnesworth you knew and I'm supposed to know? My. Whew. Could you open the windows? Why, yes. Archie. Oh, sorry, Doc. The air outside's contaminated. Oh, is that so? With what? Oxygen. Mm, oh, these factories, factories, factories. Oh, well, I found her picture in an old class photo. Here it is. Oh, yeah, now I remember. But, Doc, you and this gal were several years ahead of me in school. I, I'm not in this picture, so she must be about 40 now. Well, gentlemen, you both seem to have the situation well in hand now. So, if you'll excuse me, I will retire to my room. Oh, oh, oh yes, but we don't have anything figured out yet. Ah, but you will. Let me know in the morning how successful you have been. Good night. Well, anyway, a woman called here, and just as she was about to tell me who she was and her address, she was cut off as though she was strangled. Yeah, Archie, did you say someone strangled her? I don't know, Doc. I hope not. Well, let's start our search along Ronaldo Road. Hey, hey, Archie, Archie, don't answer it. They're after me. The men in the car, they saw me come in here. After you, nonsense. They found out Gloria phoned me. Don't let them in. Now, how could you know all that? Oh, dear me. Do you mind? A short one? I'm so weak today. Please, Archie, don't open it. I warn you. Now, just relax, Doc. I'll handle this. Good evening. Evening. Are you Archie Goodwin? Uh, no, he is. Yes. No, I'm not. He is. Put up your hands. Unhook the night chain. Now just turn off this light. Oh, I told you. I told you. Where's Wolf? Oh, he's been in bed for hours. And who is this little man? Uh, why, I'm... Don't you know? This is my, uh, my, my brother, Brother Cuthbert. Yes, he's quite right. I'm a bit older than he is. Shut up, uh... Cuthbert. All right, get your coats and hats off that rack. What for? We're all going for a little ride along the river. And it's a bit chilly. Oh, dear me. Uh, I feel faint. I'm getting dizzy. Get your hat. Uh, yes, sir. And put that bottle down. Yes, but it's so cold out there. Get along. I... Here's the car. Now, Mr. Goodwin, hand over that gun in your pocket. But I haven't got... Okay, there you are. Thank you. Now, get in the car. You get in the front seat with the driver, Goodwin. Your brother can get back with me. Okay, you know where we're going, driver. Yeah, yeah but... Yeah, but I... what? Get going. But do you know who this guy is? I do. Why? Well, now, look, I... Well, this guy is Archie Goodwin. What if he is? Well, this won't work. I mean, I didn't know it was going to be Goodwin. He's with Nero Wolf. What's your name, pal? I can't see you, but I seem to recognize your voice. Well, well, you see, it was like this. I was in a... Are you going to shut up and start driving? Okay, okay, I'm going. Now, see here, it's getting very late. I, I don't like this. Uh, where are you taking us? Keep calm, Doc. Yeah, don't get excited. Just take it easy. Listen, Goodwin, I got a record Shut for up, you. Shut my... What's the idea back of all this, friend? We're off the road here, driver. Yes, but we're way out in the country. Now, we'll all get out here. Now, wait a minute. I said get out. You too, driver. Oh, now, wait a second. What's the big idea? Now, all of you start walking over to that clump of trees. Go on. What's he going to do? What do you think? 
Okay, that's good. Just stand there. Now get out your gun, driver. Get... Oh, now wait a minute. This is Get out way your you... gun and don't turn around, driver. Now let him have it. Go on, or I'll kill you. I don't go in for this kind of stuff. Besides, shoot him and empty your gun into them. Go on. Now just drop your gun on the ground there. Now I will take Goodwin's gun, and after I finish with it, I'll just toss it over beside his body. You what? Hey, now wait a minute. You'll notice I have gloves on. Hey, Doc. Doctor Thrumming. You all right, Doc? Oh, oh, Archie, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I got you into this. I, I can't last long. Where are you hit? Tell Nero I make him a present of his new bridge work I put in. Let me have a look at you. I wanted to die in my bed with my friends around You're me. You're not bleeding. I wanted the choir to sing. What? I'm not bleeding? No. Are you? No. The driver was a bad shot. He missed both of them. Then what am I doing down here on the ground? You fainted at the first shot. I dropped purposely on the second shot. He missed every time. Come on, get up from there. Uh, We're very lucky people. Uh, what became of them? Hand me my gun. Oh, oh, is this your gun? Wrap it in this handkerchief. Come over here. Yep. Here he is, the driver. And he's dead. This is dreadful, Archie. What do we do now? You got a lighter? Uh, here's my pocket flash. Well, here's his gun beside him. Don't touch it. Have a look through his pockets. Wish I knew what he meant when he said he had a record for me someplace. A picture of a girl says to Mike from Violet. Mike. Mike. This fellow's face is certainly familiar, but I can't... Hey, wait a minute. Mike. Mike... Mike Jordan, that's it. Mike Jordan? Yeah, Wolf cleared him on a frame-up three years ago, and this, uh, this girl Violet is an entertainer in a nightclub downtown. Uh, Violet, yes, but what does all this have to do with Gloria? Strange, there's no other identification on him. Maybe the other guy took it off of him. Well, now we got to find Violet. How? We can't even find Gloria. I think now that this guy, Mike Jordan, missed us deliberately. Let's start hoofing it back to that last crossroad. There was a telephone there. I'll call Nero. So that's the story so far, Mr. Wolf. Sorry to wake you up, but we wanted you to know. Yes, we did. Oh, such a night. What was your reason for telling the man that Dr. Thrumming was your brother? Well, I didn't want him to know that it was Doc because Gloria had called Doc and he must have known about it. And the driver turned out to be Mike Jordan. And what did Mike say to you in the car? Well, he didn't finish, but he said, I got a record for you, Goodwin. It... And then the man shot him up. And when you located Violet at her place, she was cataloging recording. Hmm? Bring it in here now, Archie. Sit down, Dr. Thrumming. Uh, yes, yes, I am a bit weary. Come in, Violet. Uh, Violet, this is... Hey, wait a minute. You, you're Nero Wolf. Sit down, Miss Violet. Oh, what's the idea, Mr. Goodwin? Why'd you bring me here? Will you look at this photo? It says, to Mike from Violet. Where'd you get this? I got it, Violet. What we want to know is, where's Mike now? What's he doing? Can you tell us where he lives? What's Mike done now? Can you tell us his address? Maybe. Do you know who he has been working for? Yeah. A guy with a big car and a lot of dough. You've seen this man? Yeah, kind of a good-looking guy. I think his name is Durant or, or something like that. I understand you've been occupying yourself with cataloging some phonograph recordings. Yeah, that's what I was doing when Mr. Goodwin came in. Mike's got a home recorder over at his place. Do you have all the records that have been made on the machine so far? No, just what we made in the last week. Lots more at his place. Do you and Mike know of a woman named Gloria? No, at least I don't remember. It was on Rinaldo Road. Gloria Barnesworth was her maiden name. Where is this Rinaldo Road? I, I don't know. It's in Westchester, we think. I've never been there. What has Mike done, Mr. Wolfe? Is it bad? As a matter of fact, Mike is in the clear. Good. There is no charge against him, and there never will be. You haven't seen him for a couple of days? No. And I never go to his apartment unless him and some guests are there. Do you know where he is? Will you give me the address of his apartment? Okay. 
324 East 35th Street. Thank you very much, young lady. What's all so mysterious? Oh, something's happened to Mike. I can tell by the way you talk. Very well, Archie. You have a special visit to make. Look for the machine, and it's quite late, so you had best hurry. Well, I'm going with you, Archie. Uh, good night, Nero. Oh, I mean, good morning. Oh, I don't even know what day it is. Come along, Violet. We'll drop you at your place first. Well, there we are, Doc. Yes, has his name right on it. Mike Jordan. No, we're fairly certain that no one's in there. Hey, what do you know? It didn't lock. The lights are on. I know. I know. Listen. Yes, a light humming noise. Huh. But where is it coming from? Over in that corner, those wall cabinets. There it is. A radio. And a phonograph combination. Yes, and a recording machine. And the recording arm's still down on the record. I'll just lift it off and put the playback needle on. Yeah, there we are. But look, I don't go in for that kind of stuff. You've been working for me for several weeks now, haven't you? Well, sure, boss, but I never went in for no kind We're of going to pick this guy up and take him for a little ride. It ain't my life. All you do is drive the car. Okay, I'll take a chance. But remember, I'm just the driver of your car. If anything happens, I didn't know nothing. You'll do just as I say. Incidentally, I know a lot about you. Things the police would like to know. Okay. Okay, I'm working for you. I came out to Ronaldo Road to make an honest living. But I see I'm right back where I started. And worse, the guy just ain't got a chance. Oh, remind me. I've got to phone the place. did say Ronaldo Road. And that's where our Gloria called from, so they're all tied in together. Come along, Doc. We're going back to Mr. Wolf again, and we'll just take this record with us. Well, Archie, I guess this phonograph was worthwhile after all. Yes, indeed. Hey, don't you find this a very interesting recording, Nero? I'm sure we're going to add it to our collection. And these are the two men who took you on the right. That's right. But we're really no further along in our desire to help, Gloria. That's right. We're on Ronaldo Road. Boss, if we can find the address, will you go with us down there or over there or wherever it is? I might. And you already have the clue to the address. We have. Where? In that phonograph recording. Play it again, Archie. Just the part where he uses the telephone. And slow the speed way down. Then take down the numbers I call off. Okay, boss. Six, five, three, two, two, three. That's enough. By slowing down the record, we were able to count the clicks of each number he used on the dial. Now, there's the number the man called. We hope it is on Ronaldo Road. Have Inspector Kramer get the address of that number combination, and we are ready to make our assault. I'll call Kramer, and then I'll get the car out. It hadn't been out for weeks. Maybe it won't start. <laughs> no such luck, Archie, I assure you. No such luck. <laughs> I think we must go through this big gate. Uh, yes, yes, there's the number. 23, Ronaldo. Slip up to the entrance as softly as possible. Turn out your headlamps. Well, here we are, boss. Easy now, getting out. 
Don't pull it up, Captain. Don't pull on me. Oh. Yeah. There we are. Now come along. Yeah, spooky sort of place, isn't it? All big houses are like that. Must be 20 rooms. Yeah. There's not a light in the place. Use the knocker, Archie. Stand back. Here comes somebody. Yes? Uh, is Gloria in? What? Gloria? And who are you? Uh, uh, we are here to see Gloria. Uh, uh, come, come. It's this hour of the night? Certainly not. Uh, just a moment. She's an old friend of mine. Uh, yes, and his too. He's Archie. My good man, what is your name? Uh, Jennings, sir. In the um, household is in bed at this hour. What is it, Jennings? Who's at the door? Uh... They're asking for you, Miss Gloria. For me? Well, come in, gentlemen. You may go, Jennings. Please. Very well, miss. Just as you say. Now, what did you want? Say, Doc, is this the Gloria? Well, I, I don't know. It doesn't seem... Are you Gloria? Yes. Well, why did you call us? Oh, then then you're Archie Goodwin. Yes, and I'm Dr. Thrilling. Uh, but you I are... called you because I need your help. Desperately. Gloria, oh. what is going on here at this hour? Oh, and who are these gentlemen? Well, you... You see, Uncle, Mr. Goodwin came... Came to see you? Why? Well, I... Because I... I think you'd better go to your room, my dear. Don't you think that is best? Your room and rest? No. No, I don't want to. I won't. Go to your room. No. No, I won't. I can't. All those people walk in and out. They want to kill me. Jennings, take her to her room. Uh, yes, sir. Come along, please. No. No, I won't. I won't. Let me go. There are hundreds of people. They'll kill me. Come along. No, no. Please. No. I'm so sorry. But there's nothing we can do with her. Now, Mr. Goodwin. Yeah? What is it you wish? The girl called you Uncle. Oh, pardon me. I'm near a wolf. How do you do, Mr. Wolf? Yes, she called me Uncle, but I'm not really a relative. I'm Dr. Gunther, retained by the family. As you can see... The girl is quite ill. Uh, well, we're old friends of Gloria's, and we'd like to see her. But you just saw her. We don't refer to this young lady. We have in mind the elderly Gloria. Now, come, Dr. Gunther. You know to whom we refer. What? You, you mean the girl's aunt? Well, it's very strange. If you are a friend of the aunt's, that you are not aware of her condition. Her condition? Yes. The aunt has been bedridden for nearly a year. Paralysis. And it seems to be most coincidental with your visit, but she passed away this afternoon. Died? Gloria? This afternoon? But how could that be? We'd like to see the remains, Dr. Gunther. Yes, we'd like to see the remains. Just where are they? They are here, Mr. Goodwin. And if you and your brother and Mr. Wolf will step this way to the small parlor. There you are, gentlemen. I'll leave you alone. I'll be in the library. Well, gentlemen, there she is. What do you say? Do you recognize this woman? Well, yeah. It's been many years, but that is Gloria Barnesworth. Well, good heavens, yes. It's Gloria, all right. Poor woman. I remember now. She married a very wealthy manufacturer named Kenton, who died. She's remained a widow, I guess. Uh, he said she died this afternoon. Are you sure it was an elderly woman who called you this evening? And by the way, just feel her forehead. It's warm. She couldn't have been dead more than an hour. She isn't dead. No signs of pulse. Your cigarette case, please. Hmm. Very slight moisture. Respiration, barely perceptible. She's under heavy narcosis. You've given a heavy dose lately. Uh, let's get out of here. Wait. Do you recognize the uncle? Rather, Dr. Gunther? No, do you throw me? No. Does he look like the man who took you for a ride? It was too dark, boss. And he was all bundled up in heavy clothes. Let's get out of here. The door was locked after we came in. He's right. Come on, Doc. Let's put our shoulders to it. One, two... Go! Well, gentlemen, what on earth does this mean? Why'd you lock the door? Oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's a spring lock. I had no intention of locking the door. And I suggest, Archie, that you have it repaired. 
And now, Archie, will you step to the door and let Inspector Kramer in? He followed us up the driveway. Yeah, about time. Getting cold out here. Inspector Kramer, this is Dr. Gunther. In that room is a woman he claims is dead. She is actually under the heavy influence of narcotics. Yeah? Well, who is she? Mrs. Gloria Kenton, widow of the wealthy shoe manufacturer. And this attractive young lady coming down the stairs is supposed to be mentally ill, which I do not believe. Her name is Gloria, too. A niece of the elder Gloria. But Archie and I both knew Gloria Barnesworth. Uh, Yeah, yeah, I, I get it, I get it. And I suggest that this man is not a doctor, but is young Gloria's husband... And they're attempting to force the Aunt Gloria to change her will in their favor. This is utterly ridiculous. The aunt was able to phone Doc Thromig and me tonight, but she was apparently caught in the act. And this man, who is posing as the uncle, hired Mike Jordan to drive his car while he picked up Archie with the intent of killing him. Well, this this is the same man? The same. And if Mike Jordan hadn't recognized Archie, both of you would be quite dead. This man double-crossed Mike and killed him. Believing that the whole thing would be blamed on Mike. Mike deliberately missed. All right, so what's he going to do about it? Come on, let's get out of here fast. Look out, he's a cop. <laughs> All right, now get those hands up and keep them up. Come along, Archie. I have another appointment. The inspector can handle it from here on. Oh, oh dear me, I... Now, what happened? Am I all right? Yeah, you just fainted again when the shooting started. Oh. It's really quite fortunate that Mike Jordan recorded that conversation. Fortunate indeed. How did you know this uncle was the same guy who took us for a ride? First by his speech pattern, he is undoubtedly a Canadian. But you must have missed the most important slipper. What was that? When he escorted us to see the body, he said to you, Archie, if you and your brother and Mr. Wolf will step this way... Now, uh, how would he believe that Dr. Thrumming was your brother? No one mentioned it. Of course, the clue I planted and then missed myself. Quite right, Archie, quite right. What time is it? Uh, 8 a.m. I certainly appreciate your coming out for me on this deal. Oh, but I didn't do it just for you. There is an orchid lover's convention this morning at 9 o'clock. What? And you mean... Yes. I'm sure you'll enjoy it tremendously. <laughs> Both of you. Oh, brother. Uh huh. What's that? What's that? Nothing, Doc. Nothing at all. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story by John Edison was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin and Howard McNear, Gene Bates, Peter Leeds, Bill Johnstone, Grace Lennard, and Jay Novello. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Final Page. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective. Presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case... 
The Vanishing Postman. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter investigated a baffling seven-year-old crime and solved a murder through the eyes of a blind man. There's no time of year when a busy homemaker needs cool, leisurely relaxation more than during the summer months. And you can have that kind of relaxation when you do your homemaking the easy Linux way. Just follow the example of wise American homemakers everywhere who have learned the magic shortcut to household care. Those three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, the modern brush-on finish, Linux cream polish for fine furniture, and Linux self-polishing wax, the amazing new quick-drying wax product. Start now to enjoy extra relaxation every day. Enjoy that added leisure in a home that's sparkling with bright new beauty. Just ask your hardware, paint, or department store for the three great Linux home brighteners. And save time the easy Linux way. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. Rain has rolled in across the great city again today. The black skies thunder and crackle with lightning. The streets are glossy and slippery as glass. As Nick and Patsy drive homeward in the detective's powerful car, a torrent of rain beats against the windshield when suddenly... Nick, look out! That car! Oh! Oh, Nick! Oh. You all right, Patsy? I... Oh. I guess so. Oh, golly, I was scared. Lucky we went into this alley when we skidded off the street. Yes, and lucky that pile of rubbish cushioned the crash. Might have had a bad crack up. Hey, wait a minute. What is it? When we smacked into that rubbish pile, we uncovered an old leather pouch lying underneath. You see? Hey, you'll get soaked, Nick. It's an old postman's bag, Patsy. Falling to pieces. Must have been here for ages. Oh, Nick, come on back. And there's mail in this bag. Letters. Hello. There's a name printed on the strap. R. Draper. Oh, it's probably the name of the postman. And look at these letters, Patsy. The postmark, August 1938. 1938? Then this bag's been lying here seven years. Hey. Look here, Patsy. What, Nick? The buckle from the strap has fallen into the pouch. There's a bit of metal wedged in the buckle. Looks like a lump of lead. Well, it should. It happens to be a bullet. <gasps> well, let's get over to the post office at once. I'm afraid the explanation of this undelivered mail may be murder. <laughs> ah, Patsy, mystery. I found that postman Robert Draper vanished seven years ago and that the police and postal authorities believe him to be guilty of theft because a registered parcel containing $10,000 in securities also vanished at the same time. Oh, Nick, he stole them? Theft can't account for that bullet we found wedged in the buckle in the pouch, Patsy. Oh, no, no, I suppose not. For seven years, Robert Draper stood convicted of theft. Well, I'm going to find out whether he's guilty. But how are you going to dig up evidence in a case that happened seven years ago? I'm going to get special permission from the postmaster to deliver this mail that should have been delivered seven years ago. We've learned nothing so far in the first 47 letters we've delivered. Perhaps you'll have better luck here with the 48. Yes? Are you Betty Barnes? Yes. I'm Nick Carter. This is my secretary, Patsy Bowen. Nick Carter? Oh, please, come in, Mr. Carter. Thank you. I have a letter here for you, Miss Barnes. Mrs. Barnes. Oh, sorry. I have a letter that should have been delivered seven years ago. Seven years ago? I'd better explain. You see, seven years ago, the postman who served this district disappeared. His name was Robert Draper. What's He's going been... on here, Betty? Dan, it's about Pop. What? Well, he... Great they... Scott. Uh... Don't tell me that Draper was your father. Now, yes. now, look here. We fought that case seven years ago. There's no sense raking it up again and making out Betty's dad was a crook. Pop never stole. Why should he? He'd saved $12,000. He had plenty of insurance, $20,000 worth. Mrs. Barnes, please. I'm not trying to convict your father all over again. I'm trying to find out what really happened. But you'll have to help me. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Carter. Now tell me, what happened on that last day? Well, Pop left in the morning. You see, he lived with us. He always used to drop in at home for lunch. 
Well, the day he disappeared, he just never showed up for lunch. When Dan came home that night, I sent him out yes, to... Yes, I, uh, I went out to check up Mr. Carter. They said he never returned to the post office, and that's all we know. We never saw Dad again. I see. Mrs. Barnes, you have a picture of your father I might have. Uh, I'll, I'll get him one, honey. You know, Mr. Carter, it was on my birthday that Pop disappeared. Oh, how awful, Mrs. Barnes. Well, here's one, Mr. Carter. He's not in uniform, but it's the best we've got. It's taken a week before he disappeared. Thank you. I'll let you know how we make out. Oh, yes, here's your seven-year delayed letter, Mrs. Barnes. What? Oh. Oh, Dan, look. It, it's a birthday card from Pop. It says, Happy birthday, daughter dear. Best wishes on this day. My heart would always find you near. So I were miles away. Oh, Bob. Bob, darling. But, Nick, we've delivered 17 letters since we left Mrs. Barnes, and not one of them knew a thing. It's all right, Patsy. We're not doing badly at all. We've got a picture of Draper, and we know we had no motive for stealing those securities. Somebody else in this trail of letters will help us along further. Well, this one's for Ben Kramer, care of Kramer's Garage, 118 Land Street. Well, this is it. Let's go in. Mm-hmm. Mr. Kramer doesn't seem to be around. Now, wait a minute. Oh, I hear voices back there. Come on. She already got back double what she owed me. Yeah, now about? just give me a break, Shelley, please. Oh, That's all I ask. Megan Kramer, will you? I collect what's coming to me. But, but I can't keep on paying. It's breaking my back. I'll break your back if you try to welch, Kramer. I give you the price before you took my dough. One for ten a week. I, I can't do it, Shelley. I don't I, like I to just... intrude, gentlemen, but I'd like some information. What? Who are you, wise guy? Nick Carter's the name. Nick Carter. Hey, Kramer, did no, you... No, 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 honest... Honest, Nick, what's going on? Nothing, lady, nothing. I'll be going, Kramer. I'll see you later. Nick, what's going on here? It's obvious Mr. Kramer's been caught in a loan shark racket. Something pretty well known to the police. But something that can't be stopped until the victims are willing to give evidence. What was that one for ten they were talking about? Mr. Kramer pays a dollar a week for every ten he borrowed. Right, Mr. Kramer? I... I don't want to talk about it, Mr. Carter. It, it, It ain't safe. If, if I could only just lay my hands on $1,500 and, and, and get out from under... Mr. Kramer, yeah. we, we've got a letter for you. Huh? It's seven years old. Seven years? That, that don't make no sense. Well, this letter was mailed to you, but never delivered because something happened to the postman, Robert Draper. Remember him? Draper? Oh, yes, yes, of course. A, a friendly little fella. Blue eyes he had. Bald. He wore a handlebar mustache. A handlebar mustache? Yeah, yeah. I, I even remember the day he scrammed. Hacky, who used to keep his cab in my garage, he saw Draper. He drove him and another guy someplace. Yes, go on. Where was he driven? Who was the man? Now, now, now leave me think, Mr. Carter. It was such a long time ago. I, I can't even Kramer, think... I want the name and address of that cab driver. Well, let me... I, I, I remember now. It was... Nick! Someone's five feet around the Yes, door. Kramer's been hit. Oh, but Nick, the killer. You've got to get Kramer's evidence. The killer can wait. Patsy, get to a phone. Call an ambulance quick. Right. Got me bad. Kramer, listen. Can you hear me? Who drove with Draper in the cab? Oh, no. Where'd they drive? Shelley's bowling alley. The thug we just met, huh? Good. Do me a favor. Anything you say, Kramer. That... That seven-year-old letter. Read it to me. Certainly. I... Mr. Ben Kramer, dear sir, we are happy to inform you that your contribution has won second prize in our slogan contest. And close, please find money orders totaling $1,500. $1,500? Uh, uh, Why, that's just what Mr. Kramer needs to pay off. Mr. Kramer doesn't need any money anymore, does he? Oh. He's dead. Birthday greetings, seven years old. And now murder from a delayed mail delivery. What new and strange developments will arise from Nick's odd mission? We'll see in just a moment. The wisest worker is the one who saves as much work as possible, yet gets the job done. That's efficiency. And the efficient way to take perfect care of your floors and linoleum is to depend upon Linac's self-polishing wax. 
Try it just once and prove to your complete satisfaction that here is the ideal way to new beauty for your floors. It takes only a jiffy to wipe Linex self-polishing wax on any hardwood, linoleum, or rubber tile floor, and it dries without tiresome rubbing to a handsome luster. You'll notice that Linex self-polishing wax gives that satiny beauty only real wax can give. You'll find, when you step on that floor, that Linex self-polishing wax is the anti-skid finish, for your floor will be less slippery than it was to start with. This fact has been proved by the underwriter's laboratories. And you'll be delighted with the way the finish lasts, for Linex self-polishing wax has the highest possible content of genuine Carnauba wax. Yes, this new formula, developed by leading research chemists to give you the finest, is well worth trying. And once you've tried it, you'll follow the example of all those wise American women who use it regularly. So ask your dealer now for Linex self-polishing wax for all three great Linex home brighteners, the modern shortcuts to household beauty. And now back to our story. Investigating the strange disappearance of Robert Draper, postman, accused of absconding with registered securities he was carrying... Nick and Patsy pick up the trail of the old mystery by delivering mail found in the postman's abandoned pouch. Now we find them in the street after the sudden murder of one of their witnesses. Well, what do we do now, Nick? Wait for the homicide squad to arrive? Oh, no. Sergeant Matheson will only hold us up, call us material witnesses and all that. Now I want to get on with the case. At the Shelley bowling alley? No, not yet, Patsy. We haven't enough evidence for a direct frontal attack on Mr. Shelley. Oh. Let's get on with the mail delivery. There are more clues waiting for us to pick them up. Who's next? A uh, postcard addressed to Mr. Parker Flint's Homewood House. Homewood House, huh? Mm-hmm. That's the exclusive apartment house in the corner facing the river. Uh-huh. Come on. Let's see what Mr. Flint can tell us. Good afternoon, Mr. Flint. Your butler said we'd find you here in your aviary. Oh, uh... Uh, good afternoon. You've got a charming place here, Mr. Flint. Yes, I, I'd like it. I suppose I look silly pottered around in a glass house filled with a lot of birds, but, well, I, I like it. Uh, uh, let's step into my living room. We can talk better there. Eh? We won't keep you from your hobby long, Mr. Flint. Let me introduce myself. I'm Nick Carter. This is my secretary, Patsy Bourne. Get out of here. Beg your pardon? Get out of my house. But Mr. Flint, now, you... let's get this straight. I hate police. I'll have nothing to do with police anywhere, anytime. Now get out. Nick, what, what on earth is... Him? Wait, Patsy. Parker Flint. Thought that name sounded familiar. Eh? Yes, I remember. Parker Flint, third. Tried and convicted of second-degree murder seven years ago. Oh, you remember, eh? You also happen to remember that Parker Flint the Third, my grandson, is serving a life sentence in state prison right now? I do. And will your capable memory recollect that he was innocent? That he was convicted on clumsy circumstantial evidence that would have made an idiot laugh? Well, what do you mean? Young Flint claimed he was on a walking tour across the country. The murder of an enemy of Parker's was committed August 30th, 1938, in this city. And on that day, he was 50 miles outside town in a village named Samson. The defense couldn't prove it, Mr. Flint. So they convicted him. Not because he was guilty, but because they hadn't anyone else. Make an example, they screamed. Show there's some the same justice for rich and poor alike. Uh, they made an example, all right. And then you'll be interested in the case I'm working on, Mr. Flint. Eh? Another man runs the risk of unjust conviction. I'll have nothing to do with the police. Go on, get out. But Nick's not a police. Mr. Then. Flint, justice sometimes miscarries. Men are wrongfully convicted and sentenced. It's a human factor in law that can't be avoided. I made it my job to prevent that factor of human error as far as possible. Now, I'll help you with your case, Mr. Flint, but you've got to help me with mine. Eh? Well, what? what is your case? It's your old postman, Robert Draper. Draper, oh, I remember him well. Know him well, in fact. Supposed to have disappeared about seven years ago. Supposed? Yes, he did disappear, though. I saw him around this neighborhood seven weeks afterwards. Uh, Act as suspicious. Uh, though he was hiding, had his head wrapped up in a turban. A turban? Golly. Yeah, what's more, he seemed to be afraid of someone called Gray. Seemed to see this Gray everywhere. Gray, huh? That's interesting. Very interesting. 
Anything else that might help? No, 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 that's all. And now, Mr. Carter, about about my case. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry I lost my temper, but you understand, don't you? D- do you think you could offer any, any hope or anything? Yes, Mr. Flynn. I can give you more than hope. I'll give you back your grandson. Oh. In the form of this postcard that should have been delivered seven years ago. A postcard? From your grandson. Sent from the village of Sampson, New York, postmarked August 30th, 1938. Oh, which proves he was where he claimed he was. Heaven. Congratulations, Mr. Flint. This is the one piece of evidence that'll free him. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Nick, how do we stand? Any closer to the vanishing postman? Yes, indeed, Patsy. Mr. Flint brought us a good deal closer. How so? That turban, for one thing, is very significant. And Draper's fear of someone called Gray, even more so. But we haven't come across anyone named Gray so far. Now hold everything, Patsy. Here's our next stop. Residence of Miss Jennifer West. Miss West's got a seven-year-old package coming to her. Well, let's hope we can trade it for information. Information, Mr. Carter, about our missing postman? Yes, Miss West. Well, I really don't know any... Oh, excuse me. Hello? Oh, hello, darling. No, no, you're wrong. It's the orphan benefit. No, no, the 18th. I put you down for a box. No, certainly you can't get out of it, dear. It's a worthy cause. Yes, yes. All right, bye. Now, let's see, uh, where were we? You were going to tell us what you remember about Mr. Draper's disappearance. Oh, but I don't know anything. I don't even remember him. Well, here's a photograph of him. Hmm, no, oh, no, I'm sorry. It isn't a bit familiar. But I have such a miserable memory for faces. And in my work these days, I see so many. Day in and day out. Child Welfare Association, the canteen, the city hospital... City Hospital. Oh, I met the most interesting man there yesterday. He was in the psychiatric wing, room 325. Oh, but Miss West, we... the strangest um... disease. Monochromatism, they call it. And he's so cheerful about it. Monochromatism? Oh, it's a technical name for blindness of some kind. Such a nice man. His name was, his name was, uh, was Gray. Gray? Mm. Oh, Nick. I heard, Patsy. Thanks a million for your help, Miss West. Mm. And here's your reward. This long overdue package. Seven years overdue. Why? Why, that's Gary Horton's handwriting. Oh. Once upon a time, Miss Bowen, I... I thought Gary and I might... Oh, well, you understand. Yes, Miss West. But he's so very shy, and I... Oh. Oh, look, my dear. It... It's flowers. Artificial flowers. No, they're not artificial. That's a bouquet of live forever flowers. And they're from... Gary. Oh, here's a card. Dearest Jen, I've been wanting to ask you this for a long time. Never had the courage. Now I have. Will you... Oh, Miss West, it's a proposal. Seven years ago. And he never knew I hadn't received. He thought my silence meant... Oh, oh, excuse me, please. Uh, let's get out of here, Betsy. I have an idea that for the first time today, Miss West's phone is going to hear her say yes. So now we're headed for Shelley's bowling alley. Huh, Nick? Right. But why now? Why don't we hustle up and see that man, Gray? The one Draper was afraid of. You'll see. Hmm? Here's where we stop. Let's go. Nick, what happened to the postman? Was he murdered by Shelley? Did Shelley murder Kramer, too? Come on, come on, come on. Oh, golly, what a busy place. And there's our old friend, Mr. Shelley. Mm-hmm. Hello, Shelley. Mind if we have a chat? Now, look, don't come pussyfooting around my place. You got nothing on me, Carter. Oh, that's what you think. Bluff it ain't gonna do no good. Don't try and tell me Kramer talked. He knows better. Kramer can't talk. He was murdered. He... He was what? Murdered. Shot to death. You're lying. He was murdered in an attempt to keep me from uncovering the secret of Robert Draper's disappearance. Draper, the postman? This is a famous, Carter. Still innocent, huh, Shelley? 
Well, suppose you come over to the city hospital with us. Oh, city hospital, eh? Now I know it's a frame. I heard one of your plain clothes men call in city hospital this afternoon, finding out the visiting hours, getting a beautiful frame up, all worked out, and from my own joint, too. What's that? I ain't taking cards on this deal, Carter. I'm getting out of here. Nicky, he's running out. Aren't you going to go after him? That's it. What time is it? Uh, 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 five of eight. And we've got five minutes. Visiting hour starts at eight at the hospital. Nick, what are you talking about? I never thought he'd go that far, Patsy. Come on. We've got to stop a visitor at the hospital tonight. Who? His name is Death. Oh, not so fast, Nick. You can stop and rest. I've got to keep going. We're all sticking out. Where are we headed? To the east wing of the hospital. Psychiatry. What time is it? Uh, two minutes after eight. We may have enough time then. Eight. We're going to see that man Gray, aren't we? Yes. Miss West said he was in room 325. Well, this is 315. 317. 319. Here we are, 325. Yes, it says on the card, monochromatic blindness. You can read the card later, Patsy. Inside, Mm. hurry. Hey, pitch dark in here. Careful, Patsy. (gasps) Ouch, I... Oh, I just bumped into one of those rolling tables. Where's the light, Nick? Get down, Patsy. It's a killer. Get out of the way. Where's that rolling table? Here it goes, Patsy. Oh, you got him, Nick. I heard the gun drop. It's only the beginning, Patsy. But the beginning of the end for a... Uh, I found you, huh? Oh, Nick, oh, careful. Oh, no, you don't, mister. Oh, no. At least not without a gun. Oh, Nick. There. I got a wise steel. Patsy. Yes, Nick? Try and find the light. Probably alongside the door. Yeah. I've got it. Nick, you're sitting on Dan Barnes. Right, Patsy. Dan Barnes, Robert Draper's son-in-law. Barnes is a thief who robbed Robert Draper's mailbag of $10,000 worth of security seven years ago. It was Barnes who took for himself the $12,000 which Draper had saved up before he disappeared. And it was Barnes who hoped to collect 20000 more in life insurance if Draper stayed lost seven full years so he could be declared legally dead. But, but that man in the bed... That's not the same man as in our picture. Well, nevertheless, Patsy, that unconscious gentleman, a near victim of suffocation at the hands of Dan Barnes, is our long-lost postman, Mr. Robert Draper. In just a moment, Nick will be back to give you the final details of today's story and tell you how he was able to locate the vanishing postman. You know, fine furniture doesn't keep its good looks without help. Not when dust and finger marks and polish accumulation combine to lessen its beauty. But Linex Cream Polish disposes of all those bugbears in short order. For Linex Cream Polish actually cleans as it polishes, renewing your furniture's original handsome appearance in one quick process. Yes, Linex Cream Polish cuts your job in two, saves one whole step in your cleaning day routine. It even acts as insurance against future work, for Linex Cream Polish dries hard, leaving no oily film to attract more dust. So begin now. Get Linex Cream Polish and learn for yourself the modern way to caring for fine furniture. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners, Linex Cream Polish, Linex Self-Polishing Wax, and Linex Clear Gloss, the longer-lasting brush-on finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And remember that your dealer is headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that lightens and brightens your home at an average cost of just $2.98 a room. Chemtone covers in one coat, dries in one hour. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Nick, I still don't understand. What happened to Draper seven years ago? As I see it, here's the story, Patsy. Seven years ago, Draper met his son-in-law, Barnes, as usual, to go home and have lunch with him. Uh He probably confided in Barnes that he was carrying valuable securities and a registered letter. Barnes is the only man Draper would have told, since a postman's job is highly confidential. Well, that's right. They don't go around telling strangers what they carry. All right. Well, on some pretext or other, Barnes lured Draper to the alley behind Shelley's place and shot him. And he took the securities from the bag and left. He thought he'd killed Draper, but the bullet only creased Draper's head, rendering him unconscious. Oh, uh, then what happened? Draper recovered consciousness, but he was badly wounded. Mm. The shock of the wound 
produced amnesia, and the wound itself produced a brain condition called monochromatism. That's day blindness. The victim can only see at night. By day, he's practically blind and can only see vague shades of gray. So that's what Mr. Flint meant. That's it. And that's what the turban meant. Oh. It was Draper's bewildered attempt to bandage his head. For a few days, he wandered about, dazed, without memory, mumbling that he could only see gray. Finally, he was picked up and taken to the hospital. Barnes, who must have seen him wandering around in a dazed condition, realized he was safe so long as Draper's mind was gone and Draper was lost to the public. So he decided to let matters ride and wait. And then we came into the case. Only, I can't understand one thing. Why didn't anybody identify the picture of Draper when you showed it to them? Because it wasn't Draper's picture. What? I realized that when Kramer told me Draper had a mustache, remember? Mm Mm-hmm. Barnes was alarmed when he learned we were on the trail and cleverly handed us a photo of another person, hoping it would throw us off the scent. Oh. Then he followed us as we delivered the mail, waiting to see what would happen. And it was he who shot Kramer just as Kramer was about to give us the information we wanted. And when it became evident we were tracking Draper down, his hand was forced. And then he went to the hospital to try to murder him a second time. Right, Patsy. Unfortunately, Barnes didn't realize that murder is bad medicine. It never cures anything. Not when you're around, Nick. Well, Nick, what's the story for next week? You remember the case of the frightened social director, Patsy? The man who scattered torn newspaper in preparation for a paper chase and found... Oh, yes, I remember. The next morning when the paper chase started, they found that one of the trails was made of torn $10 bills. What are you going to call the case, Nick? The Factory of Death. Now, a final word from Nick Carter. And a very important word, too, Ken. Friends, right now, there is no better thing you can do for the protection of America's future and your own than to buy United States victory bonds. And by all means, hold your United States war bonds. Help to keep America secure. Help to prevent inflation. Help in the transition from wartime to peacetime by buying and keeping your war bonds until they mature. And by buying those all-important victory bonds, now. Nick Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson plays Patsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Alfred Bester... And any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week. By the three great Linux home brightness. Linux self-polishing wax, Linux cream polish, and Linux clear gloss. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America. And saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Philip Shaw, Johnny. Oh, fine. What have you got for me? Mr. Dale Martin is insured with National. He owns a gym, one of those bodybuilding places. Man was killed there. When did it happen? This morning, about an hour ago. Now, we don't know if it's an accident or not. The police are over there now. Anything to work on? Nothing. That's why I called you. Better get over there right away. I'll do it. But I don't take off my shirt. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar.
Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, it's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, National All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the blackmail matter. <music> Expense account item one, one dollar and forty cents. Cab fare and tip for ride from my office to Martin's Gym. After receiving what little information there was from you by phone, I arrived at 1215 at 1084 6th Avenue in the heart of downtown. On the second floor, I found Dale Martin, a very nervous Adonis, seated at a desk in his office. A policeman at the door informed me that a Lieutenant Nathan of the homicide detail had stepped out for a minute and the coroner was expected soon. Mr. Martin? Yeah? I'm Johnny Dollar from the National Insurance Company. Oh, that's the outfit I'm insured with. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm here. I want to get the facts in case there's any claim. Now, tell me, what happened? I don't know. I went back to the locker room to check on the towels, and I found him lying on the floor. Found who? Uh, his name's Royal, Frederick Royal. He's been coming up here for over a year. Well, why did you call the police and not a doctor? Because I think he was murdered. Why murdered? Well, I've seen a lot of accidents around this gym, but never saw anything like this. It, it wasn't an accident. What makes you so sure? Well, it looked like his neck was broken. I don't know how it happened, so I call the police. That a publicity's going to ruin what little business I have. Murder always ruins something. You got any idea who might have done it? No. Who was in the place when you discovered the body? My three assistants and three fellows working out. They all still here? Yeah, all of them. Nobody else left or came in? They're just the cops, but business is real slow. Huh. Does everybody know about it? No, I took the body and put it back in the rub-down room. Haven't even told my boys. Well, the officer at the door won't let anybody leave, so let's have a look at the body and see what we can find out. <laughs> Martin left one of his boys to answer the phone, and everyone else was keeping busy wrestling with weights as he led me through the locker room. The one man was taking a shower. At the end of the room, he unlocked the door, and we walked in. The smell of rubbing alcohol was strong enough to give you a hangover. There were white curtains separating two rubbing tables. The first one was empty. In back of that curtain, Mr. Dollar. Okay. Not very pretty. Mm -mm. Circus rubber man would need vulcanizing if he turned his head that far. Busted neck, all right. You wish the coroner would get in and take him away. It hurts me seeing his head hanging like that. Why don't you move him? Oh, no, sir, not me. I caught a good from little town for moving him in here. Well, don't worry about Mr. Royal. He can't feel a thing. <laughs> Lieutenant Nathan arrived with the coroner, and the latter confirmed our diagnosis. Nathan had Martin keep his clients and assistant muscle men busy. They started comparing biceps and forgot anybody else was there. Nathan was an old friend, so I didn't have to convince him that I was there on business. You saw the corpse, a dollar? Yeah, I took a pair of pretty strong hands to do a job like that. Yeah, that makes everybody around here a suspect. Got any ideas? Yeah, you'd have to know a man pretty well to let him get that close to you without starting something. Yeah, somebody could have been rubbing a kink out of his neck and got carried away with his work. Yeah. Why don't we start asking some questions? Yeah, I'll go out and round up everybody. Might as well start at the beginning. Nathan herded everyone together and the questioning started. The men were very unhappy. This bad publicity that couldn't be helped. Mr. Robert Wells, songwriter, Mr. Michael Darling, car salesman, and the third and last, Mr. Patrick Mullins, jeweler. (laughs) 
Three prosperous men, three prosperous denials. The assistants came next, the three men who worked for Martin. First, Bernie Carroll, the man who'd instructed Fred Royal, the one who'd put him through his exercises and sent him in to take a shower before he cooled off and got stiff. Sure. I worked him out and sent him in the shower like always. We tell him to take a good long hot shower to relax the muscles. Isn't that right, Dale? That's right, Lieutenant. That's the way it works. Bernie left him one over to start on Mr. Wells. Bernie's a pretty strong boy. Yeah. Any one of us could have gone to the locker room at one time or another, Lieutenant. You found him, didn't you, Mr. Martin? Yeah. Why did you happen to go back to the locker room at that particular time? Well, I do it every day. Check on a towel, soap, see that everybody has everything you need. <laughs> Question after question, trying to nail down alibis, trying to make them stick or tear them apart. According to everybody so far, it it was a big mystery. Next man, Jack Olson. Yeah, I went back by the locker room several times. Why? Well, there's an electric coffee maker on a table against the wall back there. I want to get some coffee. Mm-hmm. The other times? Well, once to look at the appointment board and see what's coming in, later to get some chalk for my hands. Chalk for your hands? Keeps your hands from aspiring, making blisters, you know, when you're working with heavy weights. Mm. You're fairly new here, aren't you, Jack? Mm. Three weeks. How'd you know that, Dollar? Well, the other boys all have heavy calluses. They don't use chalk. You know quite a bit about this weightlifting stuff, huh? Oh, sure. I used to lift candy bars when I was a kid. All right, mm. all right. Call in the last one. The last man, Johnny Morgan, and his story was no different than the others. Yes, he'd walked back past the locker room. No, he had not slipped in and popped Mr. Royal's neck while he was preparing to take his shower. The coroner removed the body, and all the rest went down to the precinct to sign formal statements. They were all released and sent home, pending further investigation. I hailed a cab and rode home with Dale Martin. Would you like some apple or carrot juice? Well, I'll try anything once. Good for you. Yeah, I figured that. You didn't kill him, did you, Martin? Don't be silly. He was the best customer I had. I wouldn't kill off, kill off my business. Here. Thanks. You have any ideas, Dollar? No. Nope. <sighs> How long did you say Fred Royal had been coming to your gym? Over a year. What do you know about him? Not much. He was a wolf like the girls. Always talking about the gal he was out with the night before. I got tired of his gab. I put him straight. You know what business he was in? Whatever it was, he had a lot of money. Wore a new suit every time he came around. Oh, excuse me. Hello? Oh, just a minute. For you, Dollar. Oh, thanks. Hello? I got something on the dead man. Got a record. Blackmail. You know where he lived? We're checking. Oh, wait a minute. Now, Martin... You wouldn't by any chance know where Fred Royal lived, would you? Well, I uh, bill to him every month. I got my books here in the apartment. I'll get the address. Oh, Nathan, Martin's got his address. I found something else in his personal effects. Key to a safety deposit box. Boys are checking to see which bank. Here's the mm-hmm. address, Dollar. Fred Royal, 673 East Weeping Willow Circle. I told Nathan I'd meet him at Royal's place. I downed my liquefied carrots, said goodbye to Martin... Half an hour later, the lieutenant and yours truly, Johnny Dollar, were tearing Mr. Fred Royal's apartment to pieces. Ah, uh, nothing. Hey, I came up empty, too. Hey. What's the matter? Here's a date book. Good. Maybe we've been working on a holiday. Let's see. Here's a name, Barbara Carroll. Carroll? That's the name of one of Martin's muscle trainers, Bernie Carroll. Mm, same name on some of the other pages. The fifth... Barbara, 6 o'clock. Again on the 2nd, Barbara, 8 o'clock. Again on the 28th and 22nd. Wonder if there's any connection. Oh, it might be his sister. Let's give it a try. Bernie and Barbara Carroll. Sounds like something they'd play at the palace. Well, let's go see their act. Here's the apartment. They live with that new fellow. Jack Olson. Yeah, the other quiet one. Police. Yes? I'm Lieutenant Nathan Homicide. This is Johnny Dollar. How you do? How you do? We'd like to talk to you, Miss Carroll. Well, certainly, Lieutenant. Come here. Thank you. I was just making some lemonade. Would you like some? Yeah, thanks. It is pretty hot out. 
Maybe you'd like something stronger. No, thanks. The lieutenant's on duty. I, uh, I guess you've heard about the accident. Like your lemonade sweet, lieutenant? Medium, please. Here you are. Oh, thank you. Your brother didn't mention anything about your going out with Royal. He was probably protecting his little sister. The lieutenant found your name written in Royal's date book. I've been out with him six or seven times. You know what his business was? He never discussed it. Did you ever meet any of his friends? No. Did he ever mention any of the other fellows at the gym? At the gym? I don't think so. Uh Uh-huh. Jack Olson lives here, doesn't he? That's right. Whose picture is that on the piano? Oh, that's Jack's father. You don't have any idea why anyone would want to kill Royal, do you? No. How did uh, Jack Olson happen to move in here with you and your brother? Bernie asked him to. When he went to work for Martin, he was living in a terrible place. One small room. I told Bernie he could move in here if he shared the rent. Mm-hmm. How well did Olson know Royal? He'd seen him at the gym. Seen him here when he came to pick me up. Mm. Where's Olson now? Working, I think. Well, thanks, Miss Carroll. We'll be talking to you again. More lemonade? Later, maybe, Miss Carroll. <laughs> Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley Spearmint Gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying sports and other activities. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good any time. And the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Three in the afternoon. Out of Barbara Carroll's cool apartment and down in the blistering street. The thermometer crowding 90 and the humidity sticking to us like a steaming blanket. I feel awful. Terrible day to solve a murder. I want to go look through some newspaper files. What for? That picture on the piano. Jack Olson's father? Yeah. I've seen it someplace before. It's a news story connected with it. Yeah, I'll drop you off. i got to get back to the precinct, see if the boys have found the safety deposit box that fits Fred Royal's key. Nathan dropped me off with a newspaper, and I went down to the morgue to do some hunting. The air conditioning made the job easier, and by four o'clock, I was headed for Nathan's office. We found the bank and the safe deposit box. Oh? Anything turn up? Yeah, yeah. Royal was doing some pretty fancy blackmailing. Here's a bundle of evidence and a list of names. Mm hmm. Hmm. Well, I can understand why someone would pay to keep these out of circulation. Yeah. Lousy battalion, isn't it? What'd you find out? Here. Mm, newspaper clipping. Oh, picture of Jack Olson's father. Same as the one on the piano. Prominent banker leaps to death. William Barrett. William Barrett? The boy's name is Olson. That's what he calls himself. William Barrett. Barrett, give me that list we got out of the deposit box. I've just been looking at it. William Barrett's name is on here, all right. That article you've got on his suicide mentions that he left a son and a wife. Yeah. Well, let's go pick up Jack Olson or Barrett or whatever his name is. Well, it might not have meant a thing, but at least we had found one person who had a strong connection with Frederick Royal other than socially. The boy who called himself Jack Olson was the son of one William Barrett, deceased, and one of Fred Royal's blackmail victims. Barrett had jumped off a tall building, 
and according to the newspaper, he had left no reason for his actions. There was a possibility that Fred Royal's blackmail had driven him to it, and if that was so, his son would have had a very strong reason for wanting to break Mr. Fred Royal's neck. We climbed into a squad car and hurried back to Barbara Carroll's apartment, where Jack Olson lived as a boarder. Now, let's go. Hey, wait a minute. Well, what's wrong? Jack Olson, coming out of the building. All right, we pick him up on the street. He's hailing a cab. All right, let's see where he's going. Wouldn't it be easier to just ask him? Oh, stop trying to ruin my afternoon. You know, there's nothing more relaxing than a pleasant drive through quiet, peaceful old New England. We started tailing Jack Olson's cab. Across town. Along the Merrick Parkway. Across a bridge. He's headed for Long Island. Well, your Connecticut badge won't be much good over there. We kept going. Across the Sound past the outskirts of a couple of waterfront towns and onto a long highway. Pretty expensive cab ride. Pretty expensive. Pretty important. Yeah. Well, they're turning off on that road. Hope we don't lose them. We took the road to the right off the highway and spotted the cab up ahead, pulling into the entrance of a large white building. The sign over the tall iron gate read... Lakeview Sanitarium. We waited for him to go in. Yes? Is there something I can do for you? I'm looking for a man. Oh, any particular man? Oh, who's in charge of this place? Uh, Dr. Feather. Well, run him out, please. I want to talk to him. Which one of you is the patient? Patient? Can't you tell? Look, just go get Dr. Fodder. Fedder. Oh, Fedder, okay. Go get him and tell him Lieutenant Nathan wants to talk to him. Lieutenant Nathan? Uh, of the cavalry. What? Oh, well, I'll get him right away. <laughs> Lieutenant. Hey, <laughs> you think that's funny, huh? Oh, well, I liked it. Let's see what kind of a reaction it gets out of Dr. Fedder. Cavalry. Nice thing to say in a place like this. Uh... Lieutenant Nathan? Yeah, that's right. I'm Dr. Petter. Oh, this is Mr. Dollar. How do you do? How do you do? Now, are you related? No, but we've been friends a long, long time, haven't we, Nate? Yeah, I'm a police officer, Doctor. Oh. We've been following a man. He came in here a few minutes ago. Is that right? The lieutenant thinks he might be a killer. I is can he... handle this, Dollar. Uh-huh. Doctor, I'm with Central Division Homicide. This isn't my territory, but I'd appreciate it. Uh, which one of you is the patient? Oh, now, look, this is getting a little ridiculous. Here are my credentials. Oh. The man we want came in here a few minutes ago. Well, Mr. Barrett is the only one... And his real name is Barrett. Who's he seeing? His mother. What's wrong with his mother? Mrs. Barrett is seriously ill. Have anything to do with her husband's suicide? Everything to do with it. I doubt if Mrs. Barrett will ever recover. We went back out to the car and tried to put it all together. Jack's father had jumped off a roof. He was being blackmailed and couldn't take it. The shock of his suicide had driven Mrs. Barrett into a permanent breakdown. And Fred Royal had been responsible for the whole thing. Motive enough for Jack to get a job with Dale Martin so he could get his hands on Fred Royal's neck... Cavalry. Oh, stop groaning. Tell me what you think of my theory. We still need a confession. We'll get it. Mind if I make a pest of myself and ask how? Let's ride back to town and see Dale Martin. You're going to come up and take a workout in a rub tomorrow, huh? That's right, Martin. And I want you to make sure that Olson takes care of me. Did he do it, Dollar? I think so. But why? He seems like such a nice kid. He had a pretty good reason. But we need a confession, and Dollar has an idea how to get it. I want Olsen working on me through the whole workout, especially when I get on the rubbing table. You're in pretty good shape, Mr. Dollar. Well, I'm carrying a few extra pounds. I will knock that off of you in a hurry. 
Don't try to talk while you're using the pulleys. Hi. Hi, Martin. He's in pretty good shape, Mr. Martin. Now, let's see. Yeah, better not do too much on the stomach the first day. I'll see you later, Mr. Dollar. Nice fellow, Martin. Yeah, very nice. Tell me, have you uh, found out anything about Mr. Royal's death? Oh, the police have got a few ideas. The lieutenant and I went up to see your roommate's sister. Yeah, Barbara told me. I hope you don't suspect her. She kind of liked Mr. Royal. She wouldn't have any reason to kill him. All right, let's go back to the rub table before you cool off. Huh? You don't mind going in there, do you? No. Why should I? Oh, some people are funny about rooms where there's been a dead person, you know? It doesn't bother me, Mr. Dollar. <clears throat> Martin's got all his towels piled on the other table. I can move them if you like. Oh, no, no. It doesn't make any difference. Royal wasn't killed in here anyway. All right. Up on your back. Yeah. Give me a good brisk rub. Let me relax for about ten minutes. All right. Slide down a little. Yeah. Uh, what'd you do before you came to work for Martin, Jack? Oh, not much. Went to school, finally decided to look for a job. Found this one. You ever study this sort of thing? No. No, there's really not much to it. Martin shows us how to use the machines, to help the clients, and rub the neck and back. Well, then all you need is a good build, a strong pair of hands, huh? Yeah, yeah I guess so. Your family live in Hartford? No. I noticed the picture of your father on Barbara's piano. Fine-looking man. He's dead now. Oh, sorry. So am I. Your mother still living? No. Oh! Oh, I'm sorry. Am I rubbing too hard? No, oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> well, you certainly got the strength for the job. Yeah, I'll turn off the vibrator and just use my hand. Do you... Police find out anything about Mr. Royal? Yeah. He was a blackmailer. Ow! Oh, I'm awfully sorry. I'm a little nervous today. Maybe I'd better get one of the other fellows to finish a rub. Oh, no, no, no. That's all right. I'm just a little tied up. The neck is stiff. Try and relax. Guess I keep thinking about Royal and his broken neck. You think I might break yours, Mr. Dollar? <laughs> well, wouldn't be hard... If I was good and relaxed, you could snap it in a second. Yeah. Yes, I could. So Mr. Royal was a blackmailer, huh? Yeah. Had a record. They're the foulest people on earth. Yeah, they certainly are. They can ruin a lot of lives. Probably why he was murdered. You think he was blackmailing someone here in the gym? Oh, not necessarily. Well, if he wasn't, then no one in the shop would have a motive for killing him. Well, I've got a theory about that. I think someone in this gym hated him so much that they waited until no one was looking and Royal was all alone. And they slipped in on him and twisted his neck until it broke and he strangled. Why would they hate him so much if he wasn't blackmailing him? He might have been blackmailing someone very close and dear to the killer. Maybe the person Royal was blackmailing couldn't stand it. Committed suicide. It's an interesting theory. Take your family, for instance. Oh, no, I'm sorry. You weren't relaxing. Supposing Royal was blackmailing a member of your family. Your father, for instance. I can't rub your neck unless you relax more. Maybe your father couldn't take it. Maybe he couldn't pay him anymore. And instead of disgracing his family, he committed suicide. Just turn your head a little to the side, Mr. Dollar. That better? Much. Well, if that happened to my family, Mr. Dollar, I guess I would kill Mr. Royal, not mind a bit. How does your father die, Jack? He jumped off a roof. Now, if you just turn your head a little more, I'll try to pop your vertebrae, huh? We followed you out to Long Island yesterday, Jack. I'm going to adjust your neck, Mr. Dollar. It's better if you relax so it won't hurt. Uh, well, if you wanted to, you could pop it anyway. I couldn't stop you in time. No, I don't guess you could. Now, now the other side, huh? 
Did you kill Fred Royal? Yes. Relax. All right, Mr. Dollar. Let's go down to the police station. Lieutenant's outside with Martin. After you, Mr. Barrett. Nathan took Jack Barrett down to the station and got from him a signed confession. I went with Martin, and with every drink I saw another Barrett. So finally I gave it up and came up here to my office. Expense account, item two, four dollars and fifty-three cents, one-fifth of very dry gin. Martin forgot his health and hygiene for a couple of hours and finished what I didn't drink. Item three, sixteen dollars seventy-five cents. Cab fare for a ride up through the country, all by myself. Expense account total, twenty-two dollars and sixty-eight cents. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment, Treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Milton Charles. Featured in tonight's cast were Edgar Barrier, High Averback, Hal March, Jim Nusser, Tony Barrett, and Virginia Gregg. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at the same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Buy wisely. Buy for flavor. Buy Del Monte. Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Time now for Rocky Jordan, brought to you today by Del Monte Tomato Products. Not far from the Musk Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against the backdrop of antiquity. Del Monte Foods presents Rocky Jordan and this week's story, Gold Fever. It all 
all started when the phone at the head of the tambourine bar opened up along in the afternoon. Chris was serving a lonely customer at one of the side tables, so I got up front and answered it. Yeah, Cafe Tambourine. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, who is it? I must speak to Jordan Bay. This is Jordan Bay. I must make no mistake. Are you sure? Look, I don't know who I am. What is this? You must hurry, Jordan Bay. Come as quickly as you can. Who said so? Pete Servos. He must see you at once without delay. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Who did you say? Pete Servos. Servos? Come right away, Jordan Bay. As quickly as you can. Well, where do I find him? Hello? Where do I find him? Where... Oh, great. Pete Cerevos. That could be only one man, and his name meant only one thing, gold. The kind you never find, only dirt and sweat and too much heartache. Yeah, Cerevos had gold fever the worst way. I guess he'd always had it. He talked me into scratching around with him in the High Sierras once a long time ago. All the gold we ever found could have been picked up on the point of a pin. Well, I got my fill of it and finally gave up, but Pete was off to chase some other rainbow. And that was the last I'd seen of him. And why he was in Cairo and what he wanted to see me about was anybody's guess. And where I'd find him was a little point my caller had neglected to tell me. A disturbing phone call, Mr. Jordan? With my mind on the servos puzzle, I only half heard the voice. It came from my lone customer at a nearby table. He'd been frequenting the tambourine the last few days. A big, ruddy, solid set man. A combination of poise and strength named von Rudstedt from across Africa in the Boer country. Uh, not that it is any of my affair, understand. Uh, light for your cigarette, Mr. Jordan. Eh? Oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I fear that I am becoming a fixture in your cafe. Well, uh, a wanderer gets the habit of settling in a spot where he feels at home. Well, stay as long as you like. Ah, you are generous. Uh, will you sit down? Yeah, okay. You, um, been around the continent much, Mr. Jordan? Africa? Oh, not much. Ah, remarkable changes since the war, especially in the past few months. Hmm? The recent gold strike in South Africa, for example. Gold strike? What brought that up? Oh, just a passing thought. You know, they tell me you're something of an adventurer, but... Oh, still worried about the phone call, Mr. Jordan? Huh? Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Van Rootstead. I was just wondering why you have not thought of chasing after some of the yellow stuff. Oh, no, no. Gave that up years ago. Ah, you can never be sure. Once he has felt it, the lust for gold lies dormant in every man. Yeah, maybe so, but it's not for me. Ah, that is easy to say, but after all, when he least expects it, a man's luck might show him a rich vein one way or another. Is that not so? Yeah, you might say that. Ah, one never knows, Mr. Jordan. One never knows. <laughs> Von Rutstedt broke it off about then and went out into the street. I stayed close to the phone, and what seemed like hours later, it began ringing again. Uh, hello, Tambourine. Hello, hello. I must speak to Jordan Bay. Look, I'm Jordan Bay. Oh, where are you, Jordan Bay? Where do you think I am? Where's Servos? Pete Servos? He's waiting for you. Why do you not come? One little detail. How do I find him? I told you. Are you Jordan Bay? For the last time, where is he? Where does he live? The address. Oh, Oh, so careless of me. Come on now, let's have it. Room 207 at the Pyramid House. Hurry, Jordan Bay. I got outside, flagged down a taxi, and made a quick deal with a driver to look up the Pyramid House. He honked his way across the Musky Bazaar and finally pulled up in front of an ancient brownstone affair. A little more on the ratty side than most. I told the cabbie to wait around. Then I was up the steps, down a dark hall, and knocking at 207. Who is it? It's Rocky, Pete. Get inside, Rocky. Pete, what's the matter with you? Better help me to bed. Sure, sure. Come on. Take it easy. Uh, thanks. I've been looking all over for you, Rocky. Well, I can see now why you had to send somebody else. What happened? Uh, a couple of bullets I picked up. Well, we better take care of it. No, I'm all right. Just uh, slow me down a little. Yeah, bullets will do that. Yeah. Won't they, though? How'd you get them? A lot anybody cares. Same old thing, huh, Pete? Gold? Yeah, uh, same old thing. I don't give up, Rocky. I told you to forget it while you could. Yeah, you think I could? It's been in my blood, and what can I do about it? 
I've been digging ever since I could hold up a pick. Yeah, and what'd it get you? A couple of bullets and a bunch of tattoos on your arm. Plenty of new ones since I saw you last. Oh, yeah. Hey, why the numbers tattooed there on your right arm? Oh, there? <laughs> That's my social security number. <laughs> At this rate, you'll never live to collect it. <laughs> I won't need it. Still think you'll strike it, don't you, Pete? Nobody's stopping me. Not even that no-good wife of mine. Well, I didn't know you were married. And I don't know why. What kind of a woman is it that won't stay by you? Share your dreams. Even help you dig. It's a tough life, Pete. How do you think it is for me? Yeah, stay home, she says. Give it up. But she'll be around plenty quick when there's gold. I know her. Uh, where is she now? Right here in Cairo, wouldn't you know? Checked into the Continental last week. And she can stay there. Look, Pete, if you didn't send for me about the bullets, what is it? What do you think? Well, Rocky, I finally struck it. What? Are you trying to tell I me... I found you... gold. A vein bigger than we ever dreamed about. South Africa load. After all these years, I found it. That doesn't concern me. Uh, cut it out, Rocky. You're not over the fever any more than I am. I told you, Pete, I'm through with it. Yeah. How will you hear this, Rocky? I'm putting the whole mine in your name. My name? Let Clarissa try and get her hands on it then. Let her try. It's all yours. She can't touch it. Now, wait a minute, Pete. You can't do that. We'll share 70-30. 70 goes to me. That's all right, ain't it? But that's not the idea. It's ours, Rocky. Enough gold to keep us both on easy street the rest of our lives. I told you I got over the gold fever a long time Don't ago. Don't be silly. It's great having a gold mine, ain't it? From now on, we worry about nothing. No more digging and sweating and dying. Ah, <coughs> uh, you're getting tired, Pete. Come on, let's just forget it, huh? What's there to forget? It ain't like I'm asking your favor. Take it easy, Pete. Maybe I'll see you later. Yeah? Well, you'll be back, Rocky. I ain't worrying. You'll be back. The lock snapped on the inside, and I went down the hall and down the steps. Well, that was a noon. A guy offering you a gold mine on a silver platter. But I didn't want it. I didn't want any part of it. All I wanted was some fresh air. Just as I reached the front door, somebody drew back away from the glass. I got outside in time to see him dodge into a doorway a little way down. I was sure it was my customer from the tambourine, Von Rutstedt. Right away, I remembered all his talk about gold fever. I wanted to know what he was doing there, so I went out after him. Hey, Von Rutstedt! Von Rutstedt, come back here! He ran without looking back, and all at once he was in a car and driving fast. My taxi was still waiting, so I got back and shook the cabbie awake. Oh, oh uh, do not be impatient, sir. Try and follow that car, quick. Oh, I have a very fine taxi. At times, it can go very fast. And take this pound note and get going. Here we are going, Effendi. He took that turn to the left. Oh, there is the car, far ahead. All right, don't lose it. Come on, step on it. There is no finer taxi in all of Cairo. As I say, it can go fast. Another pound note if you catch that car. It is a deal. He swung off to the right. Can you make it? Hold tightly, sir. Sir, look ahead. Pull up, Cabby. Pull up. If the car stands across the road, we are blind. Use the brake. Stop it. I am trying, but... Too late. We hit the car broadside, and the taxi front crumbled like a paper cup. One glance told me the cabby was all right, so I was out and running to the other car. And it didn't take any time to see the car was empty. Von Rutstedt was gone. Del Monte Foods is presenting tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Hey, here comes Joe Johnson in the house after a long, hot day's work in the garden. Man, am I thirsty. I sure could use something cold and refreshing to drink. Oh, I wonder what's in the refrigerator. Hey, Del Monte tomato juice. That's for me. Opener. Glass. Right, Joe, for refreshment. There's nothing like Del Monte tomato juice. Del Monte tomato juice is fresh tasting. Yes, indeed. Del Monte tomato juice is made from fresh, ripe western tomatoes, the flavor tomatoes. Mm -mm. Del Monte tomato juice is natural tasting. True. Del Monte tomatoes are rushed directly from field to cannery to protect their fresh, natural taste. <sighs> Del Monte tomato juice is refreshing. Right. 
Del Monte tomatoes are pressed immediately at the cannery to preserve all the sunny, rich goodness of those deep red, vine-ripened tomatoes. Fresh tasting, natural tasting, and refreshing. Fresh, natural, refreshing. That's Del Monte tomato juice. Look for it at your grocer's. Keep a can or two in your refrigerator. And remember, for real refreshment, buy fresh-tasting Del Monte tomato juice every time. And now back to Rocky Jordan and tonight's story, Gold Fever. Well, it took some time trying to pacify the little driver for the damage to his taxi. But I had other problems. Like von Rudstadt following me to Pete's house and why he'd run off when I tried to question him. Yeah, and I was thinking about a rich gold strike in South Africa that service wanted to hand over to me just to keep his wife Clarissa from getting any part of it. I decided it was time for a talk with her, so I went over to the Continental Hotel. Clarissa was there, but not exactly like I'd expected her. She was still young and pretty, like you want an American girl to be pretty. But there was something gone. She was thin, and the skin was taut across her cheekbones. She wasn't sure about letting me in. Who are you? My name's Jordan. Rocky Jordan. That means nothing to me. I've just been talking to your husband. I see. What does he want with me? Not a thing, Clarissa. But he's going to get well, if that interests you. What do you mean? A couple of bullets he picked up somewhere. Or didn't you know? I... I didn't know. How could I? He's your husband. Oh. And didn't Pete tell you I've come halfway around the world to Cairo to find him? To make one last try to get him to come home? Did you think he would? I... I don't know. Pete was such a good guy. He was a little like... I think you are, Rocky. Uh, He's still the same to me. We might have been happy. But every time we got settled with a home, he'd learn of some new strike and he was gone. Well, you must have known that about him before you were married. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But I didn't know what it meant. I didn't realize there was no end to it. Now he won't even see me. So now I don't care. He's still got gold on his mind, Clarissa. Yes. Well, I hate it. Hunting for gold is foul and stupid and I hate it. How about... Finding gold. He'll never find it. It so happens he has. What? Pete's finally struck it rich. I told you, Rocky, I don't care. Are you sure? What do you mean? What would you say if Pete put that mine he found in my name? I'd say he can do anything he wants with it. I'm going back home now. And forget Pete's service if it's the last thing I ever do. There's another one for you. Pete puts the mine in my name to keep his wife's hands off of it, only she tells me she doesn't want any part of it or him either. That's when I doubled back to Pete's place to get a few things straight. When I got there, the first thing I noticed was the door smashed open. Inside, the mattress was half off the bed, the bureau drawers open. Pete wasn't around, but somebody else was. Captain Sabaya, Cairo Police. Well, Jonah... Sam, what's this all about? You will touch nothing. What's happened to Service? Where is he? Pete Service at this moment is on his way to the morgue. He's dead. Dead? Does that surprise you so much, Jordan? I know he had some bullet holes, but he said he was recovering. The bullets which killed him were fired within the past hour. And a very thorough job. Any idea who did it? No. A man hasty in his opinions is neither wise nor honorable. I think you better look for somebody named Von Rutstedt, Sam. Jordan, a certain informant tells me you were here to see Sir Voss this afternoon. For what purpose? Just a friendly visit. Indeed. What did you talk about? Oh, old times, Pete's gold strike. Is that all? What are you driving at? Would you have killed Sir Voss for his mind? Sam, you know me better than that. Service was an old friend. Jordan, someday you will learn that withholding information serves you no good. I've told you everything, Sam. Then how do you explain this letter? Letter? Where you get it? I found it among papers in his desk. It is addressed to Rocky Jordan. I, Pete Servos, hereby grant to you full and complete ownership of my gold stake in South Africa on the one condition that I receive 70% of the profits from said mine throughout my life. 
Signed, Pete Servos. Let me see that. It will be held for possible evidence, Jordan. Oh, but the letter's to me. Do not fear, Jordan. It appears certain that you are the complete owner of a gold mine. Now that Servos is dead. Yeah, looks that way. And now, Jordan, hmm? you will kindly tell me where the gold mine is located. Where it's located? Yes, Jordan. You know something, Sam? I haven't any idea. Come, Jordan. You mean to say a man gives you a mine, but he does not tell you where it is? That's right. Indeed. Come with me, Jordan. I have something to show you. Sam put me in his black limousine with him, and we made the trip to headquarters without saying much. There, he nodded me down some familiar steps that led to the morgue. Halfway along the big room, he drew back a sheet that covered Pete's service. Observe, Jordan. Uh, it's Pete, if that's what you're asking. You say you knew him well. Long time ago. Notice the forearm uh, near the wrist. Oh, looks like a bad burn or something. It is a burn. Put there after the killing. What about it? The killer obviously wanted to erase whatever was recorded there. A tattoo mark, perhaps. Oh, he had a lot of tattoos. But this one. Can you recall what it was? Hmm. Afraid not, Sam. Very well. However, if your memory should suddenly return, let me know. I had noticed some numbers on Pete's arm that afternoon, but they wouldn't come back to me. After all, I wanted to clear up Pete's death, and the numbers might help. I had a hunch von Rundstedt knew that going back to Clarissa was quicker. There was a chance she could help. The news of Pete's killing had been a shock to her, but she was packing to leave. Can't we just forget about it, Rocky? We've got to find the killer, Clarissa. Why? It had to end this way sooner or later. Will you hand me that grip, please? Oh, yeah. Here you are. Thanks. Pete had some numbers tattooed on his right arm. They've been burned off. What were they? I, I don't remember any numbers. You sure? Yes, Rocky, yes. I, I don't even know what you're talking about. Do you, do you have any pictures of Pete around? Box in the top bureau. I was about to throw them away. Oh, thanks. Uh, uh, these all you have? Yes, yes, they're all I have. This one here in the bathing suit, how long ago was it taken? What? That was at Daytona Beach. Just before he left me for South Africa six months ago. The numbers weren't on his arm then. I told you they weren't. Yeah, that means he had them put there after he made the gold strike. What difference does it make? Don't you see? They could be the location of the mine, in longitude and latitude. The numbers are all we need. I see. Rocky. Huh? Just why did you come here? I'm trying to clear up Pete's death, Clarissa. Are you? Whoever killed him is after that mine. He knows where it is. And you'd like to know, too, wouldn't you, Rocky? And there's nothing to do with it. Are you sure it hasn't? You said you'd put gold out of your mind a long time ago. You said the mine didn't matter to you. Well, it doesn't, Rocky, but can't you see what happened to Pete? I hoped it wouldn't happen to you. you got the fever now, haven't you? You want that mine. Look, the gold's there and it belongs to me. Why shouldn't I try to find it? Yes, yes, why not? Gold can change a man so quickly. Are you trying to stop me? No. No, go ahead. I feel sorry for you, Rocky. I feel sorry. What she was driving at didn't set with me. I got out into the Cairo night. As I tried to walk it off down the Sharia El Mar, I made up my mind I was finding von Rundstedt if it took digging out every hole in Cairo. That turned out too easy. He was waiting in a doorway. A gun leveled at my ribs. Take care, Jordan. Walk ahead. Hey, you're kind of hard to catch, von Rundstedt. He will talk in good time. About who? Service? To the left. Down the alleyway. Oh, we're going to make it real private. Shut huh? up. No. Stand there now, with your back to the wall. Right, you're calling it. No tricks, if you are wise. I'm getting wise to a lot of things. Oh, that I followed you after the phone call in your cafe this afternoon? Yeah, it is true. Yeah, right to services, place. Did you kill him? There is no reason to hide it from you. We talked for a while, then I killed him. And burned the numbers off his arm. Why? Because they told the location of the mine? No one knows where the mine is except me and you, Jordan. I forgot the numbers. I could never be sure. So you figure burn them out of me? There is no other way. 
Uh, one little request, huh? It is your last. In close. And clean. Uh, as you wish. <laughs> last step was his mistake. That's when my shoe caught his shin hard. He doubled for a split second and my hand came down with a jolt cut on the back of his neck. And Rootstead dropped flat in his face and the gun clattered away. I scrambled over and came up with it. It was that easy. You're around, Jordan. All right, come up, Van Rootstead. I should have shot you while I could. Uh, now we'll talk about the mine. Clear it up. Yeah. Yeah, you will want to know, Jordan. If Servos did not tell you, he did not find that mine. It was I who made the strike. Uh, that's not what he told me. You fool. Why do you think he gave the mine to you? Why should he put it in your name? To keep it away from his wife. Ah, how can you believe that, Jordan? Servos stole that mine from me. Before I could file, he was ahead of me. It was in his name. And it was too late. Well, it's in my name now. Ah, yeah. Servos thought that would protect him from me. But I killed him for only one reason. Because he took what was mine. I killed him just as I will kill you. Only I got the gun. Ah. That poses a problem for you, does it not? I alone am in your way now. Unless you shoot me. Well, uh, go ahead, Jordan. Pull the trigger and get what you want. I was looking at him, but all at once I was seeing myself. Yeah, what Sam and Clarissa and now Von Rundstedt had said about me getting gold fever was right. I did want that mine, bad enough to kill. I could shoot, and I was safe, and this was my big chance. Go ahead, Jordan. You have only to pull the trigger. Self-defense, you can call it, and then you will be free of me. You deserve to die. You murdered service. Ah, that is it. Just die yourself, Jordan. Gold fever has no regard for fair play. I can see it in your eyes. You want to kill me, don't you? So you can get the mine. You'd have killed me. So now is your chance. You will find the mine somehow. The mine is all yours now. Just raise the gun, Jordan. Come. Pull the trigger. Shoot, Jordan. No. I'm not going to kill you, Van Rutstedt. That won't be necessary. Not for me. It was a difficult decision, was it not, Jordan? Ah, the police. Sam, how long you been there? I witnessed everything. Ali, Greco, take this Van Ronsted away quickly. Yes, Captain. Sam, you won't be needing that service pistol. For which I am very happy. I would have hated to see you raise the gun to kill him. He killed service, Sam. Yes, Jordan. I know. You see, the police have not been idle. <laughs> Looks like you've been way ahead of me. <laughs> but Van Ronsted was right. The mine was stolen from him by Pete Service. In fact, I have learned many things from the South African authorities. Huh? Including what else? Van Ronsted was a most strange and unpredictable man, known throughout South Africa. Go on, I'm listening. He too had gold fever, but of a most severe nature. In his time, he had discovered a dozen mines. Each of them, to him, worth a fortune. To him? What are you getting at, Sam? Just this, Jordan. Both you and Pete Solvers were fooled by a man with hallucinations who owned a mine that was worthless. More from Rocky Jordan in just a moment. Let's step outdoors and join the Ellis family at their barbecue. Boy, those hamburgers look good. Oh, I'm starved, honey. How long do I have to listen to them sizzling there on the griddle? <laughs> Take it easy, darling. All in good time. I'll just turn it over. There, that's about it. They're ready. Let me at them. Toasted bun. Hamburger patty. Here you are. Oh, no. Oh, no, you don't. Not plain like that. Where's the catsup? The one you served yesterday with a special flavor. Oh, you mean Del Monte catsup. You bet he means Del Monte catsup. The catsup with that special flavor. Tomato flavor at its best. It's lively, it's tangy, it's rich. Blended and simmered down according to a treasured recipe, Del Monte catsup on sizzling hamburgers, steak, or chops is a real flavor treat. And Del Monte catsup costs less than many other quality brands. Look for it at your grocer's. Remember, for flavor first, it's Del Monte catsup every time. Back now to Rocky Jordan.
Well, there wasn't much more to clear up. Sam and his men took care of von Rutstedt, and all that was left for me to do was to have a little talk with Clarissa. I bought her a cup of coffee in an all-night cafe and told her what had happened. Well, Rocky, I'm glad it's over. Yeah, me too. You know, I just took the cure. I'm out of the gold business. <laughs> I hope for keeps. You can count on it. So it was... It was all for nothing, then. Pete dreamed and stole and died for a mine without any gold. That's right. You know, somehow I'm glad he never found out. What about you now, Clarissa? Me? I need to go home for a while. Wish you didn't. Maybe sometime I'll come back to Cairo. Perhaps I'll see you then. Not scared of gold fever anymore? No. But there are other kinds of fever, Rocky. Let's wait and see. For the finest in tomato flavor, enjoy the whole family of Del Monte tomato products. Del Monte ketchup and chili sauce. Del Monte tomato sauce and canned tomatoes. And Del Monte tomato juice. Remember, buy wisely. Buy for flavor. Buy Del Monte. Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Remember, you have a date next week at the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. Same time, same station. And the story is Cairo Vendetta. Rocky Jordan, written by Larry Roman and Gomer Cool, stars Jack Moyles in the title role and is directed and produced by Cliff Howell, with original music by Richard Aron. Here's a cool suggestion for a hot day. Chilled Del Monte fruit cocktail and cottage cheese. Everybody likes colorful, delicious Del Monte fruit cocktail. Serve tempting Del Monte fruit cocktail, the brand that puts flavor first. Larry Thor speaking. Rocky Jordan is presented over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Company presents Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. Well, tonight we meet a sort of an unusual girl. Her name is Muriel, and she's quite a personality. The name of the story is Murder with Muriel. But before we get into our story, here's Jim Doyle, the man from the Fitch Company. Are you looking for a smooth shave, men? Then try Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream. It'll give you the kind of shave you want because 40 years of experience have gone into the making of this product. Fitch's No Brush contains a special skin conditioner ingredient that takes the work out of shaving. You won't have to struggle and scrape against stubborn whiskers because the skin conditioner prepares your face beforehand. It holds the whiskers up so your razor can zip them down closely and quickly. Even against the grain of a tough beard, your razor will glide swiftly, never nicking or scraping. 
Fitch's No Brush is a boon to sensitive faces because it lubricates gently, keeping that tender skin from being irritated. After this quick, easy shave, your skin will feel cool and refreshed, wonderfully smooth. And if you prefer a lather cream, try Fitch's Brush Cream. It forms a rich, abundant lather when applied with a brush. This lather stays moist all during the shave. Fitch's Brush Cream also contains the special skin conditioner for sensitive faces. Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream are available in handy 25 and 50 cent sizes. For a shave you like, switch to Fitch. Thank you, Jim. Now I'd like to tell my story. Okay, here's Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in another personally conducted tour through... Rogue's Gallery. I was sitting at my junior executive type desk one day a few months ago, trying to get a studious gander at the racing form for the next day. I had planned to attend and contribute a quick 48 bucks outside to the improvement of the breed of thoroughbreds racing at the track. 48 bucks, that's uh, six across the board, eight races, six eights. That's right, uh, 48. Well, anyway, I was working on a case for an insurance company. And they had assigned a big company detective with his brains at his feet to help me. His real job was to watch me. And he did. His girl was mad at him, and he spent all his time writing torchy poetry to her. I didn't mind that. But the big goon read it to me. That made it personal. Hey, listen to this one, will you, Rogie? Oh, no, I'm busy. Can't you see, Joe? <laughs> this will put her in her place. Listen. Gee, Cupid stupid. His dart in my heart, I trusted. Now, my heart's busted. He sent me an Aphrodite, who's awful flighty. Don't trust Cupid. He's stupid. <laughs> That's a deli, ain't it? I I'm going to send it to Rose special delivery. Mm. That ought to bring her right back to you, with a club in her hand. Why don't you give the dame up, Joe? Oh, you don't understand, Rogie. I love her. Oh. I'm looking for Richard Rogue. Yeah? What do you want? I've got a message for you. I want to talk to you. Uh, privately. Okay, okay. Come on in here. Look, I'm a busy guy today. What do you want? What's your name? I'm Joe Layton. Have you had a letter from Duke Dickerson? No. Nope. You know him, don't you? Well enough to lend him money. That answer your question? Well, he needs some dough. Tough. He still owes me. He's got some stashed in a tin box out in the valley. He wants it. He wants us to get it for him. Go on. He's planted the dough out in the valley. Yeah? Get to the point. Well, uh, he's mailed half of a map to me and the other half to you. A map showing just where the dough is buried. We're to go get it together. I get the 2500 he owes me, and you get the 100 he owes you, plus 1000 for the job. And Duke gets the rest. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. I'll take a drive out into the valley for 1,100 skins any time. But I haven't got the map yet. Well, he mailed it day before yesterday. It should be here. Well, it isn't. Drop around about noon tomorrow. Maybe it'll come in the morning mail. The Duke needs the dough pretty bad. He's got himself in a bit of a jam in Kansas City. We'll get that dough tomorrow, huh? There's something about money I like. I think maybe it's the feeling of power it gives me when the rent is paid. Anyway, this, uh, this spook shoved off, and I went back into the outer office where Joe Black was poisoned, pinning some more poetry. The phone rang, and I thought twice before I answered it. It was almost six o'clock, and I had plans for that evening. Then I finally gave in to its yammering. Rogue Detectives, Richard Rogue speaking. Hello, Mr. Rogue. I must see you right away. Hmm, sorry. It's a matter of life and death, Mr. Rogue. I'm afraid. What's the matter? What's your name? Muriel Scott. Please, come to the Rialto Theater. I can't be seen talking to you. I'm in the aisle seat, center aisle, three rows down from the rear of the theater, on the right-hand side of the center aisle. The seat next to mine is vacant. Please meet me there as soon as possible. Please, hurry. Okay, wait there. Who was that, Rogie? 
Oh, now, look, Blackie, it was private business. Why don't you run along home now and get some rest? Oh, no, the boss told me to stick with you, and that's what I'm going to do. You're tricky, you know. We don't trust you. Oh, look, I... Oh, hello. What are you doing here, Urban? Just dropped in to ask you a few questions, Rogue. Good evening, Lieutenant Urban. Hello, Blackie. Go wait in the hall. I want to talk with Rogue. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, now, what's on your mind? You know a guy by the name of Layton? Joe Layton? Hmm. That name sounds familiar. Why? He just left here, didn't he? Well, he's been here. What's that to you? What do you want to see you about? Well, I don't see how that could possibly affect you, old man. He came to see me on private business. That's all the talking I'm going to do. How'd you know he was here, anyway? I just took a card off him. He had your name and address on it. What did he want to see you about, Rogue? Well, he didn't mention your name. How come you would be shaking Joe Layton down? Is he pinched? No, no, he isn't in any trouble with the police, Rogie. I picked him up about a block from here a while ago. He'd been robbed and murdered. <laughs> Well, this was a fine time for Joe Layton to get dead. Just when he meant 1100 bucks to me. I went down to the morgue with Urban to look at the body. What I really went for was a quick look through his personal effects. There was no sign of half a map. That's all I wanted to know. Urban put me on the fire for a while, trying to get me to tell him all I knew about Layton, but I didn't crack, and I left about 10.30 to drive back to my office. My shadow Blackie was right behind me. When I walked into the office, the phone was ringing. Rogue Detectives, Richard Rogue speaking. Mr. Rogue, you didn't come to the theater. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Muriel. Something else came up that demanded my immediate attention. But I must see you right away. It's a matter of life or death. Uh, But I can't. There's, There's a $500 fee waiting here for you for just a few minutes' work. Please, Mr. Rogue. Huh? Oh, where are you? I'm at the Shady Glade Motel out in the valley. You know where it is? Oh, sure, sure. I've passed it a thousand times. Will you come right out? Please. Cabin number four. Uh, you say there's $500 waiting there for me? You got it there? Yes. Please hurry. I'm frightened to death. Well, I just had 1,100 skin shot out from under me. And I decided I couldn't afford to be too temperamental about a sure 500. So I ran down the stairs to my car and took off for the Shady Glade Motel and the lady with the seductive voice. It was a long drive from my office, and I spent my time trying to figure out how I was going to get in touch with Duke Dickinson and deal myself back in on that buried treasure deal. I couldn't tell whether Blackie had managed to tail me on this trip or not. There was so much traffic on the pass. Well, uh, anyway, I pulled up at the Shady Glade and knocked at the door of cabin number four. You're Mr. Rogue? Yeah. Come in. Well, uh, get it off your chest, lady. Please, sit down. Okay, but uh, I'm in a kind of a hurry. Let's make this as brief as possible. All right. Would you care for a drink? I'd love one. But look, you were tearing your hair out a half hour ago. I got here as soon as I could by breaking a few speed laws. Now, before we get social, what's the deal? I'm in trouble, Mr. Rogue. I'll take it from here, Muriel. Huh? Oh, oh, a reception committee with artillery, huh? Well, how about giving me a quick rundown on what's the deal? What do you want from me? You know a man by the name of Joe Layton? Yeah, I knew him. And I know what happened to him. You wouldn't want it to happen to you, would you? I don't insist on it. Get out of here, Muriel. I'll stay. Get into the other room. Go on. All right, Chef. All right now, Rogue. Let's get down to business. You had company today, didn't you? Layton was up to see you. That's right. Everybody seems to know that. What do you mean? Well, the cops came to see me later. Took me down for a little questioning. You see, they knew Layton called on me, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you shook him down for that map, you should have taken that card with my name and address off of him. And he can't think of everything. I want your half of that map, Rogue. I don't have it. Don't lie to me, Rogue. Just give me your half of the map. I don't have it. But even if I did, name me a reason why I should give it to you. Where is it? I don't have it. That's all I know. I'll give you $5,000 for it, Rogue. Huh? (laughs) Why should I sell it to you? I had to kill a man for half that map. 
I don't want to have to kill you unless it's absolutely necessary, Wilk. Believe me, I hope it won't come to that. Now, look, pretty boy. I don't have the letter, and killing me or keeping me here won't make you much of a score. Where is the letter? Why should I tell you? Ah, let's face it, chum. Is it in your office? I haven't received it yet. It'll probably be in the morning's mail tomorrow. This is not getting anybody someplace. I'll do the worrying about that. Yeah? Well, while you're worrying, take a look behind you. You got company. Oh, no, no. I'm surprised that you try to run that old bluff like that on me. <laughs> you think it's a bluff? Hey, Blackie. Drop that gun, mister. I couldn't miss you from here. You better drop it, pretty boy. My friend Joe Black is a very nervous type. Yeah. Drop it. Okay. Now, well, that's a nice guy. Look, Blackie, I'll hold a gun on this citizen. There's a girl in the bedroom. Go get her. All right, Rogie. What are you going to do with me, Rogue? I haven't made any plans yet. You'll be taken care of. Don't worry. Why don't we keep this to ourselves, Rogue? There's play. Hey, Rogue, there's, there's no dame in here. What? The window's open and she's gone. I, I heard a car pull away just as I came in here. Oh, that's fine. That's great. Well, well, it isn't my fault, Rogie. I, I did what you told me to and... Uriel got away, huh? That's right. She got away. But we've still got the main attraction. That's you. Look, Rogue, there's no reason why we can't make a deal. I'm perfectly willing to cut you in for half the money. <laughs> How big of you. You have to watch those generous impulses, Shep. Next thing you know, you'll be giving away the sleeves out of your vest. Hey, Blackie. Uh, yeah? You just declared yourself in on five bills, okay? Sure. What do I do? Shake him down. I want half of a hand-drawn map. There's no point in us working against each other, Rogue. Shut up. Yeah. I'll get it for you. Keep your hands away from your pockets. Yeah, just keep them up in the air, and I won't have to break your thick skull. Uh, toss me his wallet, Blackie. Uh, quit squirming, you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there. There you are, Rogie. And a nice wallet it is, too. Uh, uh, maybe you'll let me have it, huh, Rogie? Uh, after you've taken a map out, of course. <laughs> That's what I love about you, Blackie. You have such big ideas. Ah, well, quite a bit of dough here. And the driver's license. Glad to see that you're a law-abiding citizen, Chef. Oh, now, here it is. A little piece of paper worth 25 grand. Now, look, Rogue. Suppose I work with you. Just cut me in for five grand. A little late for that, Chef. Blackie. Yeah? I'm afraid our friend Shep might be a burden. Uh, you better put him to sleep for a while. Uh, you mean like this? Oh. You're so enthusiastic, Blackie. Now, let's get him tied up and slip him under a bed until we need him again, shall we? Of course. Uh, hey, uh, hadn't we better call in the cops, Rogie? Well, I didn't want the cops in on this deal yet. They get so inquisitive about murderers. I knew the Chep was as safe as a royal flush against three deuces. So I left him there, all tied up like a bow tie. I gave Blackie the slip and went to my apartment to get a little sleep. I opened the door and walked in, into a surprise party. Hello, Rogie. Where you been? What are you doing in my apartment, Urban? Waiting for you to get home. You got a warrant? Oh, now, Rogie, are we going to get technical? What do you want? You decided to tell me what you know about the killing of uh, Joe Layton? No. You might be making a mistake, Rogue. You know, sometimes you need a guy like me. What are you working on? I don't report to you, Urban. Go away. I've known you for a long time, Rogie. You're declaring yourself in on Leighton's murder. I don't think you did it, but uh, I think you know more than you're talking. Now, look, I've got a stake in this case. If I crack it, I'll let you know in time to get your picture in the papers. Will you settle for that? You're on the level, aren't you, Rogie? Well, you know I am. I've worked with you this way before, haven't I? Have I ever given you a bump pitch? No. Good night, Lieutenant. Good night, Richard. If you have any ideas of slipping me a double cross, Rogie, forget it. I've got a cell waiting for you, and I'm not above framing you. Remember that. I knew Urban wasn't kidding, and I had an impulse to call him back and tell him about the murder I had put away for him in that motel. But I thought better of it. As the door closed behind Urban, I heard another door open behind me. Hello, Mr. Rogue. Muriel. Why, honey, this is... Put up your ple- hands. Huh? I'm going to get that map if I have to kill you. We'll 
return to our story in just a moment. But first, I'd like to tell you that glamorous women the country over are using Fitch's saponified shampoo for greater hair beauty. Here's what lovely Bess Meyerson, recently awarded the title of Miss America of 1945, told us in an interview. A long time ago, I discovered that part of being beautiful was being clean. So I keep my hair clean by shampooing it as often as I feel it needs it. I use Fitch's saponified shampoo because it does not dry my hair or make it difficult to manage, no matter how often I shampoo it. Yes, beautiful women everywhere use Fitch's saponified shampoo. It does not dry the hair because it's made from mild vegetable and coconut oils. Even in hard water, it gives lots of rich, fragrant lather. It cleanses efficiently and gently. And here's a feature all women will cheer. Fitch's saponified shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent. This rinsing agent works with the plain rinse water to make your hair sparkling clean. No particles are left to dim the luster and highlights of the hair. Best of all, you won't need to bother with a special after rinse. Give your hair a treat. Use Fitch's saponified shampoo. You can get a professional application at your beauty or barber shop or ask for an economical bottle at your drug counter. Richard Rogue is involved in an affair concerning $25,000 in buried treasure. There's a girl in the affair named Muriel Scott. And right this minute, the lovely Muriel is an uninvited guest in Rogue's apartment, where she's holding Rogue at the end of a 45 automatic. I love girls, especially girls with Muriel's gifts. She had the kind of a figure that you'd like to add to your income tax. And a little baby face that made me want to hold her on my lap and tell her a story. But that gun changed everything. It ruined the intimate romantic atmosphere that I would have preferred. Take your revolver out of the holster and drop it. Come on, I know how to use this gun. Okay, okay. Now back away from it. You know, uh, I have a strange feeling that you've lived through this before. I have. Keep backing. Okay. Mm. Now what? Sit down. Thanks. How'd you get in here? Through the window. The one in the fire escape. <coughs> now, what time is the first mail delivery at your office in the morning? Oh, it's about 9.30. I heard you tell Shep that the map would be there in that mail. I'm expecting it. Good. I'll get it then. What did you do with Shep? Well, he's okay. Is he in jail? No, he isn't. I want my hands on that dough before I yell to the cops. Uh-huh. I want my hands on that dough, too, and I'm going to get them there. Are you, uh, comfortable? Yeah, don't worry about me. Look, baby, I I want some coffee. How about you? Just stay where you are. Oh, but look, beautiful, it's only 11.30. It's 10 hours before the mail arrives. I can stay awake 10 hours at $2,500 an hour. Easy. Mm -hmm. Ah, It's too bad you're so hard to get along with. You're a very beautiful dame, you know it? Yeah, I know it. Just keep your seat, Mr. Rogue. I don't know whether you're going to like coffee the way I make it or not, Muriel. It'll be all right. Are you sure you don't want me to hold the gun while you make the coffee? Go ahead, make the coffee and stop talking. Uh, okay, okay, beautiful. Yeah, but you'd better, better listen to my proposition. Uh, we could do a lot together with 25 grand. Ever been to Rio? More toast? Thanks, Reggie. You know, you make pretty good coffee. And you make pretty good toast, Angel. Lots of butter. And you know that costs points? We won't need them in Rio, will we? No. (laughs) Ah, We're going to make beautiful music together, baby. You know it? How did you ever get mixed up in a deal like this, anyway? Oh, he came through Pittsburgh. Mm, I know the town well. He spent a lot of money on me, and I thought I was living. Ah, you're too nice a girl to go around pointing guns at people. What did you do with that cannon, anyway? I left it on the kitchen table. Oh. You comfortable? Uh-huh. A few more hours, and I can go pick up that money, huh, baby? Yeah. Twenty-five grand. You know something, honey? What? I can just barely remember Shep.
That's nine o'clock, honey. Let's get going, shall we? Oh, well, we'll just about make it, huh? Yeah. Hmm? Well, I hope that map's in the morning mail, don't you? Well, it will be. Don't worry. Come on, I'll help you with your coat. Mm-hmm. Hey, where'd you get it? It's a nice mink. Shep stole it for me. He was a petty larceny guy, wasn't he? Ah, let's not think about him, Angel. Come on. We were on our way to the office in that letter. And Rio? Could be. Well, we're here. Now, you stay in the car. I don't know whether there'll be any cops up there or not. And if I'm not back in five minutes, shove off. And I'll meet you in the lobby of the Hotel Bellevue in an hour. Oh, you're not going to take me to the office with you? No. Then leave me the half of the map you took from ship. I want to know you're coming back. Oh, sure, sure, baby. Yeah, here you are. Now, are you happy? Yes, I'm happy. Hurry, though, will you? I'll be back in a minute, beautiful. If I'm not, remember what I told you to do, huh? I'll be in the lobby of the Bellevue if you aren't back in five minutes, right? <laughs> If that letter was in my office, I had this case whipped like Simon Legree had Uncle Tom. Then my wishbone was in my throat as I rode up to my office. The elevator had always seemed slow, but this morning it seemed to be going backwards. With just a few more breaks now, I'd be back at home, home base, like the third fleet. I walked into the office, and there sat my shadow, Joe Black. I pitched him some fast double talk about ditching him last night, ran through the mail, found the letter from Duke Dickinson with a map. While I was jumping up and down and clapping my hands, I told Blackie what I wanted him to do. And then Muriel and I took off for the treasure hunt with a spade. Are you sure this is the right path? Sure. I've got the map right here, haven't I? Look, uh, look up ahead. There's the big rock he's got on. See? Uh-huh. And uh, there's the tree. Look, Roby. Oh, the gun you. Put it back. Do you have any plans about taking this money yourself? Oh, will you cut it out? Put that rock back in your bag, I just want you to know I've now? still got it and I can oh. use it. Oh, but look, baby. Remember me. Oh, I suppose I'm a chump. I'll put the gun away. Just for you. You big, handsome cutthroat. Well, I paced off the location of that hidden treasure just like it said on the map. Feeling a little like Captain John Silver as I did it. And then I exposed my poor aching back to the unaccustomed labor of making a hole in the ground with a spade. I will never be a fan of digging. I like my spades five at a time. Preferably running from the ace down to the ten with a lot of dough in the middle of the table instead of in the middle of the pasture. But I dug. Richard, are you sure you're digging in the right place? Sure. We sighted in on that tree and that big rock. And if that petty larceny crook of a Duke Dickerson thinks this is funny, I'll personally hit... Hey. Huh? Hey, hey, pay dirt. Hear it? Yes. Hurry, Roby. Dig it out. Well, do you want this shovel? I'm digging as fast as I can. There it is. See the top of it? Be there. Be there. 25,000. Well, baby, there it is. 25 grand. You want to count it? Let me have it, Rogi. Here, baby, you, you take care of it for a while, huh? Put it in your bag and let's get back to town and celebrate, beautiful. All right. Just hold that close. <laughs> Both of you, hold it. Hey, hey, what is this? Shut up. Give me your bag, lady. Come on, lady. I don't want to have to shoot any holes in that pretty dress you're wearing. Come on, give me that bag. No, I won't. <laughs> Next time I slap you with this rod... Now, give me that bag. Get your hands away from that coat there, mister. Thanks. Ah, oh. March. You look familiar to me, tough stuff. Yeah? Maybe I'd better put you away, huh? Hmm. Duke Dickinson must have sent out a bullet into all his friends. Shut up. Lay down on your faces, both of you. Now! <laughs> Shut up, lady! I just shot a couple of holes in your tires, that's all. Now, just take it easy and don't move until I'm out of here. Thanks for the dough. Come on in the office, baby. Now, buck up and stop crying. I don't suppose you're going to 
pay any attention to me now that the money's gone. You'll probably forget me as soon as you can. Oh, baby. <laughs> oh, hi, Urban. Hello, Rogue. Who's this? A cop. What's he doing here? He's here after you, baby. Oh, oh Richard. He wouldn't turn me into the... Hate to interrupt, but uh, what's the score, Rogue? Uh, this little girl helped to kill Joe Layton. The guy who worked with her is under the bed at cabin number four at the Shady Glade Motel. How could you do this to me? After all the things you said and... and... It's... Well, it's... It's uh, not easy. But you see, baby, I don't approve of murder. Especially not in this neighborhood. Gives a block a bad name. Oh, no. No, Richard. Better take her away, Urban, before I take her away from you. She's a beautiful girl, isn't she? Richard. Oh, Richard. Well, that's the story. Of course, you recognize my old friend Joe Black as a hold-up man. You see, I figured that when Muriel and Shep were on trial, I would have less explaining to do if they thought some stranger had finally come up with the 25 grand. I gave Joe his 500 like I said I would. He beefed a little, but he took it. And then I took the 100 Duke owed me and 1,000 for the job that was agreed on, and... Then I took the 2500 that Joe Layton was supposed to get and sent it to Muriel's mother. Layton didn't have any use for it in the morgue. And I sent the rest to Duke in Kansas City. Made a nice score altogether, but... Oh, I still wake up in the middle of the night when I dream of Rio and Muriel. And that trip we were going to take. The money's spent, but the dreams linger on. They're wonderful. This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you noticed that I didn't get hit on the head in tonight's story. It was nice for a change. I hope you like the yarn. Ray Buffum wrote it. Lee Stevens composed and conducted the music. And D. Engelbach produced and directed. I want to remind you to make a date with us the next Thursday night. We're going to get mixed up in a strange affair about a photograph. We call it photo finish. Be on hand for the developing, will you? Thanks for listening and good night, all. Now, here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you'll again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Removes dandruff the first time it is used. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is the only shampoo whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance companies. This statement can be made by no other shampoo. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug counter, barber, or beauty shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. Detective Mysteries. In cooperation with the editor of True Detective Magazine and the Mutual Broadcasting System, True Detective Mysteries, brought to you by X-Lax, America's largest selling laxative. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, $1,000 reward is being offered for information leading to the capture of a dangerous criminal. A complete description will be given later on this true detective mystery, which follows in a moment. Right now, as you're listening to this program, suppose you heard the wailing of an air raid siren. Would you know what to do? Is there time to evacuate, or do you head to the nearest shelter? In order to protect yourself and your family, you must know what the air alert signals mean. Civil defense sirens have two types of warning. One is the alert signal, a steady blast of three to five minutes. This means to evacuate in cities having evacuation plans. In cities without evacuation plans, the alert signal means to stand by your radio for further instructions. When you hear the signal, do not use your telephone. Instead, tune to the Conelrad frequencies of 640 or 1240 on your standard AM radio. Conelrad broadcasts will give you the necessary instructions for evacuation or other action ordered by your local civil defense authorities. The take cover signal, a wailing tone or series of short blasts lasting three minutes, means just what it says. Take cover fast, for attack is imminent. Now, you must make the best available shelter and stay there until civil defense officials tell you when it's safe to come out. This message is brought to you as a public service. Now, the voice of the editor of True Detective magazine. The case history you are about to hear is the actual report of an actual crime. 
Office of Police Chief Herman Hillary, Chief of Townsend Township. Chief Hillary for the moment, a very confused man. Now, j- just a minute. It's my wife. One at a time. Let, let's get this straight. You won't crowd in. That's my see. wife. What's your name? Everett Lippert. These fellows with you? Uh, yes, sir. We're friends. He, he was so what nervous. What about your you. wife? She's been missing. Yeah? Three days now. You a local boy? I am, yes, sir. All my life. I, I work nights over to the cannery. So did my Nellie, my wife. I, I, I never been in trouble, Chief. Mm-hmm. On, on the afternoon of the 11th, Chief Nellie, well, before that, some folks, like my family, they, they maybe felt when I married Nellie, she's too restless, maybe, because I tend on the quiet side, and maybe too fun-loving. That's all, and, and only compared to me. But up to that afternoon, that was the 11th, Chief, she did appear all right. We were happy. Well, sit down. Um... Fine chairs. Oh, yes, well, just don't keep tossing your butt ashes on my office rug. Sorry, Chief. Sorry. Everett, you say? Yes, sir. Everett Lippert. Age? Uh, I'm going on 25. Address? I-, I rent right over the post office in town, sir. Mm-hmm. Well, go on. Well, on that afternoon, the 11th, that's three days back, I went to bed about four. It's not bedtime. Oh, you uh, said you worked the night shift. It, just for a short nap. Yes, sir. Before work. When I woke up a couple hours later, she, she wasn't there. I wasn't too upset at the time, feeling... I guess I did, that, that she'd left early to do some shopping before she went on her job. But when I got to work, Nellie, she wasn't there. She wasn't back home when I got back. Mm, how do you explain that? She just disappeared. Without saying a word, leaving a note? How it appears, sir. It's like a bad dream that don't end, even after you wake up. Not like Nellie at all. No. She was a good girl. My friends, the boys here, they, they all know Nell. Not like her. She was raised better than that. Me and the boys here, we checked everybody we know all around. No one's seen her. No one's even had a word of talk with her since last Thursday night. Well, all you accomplished by private investigating is let the trail grow cold. Why didn't you come to me? You made my job twice as hard. Well, stay here while I send out a statewide and I want you to take me to your apartment. Mrs. Nellie Lippert, described as attractive, brunette, 19, apartment of the Lipperts now, directly over the substation post office. Well, you've been through these closets and bureau drawers. Cat, I don't know. Young people like you two live in such close quarters, no kids, no distractions. You don't have any idea what your wife might have been wearing? Well, you see, sir, she just bought some new clothes. She might have worn an outfit I've never seen. What about shoes? That's funny, too. As far as I can tell, the only shoes that are missing is a pair she bought over to the highway strip last month. They were wrong for her, she said, and she was planning to give the bargain away. Hurt her feet. What you tell me looks like she went off the spur of the moment. Well, keep in touch, and give me a list of relatives and friends. Investigation turned now to other channels. All of Nellie's co-workers at the cannery interviewed, questioned, each specifically regarding their last talks with the missing pretty young brunette, most remembering nothing of importance. Then suddenly, a tentative lead volunteered by another cannery shipping room employee, a Miss D who'd always worked beside Nellie. From Miss D, this charge statement as follows. She was always dreaming about living in Chicago or San Fran or even the big one, New York. She liked to have fun and go dancing and things like that. Around here, dancing, any kind of intelligent fun's a dying art, particularly when you have to, like she did, work nights. Asked if Nellie had ever mentioned another man, Miss D replied, quote, No, girls don't tell other girls things like that, not when they're married, unquote. A girl resembling, seen boarding a westbound bus. Someone else certainly had seen Nellie working as a waitress in a one-arm joint in Boston. Other people, positive they'd seen her at a track in Maryland. Leads narrowed down, washed out. Next, a young woman of great attractiveness seen hitchhiking a lift from an overland truck driver outside Highway 5 and Route 33J intersection, the night of the 10th. The trailer truck described, hunt for it and driver on. Driver found. Of course I deny. What do you mean I picked up a girl at 33J and 5? Sure, I stop in the crossroad diner. That's a truck stop. What are you trying to do? Me with a family? Cost me my job? Back to True Detective Mysteries in just a moment. You probably know what you're doing every minute you drive, but do the other drivers know what your plans are? In other words, do you signal your intentions to other drivers every time you want to turn, stop, or do anything else that might not be expected of you? Now, the law says you must. Your own common sense must tell you you should. Most cars today are equipped with mechanical turn signals. 
Use them, but be sure to use them correctly. If you use a turn signal for indicating your direction at a fork in the road, and you should, remember that the turn may be so gradual that the signal will not turn itself off, as many do after a 90-degree turn. Be sure your signal is off after it has served its purpose. There is probably nothing more frustrating and dangerous than following a car with turn signals flashing away and the driver blithely driving straight ahead. The National Safety Council urges every driver to use his turn signals correctly, safely, at every turn. This message is brought to you as a public service. Now again, the editor of True Detective magazine. Questioning of the indignant truck driver continuing. Quite the ladies' man. What do you mean by that, Craig? Now look, friend, the yeah. smartest thing you can do for yourself right now is to assume I know at least as much about life as maybe you do. I still don't know what you mean by that. Meaning we know you've stopped to pick up women with your trailer truck? Traps. Oh, well, on a cold night sometimes, sure, somebody to talk to. Meaning we know you picked up a young woman outside the crossroads diner. Asked her inside, bought her a blue plate dinner. A lot of trucks, and it's a big truck stop. Awful popular with us guys. What's her name? It's a mistake. What's her name? You're gonna mess me up. All around, aren't you? Yeah. yeah I wrote it on the back here. Uh, there's a name and address. I have a day with her tomorrow night. We'll keep that. <laughs> The address, a street corner. The date, indeed, kept by police chief Hillary. The girl, a vivid redhead, definitely not Nellie Lippert. The redhead admitting she herself had been the mysterious girl seen riding with the truck key on the night in question. Investigation grinding to a full stop. Dead end. District Attorney Charles P. Pines, interesting himself in the case now. Pines' office. Well, you lead, chief. No any clues, eh? What bothers me? From what I understand, this Nellie Lippert's disappeared completely. Too completely. In my mind, uh, what do you want, a match? Yeah. It means only one thing. Your mind <coughs> usually runs that way. You coming into this case to heckle me? She was murdered. If she was living, there'd be bound to be some trace of her. Figures. Another thing. While it's true enough, she might have walked out on her husband without a word. How about her folks? Were they close? It's a point. One of those families that liked each other. No, she couldn't very well have dropped them word if she was dead. No. Some kind of word. How old is she, 19? Kid. Restless, the word I get back on her. But on the energy side. Full of life. Like to dance, innocent fun. Yeah, there was a world outside. Suppose it was murder. Any ideas who did it? Mm-hmm, I have. Anything definite for us to go on? No. We can't, you know that, charge anyone in this state without proof such a crime was committed first. I'd advise you to walk easy there. <laughs> Several days later, Chief Herman Hillary learning something that caused him to disregard District Attorney Pine's advice. The Lippert apartment now. How come you're quitting your cannery job, Everett? Well... Bad memories? Yes, sir. Getting away from it all. The Air Force is looking for a man, I might just as well. Mm -hmm. I'm all for being patriotic. How'd you know I quit? Payroll clerk. You also told me you not only picked up your own paycheck, but the uh, check that was still due your wife. Hers was about $100. Was I suppose that donated to some charity? No, I mean, I, I, I'm down, Chief. Real down about Nellie being gone. You're not supposed to be pushing me down some more. You're supposed to find her, isn't that right? You're supposed to cooperate. Well, I will. I have. How about taking a lie detector test, hmm? It'll clear you of any shadow of doubt. I'm afraid not. Once and for all. Since Nellie's disappearance, I'm... I'm real down. Nerves shot to pieces. I'm afraid I'd be too nervous for the machine to give any accurate result. All right. Weeks now, weeks, months. Search for Nellie Lippert, age 19, pretty, restless, and well-liked continued. No luck. Authorities receiving word that Everett Lippert has indeed enlisted. Conference after conference between Chief Hillary and District Attorney Pines. This Lippert seems on the level, Pines. If she was murdered and he did it, I doubt he'd enlist. He more than likely skip out of sight completely. Not put himself in a spot where we can keep close tabs on him. At no cost, no effort to us. Uh... Maybe you're right. Weeks, more weeks now, pressure of other police work, but Chief and District Attorney not forgetting, both increasingly upset by the continuing mystery of Nellie's whereabouts. Then, from two woodsmen out for deer, from their excited phone call... Chief, Gobby Harris, you know, from the lodge. 
Ned and me, we was out on a shoot, and we come upon this mound of earth. It's a rectangle like on the old kennel property. Yeah. Ned and me, we're taken with a look of it. We took a stick, scratched some of the loose dirt away. There's a toenail, a red painted toenail, sticking up out of the dirt. Hmm. And we cleared a foot and a leg, wrapped in a sheet. The Lily Lippert girl. Back to True Detective Mysteries in just a moment. Now, the easiest way to save is better than ever. That's right. The United States savings bonds you get through your payroll savings plan pay a higher interest faster. Yes, Series E bonds pay a higher interest than ever before. Savings bonds reach maturity faster, too, in only eight years and 11 months. Now, this means that redemption values are higher, especially during the earlier years. Now, you will appreciate the new size of savings bonds, too. They're smaller, in convenient punch card form that stores easily in any safe deposit box. For the best way to save for any goal, join the payroll savings plan. Talk to the payroll plan people where you work before next payday. And then sign up. Buy improved United States savings bonds. The best buy today. This message is brought to you as a public service. Now again, the editor of True Detective magazine. The woods now, the dirt dug, the body brought up, up from a shallow grave, the body wrapped in what was left of a cotton bed sheet, body identified. No question. Nellie Lippard. All right, coroner. Pines, uh, or one of you men, go get District Attorney Pines. Men spread like buckshot throughout the surrounding woods. Pines arriving, coroner completing preliminary. His report as follows, quote, No wounds, no bruises, pre-autopsy, unable to determine cause of death. It might have been suffocation or it might have been poison. Yes, her ankles were tied with this frayed bit of rope. One thing certain, murder, cold-blooded, unquote. Photographs taken, body removed. Wrap it up, men. I'm under my office, Pines. Chief Hillary's office now. Notify? Of course, I'll do more than notify. I just don't want to notify Everett Lippert. I want to bring him back. Then what charge? I'm not sure. I'm not too sure now that the body's been found that he's the innocent husband. She was supposed to have walked out on him while he was asleep, right? And it was a bitter night. She disappeared the way we found her with practically what little she had on. There's only one man who could have carried her out. Everett Lippert. All right. Suppose he insists someone who picked her up did the job. We better wait till we've got a stronger case, Herman. You need evidence, Herman, before you put that call through to bring him back from the military service. Only new evidence can come from the coroner. We're weak on laboratory around here. Give me the phone. I'll get you the state police technicians all you need right down. State police technicians rush, starting lab work on the remnants of the bedsheet, on the bits of frayed rope. Their report's in, teletype now to Oklahoma to the sheriff nearest Everett Lippert's military base. This cooperating sheriff asked to pick up and hold while a formal warrant is flown. Everett Lippert demanding to talk to Chief Hillary via long-distance telephone. I'm innocent, Chief. I told you Lippert, that. Lippert, you've got to come back. I'm doing good here. I don't want to see any dead body. Sheriff Carter will have a warrant in his hands in three hours. You're coming back for inquest. Got somebody else. Her folks, they'll identify her. Her mother already did. I'm not... I got rights. I'll fight you. The warrant is for murder. This is costing money. You'll be brought to my office right from our airport. Suspicion, suspicion. That's all I got out of you ever since you started this. More than suspicion now. Yeah, look. Oh, what do I know about laboratory reports? That's all these are. A decomposed cotton bed sheet from your apartment. A report from the trunk of your car. Oh. That car you sold is still on the dealer's lot. Suspicion. I want you to see how she looked when we took her out of the ground. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Put that picture away. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I did it. I, I killed her. We had a quarrel. That's what started it. It was on a Wednesday, I remember. Now she kept talking about a dance she wanted to go to on Saturday night. 
I didn't want to go. Didn't want to go. I, we kept chewing about it, and finally she told me she... She told me she was gone anyway. And would dance with anybody and everybody there. I shocked her. I shocked her on the jaw. Must have knocked her out. I don't know. I must have lost my head. Then I stuffed a tea towel in her mouth. Got a bath towel. Choked her until she stopped that heavy breathing. I tied her. Tied her hands. I tied her feet. I don't know why she, she was dead. I remember now. Her body. I lived there with her body 24 hours. Then I took her as she was. Dressed as she was out in the moonlight. It's cold. To a woody place. That, that, that place where you found her. The old kennel place. The ground was cold and there were roots. All I could dig was ten inches. And that was was not enough. <laughs> I put some dirt on top. I guess that's how they come. They, well, you know, found her so easy. Then I went home. I washed. Sun up, I went over to her folks. I guess I looked calm. They didn't catch on. When I asked them if they'd seen her. And they say you ate breakfast with them. Did I? Hardy. Did I now? Formally charged, bound over, Everett Lippert pleaded guilty on the 19th of the month to the towel strangling of Nellie Lippert, his 19-year-old wife. Except for the use of fictitious names and places, this has been a real story of a real crime, solved by real people with a real criminal brought to justice. But be on the alert. A vicious criminal is at large and may be in your neighborhood. As editor of True Detective magazine, I offer a $1,000 reward for information leading to the capture of Eugene F. Newman, one month from the date of this broadcast and as a direct result of listening to this broadcast. But first... I have a message of very great importance for all you men and women who are my age. I want you to tell your mommy that when you're troubled with irregular... That's irregularity, honey. When you're troubled with irregularity, you have her give you x lax the chocolate... Cho that's chocolated, honey. Yes, that's right. You tell them. Well, mothers, when your youngsters need a laxative, x lax does help them toward their normal regularity. Does it gently, overnight. You just give them pleasant-tasting, chocolated x lax Taken at bedtime, x lax won't disturb their sleep. Next morning, they're well on their way toward their normal regularity. And x lax doesn't rob their systems of the vital nutrition so necessary to their growth and health. You can get x lax in 15, 37, and 79-cent sizes. Remember, x lax helps you toward your normal regularity. That's x lax and now, here are the details regarding the wanted criminal. Eugene F. Newman is wanted by the Federal Bureau of Investigation on charges of unlawful flight to avoid prosecution from Buffalo, New York. Eugene F. Newman is 32 years old, 5 feet 8 inches tall, weighs 170 to 180 pounds, and is of medium build. He has blue eyes and blonde hair. Born in Brooklyn, New York, this fugitive has many distinguishing markings. A one-inch scar on the outside of his right eye, two small scars in the center of his left cheek, a birthmark on the upper part of his left arm, and a mole on his left index finger. Tattoos include the name Danny, and a heart on the outside of his right forearm, and the number 13 in a dotted circle on the back of his left hand at the base of the thumb. If located, notify Director J. Edgar Hoover, Federal Bureau of Investigation, Washington, D.C. Do not call your local radio station, but notify Director J. Edgar Hoover, Federal Bureau of Investigation, Washington, D.C. Then get in touch with the editor of True Detective, for the $1,000 reward. True Detective Mysteries has been brought to you by Chocolated x lax America's largest selling laxative. For another detailed account of a bizarre case, read The Bride in the Lake in the current issue of True Detective magazine. Accidents seem to pursue Wilmer Evans and his bride of six weeks, but he always seemed to escape uninjured. Finally, a car accident resulted in his wife's death, but Wilmer again escaped injury. It was revealed that Mrs. Evans had confided to a friend that she was afraid of her husband. He is being held for murder. Read this startling case in True Detective magazine. 
And for more interesting reading, don't miss The Art of Managing a Ball Club by Chuck Dressen in Sport Magazine. Now, at your newsstand. Fair warning. You may not like this next minute. It may bother your conscience because it's about polio shots. Now, here we are with polio vaccine available to us, a godsend discovery. It gives maximum protection against one of the world's most terrible diseases. And yet, there are literally millions of families who just haven't bothered to get their three shots. Why? What in the world can be stopping them? The shots work, the shots are available, and they're easy to get. All you have to do is call your doctor or local health authorities to find out where. Next summer and the next polio season will be here before you know it. That's why this message is so brutally frank. When polio strikes, it strikes blindly. The whole family is vulnerable. Now, you may have been lucky in summers past. Many of us have. But don't press it. Don't press your luck another summer. Remember, it takes eight months to become protected against polio. So get your polio shots right now for the whole family. Be a responsible member of this community. Call your doctor or local health authorities. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petrie family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. Say, and I've got a little something to tell you myself. I want to tell you that if you haven't sent in for your free recipe calendar, I think we've still got enough on hand to take care of you if you hurry. The requests have been pouring in like mad, literally by the thousands. No wonder. It's really a terrific offer. It's a calendar for 1945 and 46. It's in full color, and it tells you all you have to know about cooking with Petri wine. Write to Petri wine, P-E-T-R-I, Petri wine, San Francisco 26, California. San Francisco 26, California. For better hurry, so we can get your recipe calendar to you immediately. <laughs> And now let's drop in on our good friend, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Foreman. Where are the puppies tonight? Well, I, I found them playing with a dead seagull, so they've been sent up to bed in disgrace. Well, you certainly look comfortable yourself, Doctor. Uh, what's that small blue book you're reading, the latest bestseller? No, 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 indeed not. This book was never a bestseller, my boy. It's entitled Practical Handbook of Bee Culture. With some observations on the segregation of the queen. Quite a catchy title. Who's the author? A fellow by the name of uh, Sherlock Holmes. He was engaged in writing it when the adventure I'm going to tell you about took place. Well, you told us last week, Doctor, that a pair of canaries played an important part in the story. That's quite right, Mr. Foreman. It was in the summer of 1908, I remember. And I'd persuaded Holmes to leave his Sussex bee farm for a few weeks and to join me in a holiday at the little fishing village of Kingsgate. In Kent. We were staying at a charming little inn called the Fisherman's Arms. And for the first few days, our holiday was a delightful one. And then... And then, I suppose, Doctor, strange things began to happen. They did indeed, Mr. Foreman. They did indeed. Very strange things. One afternoon, we just finished a late tea, I remember. And we're sitting outside on the lawn, sunning ourselves and enjoying our pipes. Holmes lay back with his long, thin fingers clasped behind his head, gazing thoughtfully at the multicolored fishing boat, bobbing at anchor in the harbor. After a moment or two, he spoke to me. What in your very splendid companion? I can't think of anyone else who would let me smoke my pipe in silence for half an hour without asking me what I'm thinking about. That's not very surprising, Holmes, after all together. Well, nevertheless, the gift is a rare one, old chap, and I appreciate it. Oh, thank you, old fellow. Uh, by the way... Since the half hour's up, what have you been thinking about? <laughs> the lack of enterprise of a modern criminal. Audacity and romance seem to have passed forever from the criminal world. Read this note I received this morning, old fellow. See for yourself how low I have sunk. All right, have a look. Mr. Holmes, I am staying in the same inn as yourself, and as I have had a very frightening experience, so should we, I thought perhaps you would help me, please do. 
It's signed Mary Victor. An exciting document, isn't it? Written on lavender note paper, reeking of perfume, and the handwriting is obviously that of an adolescent girl. You haven't bothered to answer the course. Oh, yes, I have. I sent a message back by our good landlord that I would be glad to see her. Why, Holmes? You came down here to complete your handbook on bee farming. Oh. Confound it. Those two wretched canaries are getting their sun bath on the windowsill above us. Oh, I think it's rather jolly to hear those fellows chirping away up there. Oh, I find the sound most distracting. Let's go inside. You know, Holmes, those birds are owned by a charming couple, a Mr. and Mrs. Wainwright. I was chatting with them on the stairs this morning. I'm afraid their charm will escape me as long as their pets continue to tweet in that irritating manner. You've spoken of a peace and quiet of the country in, Watson, and yet I find that... Come in. Ah, this Mary Victor, I presume. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Please come in. Close the door, won't you? Thank you. This is my old friend, Dr. Watson. You may speak quite freely in front of him. How do you do, Victor? How do you do, Doctor? Now, sit down, young lady, and tell me what's troubling you. Mr. Holmes, I came down here from London to get away from someone, but I've been followed. I've been afraid to leave the inn, until last night I felt I couldn't stand being cooped up any longer. So I went for a walk on the seashore. Someone followed me, Mr. Holmes. I ran back here as fast as I could, but now he knows where I live, and I'm frightened. Please help me. My dear Miss Victor, I'm afraid you must be much more specific before I can help you. Who has followed you down here, and why are you afraid of him? I'll tell you the whole story. It'll sound strange to you, but I swear it. Oh, there he is again, down by the gate. I'm going to my room. No, 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 no. Don't you be frightened, Miss Victor. I'm sure we'll be... Oh, that's all. Sort of thing. I don't see anyone outside who might, might frighten her. There are two or three fishermen loitering about. Wait a minute. Here's a young fellow walking up the path. Come on, Watson. Out through the French windows again. Oh, gracious me, here we go again. I think we'll take the liberty of accosting him. Excuse me, sir. Yes? Are you looking for Miss Mary Victor? Is she young and pretty? Yes, sir. She is. Extremely so. Then I'm looking for her. Where can I find her? I can see you're being facetious, sir. Well, there's no harm in that, is there? By the way, who are you, gentlemen, may I ask? My name is Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. I'm Basil Carter. You're not Sherlock Holmes, are you? That is my name. I thought you seemed familiar. I know your brother, Mike Roth. Oh, indeed. Then I presume you're connected with the Foreign Office. Yes, I'm in the Consular Service. Are you staying at the inn, young man? For a few days. It's funny that I should run in... May I ask? I was planning a murder. Oh, really? Uh, but with you gentlemen here, I see that I shall have to be very discreet. Uh, who is your intended victim, may I inquire? There are two of them. The two canaries in the room next to mine. <laughs> oh, canaries. <laughs> For a moment, I thought that you, you were really serious. But I am serious. serious. The wretched creatures have been driving me mad. Yes, I quite sympathize with you, sir. So, we can take one apiece, Mr. Holmes. Well, I'm glad to have met you both. I'll probably see you again. Oh, goodbye. goodbye. Well, goodbye, sir. Goodbye. <laughs> I don't like that fellow, Holmes. If you ask me, he's the man who's been fighting the poor girl that came to us. He had a peculiar look on his face. When you asked me, he was looking for Mary Victor. Well, there's only one person who can settle the question, and that's the young lady herself. Come on, old fellow. Let's go back indoors. Oh, shh. Here comes Wainwright, the owner of the Canaries. Uh, good evening, Mr. Wainwright. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, this is uh, my friend, uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I am honored to meet you, sir. How do you do, Mr. Wainwright? Beautiful evening, isn't it? I just took a stroll down to the store to get some more birdseed. By the way, Mr. Holmes, I hope our Canaries don't bother you. Little fellows are such a comfort to my wife and me. Oh. So glad. <laughs> good night, gentlemen. Uh, good night, sir. Good night, Mr. Wilson. Not Wilson, Mr. Holmes. Wainwright. Oh, I beg your pardon. I'm so sorry. I thought you said Wilson. Good night. Well, not like you to mix up names, Holmes. I didn't mix them up, old fellow. I, Mr. Wainwright, is in reality Wilson, a notorious canary trainer whom I had the pleasure of sending to prison for a seven-year stretch in 95. Some years later, he made one of the most spectacular escapes from prison in the history of crime and has since managed to evade all efforts to recapture him. Wait, Scott, he seems such a sweet old fellow. Well, possibly he's reformed, but I doubt it. Our stage is set for an intriguing problem, old chap, and our cast is an interesting one. A frightened young girl, a diplomat of uncertain integrity, and a noted criminal. Watson, I have a feeling that once again the game's afoot. Holmes, why are we strolling along the pier instead of staying at the inn? I thought you said that you were expecting trouble. I am, old chap. 
And I'm sure it'll find us out. You know, Holmes, I'm still completely mystified by the behavior of that girl, Mary Victor. I knocked at her door last evening again this morning. I couldn't get any answer. And the landlord told me that she was not seen at dinner last night, nor at breakfast this morning. And yet her room had not been vacated. Curious. Hello, there's the village constable sunning himself at the end of the pier. Yeah. Good morning, Sergeant Blake. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. How are you, gentlemen? Well, splendid, thank you, Sergeant, and very appreciative of the weather that you've provided for us. Oh, think nothing of it, sir. We always arrange that for our really distinguished visitors. Oh. <laughs> By the way, Mr. Holmes, I was reading one of your friend's stories about you last night. The one called The Adventure of Mysteria Lodge. That was, uh, Wisteria Lodge, you, you foolish fellow. Well, maybe it was. <laughs> anyway, I was reading it and we both thought you made a bad mistake. Oh, really? So, of course, you come out all right in the oh, end. Excuse me, Sergeant. I stand reproved. Uh, excuse me, Sergeant. Holmes, Holmes, look. Look at that figure standing by itself right at the end of the pier. Mm -hmm. Our friend Wilson, the canary trainer. He's got a revolver. Here, here, we don't want any of these goings on in Kingsgate. Come on. Here, you. What are you doing waving that revolver about? Keep back, the three of you. I'm the law here. Don't you tell me what to do. Keep back, I say. I'm not afraid to fire. Don't do as he says, Sergeant. You don't want to trifle with. Just exactly what are you up to, Wilson? You've caught up with me once again, Sherlock Holmes. But this time you're not going to send me back. What are you talking about? The murder at the inn last night. I did it! Murder? I'm confessing in front of the three of you. Oh, you leave my wife alone. She didn't know anything about it. Now, I hope you're satisfied, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. He's pointing the revolver as he has. Wilson, you fool, stop it! Strike me pink. He done it. Over the pier and into the sea. Get help, Sergeant. It's possible he isn't dead. Right, sir. Come on, Watson. We're back to the inn, I suppose. Of course we are. We've just heard a murder confession, but we don't know who has been murdered. Holmes, Holmes, what was the telegram that you, you sent off just now? A message to my brother, Mycroft. The innkeeper informed me that Basil Carter, the young diplomat we met yesterday, he in rather hurriedly in the early hours of this morning. Come on, let's go upstairs. Well, we'll have to break the news to Mrs. Wainwright, I suppose. Before we do that, I think we'll see if Miss Victor's in her room. Which one is it? Here, top of the stairs. Hmm. We'll take the liberty of looking in. Miss Victor hasn't been seen since last night. Uh-huh. Unlocked. Lord, what a mess. Those strewn all over the place, open suitcases. Yes, it Look looks at this. as if the young lady had been planning an immediate departure. Where can't you be? No one's seen her since last night. Mr. Mary, I... Oh. Oh, I beg your pardon, gentlemen. I thought I heard Mary Victor come in. I'm Mrs. Wainwright. Mrs. Wainwright, I'm uh, afraid we have some rather, uh, rather bad news for you. Your husband shot himself a quarter of an hour ago at the end of the pier and his body fell into the sea. Is he dead? We must presume so, madam. I left the police sergeant there searching for him. Sergeant Blake should be back here at any moment. After all. You don't seem very surprised, madam. Well, he threatened to do it. This is Wainwright. Before your husband shot himself, he confessed to committing a murder in this inn last night. A murder? Who is murder? At the moment, we're not quite sure. Mrs. Right. Wainwright, I'm afraid I must ask you some rather painful questions. Are you aware that your husband was a criminal? That he served a prison sentence under the name of Wilson? Yes, I knew that. He told me when we were married two years ago. But he said that he'd gone straight ever since he'd come out of prison. That's why he changed his name. He was trying to make a fresh start. You know no reason for his planning to kill anyone at this inn? None. And unless you find someone murdered, I wouldn't give too much thought to it. Yes, if you'll forgive my saying so, madam, you seem remarkably unmoved by your husband's tragedy. Why should I pretend? We were very unhappy together. This might be the best way out of it for both of us. My husband carried quite a large amount of life insurance. In the event of suicide, would that be terrible? Depends on the policy, madam. But I must say that uh, from your attitude, I begin to doubt whether your husband is dead. What do you mean? I mean that if Mr. Wilson, or if you prefer it, Mr. Wainwright, wished to disappear, Inspector, what could be simpler than to pretend to shoot himself, drop into the Mr. sea... Mr. Mr. I'm up here, Sergeant. Ah, did you find him? Yes, Mr. Holmes. We fished him out right away. Dead as a doornail. Shot himself. Those of your last theory, Holmes. Did you find the revolver, Sergeant? Yes, ma'am. Got it right here with me. One bullet missing. 
Have you found out if anyone has been murdered, Mr. Rowe? I found out very little as yet. Wait a moment. Listen. I don't hear anything. Exactly, you hear nothing. And yet we're within a few feet of the Wainwright's room. What do you mean, Mr. Rowe? I mean that uh, there is one sound we should be hearing very clearly at the moment. Why did I think of it before? The sound of your canaries chirruping. You heard it else for days. Come on, Watson. Where are you going? To your room, madam. Hmm. I'm afraid I must uh, dispense with asking your permission. You're already in my room. It seems a little late even to mention the subject. Here's the bird cage. The window's off. Oh, he... the gun. No, old chap. If you look more closely, you'll see them on the bottom of the cage. Let me open this door and get... Oh, Joe Holmes. They're dead. And yet when we entered the inn a few minutes ago, they were still chirruping. But who on earth would want to kill a couple of birds? That, my dear fellow, is one of the things we have to find out. So far, we have a self-confessed murderer, and the nearest thing we can find to a corpse is a pair of dead canaries. <laughs> We'll bring you the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. A second I'll take, if you don't mind, to ask you if you've ever had a glass of Petri California Sherry. Because if you haven't, boy, you want to remedy that situation pronto. Try that Petri Sherry before dinner some evening. Look at its clear amber color. Smell the fragrance of those luscious grapes. And get a sample of that Petri flavor. Mmm, mmm. That Petri Sherry can turn the usual before dinner low into a main event. And say, if you like your sherry dry, as I do, you taste Petri Pale Dry Sherry. Is that ever good? But after all, when it's a Petri wine, it's always a good wine. And now, back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Strange events are taking place in the Kentish fishing village of Kingsgate. A self-confessed murderer has committed suicide, but his victim cannot be found. As we rejoin our story, the great detective began examining the room of Mary Victor, one of the missing guests. You know, Holmes, the murder that Wilson confessed to before he committed suicide might have been the, the killing of those two canaries. Well, I think not, old chap. Wilson obviously loved the creatures and kept them in spite of them with his criminal past. Uh-huh. Interesting. Very interesting. Huh? What do you find? This note. Lying on Miss Victor's dressing table. Yeah. Let's have a look. You think you can hide from me, Mary, but you can't. Wherever I go, I shall follow you. So why not get wise to yourself and stop running away? <laughs> Sounds as if the poor girl was in danger, all right. Possibly, but the writer of that note was certainly obliging. Though the letter is unsigned, he at least gives us a clue to his identity. Oh, what clue? The phrase, get wise to yourself, is very un-English. It's American. Come on, old chap. Well, where are we going now? The envelope to this letter has the Kingsgate postmark on it. I should be surprised if that fount of all knowledge, the village postmistress, can't help us find an American visitor. <laughs> yes, I know the young man you must be looking for, gentlemen. His name's Walter C. Bunker. He's been in here to send telegrams, and his accent's so strong you could cut it with a knife. It's just like one of the very Indian fellows you read about, you uh, know. Can you tell me where he lives, uh, madam? Well, then again, sir, uh, he's been rooming at Mrs. Bell's house, uh, 15 Laburnum Grove, uh, down behind the gas 15 Laburnum Grove, Mrs. Bell, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very much obliged to you. Uh, Mrs. Bell? Yes, sir. What can I do for you, gentlemen? Well, we understand that uh, Mr. Walter Bunker has been staying with you, madam. That he has. A nice young American gentleman. Is he at home, may I ask? No, sir. And I'm worried about him. This morning, when he goes out, he asks me what nearest cemetery is. Cemetery? Oh, gracious me. Huh? I tell him. And then he gives a quick, I'll see you anymore, he says. And then he walks off and I haven't seen him since. I tell you, I'm worried about him, gentlemen. And where is the nearest cemetery, Mrs. Bell, the one you directed him to? About three miles from here. Mm -hmm. Just this side of Branson Woods. Thank you, madam. Come on, Watson. Cemetery. 
secretary seems deserted. The music comes from the church. Oh, Lord, it's a funeral. Or a wedding. Come on. Hi, Jervie. It is a wedding, Holmes. I'm afraid we're on the post trail, but we'd better make sure. been following a false trail, confound it. The frightened young lady was merely frightened by her persistent American fiancé. Threatening letter that he sent her. Ambiguously worded, when you come to think of it. Anyway, we can cease to worry about Miss Victor. As she is now Mrs. Bunker, and I think we can assume that she's out of all danger. Well, we've got to start all over again. Oh, no, no, my dear fellow. The field is narrowing. We'll head back to the inn now, and I have a feeling that we're on the last lap of our strange adventure. <laughs> Here's another suspect eliminated. That is from my brother, Mycroft. I telegraphed him earlier on today to check on the movements of uh, Basil Carter, the young man who left the inn so mysteriously in the early hours of this morning. His answer informs me that the gentleman in question was recalled to the foreign office suddenly and arrived quite safely a few hours ago. Well, now I'm completely puzzled. And I, old fellow, at last see daylight. Wish I did, Mr. Earl. Sergeant, go upstairs and get the dead man's widow and bring her to my room, please. Listen to this problem. What do you want with me, Mr. Holmes? Just a second, madam. You and Sergeant Blake make yourselves comfortable. Now, in the first place, the murder occurred this morning and not last night. I know what you're hinting at. The canaries. I admit I killed them. But you can't do anything to me for that. Why did you kill those birds? I hated them. As much as my husband loved them. And when I knew he was dead, their singing drove me mad. And so I killed them. But ah. they must have been already dead when we told you of your husband's suicide. True, Watson, but the lady was uh, fully aware that her husband was dead. When we informed her of the fact, you see, uh, she murdered him. You're talking rubbish. Shoot himself before our eyes. Because when Wilson raised that revolver to his head, he was convinced that it contained blank cartridges. Unfortunately for him, his wife had deliberately replaced the blanks with live cartridges. Most great heavens, why? How? Let me reconstruct the case for you. Wilson, with the connivance of his wife here, had contrived a disappearance plot. He knew that I had spotted his real identity, and so he planned this rather dramatic exit. Confessed to a non-existent murder, and then, well, had his plan materialized, he was to shoot himself with a bank. Fall from the pier, an apparent suicide. What a fantastic scheme, but how did he plan to get away? Well, he would have swum under the water, safe distance, and so made his escape. Oh, his plan couldn't have worked possibly. No, probably not, probably huh? not. But at least it was ingenious. He would have destroyed his true identity and have had his revenge on me by making me search for a murder that had never been committed. Unfortunately for him, his wife was his accomplice and saw in the scheme an excellent way of killing her husband. You think you're so very clever, Mr. Holmes, but even if it were true, how could you prove it? Observe this revolver, Mrs. Wilson. It's the one your husband shot himself with. What can you prove from that? Ever hear of fingerprint tests? I've heard of them. But that revolver's been underwater. True, quite true. But uh, thanks to the research of my excellent friend, Dr. John Thorndike, an infallible test has been discovered for recording fingerprints even after immersion in seawater. What? I applied the test to the prints on the revolver and the bullets and compared them with some that we found on the water glass in your room. They are the same, Mrs. Wilson. Oh. Now, does a man let his wife load his suicide weapon? Sergeant Blake, I think it's obvious that the time has come for you to take over the case. All right. All right, so I did change the bullets. I hated him. I'm glad he's dead. And what's more, I do it again. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Sergeant Blake? Well, now that I've taken Mrs. Wilson to the station and booked her on a murder charge, I wonder if you'd mind answering a question. Uh, this uh, fingerprint ah. test. I'd like to know about that. I've I never heard of, of being able to take prints after a revolver has been handled two or three times and soaked in salt water. Yes, Holmes, and I'd like to know when you performed the test and took the prints off the glass in her room. I, I thought that I was with you all the time. <laughs> you were, my dear fellow. Well, then... I'll... I can give you the answer in one word. Bluff. What? There is no such test, my dear Watson. 
It would be almost impossible to expect poor Prince <laughs> after so much handling and totally impossible after submersion. Fortunately for us, though, Mrs. Wilson was gullible enough to believe me and uh, give me a confession. And there's no such person as Dr. John Thorndyke? Oh, yes, yes, indeed there is. A great success, Mark. You didn't tell me about that case, Holmes? No, no, I didn't. It was deliberate, old chap. With your taste for uh, writing sense... Would it matter that I heard? Oh, yes, it would. Huh? Uh, you'd have given away, uh, what shall I say, professional secrets? You'd have provided the public, and in particular, the criminal public, with a complete education on fingerprints. And when that happens, my dear Watson, we shall have no tricks left. That will be a sad day for detectives. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of Wisteria Lodge. Mr. Rathbone appears to the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Bill Foreman saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Regan. I work for Anthony J. Lyon, International Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. Wednesday at 9 and CBS brings you Jeff Regan, Investigator, starring Frank Graham as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery and suspense and adventure in tonight's story of The Lady Who Wanted to Live. Trouble comes cheap in this town. It's one item that's always on the market. You don't even have to go shopping for it. Somebody knocks on your door or dials your number and you've got all you can handle. I found that out when I met Amy Goodrich, a long, low blonde with lots of speed. One look at her and you knew you'd been friends too long. We met last Friday afternoon. I'd been out of town two days looking for a guy who turned up in jail in Reno. I was home counting the lumps in my mattress, trying to catch up on some sleep, when the phone began jumping around on the hook. I thought it might be somebody with Rose Bowl tickets. I was wrong. It was the lion. Hello? Regan, is that you? What do you want? Oh, it's a beautiful afternoon. The sun's shining, there's a tang in the air. How would you like to take a nice drive out to the beach? The season's over. Oh, but this is a new season. Fall, Regan. Light suntan, wild ocean. It doesn't it excite you? I haven't had any sleep in two days. No, I know, I know, and I hate myself for disturbing you. I just hate myself. Get to the point, Fatso. Well, something very important has come up, Jeffrey. I wouldn't trust anybody but you to handle it. Besides, the sea air will do you good. Give you a lift. This isn't Berlin. Say something. Well, I, I want you to call on our new client. She's a nightclub singer. Has a beach cottage at Santa Monica, 18106 Coast Road. Her name's Amy Goodrich. You still there, Jeffrey? Still here. Up, up, my boy, to the colors, on the firing line. Drop dead. Oh, now that's not being a good soldier. Why, if I didn't know you, I... I hung up, stuck my head under the pillow again, and waited for him to call back. He didn't. He was playing at coy. Well, I tossed around for another half hour. The mattress got worse, and then a fly started buzzing against the window shade. About that time, the blonde next door decided to leave her husband, and it got real noisy. So I rolled out of bed, threw on some clothes, and climbed in my car. I drove over to Sunset Boulevard and headed for Santa Monica. One eight one zero six Coast Road turned out to be a bundle of flagstone and glass brick piled up against the ocean. Had a lot of angles, like a shyster lawyer. Figure whoever built it never heard of the FHA. Front door was open. 
Inside, a skinny little guy with a complexion like dried codfish was catching up on his music appreciation. His eyes swung around when I walked in. It looked like they'd been hurting him all his life. He turned the record player down, but those elevator shoes brought him up to my chin. I'm listening to music. Whatever you're selling, we don't want any. How do you know? We never want anything. So long. Amy around? Who are you? My name's Regan. What do you want? You her? She's around. All right, she's out back on the patio, taking a sun bath. You didn't tell me what you want with her. I don't. She wants me. Okay? Okay, sure, okay. Why should you be any different? Traffic problem, huh? Yeah, we need stoplights. Go right on through the dining room. Uh, just in case I want to write this up, who are you? Felix. Felix Beethoven. Well? I didn't say anything. When I saw her on the patio by the beach, I knew why Felix was hurting. Amy Goodrich was the kind of blonde they put on those resort hotel calendars in Las Vegas. No matter what month it was, she'd always start you looking around for spring. There wasn't enough material in her sunsuit to make a good pen wiper. And when she smiled at me, I began to feel warm inside. Like a radio with a broken coil. I know it's warm for this time of year, but you aren't wearing a sheepskin. It wouldn't fit in this crowd. You're from Mr. Lyon, aren't you? How'd you know? Well, he said he was sending me his best man. So, Mr. Regan, come over here and sit by me. Hmm? Sure, I won't crowd you. Mm-mm. Your party, lady. I always drink scotch. How about you? Maybe. Later. Well, so you're the lion's eye, hmm? Very nice. Depends on how you look at it. I had to crawl out of bed to come over here. Oh? You haven't been sick, I hope. Well, when you work for the lion, you just don't get much sleep. Oh, I see. <laughs> I thought you looked nice and strong. I'll tell my tailor. And quick, too. Look, you can relax, Regan. This job is going to be easy. What is the job? Protecting me. If you're going to wear that all the time, I'd better send for reinforcements. I think you'll be able to handle it. You'll do just fine. If I know who I'm protecting you from. Yes, I suppose you do have to know that. Have you ever heard of Tim Conover, Mr. Regan? Yeah, yeah, he runs an upholstered cigar box downtown. Diamond Club. He plays for keeps. I've heard. And apparently I... I interest him. It figures. I worked for him two years ago singing. He became very interested in me, but I turned him down. Conover wouldn't like that. He doesn't. He has another girlfriend now, a Helen Lesser. I thought she'd take his mind off me, but she hasn't. You still saw? He's been around half a dozen times this past week casing the place. I think he's got some nasty ideas. Like? I don't know. But he might not be very gentle. So, um, I hang around until he shows up, huh? Mm-hmm. You protect me, Mr. Regan. I want you to stay real close to me. I, um, could go to the Diamond Club, talk to him. Well, you could, but he doesn't impress easily. And, uh, I'd still want you around. I see. You don't want me to talk to him. There'll be time for that later. But right now, um, let's you and I get acquainted. Your boyfriend isn't going to like that. Felix? <laughs> he's only my arranger. He writes better if he's jealous. He must turn out a couple of operas a day. He's got a bad ticker, hasn't he? Mm hmm. He's got a bad heart. But let's talk about us. Conover, remember? Oh, Regan, don't go. I hate to be alone. I'll be back. Why don't you stay for dinner? I'll uh, send Felix out to a double feature or something. I'm hired. I have to see Conover. All right. Kiss me goodbye. No thanks, lady. I gotta drive. But it figured Amy never read the vehicle code. I didn't mind when her arms went around me. But I could feel something else on the back of my neck. Eyes. Somewhere in that house, Felix was watching, and I knew he wouldn't like the kind of music we were making. 
Hurry back, baby. I could still feel him watching when I broke away and walked back through the house. He wasn't in the dining room, so I went through the archway to the living room. I didn't find him, but he found me. So the guy with the bad ticker, he was fast at his feet. He had a letter opener in his hand, but I didn't see the afternoon mail. I grabbed for him, he slid away. Then he came around again. This time I got the hand around his wrist. Drop it, Buster. Drop it. Can you, you... Take it easy, you got small bones. You know, do for rough work. Leave her alone. Leave her alone, Regan. You leave her alone. Felix got his idea across all right, but he had a one-track mind. I tried some questions, but got no answers. I figured Conover might do better, so I got in my car and drove back into town. It was just getting dark when I parked on Figueroa near Olympic, in front of the Diamond Club. Things were slow when I walked in, too early for the gin bill spin crowd. When I asked for Conover, the bartender blinked a couple of wet stones at me. In back, bloody jerked in his head back. toward the rear. I got as far as the shuffleboard table when a brunette eased out of the shadows. She wasn't wearing a coat, and it figured she was there to stay. May I help you? I'm looking for Tim Conover. I'm expecting him. Come on in. Sit down, Mr. Regan. Oh, so you're Jeff Regan. Ring a bell? I've heard the name before. It fits you. You're a private investigator. Yes, yes, of course. Tim's not in any trouble, is he? Not yet. What do you mean? Maybe, uh, maybe I better talk to him about it. Huh? Well, if it's that important, I better find him. Make yourself at home, Mr. Regan. If you like scotch... You... Thanks. I helped myself to that, waited around for about ten minutes. The phone rang once, and I let it go. A guy in a blue suit stuck his head in the door and said something about getting the wrong room and backed out. I was just catching up on my music when the door opened. Through the mirror, I saw Conover. A gray suit with a bulge in the front of his coat. There he is, Tim. Thanks, baby. I didn't know you played, Regan. Hello, Conover. I was having dinner. Helen tells me you've got something on your mind. That's right. Do I unload it now? In front of her? Why not? She's my baby. This is about another baby of yours. Do I go on? It's your show, Regan. <sighs> Amy Goodrich wants you to know she's got protection. Oh? Well, all right, Regan. You did your job. You told me Amy's got protection. See you somewhere. She wants to be left alone. All right. She wants to be left alone. Anybody bothering her? You are, according to her. This guy's working in a weed field, Angel. I got over her a long time ago. I haven't seen her in two years. I believe you, Tim. All right, Regan. She believes me. This is where you get off. Amy says she's seen you hanging around her place lately. Makes her nervous. Wrong guy, Regan. You made a big mistake. Sure. So the guy who picked Michigan. Look, I don't know what your pitch is or Amy's, but I'm not buying any. You may change your mind. You know, you've been in business too long, taking too many rabbit punches. You ought to start taking care of yourself. Uh, you ring, boss? Yeah. Get rid of this bum. They were a real pretty pair of muscles. One of them had a nose that looked like he'd been dipping it in an ink bottle all his life. The other one had an ear that could have passed for a golf ball. Well, they walked me out a door that opened onto an alley in back of the club. That's when the one with all the nose frisked me. Hey, just in case, Pally, just in case. Get your hands off me, punk. Easy, easy. We're just... Yeah, Gussie says take it easy. Hey, look. Uh, State of California. Gun and all. This guy's a gumboots. Max. What? I don't like no gumboots. Gumboots worse than a bum. You hear that, gumboots? Gussie says a gumboots is worse than a bum. You don't talk. Gumboots. How tough are you? <laughs> Still don't talk. Hey. Because he asked you how tough you are, huh? Are you tough? <clears throat> tough? <clears throat> Not so tough. Hey, my turn. Hold it. All right. Now, gumboots, here's what we get on answer. <clears throat> Very nice, Gus. Thank you. Come on, Maxie. We'll be late for dinner. Yeah, what about him? Ain't you hurt? 
He don't feel like eating tonight. I don't know how long I was away, but when I came back, I felt like I'd been sleeping on the wrong side of the world. I was still in that alley, and it was still dark. My head was rattling like it was full of broken glass. A yellow cat with an inferiority complex was sitting there looking at me. All over once, he started running. Regan. I didn't try to catch him. Regan. Hey, Regan. Oh. Can you hear me? Wake up. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Have you been drinking? Oh, shut up. I send you out on a simple little job. I put all my faith and trust in you, and what do you do? Wind up in an alley drunk. Get out of here. Nuzzled up to a garbage pail, bleary-eyed, with melon seeds in your hair. Stop How blowing you steam, do? fat, so you're not a locomotive. Oh, now, now, don't get so excited. You're getting seeds all over. <sighs> Give me a hand, will you? Yeah. Yeah. How'd you get here? Amy Goodrich called. She was getting worried about you. Said you went over to see Conover. She wanted me to stop you. I figured she would, but she's too late. A couple of his boys played beanbag with my skull. Well, who does Conover think he is, anyway, pushing my boy around? Just who does he think There's he... the door. Go in and ask him. Well, now, I, uh, I couldn't do that. I, uh... Well, tell me, what's this all about? That's what you're going to tell me. But I don't know anything. Amy Goodrich must have told you something when she hired me. If you're holding out me long... But I'm not, Jeff. Well, then start checking. Find out about Conover. Conover? What do you want to know about him? Everything. Find out, for example, if there's anything Amy Goodrich could be blackmailing him with. Blackmail? Regan, what is going on? I told you, I don't know. Well, then make a guess. Okay. It looks like everyone's in love with Amy. the lion standing there. He looked worried, like an elephant with a skin rash. None of it made sense. I knew I'd have to get some answers before long. I drove over to my place and straightened myself out with a shower and some Johnny Walker. A half hour later, I was back out in Santa Monica. Fog was closing in over the house when I rang the bell. Nobody answered. But somewhere in the back, there was a light, so I walked around in the sand. The patio was empty. Inside, Amy was sitting on a zebra-striped couch. She was wearing a white strapless thing with a splash of red in one shoulder. She had a movie magazine in one hand and a drink in the other. But she wasn't having a very good time. She was dead. This is CBS, and you are listening to The Story of the Lady Who Wanted to Live. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Well, the lion wasn't going to like it. His client, Amy Goodrich, was dead. And she wasn't in the market for protection anymore. I looked around for a gun, but didn't find it. Then I picked up the phone and put in a call to homicide... But I never talked to them. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Felix standing out on the patio. And he saw me. I hit the floor and pulled the lamp with me. Even after the gun was empty, he stood there pulling the trigger. Then he threw it down and began running toward the ocean. I went after him. Hold still. I killed him. Hold still. No, no, let me go. You'll drown. No, no, I don't care. I loved her, Regan. I couldn't stand it anymore. Come here. I couldn't stand it anymore, so I killed her. It doesn't make sense, does it? Sure, sure it does, but you're not going to kill yourself. The police. What about him? I phoned him. I told him everything. When? Just before you came. Come on. But don't be here. Let go. Yeah, that's why I said, come on. I dragged him out of the surf and got him into my car. He kept mumbling all the way into town. It was two minutes after ten when we got to my apartment. Three phone calls turned up the lion in a Turkish bath. He kicked, but when I told him what happened, he said he'd come right away. Twenty minutes later, he walked in. He still had a towel wrapped around his head. He looked like sitting bull in an Easter bonnet. Where is he, Regan? Where is he? In there, asleep. Asleep? 
Just like that, he can drop off to sleep after what he's done. I gave him some pills. What about Homicide? He already called him. But they'll be looking for him down at the beach. We've got to stay clean, Regan. I'm going to phone Homicide. Pick up that phone and I'll ram it so far down your throat you'll get a busy signal out of your hip pocket. This is murder. What's gotten into you? You're not going to toss Felix to the wolves. Regan, you find the girl dead. Felix has the gun. He admits killing her. What are you saving him for? What are you going to do with him? Stuff him and put him on your mantle? He's a fall guy, a patsy. He didn't do it. He didn't... He didn't kill her? He was carrying this gun. He took six shots at me tonight. That's all it holds. There's one bullet in her and he didn't have any extra slugs. Huh. Now, what did you find out about Tim Conover? Oh, he's clean, Regan. Absolutely clean. Unless you want to count a court-martial. He uh, celebrated V.E. Day by poking a major in the chops. What else? He kicked him, too. All right, all right. Hey, where are you going? Out. Look, you stay here and keep Felix company. Oh, of course, Regan. I'll do that. Run along. You needn't worry. I'll watch over Felix like a father. You'd better. But the cops will be here. It won't take them more than an hour or two to find him. Yeah, and I've got just that long to find out who really killed Amy Goodrich. All right, all right. I suppose I'll have to go along. After all, we're working hand in hand in this thing. In that case, I'll hide my ring. I didn't like the idea of leaving the lion there with Felix, but there was nothing else I could do. Besides, I still had to do business with a guy named Conover. I was just getting into my car when I felt a gun in my back. And right away, I knew Conover had business with me. All right, Regan. We got things to talk over, and I just keep walking straight ahead, the black sedan. Now, Regan, you sit in front with Helen. I'll take the back seat. Okay, Helen. Where to, Tim? Nowhere. Regan and me can do our talking right here. It's quiet. Tim, are you sure you're doing right? Please, let me handle this, baby. All right, Regan, what's the play? I know Amy's dead. Now, let's just take it from there. Who told you? I was there tonight. Tim, you shouldn't. He'll involve you. He'll tell the police. I said I'll handle this, baby. So you were there. I know. Don't tell me. She was already dead when you showed up. No, not quite. All I got out of her was the name of some guy, Dolan, and something about Lake Tahoe. She seemed to think I know what it was about. And you didn't? No. Kind of figured you'd tell me. All right. Blackmail. Amy? Blackmailing me? You didn't know her very well, did you, Regan? She said she needed protection. I think she wanted a strong arm boy. No, it doesn't fit. She was no good, but not blackmail. It doesn't fit at all. Maybe I can make it fit. Don't try. I'm not going to be tagged for this thing, Regan. You know some answers. Maybe you better start talking right now. I said start talking. I didn't know if Conover was just looking for information or if he wanted to find out how much I knew about a guy named Dolan in Lake Tahoe. Well, I had a 50-50 chance. I could get the butt of that gun across my face or I could try walking away and take a chance in getting a bullet in my back. And then I saw an old coupe, Oklahoma license, limping along the other side of the street. I opened the door, stepped out onto the sidewalk... I kept on going into the middle of the street. Conover yelled, but he didn't fire. And then the coupe slammed on the brakes. What's the matter with you, Pilgrim? You want to get yourself bashed up standing out in the middle of the street? Want to get yourself all bashed up, huh? We ran out of gas. We're joining an auto club. Pay your dues. There's no phone. Uh, could you give me a lift? <laughs> I wasn't going to anyhow. Look, climb in, climb in. I'm doing it the bowling alley. Hey, what are them two going to do? Just sit there, Nick? I didn't answer that. When we pulled away, Conover was just sitting there staring. But there was nothing to stare at. Helen was different. She registered one look. Fear. Fifteen minutes later, the Oklahoma license dropped me off at Vermont and Franklin, where I got a cab. All the way downtown, I kept wondering about Conover's play. He could have stopped me, but he didn't. That could mean he hadn't shot Amy. It could also mean he had shot her, but he knew about Felix confessing over the phone to the police. At the examiner morgue, I found Ned Fuller looking at a girly magazine. I told him what I wanted, and ten minutes later, he spread out a file dated May 9th, 1945. Is this it? Wealthy playboy shot to death. Willard J. Dolan, San Francisco socialite, found dead at Lake Tahoe Cabin. That's it. Oh, well, they never did solve it. There's some stuff here about a mystery woman. I can woman. read. They think she might have done it. Somebody's seen her come out of the cabin that night. She's tall, blonde... First name, Amy. Hmm? No, no, they never found out who she was. Somebody did. Oh, well, there was witnesses. Yeah, let's see here. Uh, yeah, Mr. and Mrs. Franklin James. 
San Diego people. They saw the dame come out. They couldn't give a good description of her. Want a bet? Hmm? A bet? Sure, I'll take Notre Dame. Who'll you take? I'll take a guy named Tim Conover. <laughs> Reagan. Hello, Conover. You're staying up late tonight. You work awfully hard for a buck soldier. That's for what your boys did to me out in an alley. I wonder what makes a guy walk into trouble three times in one day. You got a lot of nerve, Regan, but you use it in the wrong places. I'm just getting started. All right, make your play. What's next? You talk. What about... Dolan, Willard J. I told you... Lake Tahoe, May 9th, 1945. Talk, Conover. All right, then I'll talk. A tall blonde named Amy Goodrich, an unsolved murder at Lake Tahoe. But there was a witness. When I first came over here, I guess she was blackmailing you. I was wrong. You were blackmailing her. You stink, Regan. I told you you wouldn't tag me for this. Well, you're wrong. No, he is, Mr. Regan. Oh, so that's it. Thanks, Helen. Give me the gun. I'll run things from now on. I don't know what you get out of this, Regan. But you got your engine switched. Look, a mixed-up guy named Felix Beethoven actually thinks he killed Amy, and he didn't. I've got him on ice, but the cops will get him. And when they do, he's on his way to the gas chamber. Oh, Tim, please, let's get out of here. Let's not just... Wait a minute. Wait a minute, baby, wait. So I was blackmailing Amy. I had a good thing, but I shot her. And I was the mystery witness at Lake Tahoe. I thought you were a better gumshoe than that, Regan. What does that mean? The date was May 9th, 1945. You mean you haven't looked me up? All of a sudden, it hit me. Something the lion had said about V.E. Day and a major who got hit in the chops. And the whole thing came apart at the seams. Conover couldn't have been the witness. He was in a guardhouse in Germany. I began to feel helpless, like a glass blower with hiccups. For the first time in my life, I really wanted to talk to the lion. I looked at the gun in Conover's hand, then I reached for the phone and dialed. Slow. He didn't stop me. Anthony J. Lyons. Lyon, the cops. Oh, Regan. Yeah, they're not here yet. Felix? Still asleep. Well, get him out of there. Regan, I can't do that. Get him out of there. We broke our pick. What? I've been working the wrong angle. We've got to have more time. But I can't get him out of here now. We'll be seeing. You must have something. I have. A guy named Willard Dolan was killed at Lake Tahoe. A Mr. and Mrs. Franklin James were the witnesses. But Conover isn't... Reagan. Hold it. Yeah? That name. Damn. Mr. and Mrs. Franklin James? Hang up. Regan, what's going on? Hang up. Jeffrey, are you... Helen's got something to tell you. Oh, Tim, please. Go ahead. Go ahead, baby. Tell him. Tim, Wait no. a minute. Mrs. Franklin James. Yeah, Mrs. Franklin James. All right, all right. I was Mrs. Franklin James. I was a witness. I did blackmail Amy. And you figured me to be the fall guy. You hung around just so you could use me if the heat ever came on. No. No, I swear, Tim. I love you. I never meant to get you involved. But I, I used a piece of your stationery once. Amy had a trace. So she figured it was Conover all the time. Yes. Oh, I went crazy trying to cover it up. Because I love you, Tim. I love you. I couldn't let anything happen to you. No. No, but you set me up for a murder rap. No, I wasn't. I was trying to protect you. Don't you see Amy was going to kill you, Tim? She was going to kill me? Yes. All she wanted Regan for was to set up that story about your threatening her. And then, and then she could claim self-defense. But it didn't work that way. No. You came around. I couldn't let Tim find out. I couldn't let anybody find out. You killed her, didn't you? Yes, yes, I killed her. For you, Tim. I killed her for you. But we can get away, darling. Regan's the only one who knows. Sure, sure, and a kid with a bum ticker takes the rap. Except that somebody might ask questions about what happened to me. We'll have to take that chance, Tim. Regan's the only one who can make trouble for us. Us, baby. What? I don't have any troubles. You have. Oh, Tim. You're joking. Listen to me. You're wasting your time. Tim. You won't help me? No. You won't help me? No. But if you let them arrest me, I'll die. 
They'll convict me. Oh, please, please, you have the gun, Tim. You can save me. I don't want to die. I love you. I want to live. I want to live. I don't want to die. All right, Regan. You better get her out of here. Tim! Tim! Regan, I said get her out of here. Well, that's the way it wound up. Helen went to headquarters. Tim went back to his club. I went out of town for a few days. When I got back, I drifted into the office. The lion gave me the wind-up. A report on Felix. Yes, Regan. Those doctors worked on Felix Beethoven three days. Psychiatric medicine's a profound study. Profound. They finally convinced him he didn't kill Amy. Yeah, yeah. That's sad. He loved that woman as cruel as she was to him. He loved her a great deal. I suppose life will be lonely for him now that she's gone. You're wrong. What do you mean? I saw him in Hollywood today. He's got a new friend. One with red hair. You mean to tell me he's willing to do it again? To accept abuse from another woman? Why, that man's a natural for any woman's dominance. He hasn't got a thing to worry about. But you said she was a redhead and I know redheads. Yeah, but Felix is bigger than this one. Besides, the new one's a cocker spaniel. Jeff Regan, Investigator, was written by E. Jack Newman and Adrian Jondo, directed by Sterling Tracy. Frank Graham is starred as Regan, with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. Original music is by Dick Arant. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure... Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Wolf is busy planning a menu. I'll see if he can talk to you. What's the name again? You want to talk to a dame named Mrs. Collins? Hang up, Archie. Do we know a Mrs. Collins? No. I don't suppose you care, but I think her voice is very charming. Doubtless. Every female has a charming voice to you. Hang up. Okay. I'm sorry, Mrs. Collins, but at the moment, Mr. Wolf is too involved with his digestive system to be interrupted. However, if I may introduce myself, Archie Goodwin, uh, Mr. Wolf's assistant, if I can be of any help. Archie. Uh, yes, Mrs. Collins, I'll ask you. Cocktail party. Hang up, Archie. Well, Mrs. Collins, I'm afraid it would be better if you didn't expect Mr. Wolf. Goodbye. Cocktails. Foy. Sad. Very absurd. She says you promised to come to her cocktail party, and why aren't you there? Because you are going to attend the cocktail party and the probable unpleasant ending. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that genius who is the bulkiest, balkiest, the most ponderous and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolfe. Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Mr. Wolf and I refer to this as the case of the party for death. Nero Wolf really should have gone to the party since he'd accepted, but I was delegated. I can't complain now, since it was there that I met Georgia, the most beautiful redhead. Well, that's my weakness, redheads. Yeah, and blondes and brunettes. And... Well, anyway, Mr. Wolf was adamant about going to the party. I've never been to a cocktail party in my life. You know, I drink nothing but beer. You could take your beer with you, couldn't you? I could not. Do we know a Mrs. Collins whose cocktail party you said you'd go to? The phone rang and I picked it up. Where was I? Exactly. Okay. So a Mrs. Collins with a beautiful, seductive voice conned you into accepting an invitation to a cocktail party that you knew you weren't going to. Archie. Yes, master. Just a little less sarcasm, perhaps. Sarcasm? Call it impertinence, then. Impertinence, master? Exactly. Less of that, much less. Okay. Continue now. Where was I? You were eating the duck recipe. Oh, yes, the duck. Oh, here we are. Dodine de Canard. 
The dodine is one of the oldest dishes in the repertory of French cooking, being mentioned in books of the 14th century. Le grand cousinier de tout cousinier. Hurry, what time is it, Archie? Almost 6.30. Oh, in that case... Uh, you going to get up? Uh, here on this card are your instructions, Archie. If you are still alive tomorrow, you may make your report. I helped the huge bulk that was Nero Wolf out of his specially built desk chair and walked with him to the elevator that would take him upstairs to his orchids. I stepped back to the desk and found the card which bore my instructions. In his small, perfect handwriting, I read, Mrs. Albert Collins, Empire Towers. Arrive at 7, say I sent you. After the murder, telephone me before the police arrive. At exactly 7, I rang Mrs. Collins' doorbell. Mrs. Collins? I'm Mrs. Collins. I'm Archie Goodwin. We talked on the phone a little while ago. Oh, oh yes. Well, uh, come in, Mr. Goodwin. Uh, Mr. Wolf begs to be excused. At the last moment, he was unable to attend. Well, I'm glad you could come. You're not disappointed? No, I, I don't think so. I'm, I'm rather upset. I'm afraid, Mr. Goodwin, for my life. That's why I called Mr. Wolf. Oh, oh, just drop your hat and coat there, Mr. Goodwin. Uh, may I tell you something, Mrs. Collins? Well, of course, Mr. Goodwin. Archie will do. Uh, Archie? When I spoke to you on the phone, I thought I knew what you'd look like. And? You do. Well, is that good? It's not bad, Mrs. Collins. Janie will do. Janie will do. Um, Archie, mm -hmm. I, um, I think it would be best if I say you're an old beau of mine. From where? Uh, in Hollywood. When I went to Hollywood High School and you went to USC. Okay, but don't expect me to remember much about it. Well, I'd be flattered if you remember anything about it. <laughs> I want you to keep your eyes and ears open. Observe everything tonight. Well, now shall we join the party? <laughs> oh, Albert, this is Archie Goodwin. Archie, this is my husband, Albert. How do you do? Hello. And this is Joe Boyce, my husband's partner. How do you do? Boyce? I've told you about Archie Albert, but well, I guess you probably don't remember, do you? No, I don't. When I was in high school and he went to USC. Oh. Oh, well, yeah, sure. What do you have, Goodwin? I'd like a plain lime and soda. Oh, now, really? A teetotaler now? Uh, yes, I, uh, well, I used to overdo it, uh -huh. remember? So you knew my wife in Hollywood? Quite a while ago, though. Uh-huh. Been here long? Oh, a while. Did you and my wife run into each other again just lately? Yeah. A few days ago? About. Joe Boyce here is my partner, chemical business. Makes this sort of an old home week, doesn't it, Joe? In a way, Al. I guess it does at that. Joe knew my wife back in those days, too. And they're still very friendly. Yeah. Yes, indeed. You two have got something in common to talk about, haven't you, good one? Mrs. Collins, you mean? Uh, we never knew each other very well. No? Okay, good one. Let it go. Why, look. Look what I found. A new man. Just what I need. I'm Georgia. Archie. Archie, dear. Will you fix up my drink, please? Anything for a lady. Let's go to the bar. Eh, Archie? I'm determined, Joe. You're only the money. You're only Jane. I might listen. Oh, Al, can't we talk about it later? I like talking about it now, Joe. You're going to be sorry about this, Al. I am already. But you'll have 20 years or so in prison just being sorry. I've got the papers you forged right here. You're hysterical, Al. Let's face it. The firm went broke, but I suffered too. So let's forget it. Yes, Joe. The firm went broke, but you didn't. And I don't think my wife did either. The two of you had everything figured for yourselves. Well, I'm turning the papers over to the D.A. tomorrow. Nero Wolf speaking. Archie, what do you know about this expected murder, if anything? Has it happened yet? No, but who's supposed to get killed? I haven't the faintest idea, Archie. Then why don't you stop it? That is impossible. I don't even know who's there. You want me to tell you? Not in the least. How am I supposed to prevent it if I don't know what I'm looking for? You're not supposed to prevent it, Archie. I don't think you could. I don't think anybody could. You want to hear what I found out already? No. I'll tell you anyway. Collins thinks his wife and his partner, Boyce, have been stealing.
stealing his dough, and he's threatening to send boys to the clink. Archie. Yeah? You're wasting our time. Go back to the party. There is nothing you can do to prevent the murder. But I want you to be there when it happens. Now that all the guests have gone, let's uh, sit down here, Georgia. When Janie was in Hollywood, she must have had more good-looking boyfriends. Let's get personal about this, Georgia. Yeah, let's. When you say good-looking, do you mean me? I don't mean anybody else, Archie. You know, I think you're pretty, too. You'd better not let Jane hear you say that. You think she'd care? I thought you knew Jane. Only slightly. You don't like Jane too well, do you? Why? Why? Why what? Why don't you tell the truth about it? No man as attractive as you ever knew Jane slightly. Either they knew her or they didn't know her. Maybe you think I'm getting a little tipsy. The idea never occurred to me. No? Well, it has to me. Refill your glass? I'll come with you to the bar. Well, here's your drink, Georgia. Oh, I find there's no ice left in the ice bucket. Janie? Hey, Janie, no ice. Oh, well, I'll get some. Here, give me the bucket. Uh, Mrs. Collins, uh, Janie, I mean. Yes, Archie? May I use the phone in the bedroom again? Oh, of course. Will you excuse me for a minute, Georgia? I'm coming with you. Uh, why don't you just stay here until Jane brings the ice? Well, why don't you go talk to Joe Boyce? I don't want to talk to Joe Boyce. I don't want to talk to Joe Boyce ever. Now, look, Georgia. I'm coming with you, Archie. Is that clear? Okay, come on. Here's where the phone is. I could have found it myself. You don't want me with you, do you? Just sit down here on the edge of the bed and listen, if that's what you want to do. Neil Wolf speaking. Archie, boss. Well, Archie, what? Just a bit of a report. Go on. At this moment, I am sitting on the edge of one of two twin beds in the apartment of Mr. and Mrs. Albert Collins. Sitting next to me is a gorgeous redhead named Georgia. Georgia what, dear? Boys. You mean you're the wife of Joe Boys? Of course. Didn't you know? I am sitting next to the gorgeous red-headed wife of Albert Collins' partner, Joe Boyce. Archie, you annoy me. From what I just learned, I can see there's another friction going on. You mean Georgia and Jane? Yep. Fireworks between them. This one, no like other one. Have you anything more to say? When I called, I was going to ask if there's any reason why I shouldn't come home now. I wrote your instructions for you, Archie. After the murder, call you. Yeah, that's perfectly clear, isn't it? But what if there isn't any? And don't call me. <laughs> Simple, isn't it? Hello. He hung up. Archie. What? That was a strange conversation. Do you want me to explain it to you, honey? What was that business about murder? Shall we join the party? Murder. Archie, wouldn't you be surprised if there was one? Yeah? Who's going to do what and to whom? I don't know. Maybe I will. Elucidate, honey. Do you intend to figure as the killer or the corpse? I don't intend to figure as anything. But you never know. Archie, do you think Jane Collins is better looking than me? Nope. Honestly? Honestly. Then what's the matter with me? Nothing. Nothing at all. Oh, yes, there is. Look, do you want to kiss me? Uh, I... Well, I'll tell you. When I graduated from Sunday school, I took a vow. That's what I mean. But if I were Jane, you'd want to kiss me, wouldn't you? No, frankly, no. Why not? Well, when I graduated from Sunday school, I... Okay, Archie. Let's go back. You boys have such happy faces. Where's Jane? In the kitchen getting some ice. Where have you been? With Archie. Is he an old school chum of yours, too? Do you care, Joe? No. Mr. Boyce. What? How much do you weigh? 187. Why? Then I'll be giving you five pounds. Shall we step outside? This I have got to see. Shut up. Mr. Goodwin, you seem angry. Just terribly, terribly hurt. Would it do any good if I apologized? Today I'm a little upset. If I said anything to offend you, I do apologize. Now, um... If you still want me to give you a boxing lesson, I'm at your service. Let's forget it. I'm sorry, too. Jane Collins came in from the kitchen with a bucket of ice cubes, a tray of fresh glasses, and the strapless gown she'd been wearing. <sighs> there. I never thought I'd make it. Now I'm going to mix my own drink, and you can take care of yourself. Iceberg. Huh? Whiskey. And 
soda. <laughs> the simple recipe, isn't it, Archie? All it needs is the ingredients. Well, I drink to the ingredients. Mm. Ah, nice. Janie, darling. What, dear? Would you mind very much if I took Archie away from you? Uh -huh. Haven't you done that already, dear? To listen to those girls, you'd think. Wouldn't you, Goodman? Me, I never think. What do you do, Archie? I concentrate. On what? On not thinking. I did some serious concentrating on not thinking about Nero Wolf or about the conflict of the partners, Albert Collins and Joe Boyce, about the jealousies of Jane and Georgia. The next five minutes hardly seemed an hour. Jane and Boyce murmured to each other. Collins drank gently but firmly. Why can't you be honest, Archie? What's the matter with me? What, Georgia? You weren't listening, were you? To every gorgeous word you said. What did I say? I want to hear it again, just the way you said it before. I said, why shouldn't there be a murder? Why not? It's an order. It's just not considered the thing to do. Thing to do? Can you think of anything better? No, frankly. I can. My glass is empty. My glass is empty, too. Jane. Jane! Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm not much of a hostess, am I? Oh, don't answer that. Oh, you're all empty. But I've only drunk half of mine. You don't usually drink so slowly, Jane. Well, I'm just not in the mood tonight. I usually drink faster to keep you from drinking mine. <laughs> See, Albert always gulps his and then reaches for mine. What's the difference? Well, I'll fix you some fresh drinks, but uh, put my drink over there by you, Georgia. And lay off, Albert. I only had about three swallows of it. Besides, you don't need any more. I suppose we know what dear Jane is going to do, don't we? Lay off, will you? Lay off. It's my husband who said that, Archie. Archie, meet my husband, Mr. Boyce. I will now explain why dear Jane took our glasses away to the kitchen when she could have bought a drink right here. Listen, George, will you... Mr. Boyce is speaking, Archie. What, Mr. Boyce? Uh, ah, oh, nuts. Mr. Boyce says nuts, Mr. Goodwin. What do you say, Mr. Collins? I think Joe has covered the field. We were talking, weren't we, Archie? Possibly. We were talking about dear Jane. She's got to be always the prettiest, always devastating. Right now, she's putting on a completely new face. And in about 20 minutes, when our tongues are hanging out, she'll come back, all horsed up and bright and smiling with another tray of drinks. Yes, yeah, she'll take all night to fix them. Well, I'm going to get some air on the balcony. Don't jump off. Al, you're drinking too much lately. I should have worried you, Joe. Especially now. When you start drinking not only your drinks, but everybody else's too, well... Ah, Jane's right. Is that what worries you? Slide Jane's glass down. Hmm. The ice is all melted. You see what I mean? Okay, Joe, let's not be nasty until tomorrow. Huh. That gives me an idea. Think I'll propose a toast. Until tomorrow... You know, it may be rather fitting that I should drink a toast from the glass that Janie left until tomorrow. Al. Al? Jane? Janie! Albert! Oh, Albert. <laughs> Nero Wolf speaking. May I come home now? Oh, hello, Archie. I said, may I come home now? Have you sent for the police, Inspector Kramer? Of course. Who was killed, Archie? Albert Collins. How, Archie? I don't know. You were right, though, weren't you? Naturally. About what? Murder. Oh, that. We can talk about it tomorrow. Good night, Archie. Come home when you can. What do you mean, come home when I can? You'll be held as a witness, won't you? <laughs> Try not to wake me with the elevator when you come in. Well, Inspector Kramer, you've had me here at headquarters for a long while. For quite a long while. Haven't you asked me enough questions? Goodwin, you say you never saw these people before, Collins or Boyce or their wives. Yet when all the other guests had gone, you were still there. I guess I just don't know how to say goodbye. You didn't know they were partners in a chemical company. You didn't know that Boyce had forged a lot of papers with Collins' name. All I know is what you tell me. Goodwin. Yes, sir? 
I'm trying to be nice. Yes, sir. Now, I know, of course, that you went to that party because Nero Wolf told you to. Do you? My question is, how did Wolf know it was going to happen? Why don't you ask him? I already have. He told you? He says he never heard of Collins or Boyce. Did he say he'd ever heard of me? He says he isn't responsible for you or your shady friends. Maybe he knows I found a poison pellet in George's bag. Inspector, may I make an important call? Go ahead. Argy, argy. Uh, found it light. Hello? What time is it, Master? And find it, Archie. I'll tell you what time it is. It's a little after 4 a.m. I'm at Central Headquarters, and Inspector Kramer has been chatting with me about my shady friends. Kramer is a jackass. Just a second. Uh, pick up the other phone, will you, Inspector? Uh, sorry, Mr. Wolf. What was that you were saying about Inspector Kramer? I said Kramer is a jackass. Thank you. Wait a minute. Wolf! Oh? Eavesdropping, Inspector. I was just talking about bringing you down here for a little questioning, Wolf. Fooey. What's that? Fooey. It can be spelled in several ways. I spell it P-F-U-I. Fooey. You think I won't bring you down here as a material witness? Yes, I think you won't. I think you'd be making a great mistake if you did. A great mistake? Why? Because I might not tell you who killed Collins. Then you wouldn't know which one of these people to prefer charges against. Now send Archie home. Even he needs an occasional night's sleep. <laughs> what do you think of that? He hung up. So it seems. Huh. Busy? He's probably left the phone off the hook, Inspector. By now, he's probably asleep again. Uh, you know I can go out there, don't you? Sure you can. More important men than you have tried it. And where are they now? Goodwin? Yes, sir? I'm going to let you go. I'm sure Mr. Wolf and I are very grateful, Inspector. You want to know why I'm letting you go? I know why. Why? Because if you're nice and cooperative and don't make too much trouble, Mr. Wolf will solve this case for you and tell you whom to prefer charges against. Goodwin. Sir? Get out. Thank you, Inspector. Good morning, Inspector. At three o'clock the next afternoon, I was rearranging the furniture in Nero Wolf's office while the great man sat behind his desk watching me perspire. Are you finished now, Archie? I guess so. And tell me where they sat. There were two couches, like this, in front of a fireplace. Collins and Boyce were sitting together on one couch. When Georgia and I came in, they were looking at some canceled checks... Where was Mrs. Collins? I told you she was getting ice and fresh glasses. Why was she getting fresh glasses, Archie? Where were the empty ones? I don't know. Maybe they were the same ones she brought back washed and polished. Archie, I trust your powers of observation absolutely. That's why I sent you to Mrs. Collins' cocktail party. Okay, how did you know there was going to be a murder? If it was a murder. It was a murder, Archie. But isn't it obvious? How is it obvious? Suppose Colin slipped a few drops of the poison into his drink himself. It's very strong, very deadly poison, with a remarkably strong odor. Like almonds, I know. I smelled it when I picked him up. Archie, was anything found on the body that might have contained the poison, a fountain pen, whatever? Not even that. Inspector Kramer found a poison pellet in Georgia's handbag. He thinks he poisoned Collins' drink. Say, could be. But it wasn't his drink, it was his wife's. Then Georgia was trying to kill Jane, and Collins got it by mistake. We shall soon see, Archie. I was expecting a murder because you told me to expect it. I watched every move that everybody made. There is no possibility that Jane's glass, the glass with a poison in it, was tampered with by anybody. Yes, I believe. Okay. Archie, you're sore, aren't you? Have you ever spent the night with Inspector Kramer? He's really a good man, too. Why did you say he was a jackass? Because he didn't know who killed Collins. Do you? Of course. Is there ever any question about it? Just a moment, please. The only trouble is it may be difficult to prove. That's why we are giving this little cocktail party this afternoon with the help of Inspector Kramer. By the way... Yes? 
Call Mrs. Collins and tell her to bring a bucket of ice from her refrigerator. Why? Because our refrigerator's broken down. No, it hasn't. I was just out in the kitchen a minute ago. Our refrigerator has broken down. And it would be very helpful if Mrs. Collins would bring a bucket of ice cubes. What makes you think she'll do it? She will. Call her. 6.45. There we were in Wolf's office doing a repeat performance of last night's smash hit. Two couches faced each other, a cocktail table between them. On one couch, red-headed Georgia and me. On the other couch, it was a big one, Joe Boyce, Jane Collins, widow of the lately defunct Albert, and Nero Wolf. Jane had been drinking a little slower than the rest of us. Our glasses were empty. Hers was still half full. Wolf said... Oh, Jane. Yeah? At this point in last night's party, Mrs. Collins got up and left to get some fresh drinks. Repeat what she said. Approximately. Approximately will do. I think she said something like this. She said, um, put my drink over by you, Georgia. Lay off, Albert. I've had about three swallows of it. Besides, you don't need any more, Albert. Am I right, Jane? Close enough, Archie. But what of it? No. What is this nonsense all about, Wolf? Uh, Mr. Wolf is trying to make something out of nothing. I think Mr. Wolf is going to turn up something mighty interesting. Don't look so perturbed, Joe. Since I am playing the part of the late Mr. Collins, pass me Jane's glass. I'll keep my glass, Mr. Wolf. I haven't finished my drink. You're a very clever woman, Mrs. Collins. Would it be too much if I ask what this is all about? What about it, you, Archie? You make it sound as if that drink she's holding is poison. But it can't be, because as yesterday, she's already drunk half of it herself. When our freezer broke down, she was more than willing to bring a bucket of ice cubes, wasn't she? So? What would happen, Archie, if you froze a gelatine-coated pellet of poison in the center of one particular ice cube? Mrs. Collins hasn't finished her drink. Notice the ice is all melted now. She hasn't taken one sip since the ice melted completely. She came prepared in case she was exposed. Smell it, Archie. No, Archie, stand back. I can easily swallow this before you can reach me. Mr. Wolf, in a few seconds, I'll drink it. But tell me something first. Tell me how you knew. Jane, Jane, listen to me. I knew there was going to be a murder last night because you said so. I knew that it was you who would commit the murder because it was you who invited me. You hoped an expert witness would prove that you couldn't have killed your husband. So I sent Archie Goodwin, whose observations are always exact, even when he doesn't know the import of what he's observing. She brought back clean glasses. She poured the drinks out of bottles already open. And if anybody had put anything in or touched one of those glasses, I would have seen it. Exactly. The poison pellet was frozen in a certain ice cube. Mrs. Collins put that cube in her own drink, drank it until the ice had almost melted down to the poisonous pellet center. And then, then she took all the other glasses away, leaving only hers half full. And as usual, her husband drank it. No, no, Jane, don't, don't! Too late, Joe. (laughs) Too late. Well, boss, Jane didn't get away with the suicide try. That was clever thinking you did. I prepared a cube of ice in which I had frozen a gelatine capsule containing nothing more than a vitamin compound. I substituted for the cube in which Jane had placed the poison for herself. I wonder why Jane Collins wanted to have Joe. He'd stolen practically all the money in the company. He was just a crook. Birds of a feather, Archie. I don't believe Joe Boyce had any idea that Jane was planning a murder. And he still had all the money. Well, the forgeries will put him away for a long time. And poor Georgia could have had it pinned on her if it hadn't been for me. Yes, yes. You knew all along, didn't you, that Jane had planned to have Georgia accused by planting another pellet of the poison in Georgia's handbag. Jane would have gotten rid of her husband and Joe's wife in one stroke. You knew all that, didn't you? Well, I... Um... How about a bottle of beer, boss? (laughs) Could you spare the time? Uh, Georgia. Beautiful redhead. Wonder where she is tonight. I'm sure I haven't the slightest idea, but in case you do... (laughs) Well, just be quiet with the elevator door when you come in. You 
have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Mindred Lord was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Gigi Pearson, Herb Butterfield, Peter Leeds, Evelyn Eaton, and Bill Johnstone. Next week, at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Malevolent Medic. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Keep tuned to this station for the latest news. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective. Presented by Acme, America's great producer of fine quality paints. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. A man recognized as one of the great masters of deduction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, The Sixth Statue. Another exciting chapter dramatized from the life story of Nick Carter. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter investigated a strange plague called bronze disease that murdered two people and almost killed a third. Who's the busiest homemaker you know? Like as not, it's you, yourself, and no wonder. For these are busy times. But fortunately, there are fine new shortcuts to the homemaking job. Shortcuts such as the three great Linux home brighteners, which save you so many hours of work. No wonder American homemakers everywhere have come to depend on the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, the modern brush-on finish. Linux cream polish for fine furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax, the amazing new quick-drying wax product. Learn for yourself how simple a job home upkeep can be. How much lovelier your home will look with those three great Linux home brighteners. Get them at your hardware, paint, or department store. And see what modern magic they work for you. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. The regular morning work in the old brownstone mansion at the corner of 5th and 4th begins with Nick's voluminous correspondence. Scores of letters arrive every day, official, semi-official, friendly, threatening. But every once in a while, a strange note arrives, like the one Patsy is reading to Nick now. Dear Mr. Nick Carter, you are a famous detective and would not know me as I am only a housemaid. Oh, this writing is terrible. But... I have heard you will always help people if they are in trouble, so I am taking the liberty to ask you, would you help me? Mr. Carter, there is bad trouble in the house where I work, Mr. Horace Allen's house on Park Avenue. There is... is plague in the house, a bad sickness, and I think we will all die. The statues got sick first, and I know we will get it next. Please come and tell me what I should do. In clothes, please find muddy order to pay for your trouble. Yours truly, Maisie Leeds. For the love of peace. Oh, I really think this is touching, Nick. Look, here's the money order. Five whole dollars. Generous fee, considering Miss Leeds probably earns only 20 a week. Wish you hadn't sent it. Let's see that letter, Betsy. Here. Horace Allen. What? That's the famous ex meat packer, isn't it? 1270 Park. <laughs> Very rich. Yes. Hmm. Letter mail last night. Written in a great deal of hurry. Notice the ink blots? Mm-hmm. Miss Leeds seems to be rather frightened. Well, what's all this about plague? Now, here's the key line. Statues got sick first, and I know we will get it next. Statues got sick? But 
What's that mean? I think we better drive to 1270 Park and find out. Right now? Oh, can't it wait a few minutes, Nick? We've got so much work to do here, and, well, Miss Maisie Lee's trouble is probably a very vivid imagination. You've forgotten. I've been paid a retainer, Fessy. I'm now devoted to the interest of my client. Let's go see Maisie, even if we have to go in through the servant's entrance. <laughs> is a pretty swank mansion for an ex-meat packer, Nick. Yes. Heard Mr. Allen's turn to art in his retirement. He collects. Oh, I wish he'd go back to meat packing for the duration. You can't eat statues and packers. Very funny. No one home. Should be servants in the house. They don't seem to be. Oh, Nick, you're, you're not going Don't to... have to. The door's been left ajar. Come on. Oh, Nick, this isn't right. I've got a feeder on, Patsy. Come on in. Besides, it's rather unusual for a collector of art to leave the house door open when there's no one home. Now, oh, there's the library. Let's go in. Oh, golly. Plenty of stuff here. Paintings, statues. Nick, look at those statues. The bronze ones. Yes. They're, they're all greenish and crusted. Like they've got some kind of skin disease. And those bronze spears, too. And this bronze chest. I wonder how it looks inside. Maybe this... <gasps> Nick. Yes. Looks as if the plague has killed our client. As I'm very much mistaken, this body in the chest is that of Maisie Leeds. I've been through most of the house, Nick. There isn't a soul around... What's happened anyway? Don't know yet. Learn anything from the body? It's Maisie Lee's all right. Dead about ten hours. She must have been strangled and placed in this chest just after she mailed that letter to me. Oh. Patsy, there's an odd thing about this murder. It looks as if the killer had silver polish in his hands. Silver polish? Yes, there's a kind of white powder on Maisie's neck around the strangulation prints. It smells like silver polish. And, Nicky, you'd better notify the police. No. Why not? Listen, Patsy. Maisie Leeds paid me five dollars to take on her case. I didn't get her soon enough to save her life, but I am going to get a killer. This is a point of honor. Something Sergeant Matheson wouldn't understand. Well, what are you two doing I... in Nick. here? Don't move, either of you. I'd suggest you put that gun away. You might hurt someone. Answer my question. What are you doing in here? Who are you? I'm Nick Carter. This is my secretary, Patsy Bowen. Nick Carter? Yes. Well, I'm Peter Craig, Horace Allen's nephew. I was up on the top floor, heard someone calling down here. That was me. So I came down. What's the matter, Mr. Carter? Look in the bronze chest. Good grief, Maisie. All right, Craig, I want some quick answers from you. Why was the house empty when we arrived? Where's your uncle? Where are the servants? Well, there aren't any servants. They all quit yesterday, except Maisie here. Uncle Horace rushed down to the employment agency this morning. That's that's why I'm alone in the house. I see. But you didn't see Maisie Leeds this morning? No, I... Well, I generally stay in my rooms on the top floor. Uncle Horace just yelled up that he was going to the agency. What agency? The Sun Agency on Vanderbilt Street. One more question, Craig. You know anything about bronze statues? No. Who sold these to your uncle? St. Gennaro Field, English dealer at the plaza. All right. You stay here. Try and locate your uncle on the phone and get him home. We're hustling over to see Arrowfield. I want to find out what six statues have got to do with murder. Mr. Carter. That man, Ellen, is an idiot, a fool, an artistic criminal. I should never have sold rare pieces to an ex-meat packer. Go on. Antique bronzes are as delicate as tropical fruits. Unless they're cared for with delicacy and understanding, they sicken. You mean statues can really become sick? Yes, and die. Bronze disease is a corrosion that eats away the metal, rots it until it crumbles. No one knows how it starts. No one knows how to stop it. Once it attacks a collection, the infected pieces must be removed or the entire collection will die. Golly. And Brown's disease has attacked Allen's collection? You saw it, didn't you? The green crumbling crust on the surface of the bronze? And unless he removes the infected pieces, his collection is doomed. But why did you call him an artistic criminal? He has a half a million dollars worth of items there. All the money in the world can't replace one of those pieces once it's lost. Don't you understand there's nothing more valuable than a work of art? Oh, yes, there is, Mr. Arrowfield. A human life. 
Unemployment agency. Mm. Doesn't look very busy. I'm sorry, nothing available. We're looking for Mr. Horace Allen. And not here. He was here this morning? Here and gone. Can't supply him with anything. Why not? Sleeping quarters are impossible. The nephew's a chemist or something. You say the nephew's a chemist? Yes, has a laboratory alongside the servants' quarters. Terrible smells all day and all night. Well... Chemist ought to know more about bronze disease than Craig seemed to. Patsy, let's have a talk with that young man right now. Here we are. Nick, do you think Craig was lying? Don't know, Patsy. Perfectly possible. Uh. I hope Mr. Allen's back by this time. With somebody to answer the door. At least Craig ought to answer. Probably back upstairs in his laboratory. Well? Nick. Just my little pick lock, Patsy. Can't wait here all day. One second. There we are. Hello? Anybody home? Funny. You told Craig to stay here. Well, let's run up to the top floor. We'll find him there. Walk? Right. Haven't you noticed? Alan has a neat little private elevator installed. Oh. Step in. Call your floor, please. First floor, dining rooms, smoking rooms, lounge rooms. Second floor, bedrooms, bedrooms, and more bedrooms. Third floor, hot houses, bedrooms, and more bedrooms. Fourth and top floor, servants' quarters, and... Nick, <gasps> look. On the floor, it's, it's Craig. Yes. Fourth and top floor, murder. First a murdered housemaid, then a murdered chemist. How will Nick explain them and solve the mystery of the six statues? We'll see in just a moment. One of the most important jobs in keeping your home spick and span is the care of your floors. And now you have an efficient new shortcut to that very job. Linux self-polishing wax made from a new formula developed by leading chemists to give you the finest. For Linux self-polishing wax, designed to save work for you, at the same time provides amazing new beauty, new protection, new skid resistance for all your floors and linoleum. Linux self-polishing wax imparts the satiny luster that only real wax can give. And because it contains the greatest possible amount of genuine carnauba wax, the finish lasts longer. What's more, the underwriters' laboratories have proved by actual test that any hardwood, linoleum, or rubber tile floor is less slippery after Linex self-polishing wax has been applied. Best of all, Linex self-polishing wax takes only a jiffy to wipe on and dries without tiresome rubbing to a handsome finish to make any homemaker proud. So follow the example of women all over America. Enjoy greater leisure, greater convenience, greater beauty in your home with Linex self-polishing wax. Available at your hardware, paint, or department store. Ask your dealer now for all three great Linex home brighteners. The easy way to more attractive living. And now back to our story. Investigating a strange complaint about six statues, Nick and Patsy entered the empty home of Horace Allen to discover Allen's housemaid, Maisie Leeds, murdered. Nick finds that Allen's artworks are suffering from a rare disease known as bronze disease, and also that Allen's nephew, Peter Craig, is an amateur chemist with a laboratory on the top floor of the house. When Nick and Patsy return to the house to question Craig, they find him murdered, too. Now they're in the murdered man's laboratory examining his body. But well, Nick? Stabbed through the chest with a brown spear, Patsy. Evidently, one of the spears from Allen's collection. Golly. It was a powerful thrust. You can see the tip protruding from Craig's back. You can also see it's tainted with the same bronze disease that's hit some of the statues. Aha, uh-huh. hello. Well, what is it? Craig didn't die at once. What do you mean? Look, here on the floor. Oh. Craig must have tried to write something in blood as he was dying. Yes. It says N H L. 
NHL, what's that? Couldn't tell you. Yet. Nick, I've got it. Initials. He wrote the initials of the killer. Maybe. Uh, it couldn't be Allen or, or, or Arrowfield or the Sun Agency. Maybe it was one of the old servants. Hey, what's going on in this house? Where is everybody? What goes here? Nick, I think I hear... You uh, don't think. You do hear. Our old friend, Sergeant Matheson. Hey, anybody home? Craig, Allen. Hey, Mr. Allen, I... Oh, glory be, I'm seeing things. Oh, we're real, Sergeant. Good afternoon, Matty. Nick Carter and company, I might have known. What are you two? Hey, who's that on the floor? Peter Craig. Murdered. Craig, too? He's the guy that called me. First the girl downstairs, now him upstairs. What is this, a massacre? I'll give you the facts, Matty. No, 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 no. Explanations first, if you please, Mr. Oh, Carter. Here we go. Now, look, I warned you a thousand times when you get mixed up in murder cases to notify homicide. There's a law in this city. Don't you ever do anything but break the law? Yes, I solve murders. You ought to know. Yeah, 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 I know, but Nick, please. We've got laws to enforce. Make it as easy as you can for us to enforce them. Matty, I'm going to help you enforce one law today. The law against first-degree murder. Come on down to Allen's laboratory. So that's exactly where we stand in the case, Matty. The murders are tied up some way with the bronze disease. Yeah? I have an idea how, but I'm not sure yet. Well, look, uh, what about the insurance angle? Maybe Allen's trying to ruin his own statues to collect the dough on Oh, no, Matty. He could get more by selling them. Well, maybe Craig ruined the statues and Alan killed him for revenge. Maybe, but I doubt it. Besides, that leaves out Maisie Lee. Oh, forget her. She's just an accident in this case. She's not an accident in this case, and she's not to be forgotten. Matty, you won't understand this, but in this case, I'm working for Maisie Leeds. I'm not working for you or the police. What's that? I'm working for justice. Justice for Maisie Lee. I think you're crazy. Huh? See, Patsy, I told you. Well, 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 well. Huh? I'm pleased to see you all here. And a fine lot of people you seem to be. I'm Mr. Allen. Oh, yeah? Yes, indeed. Very easy man to work for. Just myself, my nephew in the house. Big house, few people, not too difficult, eh? I suppose the agency explains. Mr. Allen. You're the housemaid, eh? Very pretty, my dear. Very Mr. Allen, your housemaid is Miss Patsy Bowen, my assistant. The what? I am Nick Carter. Nick Carter, but I... I'm going to be blunt, Mr. Allen. No sense beating around the bush. Your maid, Maisie Leeds, was strangled to death. Your nephew, Peter Craig, was stabbed to death. What? Oh, oh, oh. help him in the chair, Matty. Yeah, right, Nick. Easy, Easy. Oh, Thank you. Uh, I'll yeah. be all right. I didn't spare you because we're pressed for time, Mr. Allen. The killer may strike again. We've got to work fast. Now, where were you all day? At the employment agencies, trying to hire servants. A likely story. Yeah, it's true. I had to have them in the house today. I have a very important guest coming, arriving on the 6.30 train from Washington. Says you. You can get the list of agencies of Mr. Allen to check the story later, Matty. Okay. Mr. Okay. So Allen, I want to take one of your statues home with me. One of the diseased ones. I, uh, I'm sorry. I can't permit that, Mr. Carter. My guest coming tonight. But you ought to remove the six statues anyway, Mr. Allen. Mr. Arrowfield said so. Why, they'll infect everything. I know, I know, but I can't. My guest is a famous collector and wants to buy some of my pieces. I've got to show him all of them. I see. Well, in that case, we've got to work without your help. Come on, Patsy. You'll be in my lab if anything breaks, Matty. Right. Oh, by the way, Mr. Allen, what's the name of this famous collector who's visiting you tonight? Uh, Norman Lane. Uh, Norman Hadley Lane. Oh, Patsy, turn off the Bunsen burner, will you? Of course. Nick! I just realized what Alan said. What's that, Patsy? The man coming up on the 6.30 train from Washington. Norman Hadley Lane. N-H-L. Mm-hmm. Found at a couple of museums. Put a file on him. But, but, but the letters, N-H-L, that's his initials. Mm-hmm. Oh, Nick, you're not listening. Just finishing this analysis, Patsy. Here. See this precipitate? Yes. That's the... Silver polish from Maisie Lee's throat. Is it silver polish? No. Something that came from Peter Craig's lab. Now hand me that package I brought from Alan's house. Mm. Here. Thanks. I'll, I'll wrap this. Nick, you don't seem to care about the initials. I'll bet Lane's the killer. I'll bet he isn't even on the train. He's probably here already. Huh. Here we are. Nick, that's the spear that killed Craig. Right. But that's stealing police evidence. Oh, golly, Sergeant Matheson's going to be sore. 
Alan would let me have a sample of his diseased bronze for I had to steal it. I must cut a sliver of bronze off the tip of the spear, and we'll take a look at it under the microscope. Now you're destroying evidence. Oh, Nick, Nick, I don't like it. Not destroying. I'm just taking off a shaving. There. Now, now let's see. Well? Ah. Well, what do you see, germs? Yeah, I'll let you have a look. You see? This is a slice across the tip of the spear. Now, you see the outer portions? Uh, those crystals all around the edges? Yes. The malachite crystals. Shows the presence of the brown disease. Now, what do you see inside? Toward the core of the section. Mm, just reddish metal. Exactly. Amorphous bronze metal. Just pure, uncrystallized bronze. And that, Miss Bowen, breaks the case wide open. What, what do you mean, Nick? I mean that... Oh, I'll get it. Hello? Nick Carter. Speaking. Who's this? Here's a tip for you, Mr. Nick Carter. If you want to find who killed Peter Craig, watch the clerk from the Sun Employment Agency. Quick, Patsy, get a line on this call. Trace it. Right. I'm afraid I don't follow you. The clerk from the Sun Employment Agency. You'll find him at the Hotel Brighton. Now, he'll tell you who killed Craig. Uh, just let me get that down, will you? Hotel Brighton. Uh, wh whereabouts is that? I've talked long enough. You know what to do. Goodbye. Oh, it's no use, Patsy. I couldn't hold him long enough. You get any kind of a trace? No. Sorry. Well, it doesn't matter. Get Matty on the phone. Tell him we're picking him up and take him for a ride. To the Hotel Brighton? Just tell him the killer will be at the other end of the ride. <laughs> Right, Nick, never mind the Mysterioso stuff. Where are we going? Thought Patsy told you, Matty, to meet a murderer. Where? Didn't Patsy tell you that? The Hotel Brighton. Then we're going the wrong way. The Brighton's downtown in the village. You're driving uptown. That's right. But Nick, the man on the phone said that... The man on the phone was wrong, Patsy. Here we are. This is where we're going. Huh? What time is it? 6.25. Uh, just in time. Come on. Oh, this is Pennsylvania Station. Right. And we're going to meet the Washington train. You mean to tell me the killer is this Lane guy? Norman Hadley Lane? That's who we're going to meet. We'll have to move quickly. We haven't much time. Oh, but Nick, we'll we... talk later, Patsy. I'm afraid they cut it rather fine. We've got to get to the lower level and be on the platform when the train pulls in. This way. If this is a wild goose chase, Nick... When I lead you wrong, you can say that, Matty. Not until then. Down this ramp. Right. <sighs> now, that's the Washington train. Quick. Oh, we'll never get through the crowd. We've got to. Here. Here are pictures of Lane. Yeah, take uh -huh. him. You can't miss him. He's a big man, quite stout. Heavy grayish beard. Uh -huh. Looks like Edward the Seventh. Look sharp. Now we mustn't miss him. Now listen, Nick. This is no time for arguments, Matty. We've got to locate Lane as soon as he gets off that train. Now stand by. Right. I'll take the center. You watch right. Matty, you take the left. Okay. Right. Fat man, Edward the Seventh beard. Oh, what a crowd. I think. Oh, oh we no. only know which car we Hold it. Say. There he is, car in front of us. Quick, Matty, forward. Right. It's a lane. It's a Norman Lane. Norman Hadley Lane. Get down. Get down. Nick, what are you doing? He's tackling me. <laughs> Matty, you got him? Yes, I got him, Nick. Right, hold on to him. Right. Let's take him to the station master's office. You can call the wagon from there. Well, this is quieter at least. Hey, Nick. Why didn't you warn me it was going to be an assassination? Didn't know when it was going to happen. Oh, what about Mr. Lane? Oh, I just put him in a cab. He's all right. He was pretty well shaken up when I knocked him out of the way of the bullets. Now, that's a lot better than a shot through the heart. Huh, Mr. Arrowfield? Why, oh, you dirty gumshoe snooper. I'd like to... Hold on, Matty. <laughs> He's a dangerous little man and a very clever actor. <coughs> phony Englishman, phony dealer in art objects, including phony bronzes. Phony bronzes? Certainly, Patsy. That was the whole motivation. When Mr. Allen took up collecting objects of art, Arrowfield got hold of them and sold him a lot of supposedly antique bronze masterpieces. But in reality, they were completely phony being merely modern copies of those masterpieces. And unless I'm wrong, Mr. Norman Lane owned many of the originals from which Allen's bronzes were copied. Well, Nick, uh, what about that bronze disease? When Arrowfield learned that Lane was coming to see Allen's collection, he knew Lane would recognize many of Allen's bronzes as copies of items in his own collection. Yeah? So Arrowfield, in order to force Allen to remove those phony pieces from his collection, deliberately infected them with a bronze disease. What do you know? Allen refused to remove them in spite of the disease, so Arrowfield had to do the next best thing. Kill Lane. Otherwise, he faced exposure as a dealer in fakes and phony pieces. The murder of Lane, fortunately, didn't succeed. The others did. 
And I'm going to see that you pay for them, Arrowfield. I want to be sure that Maisie Leeds, wherever she is now, gets her full five dollars worth. <laughs> In just a moment, Nick will be back to give you the final details of today's story and tell you how he knew Arrowfield was the poisoner of the sick statue. The whole year round, it's a real job to keep your home bright and interesting. That's why the three great Linux home brighteners are so important to help in your homemaking schedule, because they save so much time and work. Take Linux clear gloss, for instance, the modern brush-on finish for all wood and linoleum surfaces. Linex Clear Gloss is ideal for any surface you want to save, protecting for months against wear, against dirt, against spotting, warding off damage by hot grease, boiling water, fruit acids, even alcohol. And Linex Clear Gloss lends such sparkling beauty, beauty that's easy to maintain, for the whisk of a damp cloth removes smudges from any Linex Clear Gloss surface. Linex Clear Gloss flows on easily, too, drying to a smooth, lasting finish which protects for months. So give your linoleum, floors, and woodwork the gleaming luster, the sturdy protection of Linex Clear Gloss, the finest in household finishes. You'll find all three great Linex home brighteners, Linex Clear Gloss, Linex Self-Polishing Wax, and Linex Cream Polish for fine furniture at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And remember that your dealer is headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. Chemtone covers in one coat, dries in one hour, bringing bright new loveliness to your walls and ceilings in bedroom, living room, or hall. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. Nick, I don't see why Arrowfield killed Maisie Leeds. Because when Maisie returned from mailing her letter to me, she saw Arrowfield in the collection room deliberately infecting the false antique bronze statues with the bronze disease. She was killed to silence her. But how could Arrowfield poison the statues? Well, Patsy, as Alan's guide and mentor in the new business of collecting, Arrowfield had easy access to the house. He was able to steal in and infect those statues with chemicals he took from Craig's laboratory. To be precise, with ammonium chloride. That's the corrosive agent that causes bronze disease. Oh, and... Was that the powder you found on Maisie's neck? Right. Some of it was on Arrowfield's hands when he strangled her. Evidently, Craig remembered seeing Arrowfield in his lab taking the chemical. So, Arrowfield killed him. But those initials Craig wrote. Oh, they weren't initials, Patsy. Craig tried to write the chemical symbol for ammonium chloride, NH4Cl. Mm -hmm. He wrote the N and the H and got as far as the first elbow stroke of four and then died. We thought he'd written NHL, which, purely by coincidence, happened to be Lane's initials. Oh, I see. Well, Nick, you said Arafield's bronzes were fools. How could you tell that? I fact, you remember this afternoon in my lab, you looked through the microscope at a piece of that spear that killed Craig? Yes. Well, really ancient bronzes become heavily crystallized through the years. But the piece we examined was crystallized only around the outer surface, showing that it was cast quite recently. So that's it. Well, was Arafield trying to sidetrack you with that phone call so he could get it lame when he arrived in town? Yes. Oh. Lucky you weren't fooled. Well, you know, it's a funny thing, Patsy. I've met thousands of crooks in my time, each one more clever than the next. And believe it or not, the only ones they fooled in the end were themselves. Well, Nick, what story are you going to tell next week? Remember the time we drove south to investigate the mystery of a legendary giant called Erdman, the Earthshaker, whose footsteps apparently frightened the man to death? Oh, yes. The clues to the case were green rice grains on the dead man's hand and a drop of blood on a bird feather. Right. What are you going to call the story? The Case of the Bleeding Bobolink. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson plays Patsy. Script is by Alfred Bester. And any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. 
Linex self-polishing wax, Linex cream polish, and Linex clear gloss. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme fine quality paints. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linex dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. 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 Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the Mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, Barlachi. Maybe I should have been carrying a bar lachi, too. That being a sort of good luck charm that Chica always wore. Still, if what happened to her could be called lucky, I'll stick to a good old American rabbit's foot. It all began when I heard a commotion out in front of the cafe tambourine that afternoon. I went to the doorway and looked out on a scene that hit a new high, even for Cairo. The center of all this excitement was a dancing girl in a bright yellow shawl, full whirling red skirt, and big gold hoop earrings that somehow belonged on that vivid face. Her hair made me think of the sleek black velvet I'd seen in Cairo's Ritzia bazaars. And she had eyes to match. Her dancing was like nothing I'd ever seen. The crowd was made up of natives plus a few tourists who were delighted to run onto some local color. To show their approval, they started throwing coins. But I just reached into my pocket for a few piastres myself, and suddenly there was a rough jostling through the crowd. Let me through. Let me through at once. I had him pegged before I ever saw his officious face. Sergeant Greco of the Cairo police. In another moment, he grabbed the girl by the arm. Stop. Stop at once. No. No, do not touch me. I have done nothing wrong. Swear to me. They have a So, a common gypsy dares to resist an officer of the law. No. I will not go to jail. These people will say that I have done nothing wrong. The crowd will disperse. And quickly. Let me go. You have no reason to arrest me. I beg you, Perhaps please. Perhaps a few days go. in a cell will teach you a lesson. Hey, what's the matter, Gregor? Having trouble meeting your quota today? Ah, the gallant Mr. Joe. Go back in your cafe and water your wine for tonight's customers. Look, I don't mind the girl picking up a few coins in front of my place. Dancing in the streets is not permitted in this sector. <laughs> okay, let her go someplace else then. Besides, she is a gypsy. She will steal all of these people blind. I do not steal. This Hitana does not steal. Look, I shake out my skirts. See? No money. Oh, nothing but the jangle of all those bracelets, as far as I can see. Now you better flash that badge someplace else, Greco. An American will not interfere with Cairo Lee, Mr. Jordan. She will come with me. No, no, swear to me. Such a wild no, cat as no, you. <coughs> Wait, come back. I command you. Come back. The girl had broken away, and that's where the crowd took a hand. They suddenly moved in all around the sweating, struggling Greco and swept him down the street. It's an old trick, and the Kyrenes know it well. And he had as much chance bucking that mob as a camel caught in an elephant stampede. And I enjoyed the scene till it faded around the corner. There was no sign of the girl except a red rose that had fallen from her hair. I picked it up and went back inside. I had just sat down in my office with a sandwich and a cup of coffee when there was a knock on the alley door. Please, let me in, senor. Hey, lady, I thought you'd be clear across town by now. I hit quickly. I, I was tired and the police... Okay, the... sure. They won't bother you here. Oh, is, uh, is this your rose? Si, senor. Put it back in your hair. It belongs there. Oh, muchas gracias. You are a, a very kind gentleman. If it were not for you... Oh, you... forget it. When did you eat last? I... You do not think I beg, senor. Oh, of course not. Oh. Come on, sit down. 
quites. Oh, millón de gracias, señor. It is the, the first in many hours. Ah, I thought so. I'm surprised you speak Spanish. I am not a radiant gypsy. I am gitana. Gitana? Mm. They are the Spanish gypsies, señor. The nobility of all the gypsy tribes. You don't say. Well, where are they? In the hills, to the east. I think you'd better get out there quick. No. No, I have left the tribe, señor, forever. Left them? Why? I am through with such a life. I wish to live like other people, in fine houses, where people will not always call me the beggar and accuse me of stealing. Are you sure you're doing the right thing? I will not return to the tribe. That is why I dance in the street, for enough money to go away. I see. Señor, if you would let me be what you call entertainer in your cafe for tonight, then I move on. Uh -uh. Uh-uh. No, nothing doing, Chica. But for only a few pesetas and a place to sleep. That's out, lady. Sorry. (sighs) It is never mind. I find place. Yeah, right where Greco can get his mitts on you again. Wait a minute. I got an idea, Chica. Hold everything. Hello. Millie, it's Rocky Jordan. Well, Rocky, old son of a gun, how you been? Oh, swell. Still loading that third-rate jade off on the tourist? <laughs> Business is booming, Rocky. What's on your mind? Uh, listen, didn't you say your daughter was getting married and moving to Morocco? Sure did. You had your chance and muffed it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh... How about putting a friend of mine in her room for a couple of days? Why, oh, sure, Rocky. Anything for you. Had a girl. Be right over. I slipped the gypsy girl out the back way and over to Millie Hawk's place on the Sharia Hufan. Millie met us halfway across the little court and took Cheek in like a long-lost friend. I was gone from the tampering maybe an hour. And when I got back, it was almost dark. And I made the mistake of going back in by the alley entrance. Standing right inside the office was over 200 pounds of gypsy. He gave me three seconds to take in the jagged red scar stretching from his mouth to his temple, the patched eye, red sash around his waist, and the knife in one big fist. Then he opened the conversation. I am Tenasi. Where is woman? I, uh, I know a lot of them. The Hitana. Chica, what's that to you? I no say what, I say where. What makes you think I know? The Nazi. Her come here. Where? Where she now? Hey, 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 look. Supposing you drop the knife and let's take... I her. will kill a man who take my woman. You think I took her? See, si, but she cannot love you. She love me. Okay, okay, we'll keep it that way. So why don't you run along? Where you hide her? This knife make your time. I tell you, she's not here. Ah, look around for yourself. The place is yours. Why you go behind desk? Something in this drawer might interest me. Not the gun! Before I got the gun, Tanasi made a power dive headlong across the desk. I ducked back, grabbed his knife arm quick, and slammed it against the sharp edge of the desk. And the knife hit the floor. Just as I kicked it away, Tanasi landed right on top of me, and we had it out. It was a rolling, kicking, clawing fight that Tanasi actually seemed to enjoy. But not he. I finally got my knee in his split section, and he broke away. Before he was on me again, I had the knife. He did a quick retreat to the door. And I ask him for coin, sir. I go now. Yeah, you get the idea. You bring my girl. Bring her to our father. For I kill. Just keep going, Tanasi, and take the knife, would you? Well, what can a guy expect when he tries playing godfather to a gypsy girl? Right then, I decided on a return trip to Millie Hawk's place to check up on our star border. I made sure nobody was following me through the dark streets and... Just as I got to Millie's gate, I heard soft voices from the inside court, and I waited. My Petros, I knew you would come when I sent for you. Will you take me away from this place quickly? Have patience, Chica, my darling. In two days, we meet in Alexandria, then we'll be gone from here forever. I will wait, Petros. Kiss me now, amor mio. Yeah, looked like I was playing Cupid, too. Well, I'm not one to eavesdrop on love scenes, so I coughed a couple of times and went in the gate. Uh, <clears throat> who's that? Oh, uh, it's all right. Chica knows me. Oh, Petros, it is the kind gentleman, Mr. Jordan. This is my my future husband, Petros Varga, from Athens, Greece. Harry, the kindness. Uh, Mr. Jordan, I wish to thank you for protecting my little Chica. Oh, don't mention it. You just watch out for Tanasi. Tanasi? When did you see that man? A few minutes ago. He says you love him, Chica. I love Tanasi no more. 
He is very bad man, like a beast. I, I tell him so. I will have nothing more to do with him or gypsies. That way you're running away? See, si. One is not permitted to marry outside the tribe. What did you tell him, senor? Oh, he doesn't know where you are, Chica. But Tanasi's on the prowl and in a bad mood. He's a violent man. A terrible fighter. Yeah, I found that out. Did he hurt you, senor? No, no. But I got the general impression he'll do most anything to break up your romance. Oh, Petrus, I fear for you, too. Be calm, Chica, my darling. Do you not see that you must hide here? I will go quickly to Alexandria, arrange for passport. Oh, hold it, Petrus. Let's just be sure. Do not say that, senor. His heart is for me. It is all right, Chica. I will prove to him my good faith. Uh, here, sir, is money. What for? Please. As a favor, would you buy the steamship tickets for us at the office in Cairo? There is a boat leaving for Athens in two days. Wouldn't you rather Chica got them? I, it would not be safe for her. Please, it must be the least expensive, but if you would be so kind. And and give them to Chica to bring. Sure, sure, I'll get them for you. Oh, senor, you are the most kind gentleman. We shall be indebted to you always, Mr. Jordan. Always. All right, then, Mr. Cupid tore himself away and went back to the tambourine for the night. And bright and early, I was down at the steamship office to buy the tickets. They came to five pounds more than Petrus had given me. So, like the most kind gentleman Chica said I was, I shelled out the difference from my own pocket. I planned to deliver the tickets to Chica right away, but it didn't work out. Just as I stepped out to the curb, a big hand went over my mouth. I felt my arms locked on either side from behind. I was slammed into an old model G Ford, and off we went roaring through the back streets of Cairo. Three gypsies were playing host, and while one drove, the other two tied my hands behind me. I kept asking questions, but got no answers. And twenty minutes later, we were leaving the outskirts of the city to the east. The old car chugged past a flying red horse sign at the top of the hill, bumped off the road, and finally parked by an ox cart. Then they were dragging me down a path, and suddenly the whole gypsy camp sprawled before us. Splotches of color mixed up with tumbling bodies of children, cats, dogs, and even monkeys. Women were bending over great iron kettles while men idled by the tents. When they saw me brought in, they were all up and following. At a big central tent, I saw a magnificently built man waiting. His gaudy clothes and jewelry looked right on him. His black eyes gleamed like sword points as he spoke. Senor, you call yourself Jordan? Yeah, that's right, mister. And what's this all about? I don't like being dragged around. You were brought here for a good purpose. Well, let's clear it up. Who I'm... are you? I'm El Chacon, the king of the Yetanos. Okay, El Chacon. What do you want with me? It is known that a girl left our tribe to join a man in Cairo. She's got every right. It is also known that she went to your cafe, that you hid her. Supposing I did. Where is Chica now, senor? She's where you won't find her, El Chacon. All Chica wants is her freedom. Freedom? Freedom from what? From your tribe, from the life of a gypsy. She wants something a lot better than all this. And I think she deserves it. Por favor. How you say your life is better than ours? Uh, I can think of a lot of reasons. <laughs> look around, senor, at the faces of my people. Do they look unhappy? They sing, they dance, and yes, sometimes they cry. But even crying is good when it washes away sorrow. You say it is you who have the freedom? Uh, yet you are slaves to your houses and your cities. <laughs> we may wander where we will. Our home is the earth and the sky. It is not you, but we who are free. Now, how you say your life is better than ours? Well, I haven't got an answer for that, El Chacon. However, if one wishes to leave our tribe, we do not stop them. Then what do you want with Chica? She must return that which is ours. Return what? The entire treasure of our tribe. Many jewels of priceless value. Are you trying to tell me Chica stole them? They disappeared with her. Why else does she hide from us where she cannot be found? Have you thought of telling the police? The law of our tribe is sufficient to deal with our own. Now, where is the girl? And what if I don't tell you? Oh, Senor Jordan, you have only to tell us where Chica can be found. If you do not, the methods of Hitanos against their enemies is legend, which you soon may learn. And if that fails, we will not hesitate to turn you over to the Cairo authorities as one who harbors a common criminal. Decide now, Jordan, and quickly. You 
listening to Bar Lachi, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. For a solid hour of laughs, tune in tomorrow night to Leave It to Joan at 6 and Breakfast with Burroughs at 6.30. You'll find Joan Davis at her zany best and the balding Burroughs chuck full of hilarious brand of repartee. Don't miss the great good time which comes to you every Monday night on CBS. Now we return you to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, Bar Lachi. Hang the sucker tag on me again. I take a liking to this gypsy girl, Chica. Find her a good place to hide. I even spend five pounds out of my own pocket to help buy tickets for her and a boyfriend to escape to Athens. Then it turns out she's stolen her wealth and jewels from her tribe. Now I had the choice of turning her over to the tribe in their own form of justice, or of facing their wrath as well as the Cairo police. El Chacon stood waiting for my answer as the encampment crowded around. Speak quickly, Jordan. Where is Chica? You're asking me to break a promise I made to her, El Chacon. A promise to a thief is worthless. Tell me something. Where is another of your tribe, a man named Tanasi? He too hunts for the girl. Yeah, why? Because she won't marry him? How do I know any of you are telling me the truth? You wish then for the Cairo police to decide. I'm just asking why you don't look up Tanasi. How do you know that crazy brute didn't take your jewels? For a moment, you are strong here. You call my son crazy brute, I scratch your eyes out. It is true, old woman. Tanase is crazy brute. You speak so of my son, for that you will see. I looked at El Chacon, expecting him to break it up on the double. Instead, he seemed greatly amused. Even when the two women began pounding and clawing each other. Even when other women pitched into the battle. And even when the men took sides and turned on each other. In less time than it takes to tell, every man, woman, child, dog, and cat had joined in. All except El Chacon. Even he had forgotten about me, and I found myself in the middle. I lost my balance and stumbled over backward into the thick of the battle. With my hands tied, I couldn't do much, and I fell under a dozen feet. All I could do was roll. Something else fell and started to roll just then, a nice shiny knife. I threw myself over so that my hand held the hilt. In a few seconds more, I was behind a tent as the battle still raged. In less time than that, I had my hands free and was running. I didn't stop running till I was over the hill and well into the outskirts of Cairo. Well, there were a lot of things I had to clear up with Sheik right then. So when I finally found a taxi, I headed for Millie Hawk's place. Millie was pacing the court when I opened the gate. Oh, Rocky, have you seen Chica? No, but I want to see her right now. Where is I she? I don't know. I was away only for a minute, and when I came back, she was gone. How long ago was that? Over two hours, Rocky. Yeah, it looks like you can forget her, Millie. What do you mean, Rocky? She's bound to come back. She left your stuff here. Huh? Let me see it, huh? Okay, come on. It isn't much, just the stuff tied in this shawl. All right, give it to me. It's all she had in the world. She was such a sweet little thing. I just knew I shouldn't let her... Mercy me, what are those? Something I hoped I wouldn't find. Ever see rubies before? Rubies? Yeah, and there's plenty more to go with them someplace. But I thought the poor girl didn't have anything. So did I. See you later, Millie. Let me know if you find her, Rocky. Yeah, I'll let you know. Well, that wrapped it up. All El Chacon had told me was right. I'd been protecting a common thief. I took Chica's stuff and went back to the tambourine. Back in my office, I reached for the phone, but it won out. Yeah? Jordan, this is Captain Sabayo. Oh, I was just about to call you, Sam. I am sure you were. We have a great deal to talk about. A guy named El Chacon been talking to you already? Indeed he has. A warrant has been signed for your arrest for protection. Yeah, I know. A gypsy girl stole the tribe's jewels and I've been hiding her. Is this a confession, Jordan? On every count, Sam. I'll be right down. That will save me the trouble of sending for you. I can count on you then. Oh, I'll be there. And bring something with me. Bring what, Jordan? Uh, I won't tell you now. Only it sparkles. Sp- are, you, are you trying to tell me you had the jewels? Uh, it's possible. And maybe I'll have something else. Now what are you talking about? Uh, that remains to be seen, Sam. Just dust out your best cell and sit tight. I knew if that cell wasn't going to be for me, I'd better do some quick cleaning up. I remembered the big gypsy Tanasi had said I'd find him at the Harbada, sort of a Cairo counterpart of an American flophouse. 
So on a hunch, I took a detour down that way. I found out he had a little room all to himself on the third floor. So I got up the stairs, found the door, and knocked. There was no answer, so I tried the knob. It was locked, so I came up with my heel. The rickety door lock snapped on the first try, and I went in. There, standing back to the wall at the far side of the room, was my little gypsy sweetheart, Chica. Senor Jordan. You picked a bad hideout, Chica. But I am not hiding. How did you find this place? Thank Tanasi for that. Where is he? He went away. Senor, I could not get out. I, I did not want to come sure here. Sure you didn't. You wanted to go to Alexandria, remember? I got a couple of tickets to prove it. Give them to me. I will go now. Quickly. Not yet, Chica. And I got something else of yours. Did you forget these? <gasps> They are like... like rubies. Where did you get them? Out of the stuff you left at Millie's. But I do not understand. I... I have never seen these before. It's too late for that, Chica. They want to tell me where the rest of the so, loot is. It <gasps> is you! Tanasi. Why did you come here, Jordan? Ask Chica why I'm here. I warn you she is mine. Now you die! Before he could draw the knife, I caught him just below the ribs. He doubled and I crossed one of his chin and stood him up. This time I was on to his style and I felt like fighting. I kept outside his hairy arms and swung from the ankles every time he lunged in. Tennessee was game, but the third time did it. He went down on his face. <laughs> Senor, what you do to Tanasi? He'll keep right there, Chica. Now let's go. Where do you take me? Right to the police. You can take it from there. I took Chica down the stairs, told the clerk at the desk that the cops would be around for Tanasi. We went right to headquarters where I handed her over to Sam Sabaya. From then on, she was mum. She wouldn't answer anything. Finally, Sam closed the cell door behind her. We hesitated there before going out. Jordan, I must compliment you on your prompt action in this matter. From you, that is a compliment, Sam. You will understand that I knew from the beginning that your motivations were for the best. Yes, sure. We still have the problem of finding out where the rest of the jewels are hidden. We can hardly hope that Chica will ever tell us. Maybe Tanasi will talk. My men have already picked him up, but if he talks, it will be the first time a gypsy ever told the police anything. Yeah, see what you mean. Listen, leave me with Chica a couple of minutes, huh? Maybe she'll change her mind. As you wish, Jordan. But she will be guarded very closely. Yeah, suit yourself. You see, I agree with the old gypsy saying, it is easier to hold an eel than a gitano. Senor Jordan. Yes, Chica? You are making big mistake. Sure. I did that to begin with. You must believe me. Tanasi found me and he forced me to go to his place. How do you explain the jewels? I cannot explain them. I, I cannot tell you how they got with my things because I do not know. Chica, don't you see that if you'll tell us where the rest of the jewels are hidden, you'll get off a lot easier? But I don't know where they are. I stole nothing from my tribe. Yeah, okay. Oh, senor, senor. You are a, a very kind gentleman. You will not let them keep me in this place. You asked for it, Chica. Please, please. All my life, I I have known only freedom. If they keep me here caged up like an animal, I, I know I will not live. Looks like you should have stayed with your tribe. See? This is not the life that Petros promised me. You must help me, senor. Just think over my advice. So long, Chica. <laughs> I left her then, but her pleading eyes stayed with me. A lot different from the fiery eyes of the girl who danced in front of my cafe the day before. I tried to push him out of my mind, but a few things kept bothering me. Why she'd steal her wealth and jewels, then show herself by dancing in the streets for a few piastres was something I couldn't answer. The two steamship tickets in my pocket reminded me that Petros was waiting for her. That's when I shelled out some more of my own money for a long-distance call from the tambourine to the Greek consulate in Alexandria. Uh, Varga. Petrus Varga. Have you issued him a passport there? Uh, Mr. Jordan, is this Varga a tall, slender fist man with black hair and mustache? Yeah, that fits him. What about it? Petros Varga has not been issued a passport. In fact, he could not possibly get a passport to Greece or anywhere else. You mean he hasn't been there? Certainly not. He hardly dares to show his face in any consulate. Varga is international thief, wanted in a dozen countries. Well, that's the way it is. Uh, could you possibly be one of his victims, Mr. Jordan? Uh, that remains to be seen, mister. Thanks for everything. <laughs> All at once, I felt good again. I knew now that Chica was right. She knew nothing of the jewels. And there was just one way to clear her. 
Petrus Varga, who was loaded with hot jewels but no passport to get him out of Egypt, which meant he must still be in Cairo. Now, there wasn't a chance of my finding him in that sprawling city, so he was going to have to find me. So I took a roll of bills out of my safe, borrowed a pair of dark glasses, wrapped a muffler up around my neck, put on a dirty Panama hat, and went down through the Musky Bazaar until I spotted a familiar character who called himself Shagriff. What do you desire, Fendi? You, uh, see these, Shagriff? Ah, so very much money, Fendi. Jewels, but why do you tell me? I don't care where they come from. Get it? Oh, but I have no knowledge of stolen jewels. My room's over the rug shop at the corner. I don't ask questions. But, Fendi, I know of no dishonest person. Here, take this and get moving. Imshi. Ah, mutashaki, Yeah, that's all it took. I hurried to the room I'd rented for the day, and the procession started five minutes later. First, a scared Turk with a handful of sapphires. Next, a woman carrying a baby trying to peddle some pieces of broken glass. Next, a Dutchman with a diamond the size of your fist. I got rid of them one way and another, and went on that way all afternoon. At the end of the fifth hour, I was about to call it quits when the door opened, then quickly closed. And Petrus Varga was standing before me. You, uh... Are the jewel fence? That pens. What have you got? Have I seen you before? You won't see me again. Show your stuff or get out. How do I know I can trust you? You don't. All right, it must be cash. For what? Very well. How much for these? Open it up. Keep your hands away. What are you scared of? Open it. There. Gems of priceless value. Yeah. How much? Hurry. I'll give you 500. What? You stupid. They are worth 20,000. For the risk I take, where do you get these? You think I would tell you? El Chacon, maybe? How did you... That is nothing to you. What are you scared of, Varga? Chick has taken the rap. You're in the clear, aren't you? Jordan. You're a big operator, they tell me. Big enough to steal a hoard and jewels and plant it on an innocent girl. If you think I would tell you... You don't have to. You showed up at Millie's place only to hide a few rocks in Chica's belongings. That's when I came along and you dreamed up the idea about the tickets to Athens. You didn't intend to use them at all. You could spare the money. Stay where you are. You did not think I would come here without a gun. Now use it, Varga. Kill me. Take your bag of rocks. But what do you think you'll find outside that door? What do you mean? Go ahead. You're not scared of a few gypsy knives in your back, are you? You're lying. No one is there. No? Then why wait? Shoot, Varga. Jordan... Listen to me. I I did it only for Chica. Help me get away from here. For her sake. Okay. You made a gun. No. No, Jordan. Yes. That's better. Come on, let's go. No. Not out there, Jordan. Please. Not out there. Ah, here. cut it, Vargas. You're safe. Anyhow, till the police get their hands on you. And that's just where we're going. It took a little nudging, but we finally ended up at headquarters. Well, Sam personally let Chica and Tanasi out of their cells with a great sigh of relief. Wouldn't you know, right away, the two were in each other's arms. After telling me for the fifth time she'd learned her lesson, Chica went off with Tanasi toward their camp, both as happy as a, well, a gypsy. Me, I went back to the tambourine a little wiser myself. I was sort of glad nobody was looking when I stooped and picked something up off my office floor. It was a half-wilted rose... But it looked real pretty, even in the beer mug where I stuck it. Rocky Jordan, starring Jack Moyles in the role, is produced and directed by Cliff Howell, with original music by Richard Arant. Tonight's story was by Margaret Barnum, edited by Gomer Cool and Harry Roman. Now, here is our star... Jack Moyles. Ladies and gentlemen, beginning next Sunday, August 7th, the Rocky Jordan series will be brought to you by Del Monte Tomato Products, the brand you trust for flavor in so many fine foods. So be sure to be listening next Sunday at 5 when... Del Monte Foods presents Rocky Jordan and the story Gold Fever. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, 
the Columbia Broadcasting System. W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Oh, I'd like to get my hands on that cup that got me through the shoulder last night. Too bad it was through the shoulder, Mr. Crane. It should have been through your heart. You know, I like you. I like my women with a lot of spirit. I may just take you with me when I make my break from here. You'll have to kill me first. Oh, company. Come in and keep your hands right on that tray. I'd hate to have to shoot a beautiful girl like you. I brought up some coffee. That's thoughtful of you. Keep your hands in the air and stay away from me. Don't take any chances, Sandra. The swing would rather shoot you than not. Rogue speaking. That little scene takes me back to a night a couple of months ago. The night I met some scared people in a seaside mansion. In just a minute, I'm going to tell you the story of the House of Fear. But first, here's Jim Doyle. Just talking about a grand product like Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream isn't really enough. We can tell you what a cool, solid comfort shave it gives, but you won't really know what this comfort is until you use Fitch's No Brush. The very instant you spread this rich, smooth cream on your face, you can tell the difference. You see, it contains a special skin conditioner ingredient that immediately lubricates your skin. Even men with super-sensitive skin find that the skin conditioner ingredient keeps their faces from feeling irritated. Then, when you start to shave, you'll find how easily your razor glides along, even against the grain of a tough beard. After you've finished... Your face will feel cool and refreshed, and you'll know what we mean when we say Fitch's No Brush gives a solid comfort shave. You men who prefer a lather cream will like Fitch's Brush Cream. It gives an abundant, dense lather that stays moist all during the shave. It doesn't become dry and make your face feel parched and uncomfortable. Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream come in generous 25 and 50 cent sizes. Try it for real shaving comfort. Thank you, Jim. And now, I'd like to go on with my story. Okay, here's Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in another personally conducted tour through... Rogue's Gallery. Remember that scene you just heard? Well, one day a couple of months ago, I was in my office playing a bit of gin rummy with Herb Heidi, the bookie from the cigar store in the lobby, when Mr. J. McDonald called from the Great Western Insurance Company. I knew what he wanted. I'd read the morning papers. I hated to leave the game because uh, I was winning for some reason, known only to Herb Heidi who plays cards with all the warm human abandon of an addy machine. But I have learned to love a cash case like a bookie loves a losing horse, and uh, Great Western Insurance is a good client. So I picked up my $2.35 winnings and made tracks for the plush offices of Mr. J. McDonald. Sit down, Mr. Rogue. I have a case I want to discuss with you. Well, thank you. Uh, what's on the fire, Mr. McDonald? I suppose you read of the theft of the Somaliland diamond from the home of James E. Lee? Oh, sure, sure. Last night during a party given by his granddaughter, Sandra Lee. That much I know. The Great Western had that diamond covered, Mr. Rogue. It was insured for 
$50,000. No kidding. Mm, well, that's a lot of money. Must have been some diamond. We're offering $5,000 reward for the recovery of the stone. It's one of the largest in existence. Well, uh, bring me up to date a little, will you? It was a slip crane job, wasn't it? The papers used his name. That's right. Three members of the family identified him from Rogue's Gallery Pictures. There's no doubt that he was the man. He had an accomplice, but we have no line on him at all. And all you want me to do is pinch Crane and get the uh, Somaliland diamond back, right? Yes. Mm. Crane left the Lee mansion in a yellow convertible sedan which the police found wrecked between the Lee estate and Los Angeles. There was blood on the seat, and it's thought that either Crane or his accomplice was wounded. They're believed to be here in the Los Angeles area. Huh? They haven't made any attempt to run the police blockade. Okay, Mr. McDonald, if he's here in this town, I'll have him. Well, that's all the information I have for you, Rogue. I've had our auditor make you out a check for $1,000. Oh? That's your retainer. Oh. And, of course, if you do manage to recover the diamond, there will be another $4,000 due you. Oh, oh, uh-huh. Thanks. And here are your credentials, identifying you as our investigator. And now, Mr. Uh, Rogue... remember, you're... I'm not promising anything. Oh, yes, there is one more thing. The Lee family has been extremely uncooperative today. Extremely so. They practically refuse to talk with either the newspapers or the police. Well, how do you figure that? I mean, uh, what do you suppose is their angle? That is what we are paying you to discover, Mr. Rogue. It was about five in the afternoon when I took off the Lee mansion which was a show place up the coast about 20 miles. Old Man Lee is, uh, is an eccentric millionaire. His picture is always in the Rodegavir section with his two granddaughters, Sandra and Virginia, who live with him. A heavy fog billowed in about 10 minutes before I reached the Lee house, and drove, I drove the rest of the way by air. And by the time I pulled up at the house, my windshield was colored like the side of a battleship and was just about as easy to see through. So I parked in the circular driveway and ran up on the huge front porch. Yes? Richard Rogue, uh, I want to see Mr. Lee, please. I'm sorry, Monsieur Lee is not in. Hmm. Well, then I'd like to see Miss Sandra Lee, then. I'm sorry, Miss Sandra is not in. Oh? Well, I'll just take a look. Oh, no, no, you cannot come in. Oh, you could be wrong, dear. There. Mm hmm. I'm in. Who is it, Marie? This man is trying to force his way in, Monsieur Lee. Oh, good evening, Mr. Lee. I hope you remember me. Richard Robe? Oh, the detective. Of course. Thank you very much, Marie. Come into the study, Mr. Rogue. I, uh, hope you don't think I'm a heathen walking in here like this, Mr. Lee. It's my business, you know. I, I had to see you. Oh, I suppose so. It's about that darn Somaliland diamond. I tell you, Mr. Rogue, we've just been pestered to death all day long about that robbery. I finally had to tell the police and the newspaper people to go away and let me alone. Well, I, I don't like to be a pest, but... Uh, oh, I... we have another guest, Sandra, my dear. The detective, Richard Rogue. Mr. Rogue, I'd like you to meet my granddaughter, Sandra Lee. We've met, Graham. And, Mr. Rogue, I'd like to introduce you to John Wood. He's a house guest. I'm very happy to know you, Mr. Wood. Thank you. I suppose you're here to question us about the Somaliland diamond. Well, that's, uh, that's my job, Miss Lee. I suppose it is. Now, now, we Sandra, don't... please... Oh, my goodness. Oh, Graham, stop fidgeting. We're terribly tired of talking about the robbery, Mr. Rogue. We've talked to the police and reporters by the dozens, and, well, there's just not anything left to say. You must understand, Rogue, that Mr. Lee has been driven to the verge of a breakdown by this affair. Can't you give your information from the police? No, no, I can't. You know, I can see why you're tired of explaining what happened, but I'm in a little different position than the newspaper boys. I represent the insurance company, and... They had that diamond covered for $50,000, and naturally, they're quite interested in knowing the facts of the case. I assure you, Mr. Rogue, that I have no intention of filing a claim against the insurance company. Oh? No intention at all. I just don't want to hear any more about the diamond or the robbery. But, Mr. Lee, Oh, please, Mr. Rogue. It's Graham's own business if he wants to take the loss, isn't it? Well, yes, I suppose it is, but it's a little unusual. And I don't think he should make any such decision under the present circumstances. It's easy to see that you're all upset and jittery, but... Uh, and with good I... reason, really, Mr. Rogue. Mr. Lee has not been well. Couldn't you talk with him tomorrow? No. I'm, uh... I'm sure you won't mind, Mr. Lee, if I have a chair here in front of the fireplace. It's... No. That's a terrible night out. Had a tough drive the last few miles. Fog is awful. Yes. I have noticed that the fog is in a little heavier than usual tonight. It's depressing, isn't it? Fog on top of everything else. 
Oh, Mr. Rogue, I'm so upset. Maybe you'd better start back to town, Mr. Rogue. It'll be slow going in this fog. What's the matter with you, Miss Lee? You're not the hysterical type. Will you please leave, Mr. Rogue? No. I'm an investigator, and I've got a job to do. I'd be a lousy investigator if I didn't try to get to the bottom of this situation. Who are you protecting? What are you afraid of? Are you accusing us of complicity in the disappearance of that diamond? I don't even know you, Mr. Wood. I'm talking to the Lees. I'm not accusing them of anything. Look, Mr. Lee, crime is my business. I know how to deal with crime and criminals. Why don't you tell me what's on your mind, Mr. Lee? I'm sorry, Mr. Rogue. But as far as I and, and my family are concerned, the theft of the Somaliland diamond is a closed matter. I have my reasons now. Please go. Yes, you... You can't do any good thing here. Where's your other granddaughter, Mr. Lee? Where's Virginia? She's returned to her school in the city. Oh, I see. Oh, Graham, please, make now, it leave. Now, dear, I'm sure Mr. Rogue will be going. Did you ring, monsieur? Yes, Marie. Will you please show Mr. Rogue to the door? Okay, okay, okay. But uh, if you ever feel like you need any help in whatever it is that's forcing you to act like this, Mr. Lee, call me, will you? I'll be waiting for your call. Yes. Yes, I will. I'm sorry, Mr. Rogue. Good night. Good night. Good night, Miss Lee and Mr. Wood. Good night. Good night. This way, monsieur. Monsieur Rogue, you are the detective? Yes, that's right. There are strange things going on in this house, Monsieur Rogue. There is much trouble. Well, uh, can you tell me about it, Marie? Oh, well, I... Marie! Uh, yes, Monsieur Wood. Mr. Lee wants to see you in the library. Good night, Mr. Rogue. As I got in my car and sneaked down the hill through the fog, I told myself I was wasting my time. That I was looking for a man named Slip Crane, the jewel thief. And that I had no business getting mixed up in the family affairs of the Lees. <laughs> There was a filling station and general store at the spot where the highway joined the private road that led up to the Lee estate. Sam's filling station for you and your car. I stopped in there for a sandwich and a cup of coffee. Great night to be driving around, mister. Yeah, yeah, it is. Hey, uh, give me a slice of that pumpkin pie, will you? Why, sure. Here you are. Just came down the hill from the Lee house, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, sir, there was plenty of excitement around here last night. Yep. Cops all over the place. Newspaper men. Best business have done in years. The whole district is still full of cops. They've thrown up a roadblock in every direction. Hey, you policeman? That for a fashion. You working on the case? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That must have been some diamond. Mm. You know, those Lees are nice people. The old man's a little fidgety, but the rest of them are swell people. Well, he's all right, too. Yes, sir, nice guy. You know them? Know them? Why, sure know them. Known them all for years. The kids, Sandra, Virginia, been eating my hamburgers ever since they was old enough to toddle down here. Yeah? You know what school Virginia goes to up in the city? Why, sure. Same one Sandra used to go to. Hmm. Uh, let me see, uh, Mrs. Whipple School. Oh, well, thanks. Hey, uh, what's the toll charge to call the city? Uh, two bits for the first three minutes. There's a phone booth right over there. Thank you. Yes, sir, those little Lee girls are the salt of the earth. I've known him for ten years, I guess. Knew the daddy well, too. Went to school with him. He's a colonel now, an eagle colonel in Washington. A big shot. Hello, operator. Please get me Bargate 63645 in the city. Smith on duty. Oh, hello. I, uh, I would like to speak with Virginia Lee, please. Miss Lee? Why, well, I'm sure she isn't here. She's at her grandfather's home up the coast. Well, she is? Are you sure? Oh, yes. Uh, just a minute. Miss Lee is home, isn't she? Uh, yes. Miss Lee is not expected back until Monday morning. Thank you. Get your party? Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, give me another cup of coffee, will you, Sam? Why, sure. Oh, uh, tell me, Sam, uh, I know the whole Lee family, except Virginia. She's only about 14, isn't she? Jenny? Oh, no. No, she's 19 to 20. Mm. 20, I think. She's a wild one, that youngster. 
She's all for having fun. Nothing at all like her sister, Sandra. Oh, oh. Well, I guess I'll be on my way. Can't sit here all night. I don't envy your drive, none. Better take it easy in that fog. It was all as plain as the nose on an anteater's face now. They told me Virginia was back at her school. She wasn't. Sam told me Virginia was a wild one. I knew Slip Crane. He was a smoothie. So, one and one makes two, and these two were Virginia Lee and Slip Crane. She'd run away with him. That's why the old man didn't want the case followed any further. That's why he was willing to take the loss rather than have the police arrest his daughter with Slip Crane. When they caught him for the theft of the Somaliland diamond. I got in my jalopy and drove back to the Lee estate. I wanted to have a talk with that maid, Marie. I parked at the turn in the driveway and walked through the fog toward the servant's cottage at the rear of the main house. I could see a halo of light back there pointing its fingers through the haze. I headed for it across the lawn. I heard a movement behind me and then... Oh. Oh, I caught my dream train for cloud eight. And who was waiting for me there? Was my alter enemy, Yugor. <laughs> In trouble again, eh, Rogi? What happened, midget? <laughs> you got hit on the head. <laughs> As usual. Oh, no, who hit me? I didn't see them. <laughs> it's a wonder you've lived so long, Rogi. Dumb as you are. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It was a Dane that hit me, wasn't it? Was it? I remember the perfume. I remember getting a sniff of it just as you let me have it. <laughs> That's you, Chief. Sniffing when you should have been ducking. <laughs> oh, my head. Oh, you'd think I'd get used to this, but I, I don't, do I? <laughs> you know, Rogi, you haven't time to talk with me tonight. Get back downstairs. <laughs> oh, just let me rest a while, will you? Oh, can't. Over the side with you. Please, don't push me, please. I'm tired. Over you go. Come on. You got some trouble to straighten up down there. Over you go. Over the side. Look out. Look out. Oh, here I go again. I began to come to... I could hear voices fading in and out. I couldn't focus my mind's eye on them, but I listened without quite knowing what it was all about. Oh, oh, Mr. Rogue. Please, please, wake up. Sandra, don't move. I see you and I have you covered. All right. I'm not moving, Mr. Wood. What are you doing? Who's that lying there? It's Richard Rogue, the detective. Oh? Rogue, huh? What happened to him? I, I knocked him out with this poker. I thought it was you. You followed me when I left the house, huh? Yes. I was going to try to kill you. Really? How interesting. Instead of that, you fixed it, so I'll have to kill Richard Rogue. We'll return to our story in just a moment. But first, I'd like to tell you that one of Hollywood's foremost hairstylists remarked recently that most women do not shampoo their hair often enough. She pointed out that movie stars' hair is frequently shampooed every day because they know that beautiful hair must be kept sparkling clean at all times. Now, you're probably thinking, isn't it hard on hair to wash it so often? Doesn't it become dry and difficult to manage? The answer is no. Not if you use Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo. Thousands of women in the United States and Canada have found they can wash their hair as often as they like with this shampoo, and their hair is always soft lustrous and easy to set. Fitch's saponified shampoo does not dry the hair because it's made from mild coconut and vegetable oils. These pure natural oils are kind to your hair. It makes swirls of rich, fragrant lather that rinses out completely, for Fitch's saponified shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent. Just rinse with plain water, and the rinsing agent goes to work to remove all remaining particles from your hair leaving it soft and full of natural highlights. You can get a generous six-ounce bottle of Fitch's saponified shampoo for 50 cents and the economical 16-ounce size for one dollar. Use it often to keep your hair shining and lovely. (laughs) 
Now back to Rogue's Gallery. Richard Rogue is telling our story. I was telling you about the time the Somaliland diamond was stolen from the home of wealthy old gem collector James E. Lee. The insurance company put me on the case, and I went out to Lee's secluded country mansion, but uh, got no place. He wouldn't even talk to me about the robbery. I left, uh, picked up a few more clues, and returned. I was walking across the lawn in a pea soup fog when I was knocked unconscious by Sandra Lee, the old man's granddaughter. And when I returned to consciousness, I I played possum and listened to the conversation between Sandra and uh, John Wood, a mysterious house guest of the Lees. So you followed me when I left the house, huh? Yes. I was going to try to kill you. Instead of that, you fixed it, so I have to kill Rogue. Do you think that would be smart? He doesn't know anything. No? Come on, help me carry him into the house. There's a certain permanence about being killed that made me act deader than a ghost town on Monday night. I was as limp as a wet sock when they picked me up and carried me into the house. Wood, uh, who was a very strange house guest, lifted the rod out of my shoulder holster before they laid me out on a divan in the study. Old Mr. Lee was very upset when he saw me. He, he immediately started patting my hands while Wood poured some very good brandy down my throat. I was in no hurry to face facts, but eventually I figured that one more sip of brandy would be overdoing it, so I snapped out of it. He's coming out of it. Oh, mm. oh what happened to me? Oh, my head. Oh, dear, I knew something like this would happen. I hit you. I didn't know who you were. You should know better than to be caught prowling around the lawn up here after what happened last night. Yeah, yeah, I suppose you're right. Uh, what did you hit me with? A poker. Oh, Sandra. I don't know what your father would say. What were you doing on the lawn at this time of night, Rogue? You're lucky you didn't get shot, you know that? Yeah, yeah, I suppose I am. Oh, well, I, I didn't think of that. Uh, could I have another drink of that brandy? It makes me forget my headache. Of course, Mr. Rogue. Uh. Here you are. Uh, thanks, yeah. <sighs> yeah. <clears throat> oh, that's uh, strong. And You know, Mr. Lee, I, I came back to tell you... Uh, I've got the deal figured. What do you mean? I mean, well, Mr. Lee, you told me that your other granddaughter, Virginia, had gone gone back to her school. Yes. I called Mrs. Whipple's school and found out she wasn't due back until Monday. Yes? Oh, you called the school? She wasn't there? That's then. right. So right away, I knew why you were so anxious to get me to drop the case today. You've got it all figured out, haven't you, Rogue? Sure. I'm right, aren't I? Virginia, your granddaughter, eloped with the thief. That's right, isn't it, Mr. Lee? I, uh... Guess we might as well admit it to you, Rogue. Nothing else we can do. Is there, Mr. Lee? No, I, I guess not. Now, that's not for publication, you know, Rogue. We'll make it worth your while to forget it. Won't we, Mr. Lee? Why, of course. If you say so, Mr. Wood, I it, mean... It, uh, it'll cost you. Uh, I'm not in business for my health. For a thousand bucks, I forget what I know. That will be satisfactory. <laughs> You're something of a louse, aren't you, Rogue? <laughs> something. You can call me a louse if you'll give me that grand... You got that much in the house, Mr. Lee? I believe I have, in the safe. You want me to get it for you, Gramps? We might as well get Mr. Rogue paid off and out of here. Now, that's the kind of talk I like to hear. Yes, Sandra. Will you get it for me, dear? So that's what you came back for, the shakedown. <laughs> you private dicks are all alike. For the first time since I'd been carried into the house, Wood was loosening up. My attempt at a shakedown had sold him on the fact that I was just a chiseler. And I could see the hand he had on that gun in his coat pocket relax a little. That brandy had given me a transfusion and I was feeling all of my faculties falling back into place. I was tense as the East ring on a Heifetz fiddle and just as ready to play when I saw Sandra sneak in the door and grab up that poker she'd used so effectively on me. I figured it was my move. So I started to get up. I wanted to get Wood concentrating on me. Oh, you know, uh, you know, I have, uh, I think I've got a concussion. My my head is spinning like a top. Look, uh, is his skin broken, Wood? I don't know and I don't care. Well, you can look, can't you? Come here. Better take it easy, Rogue. You're in no shape to make any sudden moves. No, I, I just want to see if I can sit up. 
That's all now. Look out! Take it, Sandra. I've got his gun arm. Let go of that. Oh, nice work, Sandra. Get his gun? Sure. He's got one of mine, too, that I want back. Sandra, how could you dare with Virginia? I had to do it, Graham. Give me your belt, will you, Mr. Lee? I want to use it to tie up this character's legs. He's one of the men who stole my diamond. He was with that crane man. They worked together. Here, I, I'm, a, I'm still a little confused. Sandra. Yes? Give me your handkerchief, will you? I want to gag our friend. Incidentally, I was conscious when you explained to him that you knocked me silly by mistake. Please, we must get to Virginia. Poor Virginia. We will, Gramps, we will. Just leave it to us. Where is Virginia? She's upstairs, with Crane holding five this morning. What? Well, here, here. Fill it in a little. What happened? These men came back here last I'll night, Miss... Uh, you mean Crane and Wood robbed you and then came back here and hid up after they wrecked their car and couldn't get through the police blockade? Yes. Crane was wounded. They waited until the police were gone about five this morning, then they came in. Hmm. They kidnapped Virginia and held her in a room. Crane stayed with her and Wood made us introduce him to the police and newspaper men all morning. Okay. House guest. Okay, okay. Now, this guy's all taken care of. Let's go get Crane. Where is he? He's in one of the front suites, upstairs. In a room that has windows out onto the porch? Yes, um, the first window at this end of the porch. All right, now listen. In exactly five minutes, you knock on the door to that room, right? This sounds dangerous. I shinned up the pillar at the far end of the porch looked my rod over to see that it was in good working order, and then I inched over to the window of the room where Crane was holding Virginia. Virginia was tied in a chair. Crane was babying a bloody shoulder. I could hear them talking. Oh, I'd like to get my hands on that cup that got me in the shoulder last night. Too bad it was through the shoulder, Mr. Crane. It should have been through your heart. You know, I like you. I like my women with a lot of spirit. I may just take you with me when I make my break from here. You'll have to kill me first. Ah, company. Come in and keep your hands right on that tray. I'd hate to have to shoot a beautiful girl like you. I brought up some coffee. That's thoughtful of you. Keep your hands in the air and stay away from me. Don't take any chances, Sandra. This thing would rather shoot you than not. Drop that gun, Crane. My next shot goes right through your back collar button. Well, he dropped it. And that's about the end of the story, except that I took the uh, Somaliland diamond from him and won the five grand reward, which I, uh, which I spent on Sandra Lee during the next few months. I thought some of asking her to marry me. And believe me, I, I think she was all in the mood to give her the nod. No, no, really, really. But I thought better of it and stayed single. Making me one of those select eligible young men who has never made the same mistake once. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Did you uh, miss the murder in tonight's story, or do you think we can get along without one once in a while? Ray Buffum wrote tonight's yarn. Leith Stevens composed, composed and conducted the music, and Dee Engelbach produced and directed. But don't forget to tune in again next Thursday night. We're going to present an exciting story about a horse, a jockey, and a murder. We call it Last Race. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening, and good night, all. Now here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time. Uh, oh, and by the way, be sure to see Dick Powell in his newest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater soon. And as I was saying, don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Removes dandruff the first time it is used. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is the only shampoo whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance companies. This statement can be made by no other shampoo. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug and toilet goods counter, barber, or beauty shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H.
The Adventures of the Saint, starring Vincent Price. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charters and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes transcribed to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Vincent Price as... The Saint. You know something, Simon, darling? Some things, Anne. Among them, the fact that you're a very disturbing person. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Perhaps that's my answer, then. Answer to what, may I ask? Why, you phoned me the moment I returned from Bermuda. I've been wondering why you're going to ply me with a football game, a dinner, and a play. Well, why not just relax and enjoy it? I'd like to. (laughs) Particularly when I remember that last evening we spent together in Bermuda. Before you had to fly back to the States on some nasty murder business or other. Yes, that was quite an evening, wasn't it? Quite. Do you know you're very beautiful? I've always enjoyed your thinking so, Simon. Well, in as much as I have a tremendous distaste for murder interfering with moonlight, I now intend to take up where we left off. Is that a football game? Oh, well, it'll be a good game. As a matter of fact, it had better be the trouble I had digging up tickets for it. <laughs> Well, here we are, Anne. My, how things have changed since I was in Bermuda. Imagine they're now holding football games in cigar stores instead of stadiums. This happens to be Tony Cartago's little establishment. There's an office inside where Tony conducts his main business, which consists of handling bets and scalping tickets. Oh, you do know the loveliest people, Simon. Yeah, for which you should offer thanks. We couldn't get any seats to today's game otherwise. Tony has a couple for us. Oh! oh. Well, didn't your mother ever tell you that it's not polite to go running into people that way? Oh, I, I'm terribly sorry. I, I didn't see you. My apologies. Mm, not bad. Nice manners, too. I wonder why she came tearing out of Tony's that way. Oh, if you're interested, Tony can probably tell you. I wonder where I've seen that girl before. Oh, it's some harpy's huddle, I imagine. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Come on, let's go in. Ooh, some place. I bet you couldn't buy cigars in here for love of money. Well, I'm not sucker enough to lay odds against that. Uh, the real business is conducted right in here. <laughs> Hiya, Tony. I want you to meet... Simon. You better stand back in. My old grandmother would often say, yikes. Yes, I see. He's been shot, hasn't he? I'm afraid so. He's still alive, though. Hey, Tony. Tony, who did it? Can you hear me, Tony? Who gunned you? No, I didn't. Duke, he knows. It's me, Tony. Temper, who shot you? Don't know. Bonds effect. Bring that. Uh, uh. Oh, Simon, is he? He is. Well, there's nothing to do but call the police. Why, Simon, the saint calling in the police on a case? What's happened to you? It's very simple, Anne. I'm much more interested in a beautiful woman. Oh, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Well, why don't you call them? Oh, a visitor. Two visitors, darling, a man and a gun. That phone's getting kind of heavy, ain't it, mister? The phone? Oh, yes, yes. Come to think of it, it is kind of heavy at that. I'll take care of it for you. That's better. You know, you're the second person we've met today who should read Emily Post. Don't you know it isn't polite to point at people, particularly with a gun? Shut up. And it's also impolite to tell me. Shut up. Uh, you see what he means, darling. He wants you to shut up. Oh, is that it? Yeah. I wondered what he was driving at. That's very fun. I'm so glad you liked it. Though I have a better routine that goes like, give me that gun. Oh, you know, the funny was making on it. Simon, get up, Simon, get up. You killed him. Oh, no, I was just sleeping. Maybe that gun over his head will learn him a thing or two. But you... Sh- and if you're smart, you won't kick up any fuss. They just as soon kiss you, too. Kiss me? Yeah, with the butt of my gun. Now relax, baby. Simon, wake up, Simon. 
Simon, wake oh. up. Oh. oh, come on, Simon, wake up. Now let's leave a later call. Oh, Simon. All right, Ann. Hey, what goes on here? We're tied up. Yes. Pete thought we'd be more tractable that way. You know something? He's right. Where are we? How'd we get here? Uh, Pete, he's the guy who conked you. Yeah. And a buddy of his named Louie brought us here. It's a warehouse of some kind. We're in one of the storage bins on the first floor. Uh, nice. Are we stored away for the winter? No. No, with a little luck, we'll be out of here in five minutes. A mistaken identity, and I'm not Superman. And these ropes are pretty tight and strong. Oh, darling, yours may be, but mine aren't. I've had them loose enough to throw off for 15 minutes. I was just waiting for you to wake up. Well, now, don't tell me you're a superwoman. No. No, I owe it all to dear, sweet Louie. When I looked at him piteously out of my big blue eyes, he just couldn't tie me up too tightly. I worked myself free while you were sleeping soundly in the corner. Never again will I underestimate the persuasive powers of women. <laughs> now, see what you can do about getting me loose. All right. There's a little knife in my vest pocket that might help. Uh, this pocket? Right. Oh, be careful. I'm ticklish. Oh, I've got it. You know, Simon... I just remembered who that girl was we saw running out of Tony's place. Yeah? Who is she? Betty Streeter. She... Ah, there. That fixes up your hands. Thanks. Now, let's have the knife. I'll get my legs loose myself. Here. Betty Streeter, huh? Mm -hmm. The luscious lollipop whose picture's been in the newspapers lately over an engagement or something? Yes, that's right. She's engaged to Jack Landers, an old boyfriend of mine. Oh. Oh, lucky girl. Jack is so handsome and fascinating. That's very interesting. There. Now the legs are loose. Now let's see if I can stand up. There. How do you feel? Oh, outside of that bomb burst in my head and the fact that my legs are apparently cut off at the knee. I... Simon, someone's coming. Slip those ropes over you and lie down on the floor quick. Okay, okay, Simon. When he comes in, make with those baby blues and attract his attention for a minute. I'll be behind the door. And then what? Well, I won't be dealing a hand of canasta. Quiet now. Well, hello, Petey. How do you feel? Fine, baby, fine. Just come back to... Hey, the boyfriend, where is he? Here I am, Pete, with a peachy key. Aha, uh -huh. now that's what I call more like it. Come on, on your feet. Yes. Yeah. I'd better pick up Pete's pop gun. Right, now, let's get out of here. Now, that's the first sensible thing you've said today. Let's... What's that noise, Simon? I don't know, but it sounds like my head feels. There's no time to delve into strange noises now, my sweet. Come on, let's go quietly. You know, I wonder if Louie, the other mug, is hanging around. No, no. After Pete searched you and didn't find anything, I heard him say he was going to report to the boss. I guess he's still reporting, then. The place seems deserted. Oh, look, there's the front door. Let's head for it. Well, oh, it's certainly nice to be out of there. Yeah. Hey, what was the name of that girl again, Ann? Girl? Oh, Betty Streeter. Why? Look at the sign on this building. Sign? Simon. It says Streeter's Warehouse. Yeah, that's what it says, doesn't it? Come on, Ann. Let's find out what this is all about. Uh, Simon, darling, I thought you were going to call the police. Ann, darling, that was before Petey hit me over the head with his gun barrel. Oh, I was afraid of that. Okay, what's our first stop? Well, first, we find ourselves a nice telephone directory. May I ask why? To find out what street the streeters live on. <laughs> Yes, who... Anne! Hello, Jack. Remember me? Remember you? Oh, Anne, sweetheart, if you don't think so, get a load of this. Mm. Mm, Jack, that's a rather warm <laughs> greeting after all these years. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Uh, Simon, I, I want you to meet an old friend of mine, Jack Landers. Jack, this is Simon Templer. Glad to see you, Templer. Mm, but not as glad as you are to see Anne. Uh, well, not quite. No. Come on in. Thank you. Yeah, what are you folks doing here, anyhow? We came to see Betty Street here. Uh, this is where she lives, isn't it? Betty? Hmm? Yes. Remember the girl you're engaged to? <laughs> sure. Run along. She's in the living room with her father. Uh, say, by the way, Landers, uh, have you got a handkerchief? 
Handkerchief? Yeah, of course. Why? Well, I have heard that misplaced lipstick is a better detonator for atomic blast than plutonium. And before the two gals oh, meet, well, I... Maybe you're right, this Templar. Is... Well, Betty... <laughs> Holy smoke, what was that? Well, either Betty's involved in a premature explosion or they were shots. Come on, let's see. It's the living room, Templar, to the left. I'm with you. Stay back, Ann. Betty! Betty, what? Oh, Jack, someone shot at us through the window. Dad's hurt. He, Dad, he look was... after Mr. Skeeter, Jack. I'll take care of the guy at the window. You'll be careful, Simon. He may still be out there. Now she tells Let me get a crack at him, Templar. Did you get him, Jack? I think I got him in the leg. He stumbled after the first shot, but he got away in that car. Well, now that quiet has descended once again, it might be pertinent to inquire as to the state of Mr. Streeter's health. Oh, it, it's nothing serious, just a slight flesh wound. A slight wound, is it? Feels like my whole dead blasted arm has been torn off. Do you any idea who was so interested in perforating the Streeter's skin, Mr. Streeter? Yeah, I'll say I have. It was one of the... Dad, Dad, there's no need to talk like that now. Oh, blasted Betty, there's no reason for me to hide things. That crook's been trying to chisel in on my warehouse business for over a year. He's taken one of them over already. You couldn't possibly be talking about uh, Duke Raymond, could you? That's right, Templin. He's threatened Mr. Streeter before. Looks as though he sent one of his gunmen around to enforce that threat. Oh, you've got to give in to him, Dad. The next time you won't be so lucky. You ought to realize now that he won't stop at anything. Give in? Nonsense. I hate to sound mercenary, Mr. Streeter, but uh, how much would it be worth to you to get your skirts cleared of Duke Raymond? How much would it be worth? Mm-hmm. Who are you? My name's Simon Templer, if that means anything to you. The, the saint? I'll confess it. Has that startled you, Miss Streeter? Oh, why, 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 no, not at all. I, I just didn't expect it. Of course, it. after all, only sinners need be frightened by saints. Well, Mr. Streeter, what do you say? Uh, all right, I'll make you an offer. Ten thousand dollars if you get Duke Raymond out of the way. Nothing if you don't. You've just made yourself a deal. Simon, you taking money for a case? The juries award damages for broken hearts, Anne. And you have no idea how badly I feel about letting Cupid down. Well, Miss Morley, this is our famous riverfront. How do you like it? I don't. Now, there's the spot we're heading for. Do you see it? Well, I see some speedboats moored at a dock, if that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Any particular reason for coming here? The usual reason. We're going for a little boat ride. Uh, How much for the ride, buddy? Uh, Twelve miles south, twelve miles back for a buck. That's fair enough. Come on, Ann, let's get in. You know, the more I think about this, Simon, the crazier I think you are. Why would anyone want to travel 12 miles out into the ocean? To see Duke Raymond, of course. Oh, I see. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's playing Father Neptune on top of a wave, I presume. Not exactly. You'll see when we get out there. And I'll expect a great big apology for those words when we get back. You mean, if you get back, don't you, Tim? Simon. Yeah, I see. That man's here again. Tell me, Petey, my friend, what are you doing here? Are you coming along for a ride? That's right, Pa. Huh? Yeah. You know, after paying a buck for 12 miles out and 12 miles back, I think I've got a right to be particular about the kind of company I have. Well, don't let it bother you, pal. This gun in my hand makes us equals. Besides, you better pay only half a buck. Why only half a dollar, Petey? Because it's cheaper by the dozen, right, Petey? Yeah, yeah, you'll get the idea, pal. You may be going 12 miles out, but I don't think you're ever coming back. Oh, Pete, this ride hasn't been very comfortable so far. That gun sticking in my back irritates me. Yeah, it's too bad, isn't it? Uh, sympathetic soul, aren't you? Oh, well, the ride's nearly over. There's Duke Raymond up ahead. That's funny. I don't see anything but an old freighter out there. That's it, lady, the Black Deuce. The Black Deuce? Wait, man, isn't it? It's a quaint ship. Gambling is the special thing. And I always thought that was against the law. That's when you're 12 miles out and you're Duke Raymond, it isn't. You see... Simon, there's not a cabin cruiser coming up behind us. Yeah, it's coming up fast, too, and no lights on it. I don't like that. I don't like it at all. Oh, don't worry, Pete. It's just pulling ahead of us. Yeah, I guess... Hey! Hey, what do you think you're doing? Simon, the boat's turned toward us. It's going to run into it. Look out! You're going to ram us! You're going to... Oh. Oh. Ah, 
you doing, Ann? Oh, all right. So far, but not much. Just a couple of more strokes will do it. Keep it up. There we go. Just two more now. Phew. Oh, I thought we'd, we'd never get here. Must have been telepathy. Oh. Wait a minute. I'll, I'll climb on board. Uh, okay, now that does it. Okay, now give me your hand. Okay, sir. Easy does it. Uh, oh. Well, quite an experience, I'd say. Oh. Where are we? We're in a speedboat moored to the Black Deuce. Which reminds me, it's time to go to work. Oh, yeah. You're not actually going aboard that ship, are you? That was my original intention, wasn't it? Besides, Pete and his boyfriend will drown if I don't get help out to him. Oh, and you've got to earn that $10,000. As I know. Yeah, right as usual, Angel. Now, listen closely. Do you know how to run a speedboat? Yes, yes, I do. Why? Well, I've got a funny idea you're going to have to run one in a very few minutes. I do. Who are you? I'm Simon Templer. The man Pete was supposed to bring in part in the wet clothes this damn sea air, you know. Where's Pete? The last time I saw him, he was hanging onto a wrecked speedboat a couple of hundred yards away. Hanging onto him? Come on. Get down to cases, Templer. What's the racket? Uh, Duke, I have a funny hunch you're going to lay off Streeter's business. Am I? What makes you think so? A possible murder rap? Kids talking, Sapper. Tony Cartago was bumped off. Why? You're so smart, you ought to know. Maybe I do. I'd guess it was because he knew too much about bonds. Bonds? Yeah, you know, securities, negotiable ones with a lot of dough. Where'd you get that idea? From Tony. He talked before he died. He mentioned you and bonds. Tony always talked too much. You talk too much, too. Mm, yeah, I'm beginning to get what you mean. I thought you would. You know, Duke, there you are, sitting behind that desk with a gun in your hand. I wonder. You wonder what? I wonder how you'd look with that desk on top of you. <laughs> Too bad, Duke. You missed me. Sorry, I can't do the same now. Oh. Imagine that. Duke Raymond sleeping during business hours. <laughs> You'll never get ahead that way, old boy. Horatio Alger would positively frown upon you. <laughs> Nice going, Anne. Thank you kindly for picking me up out of the water. If I'd known what was going to happen, I wouldn't have. When I saw you dive off that rail and all those people started shooting at you. Oh, just a necessary unpleasantness, my sweet. I had to get some information from Duke about bonds. Bonds? You going to play the market? Right now I'm playing the field. There's a murder in it. And I'm going to start at Mr. Streeter's warehouse. The warehouse is over to the left side. Sure, but we're going next door. And just what do you expect to find there, Sherlock? A printing press, of course. There, you see. The Travers Printing Company. Well, I see it, but I can't understand it. How did you know this place was here, and why look for a printer? Tony Cartega told me to look for one just before he died. And as for this place, you remember the thumping noise we heard as we were leaving the warehouse? Why, of course. It was made by a printing press. Sure, that's what I thought. Well, shall we go in? At this hour? But it's so dark, nobody will be in there. Two facts would impress me no end. Now, let me see. I should have some keys in my pocket. Why bother? That door's already partially open. Yeah, you're right. Oh. This is black as pitch in here. I, mean, I can't risk a light until we're sure it's empty. There's a crack of light over there. Yeah. It seems to come from a doorway into another room. I wonder if... Oh. What's the matter? I, I hit my foot against something. Something soft. You don't say. 
Suppose you look up at the ceiling while I shine this pencil flash down. <gasps> oh, Simon. Perfectly expressed. He's dead, isn't he? Well, if he's not, he ought to be. He's been tied up, gagged, strangled, and shot in the leg. Who is he? I think he's the gentleman who tried to kill Mr. Streeter. Well, how do you... Because Jack shot him in the leg, remember? He's probably Mr. Travers the printer. He... What is it, Simon? Why'd you turn off the light? Because that light in the other room just went out, and I hate to be a nonconformist. Where are you going? I'm going to step over there and see what's up. Oh, be careful. Sure, but I'll risk it. I'm going after him. Oh, look out, Charlie. He's a killer. What is it? Oh, What's wrong? Whoever it was locked and bolted this door. I'll have to kick it down. Watch it. Someone may still be in there. You have the most pessimistic thoughts. Now, wait till I find the light switch. There. Well, nobody's here. He must have gone out that window. Yeah, and if I hadn't been idiot enough to bump into something in the dark, this case might have been over by now. Either that or you'd have been dead. I... That funny hissing sound. That? Oh, it's the flame under that lead pot over there. What's cooking? Oh, printers use them to melt their old linotype slugs in. Yes, but why would that be going now? Do you think the killer left... There was a reason I wanted you along tonight. You've just hit it. There's the type. Yes. You see those engraved copper and zinc plates on that work table? Mm -hmm. If we'd come in a few minutes later, they'd have been in that lead pot. But what are they? Oh, I'm not so good at reading upside down and backwards, but... Six uh, percent debentures, state of secured highway taxes. Huh, so that's it, what... Would you mind explaining, Simon? Later, darling. First, I've got a little surprise party to prepare. Surprise party? Yeah, as soon as I remove the handkerchief gag from Mr. Travers, send a message to Duke Raymond and make a few phone calls, we'll go to the scene of the party. How nice. Now, what's going to happen there? What usually happens at a surprise party? Oh, don't tell me. I know. One very foxy murderer is going to get a great big surprise. <laughs> So the surprise party is going to be at Tony Cartago's place. Right you are, Ann. There it is now. What's going to happen, Simon? All I know is that you called a lot of people in a disguised voice and told them something about Bonds and Tony's. Why? Well, if you'll look inside the cigar store, what do you see? Well, there's a light inside. Correct. And that must mean one of the guests has arrived. Look quiet as we go in. I want to see if that's an early bird or a worm. Seems to be awfully busy looking for something. Well, let's help the poor soul find it. Hello, Betty. Oh! What's the matter, Betty? Looking for some bonds? Bonds? Uh, the ones you were called about this morning? Well, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, that, Betty, that'll never do. However, I wasn't the one who called you this morning. How did you know about that? Hey, we you the party? Jack! Hello, dear. All right, Templar, what's this all about? Hello, gentlemen. Nice of you to come, Mr. Streeter. Uh, Jack, I was just talking to Betty about that phone call of this morning. What did your caller say, Betty? Something about your father's life being endangered over some bonds and that you'd better get down here fast to save him? My life in danger? What kind of nonsense is that? It wasn't nonsense to Betty. She came down here all right. We walked in right after Betty left and found Tony Cartago dead. Now, just a minute. You're making a pretty dangerous accusation there, Templar. It happens to be true. Mr. Streeter, Duke Raymond forced you to sell him that warehouse next to the Travers Printing Company, didn't he? Yes. And it took a lot of force. He ruined the business by destroying merchandise, wrecking trucks, the usual racketeering methods. I had to sell to stop losing money. Maybe you better not talk so much, Streeter. Yeah. Maybe it won't be healthy. For well, 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 more guests. Duke Raymond and Pete. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Sapper. What gives here? Well, now, that's a rather silly question, Duke. You came here looking for bonds, didn't you? So your message was a frame, huh, chum? Only in a manner of speaking, chum. Someone in this room owed you money from gambling, didn't they, Duke? And promised to pay in negotiable securities to be left until called for here at Tony Cartago's. 
It's your story, Templer. Keep talking. But when Pete came to pick up the bonds for you, they were missing, and Tony was dead. It's lucky for you, too. If you tried to sell those bonds, you'd have been arrested. They were forgeries. Forgeries? You sure about that? I know it, and I can prove it. Surprise, surprise, surprise. What do you think of your gambling friend now, Duke? That dirty job will cross her. With all that dough in the family, too. Oh, loud down, Rat is gonna get No, him. you don't, Duke. Okay. Stop right there. Simon, he's got a gun. Isn't that strange, Jan? I was thinking the same thing. Jack. Oh, no, Jack, not you. Pretty sharp, aren't you, Templer? Got it all figured out. Oh, I've been known to get around, Landers. Anyway, it was rather obvious. Particularly after you kissed Anne. After he kissed me? What did that have to do with it? Well, you see, Anne... I got something to say first. <laughs> Oh. He's dead. Yes, good old Pete. He never misses. There, there, my dear. There, there. Thanks for keeping him busy while I went for my gun, Tim. Oh, think nothing of it, Pete. And to show my appreciation... Here. What? What's the big idea, Ah, uh, Duke, let's not be hasty, shall we? I've got a gun, too. The one I borrowed from you aboard your ship. Get on the phone, Ann. Call the police. You bet, Simon. Right away. As for you, Mr. Streeter, get out your checkbook. The amount is 10000 payable to your favorite charity... Your friend Duke Raymond won't bother you again for a long, long time. Would you like another drink, Anne? No, thank you, Simon. I suppose I should thank you for a lovely day. Mm, it had its points, but the football game might have been more exciting. I doubt it. But I still need some answers. But don't you see, And Jack was terrified when he couldn't pay Duke the huge gambling debt he owed him. So he hit on the idea of forging bonds. He had Travers print them. But I still don't understand why he killed Travers. Well, he had to make sure that Travers wouldn't talk. So when Jack went to the print shop to destroy the evidence of the forged plates, he destroyed Travers too. Yes, but why was Tony killed? Tony held the bonds for Duke. But when he discovered they were forged, he called the streeter home. Yes. Then he got the message and hurried down to see what it was all about. She thought Tony was talking about her father. And Jack was there, overheard the conversation, and beat her to Tony. Right. And he tried to kill us with a cruiser to stop us from getting Duke's store. Mm-hmm. He was a busy little man. Okay, mastermind. I guess I've got it. Except for that crack about the kiss. How come you knew Jack Landers was guilty because he kissed me? Lipstick, Ed. What? Lipstick? Yeah. yeah. You see, after you kissed him, he had lipstick all over his face. Yes. When I called it to his attention, he wiped it off with his handkerchief. And the handkerchief that gagged Travers had lipstick on it, too. Oh. And to think that just because he kissed me, he, he's dead. Mm, I wouldn't feel that way about it if I were you. Your kisses wouldn't kill anyone, and I can prove it. Can you, Simon? Sure. Watch. Mm. Oh. There, you see? I guess you're right. Oh, please don't agree so quickly, Anne. Why not? I'm seriously considering making a lifetime work out of proving it. listening to another transcribed adventure of the saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. Now here's our star, Vincent Price. Ladies and gentlemen, in tonight's cast, you heard Shirley Mitchell, Barbara Eiler, Jack Moyles, Tom Brown, Edmund McDonald, and Anthony Barrett. This is Vincent Price inviting you to join us again next week at this same time for another exciting adventure of the saint. Good night. <laughs>
Tonight, we again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Headquarters in his most famous cases of crime and murder. As all of you know, Mr. Chameleon is known in the police as Chameleon, the man of many faces, who appears in various impersonations to track down his prey. The audience always knows who Mr. Chameleon is, but the criminal he is tracking down seldom does. Tonight, we give you Mr. Chameleon and the case of the Jewels of Death. New York City, after one o'clock in the morning, is a place where anything can happen and does. And the ring of a doorbell in those early hours can be a terrifying sound, as Helen Casey can testify. And as she slips on a robe in her attractive West Side apartment, she says to herself, Who can that be? Perhaps I shouldn't go to the door. Oh, but it might be something important. I, I can't take a chance. Yes? Who is it? What do you want? Why, there's no one out there. They must have gone. <gasps> oh, it's you. I thought it might be. I've been wanting to explain to you. I've been wanting to explain it. <laughs> and an hour later, in quite a different neighborhood, among the swarming tenements of the east side... Another sleeper is aroused by a pounding on the door this time. And Cyrus Allen, a poor little pawnbroker, goes to the door of his shop. All right, I'm coming. Merciful heavens, what sort of an hour is this to get a man out of bed? Can't they see the place is closed? Yes? You? What are you doing here? You've never come here before. Uh, I've been wanting to explain to you. If you just give me a chance to explain to you... Oh, no! No! Ah, ah. And now, at Central Headquarters, the following morning, we find Mr. Chameleon with the Commissioner of Police. And the famous detective, the man of many faces, is frowning as he studies the report, which has just come in. That's very strange, Commissioner. I'm... This girl, Helen Casey, lived in a very swanky apartment in the 50s. And yet she was killed in the identical manner as old Alan, the pawnbroker. It's chloroform to death, Chameleon. Mm-hmm, chloroform. Both knocked out first and then bound in such a way that any effort to free themselves would only hasten their death. Someone picked up that rope trick in China. In addition, the killer fastened a handkerchief soaked in chloroform around the victim's nose and mouth. Not a very nice way to die. Yes, but why the two murders? Since obviously they were committed by the same man. It must have been a man, Chameleon. It would take a man to overpower them. Well, that, Commissioner, is the only thing that I'm sure of at the moment. Casey Girl's apartment was violently ransacked, so was the pawn shop. Commissioner, that pawnbroker, Cyrus Allen, hasn't he been under suspicion as a fence? Of course he has. Aha! Well, now we're getting somewhere. Come in. Well, if it isn't Detective Sergeant Arnold. And look at his shining face, will you, Dave? What's the matter? Have you caught the killer? Nope. Well, I've got news about that Casey Dame, Mr. Chameleon. She worked at Farshawn, the jewelers, right up to last week. Farshawn? Mm-hmm. She worked for the fabulous Farshawn. Well, now we are getting somewhere. Hello, operator. Uh, put a call through to Farshawn, the jeweler on Fifth Avenue. I want to speak to Mr. Farshawn himself. Do you know Farshawn, Chameleon? Uh, not the man himself, no, Commissioner, but um, I've often bought things at his shop. What a layout he has. He's designed some of the most beautiful pieces of jewelry I have ever seen and charges fantastic prices. Hello? I'd like to speak to Mr. Farshawn, please. This is Mr. Chameleon of Central Headquarters. Oh, he isn't. I see. Are you his secretary? Well, perhaps you can help, Miss Kent... Um, I'm uh, calling about Helen Casey. 
Oh, you know about her death, do you? I understand that she worked for Mr. Farshaw. You fired her? For what? Ah. Uh, oh, for stealing. Yes. They found one of their rings was missing. Uh-huh. Uh, tell me, Miss Kent, aren't you uh, pretty careful about whom you uh, hire for the jewelry shop? Oh, I see. Well, thank you. If I need more information, I'll call you back. That girl, Miss Kent, has a charming voice. So what, Mr. Chameleon? So what? Dave, I am extremely sensitive to voices. Miss uh, Kent said that they were shocked about the murder of the Casey girl. She was sent to them by the Apex Agency. You get them all there, people. They haven't yet replaced her. Uh, Dave, you um, uh, get the list of all stolen jewelry and bring it to my office. I want to look it over. The Cartwright rubies set in a heart-shaped pendant. Oh, they're worth a small fortune. And the Black Pearl of Isis. Oh, that'll never turn up. Or will it? Mr. Chameleon, did you send for me? Uh, yes, come in, Madeline. I want you to go to Farshan's, the jewelers. Not a very uh, special sort of pendant. One that um, corresponds with the one that we have here on the stolen jewelry list. Rubies and diamonds in a heart-shaped setting. But, Mr. Chameleon, you don't think that Farshaw... Well, he's the finest jeweler in town. Surely he wouldn't deal in stolen gems. Uh, Farshaw, my dear, simply designs the pieces. I hear he's a very gentle, vague old man. But um, someone working in the shop may be dealing in stolen gems without his knowledge. But, Mr. Chameleon... Now, you're a very beautiful woman, Madeline, as well as a good detective. I'm sure that they'll believe that someone is quite willing to buy you a ruby pendant... I'll see you this afternoon. You mean you're going to question them? No, no. I mean, I will probably take your order. What? You see, they need a uh, new clerk at Farshan's jewelry shop. And the Apex Agency is sending them a distinguished gray-haired man who walks with a slight limp and uh, comes from a fine old family. His name will be Howard Dillon, Mr. Chameleon to you. Oh, that's to be your disguise. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dillon has an appointment in half an hour with Mr. Farshan's secretary who has a very beautiful voice. I hope her face won't disappoint you. Oh, you are a woman as well as a detective, Madeline. I'll tell you something about Howard Dillon. He's very nearsighted, so Miss Kent's face will be much less important than her voice. Miss Kent, uh, do you mind my telling you that you have a very beautiful voice? Not at all, Mr. Dillon, though it won't get you the job here at Farshan's. Well, what will? Mm, probably your distinguished appearance and your social connection. Oh, uh, here's Mr. Paul Stewart, the vice president of Farshan's. Mr. Stewart, this is Howard Dillon. Apex sent him over. Oh, yes? Yeah? Not that their recommendation is worth much after that dreadful Casey girl... Uh, Miss Casey was murdered, wasn't she? Am I supposed to weep over that? Apparently she had it coming to her. Well, Mr. Stewart, shall we engage Mr. Dillon? Well, shall we engage who, my dear? Are we taking on new help? Oh, Mr. Farshan, yes. This is Howard Dillon, Mr. Farshan. I am deeply honored, sir. I've admired your work as a jewel designer for many years. I consider you to be in a class with a world-renowned Van Vec of Amsterdam. He has a pleasant tongue, Elise. I've noticed that, Mr. Farshan. He also has excellent credentials. He has, eh? Well, what do you say, Paul? It's up to you, Mr. Farshan. No, I think not. I'll leave it up to Elise. She always knows best. Well, come along, Paul. Good day, Mr. Dillon. Good day, sir. Uh, Miss Kent, uh, do I get the job? I think I'd enjoy working here. A great many people would. This is a treasure house, Mr. Dillon. As fabulous as anything out of the Arabian Nights. For instance, there's a Maharaj of India who comes to Mr. Farshan and... Oh. Yes? Oh, but you'll hear about that later. There is one thing I must caution you about, however. If any customer consults you about an unusual piece of jewelry, always send for Mr. Stewart, who'll tell you if it can be made. Uh, not Mr. Farshawn, Mr. Mr. Kent. Farshawn is a genius. He does the actual designing in the studio in his home. But Mr. Stewart, who's worked with him for years, knows what he'll undertake and what he won't. So 
send for Mr. Stewart. Is that understood? And it is also understood that the job is yours. Principally, I'm afraid, because I happen to like you. Now, just a moment, if you please, Miss um, Evans, did you say? Madeline Evans. Uh, just a moment, Miss Evans, while I call Mr. Stewart and ask him about that pendant. Uh, Mr. Stewart, uh, may I have a word with you, please, sir? Yes, yes, Mr. Dillon. What can I do for you? Uh, this young lady, uh, Miss Evans, is looking for an antique pendant set with rubies. Uh, do we have such a piece, or could Mr. Farshaw make one up? A pendant set with rubies? Yes, my mother once had one. A heart-shaped pendant with three large rubies, the outer rim set with diamonds. I've had a sentimental desire to own such a pendant, and now a, a friend has told me to order one if I can. I see. Why do you look at me so strangely, Mr. Stewart? I assure you my friend is quite able to pay for it. I don't doubt it, Miss Evans. Just occurred to me that we might have such a piece. Seems to me Mr. Farshawn once designed a similar pendant. Miss Evans, suppose you come with me and give me your address and telephone number. I'll get in touch with you. Splendid. And thank you, Mr. Um... Uh, Dylan. and I want you to know, Miss Evans, that you were my first customer, and I do hope you get your pendant. So do I, Mr. Dillon. Well, you look extremely pleased with yourself. Well, Miss Kent, I didn't hear you coming. I was just keeping an eye on you. I feel in a way you're my protege, Mr. Dillon. Well, I can't think of anything that I'd enjoy more than having you keep an eye on me, as long as I am allowed to indulge in the same pastime. <laughs> you know, I really do like you. I like you, too. Uh, Miss Kent, uh, would you consider it presumptuous if I asked you to have dinner with me? Well, that depends upon how soon you wanted me to dine with you. Tonight? Tonight is perfect. I like presumptuousness in a man, Mr. Dillon, as long as the man is attractive, of course. Enjoying yourself, Elise? It's wonderful, Howard. But we always have wonderful evenings together. I have yet to go out with you that everything wasn't just special. Well, like yourself, Elise, you are very lovely, you know. Am I? Mm -hmm. Do you think you could fall in love with me? I think I'm a little in love with you. Well, thank you. <laughs> but uh, seriously, all you need with that white evening gown is the Black Pearl of Isis. The Black... What do you know about the Black Pearl of Isis? Well, it was stolen, wasn't it? Uh, since I've been working at... Farshawn's jewelry shop, I have acquired a tremendous interest in precious stones. Well, keep it under control. It's like a drug, Howard, that love of precious stones. I know. Oh, but uh, excuse me for a moment, will you, while I go to the powder room? Yes, of course. Mr. Chameleon, I mean, Mr. Dillon. Madeline, what are you doing here? Oh, dining out, just as you are. I have a social life, too. Oh, I see. Well, what about that pendant? Farshawn phoned me today. They're going to have it for me. Good, good. If that turns out to be the missing Cartwright pendant, or if the rubies turn out to be those famous rubies, then we'll know that someone at Farshawn's is dealing in stolen gems, and those two ghastly murders will... Look out. Here she comes. Well, thank you, Mr. Dillon, and you'll probably see me at Farshaw's tomorrow. Good night. Uh, good night, Miss Evans. Lisa, I was just talking to Miss Evans, my first customer, you remember? How could I forget her? She's very attractive. And I happen to be an extremely jealous woman. Jealous of Miss Evans? I hardly know her. Then leave it like that. After all, Howard, you don't want to get mixed up with a detective, do you? A what? Oh, yes. I found out this afternoon that that beautiful girl, Miss Evans, is really a detective. Seems too bad. I mean, what a profession for anyone. Detectives must have such very unhealthy lives. <laughs> Mr. Chameleon and the case of the Jewels of Death continues in just a moment. And now back to Mr. Chameleon and the case of the Jewels of Death. It is the following noon, and in the police commissioner's office, we find Madeline Evans and Mr. Chameleon with the commissioner. And of the three of them, only Mr. Chameleon remains calm, for even the commissioner is talking excitedly. 
But don't you see, Chameleon, they're on to you. I'm sure of it. They discover that Madeline Hill is a policewoman, and the chances are they suspect you. Can't be helped, Commissioner. I've got to continue my work at Farshan's jewel shop as Howard Dillon, whether somebody knows the truth about me or not. But they do, Mr. Chameleon. Just the way that woman told you that she knew about me. Doesn't that prove it? Mm, perhaps. I received a very courteous phone call this morning from Paul Stewart himself, saying that they'd found that it was impossible to make a ruby pendant like the one I described. So they've been warned. Now, if Paul Stewart and that Kent woman are dealing in stolen Paul gems... Paul Stewart is a vicious customer. I knew that immediately. But it's possible that Elise Kent... That she what, Chameleon? Mr. Chameleon started to say that she must be innocent, since she has such a perfectly delightful voice. That, my dear Madeline, is a dirty crack and not true. No question but that someone at Farshawn's is dealing in stolen gems and right under Paul Farshawn's nose. But until we have proof... Well, you know my motto, the innocent must be protected and the guilty must be punished. Even if you're personally attracted to the guilty? Commissioner, will you please remind this young lady that I'm a cop? Now, back to work at Farshan's. Another day, another dollar, in my disguise as the jeweler's clerk, Dylan. Chameleon, you're in danger, I'm convinced of it. Yes, so am I, Commissioner. Did you forget there have been two brutal murders? We're dealing with death as well as stolen gems. Besides, I'm curious about uh, Farshan's masterpiece that he's making for that Maharaja. I'm just wondering if by any chance it contains a black pearl. Now listen, Elise. You're playing a dangerous game and it's got to stop. It's a matter of life and death. Who's death, Paul? I think you know. You must be there tonight, that's all. I... Did you hear footsteps? No. All right, I'll be there at 11 o'clock sharp. You can count on me, Paul. I'll wait, be wait, at the... Wait, wait, wait. Wait a minute. Is that you, Mr. Dillon? What were you doing, eavesdropping? I uh, know, Mr. Stewart. I started to come into Mr. Farshan's office, and I realized you and Miss Kent were having a private conversation. Oh, you did? Then why did you listen? He wasn't listening, Paul. You're being ridiculous. Sorry. Better get into the shop, Dylan. That is, if you're really serious about the job. Well, what ails him, anyhow, Elise? He, uh, disappointed in love? Could it be that I have a rival? No, you have no rival. Well, then how about dinner in the theater tonight? I... I can't. I... I have a date. With Paul Stewart at 11 o'clock? I did overhear that much. Do you really care if I have a date with Paul Stewart? I'd care a great deal if you had a date with that girl detective friend of yours. Elise, are you meeting Paul Stewart tonight? And if so, where? Tell me, you must. Oh, Howard, don't be silly. You're imagining things. Of course I don't have a date with Paul Stewart tonight. <laughs> You're sure we're heading in the right direction, Mr. Chameleon? No, I'm not. I'm taking a chance on it, Dave. But some tremendous transaction is taking place tonight. Where, I don't know. At least didn't dare tell me that. Best you could do is tell me the time. But the police are watching the jewelry shop and Paul Stewart's apartment house. And at least Kent's place, too. Not enough, Dave. Not enough. I want to be there on the spot, personally, before another human soul is chloroformed out of existence. Just pray that I've hit on the right place. Well, 11 o'clock, Mr. Chameleon. Mm-hmm. Here we are. This must be Farshan's house. His workshop, I understand, is on the top floor. Mm. The place is dark. Mm. Let's try the front door. What? Are you nuts? No. Ah. Door's been left unlocked. Then it's a trap. Maybe. And maybe not. Even if it is, Dave, we are going to walk right into it. Okay, here we are, Dave. This must be the workshop. Look, Mr. Chameleon, I don't like this. No one's even tried to stop us. Don't be impatient, Dave. They will. They will in time. Let's see if this door is open, too. Oh, there's a light on in here. Yes. A light shining down on the work table. 
There's a single piece of jewelry lying on the table. I think we're supposed to go in and look at that. Holy smoke! Mr. Chameleon, look at it, will you? Hmm. Beautiful, isn't it? Perfect setting for the Black Pearl of Isis. A what? The Black Pearl of Isis, about to be shipped to that Maharaja, I imagine. Good evening, gentlemen. What are you doing here? Did Paul Stewart bring you, Mr. Dillon? Uh, not exactly, Mr. Farshaw. I see you've been admiring my handiwork. Do you like it? It's magnificent. Uh, where did you get that unusual pearl? It's superb, isn't it, Mr. Dillon? Paul Stewart got it for me. He gets me all my precious stones. I'm simply an adulpated artist, I'm afraid. I specify what I want, and he produces it. Well, the, uh... Black Pearl of Isis is quite something to produce. That was stolen three years ago from a tremendously wealthy Chinese warlord. What? Sto... <gasps> Paul! Take it easy, Farshan. Nothing will happen to you, but these two gentlemen had better get their hands up. <laughs> ah! Sorry, Mr. Stewart. I was a little quicker than you were. Uh, Dave, you got his gun? No, Mr. Chameleon, I've got it. Oh, so you are Mr. Chameleon. I should have known it. And who's Mr. Chameleon? Paul, I don't understand this. They say this pearl is stolen. What is it all about? And this is Howard Dillon. His name isn't Chameleon. You know perfectly well, Mr. Farshawn, that my name is Chameleon. I think you've known it for at least 24 hours. You also know I'm a detective who works in disguise. But believe me, I am not the actor that you are. What? <laughs> really, this is all so... So bewildering. Paul, tell this man, this, this chameleon, that I don't know what he's talking about. Mr. Farshant's quite innocent chameleon. He didn't know the gems were stolen. You are afraid of him, aren't you, Stuart? You're so afraid of this man that you'd rather take the rap for him than have him turn against you. No. No, you're lying. You know how Farshan operates. You know how he brutally murdered those two fences who held out on him, tried to keep the jewels that he wanted. Chameleon. You have an alibi, Stuart. At the time of those murders, you were spending the weekend with your sister. We know. We've checked on it. But uh, Mr. Farshan has no alibi, have you, Mr. Farshan? I retire every night at midnight, sir. You can never prove otherwise, and my friends won't talk against me. One of them will. The only one in your outfit who wasn't afraid of you. Where is she, Farshan? Where is Elise Kent? I have no idea. Dave? Yes, sir. You search the place and start on this floor. Yes, Mr. Chameleon. And stop smiling, Mr. Farshan. You think that we can't find her? 